CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Mr. Victor Hugo said, Where the telescope ends... The microscope begins. Which of the two has the grander view? Which indeed? For the longest time, we had been urged to think big. Now there are those who say that perhaps we could more readily solve our problems if we were to think small. Big? Small? How do we really know which is which? mystery drama, Heads You Love, Tales You Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Marion Seldes and Court Benson. When you meet the Countess Elena Moreni, your immediate reaction is... Of course, this lady must be the genuine article. She's tall, slender. Her features can only be described as exquisite. Her costume, though basically simple, is the height of stylish elegance. Were this the Europe of a hundred years ago, she would have been the brightest jewel in the palace of a king. Ah, but if we're to discuss the beautiful Countess Elena, we should hear from her uncle, Count Stepan Moreni. He knows more about her than any person living. Or dead. Yes, at one time the Moreni family had extensive holdings in what was called Transylvania. But everything's gone. All that I have left in my old age is my niece, Countess Elena. And the truth is, strictly speaking, she's neither my niece nor a countess, nor is she even a Moreni. Years ago, her name was Gertrude Schmidt, and she was a scrawny, timid teenage girl who helped out in her father's delicatessen on the northeast side. And I remember that certain day when everything ended and everything began. Uh, good evening to you, Herr Schmidt. Uh, Count, uh, you have not forgotten us. Uh, why should I ever forget you, Herr Schmidt? Oh, I thought that uh, since you had come into your fortune... No, Herr Schmidt, I have not come into my fortune. The fortune I have come into could have been anyone's fortune. <laughs> I've merely won the lottery. Ah, but this may be the way that Providence has of... Um... Correcting a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> My good Herr Schmidt, Providence will never admit that he or she or it has ever made a mistake. You can say what you want, Count. I believe it was ordained. <laughs> Why are you surprised to see me? Uh, I, I thought that now you are rich. You would buy at some more exclusive places. My good friend, you are the only shop in town where one may purchase paprika that is worthy of the name. A true paprika. I have put some aside for you, Count. Gertrude, here is Count Moreni, who has come all this way to buy from us. Uh, well, say hello. A good evening to you, Fräulein Gertrude. Trude, where are your manners? Oh, she is so shy. <laughs> Look at her. When you stand erect, child, you have the carriage of a queen. But why is she so timid? Frightened of her own shadow? Wait, my good friend, wait. One day she will discover the power within her, the irresistible forces of fire and ice in those brilliant, beautiful blue eyes. <laughs> I tell you, she was born to break hearts and rule men. <laughs> if only I could just get her to say hello to people. All in good time. Some blossoms bloom early, others late. But the magnificent flower... Stick them up! Oh, 
You, you heard me. There's a gun, my friend. Be careful. Just, 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 just stick up your hands. There's no need for this young man. If you're hungry, you can have food. If you want money... Shut up! You, you can have anything, but put away that gun. Just, eh? just, just, um, uh, uh, open the register. Schmidt. Schmidt, do, do exactly what he tells you. Good. Now, just, just stand back. Oh, oh, it, 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 it went off. I, I, I didn't mean to. It just went off. Yes, it just went off, and Joseph Schmidt fell down dead. I was standing next to him. A little more to the left, and it could have been me. As it was, I was blinded momentarily by the flesh. I could feel the sting of the exploding powder. The gunman, of course, ran away, and the police never found him. Some weeks later, I decided to return to the shop. Perhaps I could do something for the young girl. Yes? How can I help you to... Oh... It's the Count. Good morning. <laughs> that bandage on your eye is something wrong. Oh, it was from the... Oh, well, n n never mind. You needn't be afraid to say it. I heard you were blinded from the powder from that shot. You're better, aren't you? Yes. Then it's just a temporary thing. Yeah, we hope. Uh, my dear, you look tired. Oh, yes. I understand your... Keeping up the shop all by yourself? I'm trying. And you're finding it difficult? I'll manage. Of course you will, of course. However, the price may be too high. What do you mean, Camarini? Come with me, my dear. Where? Just over here, to the mirror on the wall. Now, look at yourself. What do you see? Well, I... Shall I tell you what you do not see? Lines, shadows, brought on by work and worry. The struggle to make ends meet. Well, I suppose it cannot be helped. Oh, but it can. How? Gertrude Schmidt, who must labor for her daily bread behind a delicatessen counter, will fade early, wither away. But the Countess Elena Moreni, ah, she is something else. Who? Who is she? The only child of my late brother, Zoltan. And I am an old bachelor, therefore she is the last of the Morenis, and she will inherit my fortune. But why must she wait till I am dead and she is old? I shall endow her with it now. <laughs> look at me, child, look at me. Countess Elena Moreni. Countess Elena Moreni? Elena, for the only woman I ever loved and lost. <laughs> she was so much like you. You shall keep her memory ever green. But what, what, what are you saying? You will become my niece, the Countess Elena Moreni. Me? You shall become the most beautiful, the most famous and sought-after woman in all the civilized oh, world. Please, Count, I... We I, have nothing to say about it, you or I. But, Count, I, I have everything to say about whether or not I'm going to it allow... It was almost the very last word your father said. What word? Providence. We were talking about my coming into a fortune, and he said it was ordained. What? What was ordained? My dear, your father at that moment was only a minute away from his death, a single footstep from eternity. Did he already sense the meaning, the design? Was it even then being slowly revealed to him that I would use the money for you? Oh, but please, no, I... I'm frightened. Frightened? Oh, 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 no, 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 child. Be rather joyful, be jubilant, that he has been able to sense your glorious future. I can see you now, the Countess Moreni. No. No? I... I can't. Why not? Because I... I, I just can't, that's all. Tell me why, child. Because... 
The man who killed Papa, he must pay for it. I must make him pay. You? Who else? Was it police? Ah, the police have already forgotten him. Well, I shall make this killer pay the price. How? I'll wait for him. Where? Here. Look inside this drawer. You see? Oh, that's, that's a revolver. And I know how to use it. <sighs> Revenge. Surely, Amoreni you cannot argue against it. He will come back here one day. Why do you say that? He will come back. I know it. My dear, your grief has made you angry and frustrated. My father was murdered. And you cannot tear yourself away from the place where he fell, as if somehow that would keep him by your side. But ask yourself, what would make him happier? If you wasted away as a drudge in a shop, or if you blossomed into the magnificent Countess Moreni? <laughs> She didn't need very much persuasion. But while your average countess is born, your true noblewoman must be made. And she was given all that was required to make her a great lady. And I must say she was an apt pupil. She learned French, the language of civilization. To pass, to cast, to glass. Italian, the language of art. De quoi, de la, de jouy, de la slice. Spanish, the language of passion. La vida es sueño, y los sueños, sueños son. And there were the piano lessons, and the painting lessons, and tennis, and golf, and shooting, and sailing, and travel. And soon people were beginning to notice this fabulously beautiful and unbelievably talented Countess Moreni, who came from one of the oldest families in Central Europe. And there was this celebrated love affair with the scion of one of America's wealthiest clans who shot himself when she left him. She was constantly sought after for interviews, and so was I. Most of them was the usual light-headed fan magazine type. But one journalist proved to be remarkably perceptive. Count, when you see her, she seems to glitter and sparkle like some priceless gem. Of course. But I think I sense a dark quality. I beg your pardon? Almost a shade of sadness. Yes? As if there has been some tragedy in her life. Has there been a tragedy? Why don't you ask her? I did. And what did she say? She said no. Well, then, that should be the answer. But I don't believe her. Uncle Stefan? Oh, my darling, come in, come in. You're not having your nap. That's disobeying the doctor. Uh, and you're reading a book. <laughs> you make it sound like a crime. It is. He said your eyesight was just too weak. Well, he said my eyesight was failing. And so it might just as well fail in the line of duty. <laughs> oh, well. I'm afraid we have something to talk about. Oh? Uh, this is rather awkward. You see, my dear, <laughs> it seems I, I've run out of money. My dear uncle, <laughs> I have been expecting this announcement. You have? Yes, the wonder is that your money lasted as long as it did. And so, as I saw this day approach, I said to myself, I must go to work. I have become an interior decorator. Oh? Well, why not? All one needs is taste. So, I've opened an office. I look at you. I, I, I simply cannot believe that you started this life as Gertrude Schmidt. And I can never forget it. I know. And it shows. Well, to you, naturally. Yes, and also to an extremely perceptive reporter, Miss Rivers. I've never forgotten my father. And that day... And I've made a vow that that murderer will be brought to justice. Sometimes, my dear, we must remove vengeance from our hearts, or it shall destroy us. No. Something inside me says, follow your destiny. That man who murdered your father is part of it. 
you will meet him again. Oh, dear Uncle Stefan, I feel I shall meet him again. And soon. Where? In the rarefied atmosphere of her present environment, among the rich, the great, the famous? The fact is, she's become a part of this world. Well, did she meet him again? What happened to that nervous young killer? You know you're going to find out in Act Two. Most popular of all stories is Rags to Riches. But the problem with most of them is the fact that the transition is never really smooth or easy. And no matter how high one becomes, or how many riches one acquires, it's impossible to leave all the rags behind. There are always loose ends to be tied. Usually ghosts that must be laid to rest. Here again is Uncle Stefan. Till now, she had just been a beautiful playgirl of the international set. But soon her entire image had changed. She had become a professional working woman. You would see her designs in the leading decorating magazines. She was being consulted and quoted. She had acquired stature and authority. <laughs> My little Gertrude Schmidt, whom I had transformed into the magnificent Countess Moreni. There was only one small cloud. The usual one that never could disappear. May I have another cup of coffee, my dear? No, you really shouldn't. Yeah, it's your fault for brewing it exactly the way I like it. Well, it's the way Papa taught me. <laughs> and every time I smell it, I think of him. Isn't that why I do it? Deliberately? To keep him fresh in my memory? Certainly. <laughs> You realize that's a question Freud would ponder over for pages and volumes. <laughs> and you so casually dismiss it in one word. <laughs> oh, naturally. <laughs> You're in a good temper this morning. And you've mentioned Freud. Mm -hmm. Does this mean what I think it does? And what is that? Are you thinking it's time you fell in love? No, oh, it's always time to fall in love. All one needs is to find the man. <laughs> Yes, that's the way it goes. She was unaware of it, but this was the day that she was destined to meet a man who... Ah, uh, but I mustn't get ahead of myself. I can only say that that day there was another conversation at another breakfast table. Harry? Yes, my dear? I waited for Margaret to finish serving breakfast. Oh, does that mean we're going to have a scene? You didn't keep your appointment yesterday? What appointment? With Countess Moreny. Oh, Ma, why do I have to be involved in this thing? It's your house. You live here, too. Well, let her decorate the place any way she sees fit. She can't do it unless she knows She what... is being paid and quite well to do it. A house must be an extension of the people who live in it. Mm, it's a good sales talk, but she doesn't have to persist in that nonsense. She already has the job. Let her do it. Take the money and run. That is not how the Countess Moreni has become the foremost interior decorator in this country. Alma... I am too busy. You promised I could have the Countess do the house. I wrote out a check. What more do you want? Unless she has an opportunity to meet you, she'll resign the account. Well, that's just too bad. Terry, I am trying to hold on to my temper. Alma, I'm very busy. I don't want to become angry. Don't force me to make an issue out of this because I will. All right. All right. <sighs> this afternoon at 2.30, be there. Who? Oh, yes. Ask him to come in, please. Finally, Mr. Harry Collins. Ah, oh, the elusive Mr. Collins. Elusive no longer. So... There is a Countess Moreni. She's not merely a picture in the magazines, a story in the paper. Have a chair, Mr. Collins. 
Had I but known. Had you but known what? Well, that words fail to express, pictures even fail to communicate the essence of the most... <laughs> oh, why wouldn't I say it? The most magnificent woman I've ever met. <laughs> you realize, of course, that this is a business meeting. The business of which is to get to know me better. Or is that merely sales rhetoric? Are you always so verbally extravagant? Oh, I'm not sure. I wonder if you bring it out in me. Mm, is that a business-like question? Shouldn't it suggest uh, an extravagant color for my study? How about a bright yellow, strong red? No, you couldn't live with them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I hardly spent any time there anyhow. Why? That is a long story. Why don't I tell you about it over lunch? No, I've just come back from lunch. Or oh, dinner, then. Don't you have dinner with your wife? I can't when I'm having a business meeting. Ah, but your wife is my client. Why don't we talk about it over cocktails? Why don't we talk about it here? Well, the fact is, an office always seems to inhibit me. Mr. Collins. Uh, 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 uh. Harry. <laughs> Mr. Collins, I don't think anything could ever inhibit you. No, you must try some more of Ilona's soup. I think she surpassed herself this evening. Uh, thank you, my dear. Oh, uh, oh I'm sorry. I, I didn't it's see It's all that. right. It's all right, darling. Uh, the doctor said it would come to this. No, no, no. You mustn't talk about it. Well, I've seen what's worth seeing. Transylvania, the most beautiful country in the world. And you... The world's most beautiful woman. As for the rest... I... I met a most amusing man this afternoon. Ah, that means he's married. How did you know? Well, if he was single, he'd be interesting. But since he belongs to someone else, he can only be amusing or diverting. Well, he may not belong to someone else forever. Oh, have we reached that stage so soon? No, we are at no definite stage. <laughs> uh, what is the gentleman's name? Uh, Mr. Harry Collins, and I've asked him here for cocktails tomorrow afternoon. And you must promise to ask for no more than one martini. And may I present my uncle, the Count Moreni? How do you do, sir? Countess Elaine has told me a great deal about you. Uh, but she's told me almost nothing about you. Uh, there isn't very much to tell, I'm afraid. Oh. I must disagree. Everyone's life is a book which consists of many volumes. I think that I will do Mr. Collins' study in gray and white. I have the feeling that he is underneath it all an extremely serious-minded person. You've discovered my secret. At that moment, at that precise moment, did I also discover a secret? Why? Why suddenly... Did I hear a shot? No, it was only in my mind. The two of them kept chatting as if nothing had happened. That shot, why did I hear that shot? And now I was listening to his voice. When I can no longer get out of going to my office, I'm involved in real estate dealings. Oh, you are that, Collins. <laughs> Guilty as charged. The voice... It was older, smoother, more cultured, but it was still basically the same. As he spoke, I could hear him say... Pick him up! Open the register! Was it possible? Of course not. How? And then I said to myself, Stefan, it's the voice. You know it's the voice. I peered at him. My eyesight was almost gone. If only I could see. If only... You're not very hungry this morning, Uncle. Oh, I... I'd like to say a penny for your thoughts, but in these inflationary times... <laughs> Tell me, what did you think of Mr. Collins? Um, as, as a client? I was thinking of him in another category. Definitely? Possibly. My dear, this Mr. Collins, does he seem familiar? In what way? Oh, in any way. Hmm, I don't think so. 
You don't feel perhaps that you might have met him somewhere, sometime? No. Does he seem familiar to you? I... I'm not sure. Why do you ask me that question? Does Mr. Collins seem familiar? Well, he, it was just an idle question. But you never, never ask an idle question. <laughs> I'm getting older. And wiser? No, unfortunately. Well, to lay that particular question to rest, I've never met Mr. Collins before. Uh, that should end it, then. I couldn't even imagine where or, or under what circumstances. <laughs> Good afternoon, Miss Rivers. How good of you to come. What reporter in her right mind would refuse an invitation from the celebrated Count Moreni? <laughs> you mean the uncle of the celebrated Countess Moreni. The tea tray is laid out, as you can see. <laughs> well, I wonder if you'd be good enough to pour. Of course. Cream, sugar, lemon. Well, just, just tea for me, thank you. And now, sir... May I ask why you have invited me here? I want information. We reverse roles. <laughs> I'm the one who usually makes that request. What do you know about a Mr. Harry Collins? May I ask why? Uh, let me say this. I if you keep this matter confidential... It's not my business to keep matters confidential. Quite the other way around. I will promise you, if anything comes of it that should be of interest to the media, I promise you will be given, what do you people call it, a, a scoop? <laughs> we say beat. Uh, <laughs> Why do you want this information? That must be part of our bargain. Agreed? I'll call you tomorrow. This is Count Stefan Moreni. Now, how may I help you? I'm afraid I can't be of much help to you. Oh, this is Miss Rivers. Well, then again, it all depends on the kind of help you need. Uh, concerning Mr. Collins. He was a very poor boy from the northeast side. Ah, the northeast side. Mm -hmm. The kind of kid who'd get himself into all kinds of scrapes. Ah, uh -huh. serious ones? He was suspected of a few burglaries here and there. Nothing that could be proved. Uh, has he no police record? No. Well, he met a girl, got married, got a job, went to night school. The girl evidently reformed him. She's his present wife. I uh, see. He went to work for a real estate firm. In ten years, he owned it. It's been growing ever since. And that is all we know about Mr. Collins? That is all we know. The conviction. It kept growing stronger. Harry Collins. This self-made millionaire. He was the killer. How could that be possible? But wasn't anything possible? Didn't scrawny Gertrude Schmidt become the radiant Countess Moreni? I was positive... But what could I do about it? How could I hope to prove it? What can he do? And how can he hope to prove it? And after so many years, isn't the trail ice cold? And after all, Elena was there too. If Harry Collins is our killer, why didn't she recognize his face or his voice? Well, that's why we have a third act. You can say what you like about facts and figures and statistical data. The truth seems to be, or at least experience tells us, that most of our great decisions are based on hunches. After all, the last time you fell in love, what did you go by? A rational analysis? Or what you are pleased to describe as the dictates of your heart? Another name for a hunch. What's true of love is also true of murder. Sometimes a hunch is your best line to a killer. Good morning, my dear. Ilona made the coffee this morning. Darling, someone has to, since you refuse. Well, the doctor says you're... N oh, 
What is the use? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's relax and enjoy it. <laughs> she makes it just the way you do. <laughs> you mean the way Papa did. How is your friend, Mr. Collins? You mean my client, Mr. Collins. Oh, we're still at that stage, hmm? Have some coffee. Yes, I will. Oh. What is it, my dear? I don't know. I... Is something wrong? Oh, Papa. What about Papa? I thought I'd blotted that picture from my mind forever. Oh? The terrible day, that... Terrible shock. No, 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 no. Don't think about it. Can't help it. But why? Why does it suddenly appear before you now? I don't know. Uh, possibly the coffee. Possibly the coffee. Combined with the mention of Harry Collins' name. Perhaps there was some kind of subconscious linkage. Oh, don't ask me what. I usually laugh at people who talk this way. But she would have to decide for herself if Harry Collins was the same who killed her father. She would have to recognize him. No one else could make that judgment. Of course, I could be of assistance. And so I summoned my housekeeper. Yes, Count. Uh, sit down, sit down, please, Ilona. Uh, tell me, do you remember many years ago Schmidt's delicatessen on the northeast side? How could I forget? <laughs> <laughs> what a delightful place it was. Mm. Do you remember all those delicious smells? Oh, Stefan, if you want to talk about the old times, please, I'm busy. Later. No, no, pay attention, woman. I have an important job for you. What were those smells? You are not serious. Answer the question. Mm, he always had coffee ready to serve. Ah, yes, yes. And why was it so distinctive? The little bit of chicory. Ah. What <laughs> were the other smells? Those delicious meats and sausages, eh? The salads? <laughs> You're making me hungry. And the doctor says I must diet. <laughs> you must duplicate those heavenly aromas now. In this room. I do not understand. The thing is crystal clear. I want this room to smell as if one had just entered Herr Schmidt's delicatessen. But can't. What is the problem? There was no problem. My Ilona was a servant of the old school. She fussed and complained. But there was a twinkle in her eye. And now to set the appointment. Elena, my dear. Yes, Uncle. I am quite taken with this Mr. Harry Collins. Oh? Do you suppose we could have Mr. Collins over for cocktails? When? Whenever it's convenient. Mm. This afternoon? Why not? Oh. Uncle Stephen, I don't know. There's something about him. Yes? It attracts me or... Frightens me. What does that mean? I have no idea. I'm I'm disturbed. Well, how? Are, are you in love with this man? Love? I don't know. I've never been in love, but I, I have this feeling. Yes. It's as if some force has been generated inside me. It's a force that's going to be released, whether I want it or not. Uncle, is that what love is? <laughs> It's love, or it's the other side of the coin, hate. Soon we shall know, soon she would know, she would find out for herself. And if he were not the killer, she would find out without even knowing what it was she'd found out. That afternoon, she arrived first. Huh. I'm early. Harry said he'd try to be here before six. Uncle Stefan. What is it, child? The room. Uh, what about it, dear? It's like... <sighs> it smells like Papa's store. That's right. <laughs> somewhat. No, no, no. More than somewhat. Well, I've asked Elona to prepare some food. Well, she must have outdone herself. I'm, I'm carried back to all those years to Papa's shop. Hmm. <sighs> The coffee with a pinch of chicory, the baked meats, the potato salad, the sauerkraut. Hello. I was able to get here early after all. No, no, no. Papa, Papa. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, catch her. She's going to faint. Here. Uh, put her on the couch. Oh, uh, what happened? Uh, should, should we call for a no, doctor? No, 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 no. She should she, she'll be all right. Well, shouldn't we do something? Ilona will take care of her, Mr. Collins. I wonder if you would be good enough to excuse us. Well, uh, sure. Funny. What's funny? I... I, I don't know. I, I have this feeling. Uh, yes? I, I don't know what it is. Uh, Can you describe it? Mm, no, I, I, I can't. Um, I, I think I'd better go. All right, Elena. Yes? No, 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 no. Don't try to get up. Lie quiet for a bit. He's the one... Harry is the one. Yes. And you knew it. Yes, my dear. Why didn't you tell me? What was there to tell? A suspicion? It could have clouded the rest of your life. You had to make the discovery for yourself. And I made it. Yes. Now what? Now, I'm going to kill him. Is it wise? Your own words. A Moreni cannot argue against revenge. When he has been injured, he does not run whining about it to the law. That was a philosophy for another place, another time. There's a practicality here. Think of what you have to lose. The world will discover that the Countess Moreni is really Gertrude Schmidt. Well, the world will survive that discovery. But will you? There's nothing shameful about being Gertrude Schmidt. But there's something awfully wasteful about spending the rest of your life in prison. I, I know that, but I have no choice. You don't? Uncle, are you saying that he's to get away with murder? He has to pay for it. Now, please, Uncle Stefan, I must get up. Where are you going, my going dear? Going to my room. I have a twenty-two caliber automatic. And then I shall visit Mr. Harry Collins. Alma, are you busy? I, I want to talk to you. I hope this won't take long, Harry. I'll have to go upstairs soon dress for dinner. You will, too. We're dining with the Alcott. Alma, please, listen. I... I want a divorce. Alma? No. I won't let you go. What good am I to you? I own you. And don't you ever forget it. If I should go to the police Alma, and... please, please, try to understand. I... I'm in love. Oh, of course you are, darling. You're in love with me. Can't you try to understand? I saved your life that night when the police came looking for you. And every day that I remain silent, I keep saving your life. Oh, the door. Do you suppose it's the police? Alma. There's no statute of limitations on murder, you know. Suppose they think they found a clue. <laughs> Oh, don't worry, darling. I'll swear again you were with me all night. Oh, no, Of please. course, that didn't do my reputation any good. Things were different in those days, but I didn't care. I loved you. I'd give up anything for you. Now, let me open the door. And don't you say a word. Why, Countess... What a delightful surprise. Good evening, Mrs. Collins. Uh, uh, won't you come in? May I fix you a drink? No, thank you. I can only stay a moment. Oh, that that's a pity. I just stopped by to shoot your husband. Oh, does he make you want to do that, too? There are times when I feel that Elena. I... Elena. Elena? Yes. Elena. I'm in love with her. She's the one, Alma. Oh, really? Oh, you have exquisite taste, Harry, darling. So, the two of you did not confine your discussions exclusively to interior decorating. Countess, do you have serious intentions concerning my husband? Yes, I have. Oh, then I'm sorry. He is a most attractive man. That is why I intend to hold on to him. I know you're a woman of the world. 
You'll get over him, and he'll get over you after a while, just as he's gotten over all the others. No, no, not this time. Harry will will not have a scene. Elena, she's asked you to decorate the house, show it for what it is, a place of hate and bitterness. Oh, do it in stone and bars because it's a prison. She is blackmailing me. I was a stupid kid. I got into trouble. I, I, I killed a man. I, I didn't mean to. It just happened. She, she gave me an alibi. I gave you more than an alibi. I made you go straight. I worked so you could go to night college and become somebody. Whatever you are today, you owe to me. All right, but how long do I have to keep paying you back? When are we going to be even? Never, Alma. I'm not asking for myself. It's also for you. Let go of me. It can't go on forever. Tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, I am going to kill you. Oh, myself. For both of us. We will always be together, Harry. Excuse me. I seem to have interrupted a family argument. I must be going. Oh, surely, Countess. You did have a reason for stopping by. Yes, I told you. I came here to shoot your husband. But I see now it won't be necessary. Things will take care of themselves. Elena, what are you saying? As a matter of fact, I brought this. Oh, it's a pistol. Well, of course. Why don't I just leave it here? I'm sure one of you will find a use for it sooner or later. You, you actually did come here to shoot me. Yes, but as it turns out, I don't have to. You are already dead. There is certainly a new style in things. We hear all kinds of sentiments concerning revenge, such as "living well is the best revenge," "success is the best revenge," "survival is the best revenge." Who knows? I can only say that if revenge is being put on a more positive and less violent basis, I am certainly in favor. I shall return shortly. An eye for an eye. It's so clearly stated in the book. And for years, we have tried to probe beyond its literal meaning to the spirit, and perhaps what was really meant in that ancient language was picked up later by a poet named Sir William Gilbert. Make sure the punishment fits the crime. And once we start to really analyze crimes and their punishments, we cannot help but find new insights into old problems. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Court Benson, E. V. Juster, and Russell Horton. This is E. G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I'd invite you to sit down, but at the moment we're in a laboratory. The laboratory of Dr. John Gilbert and Stephen Kaplan, two research scientists at State University. 
with nothing but sinks and test tubes and Bunsen burners, and only one chair at a desk where Dr. Gilbert is now sitting, alone, talking into a small tape recorder. I think, without disturbing him, we might just listen. Tape 26. 4 p.m. Friday, February 17. Tomorrow, we will make the supreme test. The serum I-23 has already been effective on mice and rabbits. Tomorrow, if it works on the human body, there's no end to the potential. I have no qualms at all. The serum won't kill me. At least, I don't think so. But we cannot know its true worth until we try it on a human. On me. Our mystery drama, I Thought I Saw a Shadow, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Nat Poland. tampers with the forces of nature, sometimes great things are revealed to him. Radio, for instance. Had it not been for man's curiosity, his probing and questioning, the miracle of broadcasting might still be undiscovered. And then, where would we be? That's just one of the thousands of ways that humans have put the laws of nature to productive use. But there are other laws and forces that are better left untouched, unexplored. For these laws are immutable, fixed, unchanging. And some of them, when disturbed, produce frightening and devastating results. Let's go to the laboratory of Dr. John Gilbert and his assistant, Dr. Stephen Kaplan, as they prepare to tamper with just such a law. Lab 2, Kaplan here. Yes, sir, right here. John, Colonel Morgan. Oh, thanks. Hello, Colonel. I was expecting your call. Yes, on Saturday. But I... I know we've discussed it, Colonel, and I have to be firm. No witnesses. I realize the government is funding the project, but until Dr. Kaplan and I are sure it's ready, we have to conduct our experiments in absolute secrecy. Thank you, Colonel. Yes, yes, certainly, as soon as we have the result. Goodbye. If this thing's supposed to be top secret, how does Colonel Morgan come off thinking he can bring in a party of bird watchers? Well, he has to act important. He wants to be sure he gets whatever credit is coming. And I should be used to that. You mean Dr. Ferguson? She could have shared that award with me for the work we did on blood plasma. It was mostly my work. She could have given me some recognition, even though I was only her student. Well, forget her. I'm still worried about going ahead. I don't think we've run enough tests on the animals. I think it's too soon to be squirting the stuff in your arm. I know, Steve. But how much further can we go with the animals? We can't get a subjective reaction. We know the primary function of the serum works, but we don't know how they feel, how they move under the influence. I know you're right. And I know we're going through with it on Saturday. And I know I'm supposed to be a level-headed scientist. And I know I'm damn scared. I'll get it. Lab two, Gilbert. Hello, John. I- I'm not interrupting. Margot. Oh, I'm sorry to bother you at the lab, but I never get an answer to the apartment. I know, I know. I'm not there much anymore. You were never there much any time. Oh, but that's past, John. I, uh, I wonder if I could see you. Of course, Margot. This project's taking all your time. You name it. Well, I could, uh, meet you tonight. Do you want to come to the apartment? No, I'd rather you came here. Want to make a dinner? That'd be nice. How about seven? All right, I'll be there. Goodbye, John. See you later, Margot. No comment. She's still my wife, Steve. In name only. I hate to see your concentration broken by another meeting. Particularly now. Two days before... I'm not a teenager, Steve. I can control my emotions. John, does Margot know about our work? No, no. I've kept it top secret even from her. Which wasn't difficult since we see each other so seldom now. Are you going to tell her? Why should I? I don't know, really, but... 
If something goes wrong... What would telling her in advance accomplish? I think, as your wife, she ought to know there's a chance she may never see you again. More coffee, John? No, no, thanks, Margo. I'd rather get down to some serious talk. Okay. Well, we've been through the wine, the candlelight mistake... Now we've got to face the facts. The fact being? I want a divorce. I was afraid of that. John, don't make it any more difficult for me. We've been separated for almost a year. I want to be free. Do you? Really? No, yes. A few months ago, I might have had doubts. But now I know I want to marry Bill Watkins. I want to be free to marry him. Well, I can't blame you. I'm not going to drag up the old neglected wife routine. You'll always be a deep part of me. But I want more out of life than the shadow of a man. Well, I, I can't argue the point. But you'll always be a deep part of me. You know, working in the lab those, those many nights, those lonely nights for you, for me, you were always there. I love you. Even though you were home and I was working, we were there together. I may have been there for you, but for me, it was lonely. Is lonely. Well, I'll... I'll do whatever you want, Margot. Thank you. No, damn it, I don't mean that. I don't want Bill Watkins to have you. John! Give me one more chance. Let, let, let me finish this project I'm on now. It'll only be a few weeks, and I'll, I'll take a sabbatical. We'll travel. We'll be together every minute. And then I'll settle for a teaching position in California. A nice, quiet, steady life. In other words, your career is the price you'll pay for me. Yes, if I have to. And you'll hate me for it. No, John. I want it my way. Well, it doesn't have to be settled tonight. Things can change. Maybe you will be free. What do you mean by that? Well, Steve thought I ought to tell you. It's supposed to be top secret, but as my wife... What is it, John? The project, the government project. Well, I know that. It, I know it's taken every minute for two years. But you've never known what it was. No. No, I could have put up a fight against another woman easier than that secret project. Well, Steve thought... I ought to confide in you as my wife because as he put it you may never see me again what? you've got to swear to secrecy Margot no one on earth except Steve and a handful of government officials know about this all right I, I swear Steve and I have developed a serum a serum that's injected into the body and renders the body totally invisible Invisible? It changes the molecular structure of the body. It works on the nucleus of the body's atoms. We've proved it with the lab animals. Invisible? But why? Margot, its use in the military is beyond imagination. For spies, troops, invisibility could turn the outcome of battles. And it works. On lab animals, it works. Oh, that, that's fantastic. And on Saturday, we're... Trying it on me. On you? John, you mean you're... You're going to become in invisible? Well, that's the hope and the plan. The effect only lasts for an hour or so. But we can't be sure of it until we try it on a human. On the rats in the lab, it lasted one hour. Then, gradually, they reappeared. No worse for the experience. Then it's not dangerous? Not to the animals. But we've got to try it on a human to really find out. To get the subjective reactions. I mean, will I see myself? Or will I look down and see nothing but space? How will I move? My body will still be there. I won't be able to walk through things like a ghost, or will I? These are the questions we have to answer with a human subject. You. Me. You'll... You'll come out of it all right. We hope and expect so. The effect has to wear off. And if it doesn't? You'll never see me again. Oh. 
You seem to be making light of it. I have confidence in the serum. I admit I'm a trifle nervous about the sensations, the unknown. But to a scientist, the thrill of the unknown is the whole reason for being. Oh, how well I know. But it's not dangerous. If it were, those rats and rabbits would have been dead. Or worse. But you'll have to take a, a much larger dose than you gave the animals, won't you? Well, naturally. You see, being a scientist's wife, something did rub off. And what that larger dose may, may do... Is something we have to find out on Saturday. Ready, John? Yes. Now, you're sure? You... I'm sure, Steve. We've worked for two years for this minute. All right. Oh, damn it. Let it ring. I, I can't. Lab two. Steve, can I talk to John? Oh, it's Margot. All right. Margot? Oh, John, I had to call. Are, are you all right? We haven't started. You called at a very awkward time. Oh, I'm sorry, but I simply can't stop thinking. I understand. But you'll have to let me call you later. If you're able to. I will, I will. Please, Margot, I can't talk now. Oh, all right. Call me later. Go ahead. Okay. It's a large dose. At least 30 seconds to empty the syringe. Uh, feel anything? Not yet. I'm going to slow down on the pressure a second. Why? Let your body absorb what it's got already. I don't feel a thing. Maybe I'm not supposed to. You don't look any different either. It's too early to tell. Maybe the dose we planned isn't big enough. Stop the tape recorder. I have now absorbed 200 cc of the serum I-23. The 23rd formula which Dr. Kaplan and I feel to be the effective limit for invisibility. I have no sensation... 20 seconds have passed since the beginning of the injection. In our experiments with mice, invisibility began within the first 10 seconds and was complete by 30. Taking into account the difference in size and body tissue, I should begin to disappear within two minutes and complete invisibility should be affected in five. 40 seconds have passed. The syringe is empty. Feel any different? Our proportions couldn't have been that much off. It's not likely. But everything's still an X factor. The dosage must have been too small. We don't know that yet. All right, all right. We'll wait 15 minutes. Uh, failure number one. I don't understand it. I'm too tired and discouraged to rethink it now. It just doesn't work on human tissue. Larger dosage won't work either. If it's going to be practical for military use, the dose has to be small. A capsule a guy can pop in his mouth. A spy can't wait around for two or three injections to work. I know, I know. We'll go back to the formula Monday. I'm going to forget it for 48 hours. What time is it? Mm, 4.10. All right, I'm going out and have the biggest martini I can find. How about you? <laughs> I'll take two. You know, the nitrogen element may be too low. I don't think so. The balance was 80-20 nitrogen over phosphate. More likely it... John. Hmm? Stop a second. What's the matter? Well, look. On the pavement ahead of us. What? The sun's behind us. Look at my shadow. Uh, so? In front of you, there is no shadow. You're right. Your body isn't casting any shadow at all. No shadow. A curious condition for Dr. John Gilbert. For anyone, for that matter. After all, one's shadow is a very personal thing. It's yours alone. And to be without one, well, it's unnerving, to say the least. Thank goodness I still have mine. I can see it right here on the studio floor. So don't go away, please. Me and my shadow, if not Dr. Gilbert's, will be back shortly with Act Two.
without a shadow. Something strange happened to the body of Dr. John Gilbert when he tried to make himself invisible by injecting a serum into his veins. But something stranger still is in store for Dr. Gilbert. For Margot, in fact for the entire city where Dr. Gilbert lives and works, let's return to State University. No shadow. Something's happened, Steve. The serum had some effect. It's working. Maybe this is one of the first signs. Come on, back to the lab. I want to make some tests and go over our notes. Now, move the light closer. Closer. That's it. Now circle me. Move back. Raise the light a little. Still nothing. Not a sign of a shadow. It's been 55 minutes since the injection. This is as far as the serum will go, apparently. What do you mean by that? The only way I can figure it. My body has lost some of its density. It won't obstruct light. That's why there's no shadow. Yes. Yes, the molecular structure must have dispersed just so far. Uh -huh. It's obvious, then, that a massive dose is the only thing that will bring on complete invisibility. Oh, no more, John. Not now. No, no, no. I didn't mean that. I'm not ready for more. But I'm going over the formula till I find it. The one equation that will push us over the line. We're so close. Oh, boy. Well, uh, why don't you take off? I have nothing on for the night. I'll work with you. I'd rather do it alone, Steve. John, do you think it's wise to be alone? We don't know what reaction might be next. The phone's right here. Now, if anything happens, you'll be the first to know. You're not hiding it very well, Margot. I know, Bill. I'm sorry to spoil our supper. Margot, I love you. We're going to be married. Your problem is my problem. Not exactly. It's John. I'm worried about him. Is he giving you a hard time about the divorce? No. But he, he was going to call me today. I was expecting to hear from him before you picked me up. What's he calling you about? I, uh... I, I can't tell you. You still seem awfully interested in John. I am interested in his work. It's important. I thought his work was the whole problem between you two. It was, but... Well... Then why all this sudden interest? The concern? Oh, Bill, you have a way of twisting things, I say. Margot, level with me. I can't tell you any more than I have. Only that I may never see John again. <laughs> that would be fine with me. Oh, stop it, Bill, please. If you knew my reasons, you'd understand. But I, I, I can't tell you. I feel no physical sensation at all. No dizziness, no apparent lessening of muscle tone or tissue structure, no loss of weight. <laughs> Just loss of shadow. Oh. This will be the last entry for this date. Saturday, February 18. I will resume tomorrow when... Steve? Steve, is that you? Steve? Who's there? I could swear someone came into the lab. New item. It's 10.05 p.m. I have a distinct feeling someone has entered the lab. There was no sound, just this feeling. I will continue taping in case this may prove helpful if anything happens. I know I am not alone. Who's there? Answer me! I... I can... I can see... a shadow. I know someone's there. Shadow is moving from the outer hall. In a second, I'll know who it is. There's nothing but a shadow. A man's shadow moving into the lab. It glides across the floor now, not toward me, toward the wall. Within all reason, this can't be. But it is happening. Now it moves along the wall. It stops, it hangs there, on the wall, waiting. The shadow of a man. Now I know. 
I know with all certainty that that shadow on the wall is mine. How still it hangs there, waiting for the last of the serum to wear off. Not now. It moves again. Moves with a will of its own. Slowly across the wall, toward the window. There, it pauses by the window. And now, it disappears into the night. This is Dr. Ferguson, Judith Ferguson. Yes, doctor. I'd like to have the 1969 AMA report on cholesterol sent to my office right away. I'm sorry, Dr. Ferguson. The archives are closed. They're never closed to me, young man. I'll expect that report within the half hour. But, doctor, the files are locked for the night. I have no authority. Then who has? Only Mrs. Abrams, the director. Then get her at home and get me that... Just a minute. Who's out there? Dr. Ferguson? I've got to go. Someone just came into my outer office. Uh, get that report and get it now. Who's there? Funny. Thought I saw a shadow. Huh? It is a shadow. What? Who's there? Answer me. Just a shadow. It, it can't be. Oh. Oh, get away. Please. John? What? Oh. Oh, Steve. You've been here all night. What time is it? 9 a.m. Oh. John, are you all right? Yes, yes. Yes, I think so. I can't seem to remember. I even... Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Steve, something's happened. It sure has. Dr. Judith Ferguson was found dead in her office last night. Dr. Ferguson? It's on all the newscasts. Some clerk from the archives took a report to her office, said Ferguson insisted on having it last night, and he found her. Murder? They don't say. How awful. Mm. We'll hear all the lurid details soon enough. I'm more concerned about you. Any side effects through the night? No, no, it's funny. You know, I can't seem to remember anything after you left me. I think I started to dictate, and the... I just don't remember. My mind's a blank. Why can't I remember? Another effect of the serum, perhaps. Maybe, maybe. Well, maybe the tape will tell us. I'll rewind, and then we'll find out what happened to me. Huh. That's strange. There should have been more than that. We'll play it. There are no physical sensations at all. No dizziness. No apparent lessening of muscle tone or tissue structure. <laughs> Just loss of shadow. Oh. This will be the last entry for this date. February 18th. I will resume tomorrow when... Well? There's more. There's got to be more. Well, that's all there is. You fell asleep. No, no, there's something... An impression, something more happened. But why isn't it on the tape? <laughs> you fell asleep. Why can't I remember? Why? Oh. Uh, lab 2. Kaplan here. May I speak to Dr. Gilbert, please? Who is calling? Lieutenant Healy, 4th Precinct. Oh. The police, John. Police? Why? Hello? Dr. Gilbert. I'm Lieutenant Healy, 4th Precinct. I wonder if I could talk with you this morning. What's wrong? Margo? Oh, it's about a Dr. Judith Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson? Oh, yes. My associate just told me. Uh, we're asking everyone who knew her to help if they can. I understand you're acquainted with her. Yes, yes. Some time ago, I was a student in one of her classes. In about an hour, all right? At your lab. Yes, I'll be here. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. What's up? He wants to talk to me about Judith. 
They're asking everyone who knew her. Well, you haven't seen her in how long? Well, I see her in the hospital now and then, but our work together was over two years ago. Oh, relax, John. You haven't got anything to worry about. You know Dr. Ferguson how long? Well, Lieutenant, we were actually associated for only a year. I was a graduate student in one of her classes. That was two years ago. We wouldn't single you out like this, Dr. Gilbert, but we're told you and Dr. Ferguson were involved in a successful medical project, one that Dr. Ferguson received an award for. Yes, on blood plasma. We'll have to work in that closely with Dr. Ferguson. Can you remember any incident, any friend of hers, anything that might give us a clue to who'd want to kill her? Well, then... You do suspect murder. Uh, this was no accident. How was she killed, Lieutenant? Nothing's been said. We were keeping that quiet. She was suffocated. Apparently, a clerk from the hospital archives department took a report to her office. She didn't answer his knock, so he got the custodian to open the door. They found her. The office was locked from the inside? Uh, windows, too. Well, then if it was murder, how did the killer get out? That's just one of the problems we've got with this case. Oh? There were no marks on the body. But the room was a shambles. She fought with someone. But we figure whoever tore that room apart has some marks on him. That's why we're talking to anyone we can find who knows her. Something will give the killer away. Well, thanks for your time, Doctor. I'll be in touch if we need any more from you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, Lieutenant. There was a time, I suppose... And I could easily have killed Judith Ferguson myself. My work, her acclaim. But I certainly wouldn't dream of it now. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. It's getting late. I'm so mixed up. These two days have been... <gasps> Wait, what's the matter? Someone's come into the lab. I didn't hear anyone. No sound, no. But someone's here. <gasps> now I remember. Last night, I remember... I was alone. I thought it was you. What are you talking about, John? It's back. It's here in the lab, just like last night. John, stop this. There. There. There it is. Good Lord. What? Shh. It's my shadow. My shadow. Alive. And with a will of its own. You saw this last night? Yes. Now watch. It moves along the wall. So slowly. I'm seeing this. I couldn't believe it either, Steve. There it goes. Look. Along the wall. The drapes. Now, out the window. Just like last night. It's gone. Just like last night. It vanished at the window. And then, Doc, Dr. Ferguson. Ferguson? You don't think it was responsible for... It seems to have a will of its own. Steve... Where is it going now? You've heard it said that some people are afraid of their own shadow. Well, it seems that Dr. Gilbert's shadow is something to be afraid of. It has already disposed of one of Dr. Gilbert's dark subconscious resentments. And there's not the shadow of a doubt there'll be more sinister happenings when I return shortly with Act Three. A shadow is on the loose. A shadow with a will of its own, now drifting, gliding. And where, indeed, is it going next? What or whom is it after? Both John Gilbert and Steve Kaplan saw it pass through their lab. There's no doubt that Dr. Gilbert's shadow has an existence of its own. And Gilbert seems to think he knows what it's been up to. John, are you suggesting that this... this thing killed Judith Ferguson? I'm quite certain it did. That's impossible. The policeman said Judith died of suffocation. No marks on her body. A locked room. Does that sound like an ordinary murder? No, but why Dr. Ferguson? I don't know. Perhaps because I wished her dead at one time. I think we should notify this Lieutenant Healy. And tell him what? 
that we think a shadow is out killing people, your shadow, he'll lock us up. Oh, I know. It does sound like nonsense. If this thing is a part of you that disengaged itself when you took the serum... It should return to normal when the serum wears off. Steve, it has worn off. I took that injection more than 24 hours ago. But that that thing still exists. I'm still not sure I buy it, John. We don't know how long the serum might stay in your body. We found no trace of it in the mice after four hours. True, but their shadows didn't go wandering around well, either. Perhaps mice don't have resentful souls. Now, oh, you've really sold yourself on the idea that some astral part of you killed Judith Ferguson. When the serum changed my molecular structure, who knows what it released? I am changed permanently. The serum wore off long ago. And that thing out there continues to exist. Lab 2, Dr. Kaplan. Oh, Steve, Margot, is John there? No, he went home around 4 o'clock. Oh, I can reach John at the apartment then. Yes. How is he, Steve? I mean, really, after the experiment. Tired. Very tired. We both are. But there were no serious effects. Oh, I'm glad of that. How did the news of Dr. Ferguson affect him? He was shocked. The police were here this morning. The police? Why? Well, they're questioning everyone who knew her. But why John? They certainly don't suspect him. Of course not. It's routine. Well, I'd better call him. Thanks, Steve. Bye, Margot. Oh, that must be Bill. Uh, coming! Uh, come in, Bill. Feeling better today, darling? You were pretty upset last night. Ah, yes. I, I'm sorry I spoiled our dinner. Margot, we've got some things to talk about that can't wait. I know. John. No, not John. You're the one who's making my life complicated, not John. Do you want me or don't you? Of course, Bill. But why do you insist I cut off every mention of John? I won't share you. Oh, Bill, that's kid stuff. It's not kid stuff. And it's not only this weekend... I felt it for weeks. I am trying desperately to control myself. I've had a nerve-wracking weekend, and you won't let up on me. Then tell me what's so special about Dr. Gilbert this week. Bill, let go of my arm. Tell me. He's doing an experiment. So? Well, he's, he's trying to... To what? Bill. Bill, there's someone in the bedroom. What? I just saw a shadow pass the bedroom door. But how could anyone get in through the... What is it? A shadow. Moving along the wall. The shadow of a man. I see it. But, but, but how? This doesn't make any sense. Oh. There's no one here. Just a shadow. Oh, Bill, I'm frightened. It stopped. Now it's sliding down the wall. Coming along the floor. Coming towards us. Oh, oh Bill, it's covering you. I can't breathe. I, I, I don't know what to do. We haven't been able to get a word out of her, Dr. Gilbert. She's in deep shock. Then you don't know what happened in Margot's apartment. I'm hoping you'll be telling me. This smacks of more than coincidence, Dr. Gilbert. Two people whose lives touched yours. Dead within 24 hours of each other. And killed the same way. Are you ready to believe me? Ready? My shadow killed them both. I don't know who will be next. Now look, Dr. Gilbert, if you're going to make light of this, I'll make damn sure you're sorry. Oh, I'm not making light of anything. My shadow is loose. With a will of its own. Now you may be an eminent scientist, Look at the but... floor, Lieutenant. Look! There's your shadow. Where's mine? Oh. Well, oh, okay, I've, I've read enough science fiction to believe it. But don't ask me to be putting out an all-points bulletin on your shadow. Shadows don't kill people, Doctor. People do. Is, is, is that you, Bill? Margot, it's John. John. Oh, Bill's dead. Relax, Margot, don't try to talk. Oh, it was so horrible. The shadow on the wall. It came at us. It moved along the floor. And then Bill... Charles... Shh, shh, shh. Mrs. Gilbert. You saw this shadow. 
Only a shadow. There wasn't anybody there. Nothing but a shadow. A, a shadow. Well, I'll be outside. I've got to make a phone call. John, how is Margot? She's out of shock. They have her sedated. Uh, this Bill Watkins was victim number two. There's no doubt. She saw the shadow. It enveloped him and slowly suffocated him. What does Lieutenant Healy say? I told him the whole story. He had a hard time accepting it until Margot confirmed the shadow. Dr. Gilbert! Dr. Kaplan! Oh, we've got real trouble. What's the matter, Lieutenant? Two more deaths. Exactly like Ferguson and Watkins. Who? Uh, a reporter from uh, from the Herald, Jim O'Hara. I, I never heard of him. Well, how about a Helen Morris, a bridal consultant at Long's Fashion Center? No, I don't know her either. Oh, you're, you're positive there's no connection? None at all. Well, that means the thing is hitting at random. Oh, Lord, what have I done? Well, look, is there any clue, Dr. Gilbert, anything that might help? There hasn't been time to study it. It only started yesterday and... Wait a minute. There is something. The shadow always returned to the laboratory. I saw it first before Dr. Ferguson did. And then we both saw it there this morning. Before it went after Bill Watkins. Then your lab is the most likely place to look for it. I don't know. I don't know what it will do. Still, I'm responsible. How can we stop it if it does show up? Well, we'll worry about that later. If this leaks to the press, we'll have a panic. <laughs> That's right, Captain. Dr. Gilbert thinks it will come back here to his lab. No, well, uh, I don't know. Wait a minute. The captain thinks he ought to send a, a cordon surround the lab. You wanted to keep this quiet. No cordon's going to catch a shadow. <laughs> Hello, Captain. The doctors think it'll attract too much attention. I agree. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll wait. And keep your line open. <laughs> an hour. Nine o'clock. I wonder if we're driving it off waiting like this, Lieutenant. I think it'd be better if I were alone. No way. I'm going to be staying. Dr. Gilbert has a point, Lieutenant. Well, there's nothing any of us can do if, if, if it does appear. You can't shoot it, catch it. Why don't you leave me alone and see what happens? Well, maybe you know more about this then than I do. I'll go along. I'll be right downstairs, though. I'll wait with the Lieutenant, John. Maybe this is between you and whatever it is, your shadow. Yes. Yes, I think it is. I don't like leaving him alone. Neither do I, Lieutenant. But I don't know what else to do. If the shadow comes back, maybe he can deal with it. And it may not come back. It may keep on killing. Who knows what it's going to do? Who ever heard of anything like this before? I can't believe I'm staking out a shadow. We can wait in here, faculty lounge. Well, I only wish I knew what we were waiting for. Tape 12. Sunday, February 19, 9.30 p.m. There have been no further effects on my body... Nothing more to indicate the cause of this strange transformation that's taken place with the loss of my shadow and the subsequent power of that being. Will it return to me? I know now what I have to do, what I must do. There it is. Slipping in at the window. I knew you'd be back. There's only one way you can be stopped. When I die... You'll have to return to me. Locked to me as you were all through my life. My shadow. No longer with a will of your own. It's my own life that gives life to you. Almost 9.30. I think we ought to go back up. At least I can see if he's okay. Maybe you're right. Come on. Yeah, no, I got my doubts about anything happening like this. That's John. I'm getting me gun ready. He may still be alive. John. Oh, let me get to the phone. Police emergency. Get me. Uh, he's dead. 
Never mind. The gun's still in his hand. He never fired a shot. And there's not a mark on him. The thing. Just like the others. We'll never know. Oh, John. What are you doing, Doctor? Uh, what I should have done long ago. Destroying the formula and everything about this fiendish project. The chemicals, the notebooks, even the tapes. I don't want to know anymore. I hated this thing from the start. I got to call headquarters. That, that thing may still be on the loose. No. No, it isn't, Lieutenant. Look on the floor. Oh. Yes, I see. Yeah. The shadow of a man slumped over in his chair. Do you have any doubt it's Gilbert's shadow? As still as he is. What did kill Dr. Gilbert? His shadow? His subconscious? Dr. Gilbert went too far over the border of man's understanding. He delved too deeply in secrets that should remain untouched. For in all of heaven, earth, and even hell, there are some things that are better left untampered with. And this was one of them. I'll be back shortly. Stand up and take a good look at your shadow. Is it following your every move? Is it really the shadow you're casting or, look closely now, do you detect a little deviation, a little rebellion, a hint that perhaps your shadow might like to do its own thing? you'd better turn off the lights. That's the surest way I know of getting rid of shadows, wanted or otherwise. Our cast included Nat Poland, Joan Shea, Gordon Gould, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I'm E.G. Marshall, keeper of the establishment where we offer you a full line of spine-tingling items, the shivery best in murder, suspense, terror. And right now, you can sample our latest offering, which has to do with a return from, well, uh, let us say, a return from the beyond. They say that successful people are those who refuse to take no for an answer. They cannot be swayed by reason. They cannot be convinced by the facts. They cannot be moved by logic. They simply will not listen to anyone who says no. Not even to the angel of death himself. Our mystery drama, 
Is the Lady Dead? was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes and Joan Loring. absolutely no scientific proof, but it does seem to me that, in a general way, a great many people have names that appear to harmonize with their personalities. Do we, therefore, unconsciously strive to maintain the image that our names evoke? I presented this thought merely to introduce you to a gentleman named Barney Kruger. I'm sure Barney Kruger creates an image in your mind. And I'm willing to wager it's a picture of a down-to-earth, practical, two-fisted guy. And you're absolutely right. Barney Kruger is 32 years old and a self-made millionaire. He made his money by sharp, shrewd thinking. By taking nothing for granted. By digging, probing, investigating. Well, I don't give a rap about the report, Carlson. I want to verify those assets. I want to check bank statements. Investigate every officer of that corporation and start with the day he was born. Now, you know how we do things around here. Get on a plane for Chicago, Carlson, and start digging. <sighs> I want to get something done around here. You've got to do it yourself. There's no other way. Uh, Mr. Your... Kruger. Oh, yes, Winters. Your mother's here. My, my mother. Oh. Oh, yes, my mother. Well... I guess, uh, I guess the time has come. Show her in. Yes, sir. Thank you, Winters. Hi, I'm Mom. Hello. Get your drink? No, thank you. Well, this is a happy surprise. Surprise? Well, I thought you'd be in Europe at least another week, and someone you just called me just before. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I did come back ahead of schedule, didn't I? Barney? Yes, Mom? Well, something seems, uh, different. Different? What do you mean different? Oh, I don't know. The apartment just seems different. Uh, did you have anything done? There's, there's a definite air of difference about the place. Oh, good or bad? Well, I, I'm not sure, but I, I, I rather like it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I like it. Now tell me, dear, how was Europe? Oh, you know, Europe. Oh, honestly, Barney, I'm sure you've lost count of the number of times you've been to Europe in the past ten years. Oh, no, 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 I haven't, Mom. I've gone exactly 85 times. You can check my secretary. She has all her records. Well, what's the difference? All you know about Europe covers some airports, hotels, restaurants, some offices, a few mines, a few mills. Mom. You never get to do anything in Europe. I mean, you don't get to do anything... European. Oh, now, look, next time, try something different. Mom, I did do something different this uh-huh. time. Don't tell me. I'll bet you bought a department store instead of a steel factory. Well, not exactly. Now, it doesn't... I got married. Married? Yes, that's right. Oh, well, congratulations, dear. Now, now, where is she? Well, she's right here, Mom. Well, well can I see her? Well, of course you can see her. It's just that I wanted to break the news to you. Oh, myself. Barney, I'm so happy. I, <laughs> I can't believe it. Well, I, I can hardly believe it myself. Well, now, how long have you known her? Uh, let's see. What's the day? Uh, Thursday, huh? Uh, well, it's exactly a week. A week? Yes, and what a week, Mother. And who is she? Rachel. Rachel? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, that's a, that's a lovely name. Uh, Rachel who? Ra- Rachel, uh... Uh, I don't know. Uh, you don't know her last name. Well, I do, I do, I did. But I, but I don't seem to remember, Mother. Well, what's the difference? She's Rachel. She's Rachel Kruger now. Well, how did you meet her? Well, it's, it's like a dream, Mom. It's just like a dream. Yeah, I know, but you had to meet somewhere. Yes, well, I ran her down. You what? Well, you know, Mother, in England, they drive on the wrong side of the road. Uh, You mean you drove on the wrong side of the road? Well, I don't have any trouble with it while I'm driving straight ahead, Mother. It's when you come to a turn and you have a tendency to swing over to the right. And so we had a little collision. Barney! Yeah, well, well, no one was hurt or even scratched, Mother. But that was how we met. And so I, um, I took her to a garage to get her car fixed and then to dinner while we were waiting. And, uh, it just happened, Mother. We just fell in love. You don't believe it. Oh, I believe it, Barney. Yes, we we both knew it. 
And there just didn't seem to be any question about our getting married. I, I would have asked you to fly over, Mother, but time suddenly seemed so precious. We, we didn't have a minute to waste. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how happy we are. Oh, no, don't even try. It's, it's, uh, just, uh... Just what? Well, it's just, this is so unlike you. The fact is, you don't even know this girl. Well, I do know her, But you don't know her parents, her background. You don't know anything about her. I know everything. Well, for instance, where was she going when your two cars collided? Uh, I never asked her. Uh-huh. That's what I mean. Well, I know everything I want to know. I, it's certainly not the way you do business. This isn't business, Mom. This is love. I never thought I'd hear you talk like that. Well, the same rules don't apply in love. All, all you've got to go on is your heart. And if you can't trust that, well, you're in trouble, I guess. Well, Barty, look, I am all for it, and I'm all for Rachel. And when can I finally see her? Right now, Mother. You're having dinner with us. <laughs> I want to know everything about you, Rachel. Oh, it isn't possible to know everything about anyone, even oneself. Are you English? No. Oh, uh, well, where were you raised? It was a very unhappy time. I, I never think about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Are your parents alive? I have none. Oh. Well, what happened? Uh, they were killed. Was uh, was it an ac accident? Uh, no. Oh, please forgive me. I'm not trying to pry. I'm I'm just curious, and it's a natural curiosity. Of course. Oh, what a perfectly magnificent ring. Oh, I had to buy it in a hurry. Mother. I think it's much too large. Angel, that is a diamond. I wear it because it makes Barney happy. Well, I don't think I have ever seen him so happy in his life. It's so easy to make Barney happy. A pity he had to wait so long. Well, my dear, I think you're worth the wait. Now, time I was homeward bound. Oh, well, Mother, must you go? It's so early. Oh, but when you're a guest of a newlywed couple, that's when your welcome wears out. Early. <laughs> Rachel, dear... I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Call me mother. Mother. Listen, why don't you two girls get together, go shopping, have lunch and things? Oh, don't worry, Barney. We'll arrange for all that. I'll call you tomorrow, Rachel. Goodbye, mother. Well, I'll see you to the door, mother. Well, Mom, what do you think? Oh, Barney, Barney. She is just wonderful. <laughs> Yes. Aren't you asleep? I, uh... What is it, honey? It's nothing. Oh, no, 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 it is something. Oh, Barney. I didn't know people could be so happy. <laughs> There's nothing to it. Just fall in love. Barney, now that I know what love is, I want to live. Rachel, what do you say? I want to live. Of course you're going to live. I mean, why shouldn't you? You're so strong. You're so sure of yourself. You fear nothing and no one. Oh, darling, don't let anything happen to me. What do you say? Just hold me. Hold me as if it's the very last time. Darling, what are you saying? Life is so beautiful. I just want to live. Well, you will. You will. Believe me. Yes, my darling. I believe you. Rachel. Hmm. Won't you tell me what you're talking about? Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I'm i just frightened. Of what? Of what? When you want something so badly, you become scared. But you don't have to be scared of anything. I never really wanted to live until I met you. But why? How could anybody not want to live? Oh, there are times when... Life can be a terrible thing, and death oh, no, is only... Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to have any more of that kind of talk. Promise. Yes. Oh, Barney. I promise. Barney! What a surprise. Hello, Mother. Uh, 
would you like? Something to eat or drink? No, no, I didn't come here for that. Well, of course not, but every mother has to ask that question. It's part of the franchise. Mom, I'm worried. Why? Well, it has to do with, uh... Rachel. How did you know? I'm worried, too. Oh, why are you worried? It's something in her eyes. What? I don't know. Yes, I see something in her eyes, too, Mother. Something... Something that scares me, and I don't know what it is, either. I think it's a look of fear. Well, what can she be afraid of? We don't know. Actually, we don't know anything about Rachel. We love her, but we know nothing about her. Mom, Rachel is afraid of dying. Is she ill? Oh, the best doctors in the country can find nothing wrong with her. But I think I know what it is. What are you saying, Barney? You've heard of people who died of grief. Of course. Well, why can't people also die of happiness? Barney. Mom, Rachel is dying. Something's killing her. Barney, don't say that. Mom. Uh, I'd better answer that. Hello? Mother. Oh, Rachel, dear. What? How are you? Mother, is Barney there? Uh, Yes. Yes, dear. I'll, I'll put him on. Barney. Yes, thank you. Rachel. Barney, please. Come home quickly. Quickly! Barney. Darling, why didn't you call the doctor? Because... Well, I'll phone him this minute. No, no, please. Just hold me. But, Rachel... Don't leave me. Don't leave me for anything. Rachel, you need to be... No, I have everything I need. Everything I want. Right here. Right now. Oh, darling. I want to live so badly. Well, you will. Don't let me go. Don't let me go there, Barney. To that place. Please. Please, Rachel, don't talk like that. If I let go, bring me back. Oh, Rachel. You're so strong, you can do anything. You can do anything. Rachel. Promise you'll bring me back. Uh, Rachel. Promise. Well, I, I, I... You're different from other people. Barney, you're wonderful. I know, I know there are things you can do. Oh, Barney, promise. Why? Well, I promise. And I'll help. I'll try as hard as I can to help. And the two of we, two together, we, we can do it. We can bring me back. Back. Rachel. Rachel. Mother is here, sir. Tell her I'll see you later. Uh, Dr. Mallory. Send Dr. Mallory away. He offered to make the arrangements, sir. Arrangements? For the funeral. I'll make the arrangements myself. That's all, Winters. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Winters. Yes, sir. What are we having for dinner? Oh, I, I, I didn't think. I can prepare some sandwiches, sir. Oh, no, no, no. Mrs. Kruger doesn't like sandwiches. Do we have any lamb chops? Yes, sir. Well, I'll have mine rare, as usual, and Mrs. Kruger likes hers medium. Oh, no, sir. Your mother likes hers well done. I'm not talking about my mother. I'm talking about my wife. Your wife? As you know, Winters, there's an exact science to making chops medium. She likes them exactly between rare and well done. But Mrs. Kruger is, uh... Yes, Winters? Mrs. Kruger is what? Uh, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. There may be an exact science to broiling lamb chops, but you must admit there's a fine art to being a rich man's butler. And so Winters departs to instruct the cook to prepare a very special dinner. A dinner for two people, one of whom is alive, the other dead. And we'll be back after dessert when I return with Act Two. Death is always the final answer. And death always has the last word. 
but not for Barney Kruger. Rachel is dead. There is absolutely no question about that. But evidently, Barney Kruger will not accept it. Before you dismiss Barney Kruger as a psychotic or a kook, remember, this is the same Barney Kruger whose reputation for hard-headed practicality is respected throughout the business community. Mrs. Kruger. Yes, Winters. Is my son... I don't know what to say, Mrs. Kruger. He, uh... He ordered dinner for himself and for, uh... For, for who? Uh, uh, for her. What are you saying, Winters? Mrs. Kruger, I, I'm very much aware of what I'm saying. But surely he knows. Yes, ma'am, he knows. But still, he ordered... I see. Oh, I... I'm not sure of what to do. I was wondering if you had a suggestion. Yes, Winters. Serve the dinner. Barney? Come in, Mother. Sit down. Uh, have you... had anything to eat? Oh, yes, yes. All right. Everything's fine. Well, Winters... Uh, Winters told me... Do you want to look at Rachel, Mother? She's even more beautiful than... than uh... Yes, Barney. Now, we have to make certain arrangements. You know that, don't you? You know, she came into my life so suddenly, Mother. And so suddenly she left it. Barney... I can't believe that. I won't believe it. Barney... The ring... No, no, I won't believe it. You, you really don't intend to bury her with the ring. Bury her? Well, yes, Barney. We have to make arrangements. We no, we, we won't do any such thing. We'll bury her ourselves. Barney. No one must ever touch her mother except the people who love her. Will you help me? Well, I... Just the two of us. We'll see Rachel to her grave. Uh, 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 Barney, now you really shouldn't bury her with a ring. Why not? Because the ring is worth a... That diamond is worth oh, a... Yes, I know. Rachel said it herself, it's worth the Queen's ransom. Well, it may sound rather hard and unfeeling, but what can that ring mean to her now? Oh, everything, Mother. But I don't think... It means... It means that I believe she's still my wife. Yes, of course And she... it means I haven't given up hope. Hope? Of what? Well, so long as she wears that ring, I could... We, we can... Can what... We can bring her back. Bring her back? Yes, Mother, bring her back. Barney, the age of miracles is past. Oh, no, no, it hasn't. It's still here. Barney. You want to see a miracle? You want to see one? Come Barney. Here. No, 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 Mom, I mean that. Come here. Where, where? Just look. Look in that mirror. Well, why do you want me to look in the mirror? So you can see a miracle. But, uh, I don't You, think... you are the miracle, Mother. Why are you... What, what did it say about you in the Sunday paper, Mom? Uh, I, I don't remember. Well, I remember. I memorized it. I was so proud of it. Mrs. Elwood Kruger, the acknowledged social leader of the city, stunningly attractive, impeccably groomed, was hostess at the reception for the senator. Barney, darling, look, I, I don't... You don't want, Mother. You don't remember. You don't remember how it was when I was a little kid. You don't remember that my father was a hopeless drunk. Look, Barney... And how you washed dishes in an all-night hash joint so you could support the three of us? And when he died in a charity ward, you were thankful because it meant one less mouth to feed. Barney, why I you... looked at you, Ma, every day. You were ready to drop dead from exhaustion. And I said, I'm going to make a great lady out of my mother. And when I was five years old, I started selling papers. Barney, this is not what we're... It is, it is, Mom. It is what we're talking about. Who were you, Ma? What were you? You were just a poor girl with no education, no training... Look at what I made possible. I realize, Barney, I Just know. Just look in the mirror. Look at you now. Stunning, socially prominent Mrs. Elwood Kruger. You eat lunch with senators. You've had dinner at the White House. Now look in the mirror and tell me what you see. A miracle. Winters. Yes, sir? It's very cold in here. But, Mr. Kruger, the thermostat is way up. Well, Mrs. Kruger is feeling chilled. Mrs. Kruger? Yes, and, uh, bring her some of that brandy I brought back from Paris. Eh, uh, sir, may, may I say something? What? 
I, I, well, there's no other way to say it than to say it. Sir, uh, Mrs. Kruger isn't here. I'm aware of that, Winters. You buried... Uh, her funeral was this afternoon. Yes. Then... Then you have to admit... What? What do I have to admit? You have to admit... You have to admit she's dead. Yes, yes, Winters. She's dead. For now. For now? Yes. For now. What is... Huh? I'd like to ask you something. Yes, sir. I uh, need a man to work for me without asking a lot of questions who believes in what I tell him. A man who's with me. You follow this? Yes, sir. Till now, that man has been you, Winters. Yes, sir. So, my question. Is that man still you? Yes, sir. That man is still me. Well, you have to believe with me, Winters. Understand? I, I, I think so, sir. Fine. Bring Mrs. Kruger her brandy. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, will Mrs. Kruger want anything else? I don't think so. Yes, sir. Thanks again. Oh, Rachel. Rachel, I want to help you. I'm trying. I'm trying as hard as I can. Rachel. Rachel. much concern, Mr. Kruger. Uh, Mr. Kruger? Hmm? Oh. Uh, about what, Carlson? Well, the amount of our investment. We're dipping very deeply into reserve capital. Well, that's what reserve capital's for, isn't it? That's why we're getting on a plane for, sh for Chicago to see, see if we... Uh... Yes, yes, go on. But we're going to Chicago shh, to see if... Shh, shh. Don't talk. No. I guess I'm hearing things. Well, now I have all the information you need about Henley. Henley? What What do you mean, Henley? How did you know about Henley? How do I know? And Mr. Kruger. That's why we're going to Chicago to acquire Jason Henley and company. Oh, oh yes, Henley. That, that... Rachel? 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 Where are you? Uh, Mr. Kruger, who are you looking I'll, for? I'll, I'll, I'll see you later. But but our plane leaves for Chicago. She, and she was just here. She, now, she can't have gone far. But Mr. Kruger, we have to get on that plane. You get on the plane. You go. But you're the one that has to examine the assets. Well, you do it, Carlson. But you have to make a decision by tonight. You make the decision. You go there and you make it. Mr. Kruger, Mr. Kruger, where are you going? <laughs> Mr. Kruger, what happened? You, you look exhausted. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I guess I am. What is? I thought I, I heard the, heard, uh, I, I saw, I saw. I, I ran. What is? I ran. I ran around for hours, trying, trying, just trying. I know why. It, it, it's because, it's because this would have been our anniversary, our first anniversary. Yes, sir. I know that, sir. I took the liberty of opening this bottle of champagne. And, uh, I brought two glasses. Oh, thank you, Willis. Thank you. Good night, sir. Yes. I thought I... thought I did it, Rachel. I thought I did it today. I thought I brought you back. I thought I heard you. But I'll keep trying. I'll, I'll keep trying. I'll never stop trying, Rachel. Oh, Rachel... Rachel, I can see us so clearly that day, that crazy day I ran into you, and you were so frightened at first, you were so scared, it was, it was all I could do to get you to tell me your name, and I, I kept asking, what's your name, what's your name, and you just kept staring at me, and your eyes were so big, and finally you said, my name is Rachel. Rachel. That's a very pretty name. What's yours? Barney. Barney. I like the sound of that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about the car. Oh, I don't mind. I never liked this car anyhow. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Rachel. I'll have it fixed. No, 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 no. I won't have it fixed. I'll buy you a new one. Oh, are you that rich? Oh, I'm fabulously wealthy. 
but, but don't hold it against me. Uh, do you know you really... You really are a very nice person. How can you tell? I learned how to recognize good people. It was very important for me to know that at one time. Rachel, do you want to hear something crazy? <laughs> Nothing is really crazy when you think about it for a while. No, no, no. This is the wildest thing you'll ever hear. What is it? Here I am, an American, driving through a place called Henley just outside of London. I hit a car some girl is driving, and we stopped to talk. And ten minutes later, I find out I'm in love with this girl. All I know about her is her name. Her name, Rachel. Now, go ahead. Tell me I'm not crazy. Hmm. Perhaps we're both crazy. All I know about you is your name, Barney. And I love you. Rachel. Rachel, you're here. I'm here. It's, it's you. It's really you. It's not my imagination. Put your arms around me, darling. And, and the ring, your wedding ring. You're wearing the ring. Oh. You, you couldn't be wearing the ring if it weren't really you, Rachel. Oh, Barney, you did it. You brought me back. Yes, 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 you're back. You're back. That's all I have to know. You're back. <laughs> It all shows what can happen when you're in the habit of saying no. But is she back? Is it possible? You remember the story of Orpheus? He went to the land of the dead to reclaim his lost bride. He almost succeeded, too. However, there was a little detail he forgot about. I won't forget to return shortly with Act Three. It's part of the culture of our country. We raise the kids on slogans like, never say die, don't give up the ship. And when threatened with annihilation by a numerically superior enemy, didn't an American general earn immortality by simply answering nuts? Barney Kruger took it all seriously. He believed he could attain any goal he set out to reach. He's even brought his wife back from the dead. Barney, I knew you would do it for me. I knew you would do it. Oh, Rachel, I can hardly believe it. Everything in the room, it's exactly the same. Exactly. Yes, yes, I didn't touch anything. Nobody touched anything. Everything is here, you see? Just as I left. Yes, your clothes, all your things. E e even the book you were reading, darling. Oh. Look, look, it's still open at the same page. That's why I could come back, Barney, because... Everything that's me is here. Oh, you were never gone, Rachel. Never. Keep me here, Barney. Keep me here. Yes, I will. I will. I, I just wish I knew how. But you know how. You know. Hey, excuse me, sir. I, uh, I, I thought... I thought I heard you talking Winters. here. Winter, Winters, look. It's huh? Mrs. Kruger. See, dear, it's Winters. You always liked Winters. Is, isn't that just great, Winters? She's back. Oh, uh, uh-oh. Yes, sir. Barney. Mom. Well, what's the sensational surprise? I hope you're hungry. Oh, of course I am. Am I late for lunch? Oh, you'll remember this lunch as long as you live. Well, uh, I see the table set for three. Who is your guest? Oh, no, no guest, Mom. It's all family. Family? Mom, I have a problem. Oh, are you asking me to help? Yes, yes. Well? Well, I, uh, I didn't realize how complicated a thing like this would be. You see, after all, legally, she is dead, and, uh... And what? And there was a death certificate, a, a burial, and, uh... Well, how can I account for the fact... Barney, what are you trying to say? Mom, how, how, how do I, uh... Re reintroduce her in, into the world? Barney... Are you all right? Mom, Mom, she's back. Who? Who do you think, Rachel? Barney. I, I did it, Mom, I did it. I made the miracle. I made it happen. No, Barney. Wait, wait. 
Just wait. You'll see. You'll see. You'll see with your own eyes. Now, wait. Now, Barney, please. Wait, 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 Mom. Wait. Rachel? Rachel, Mother's here. It's time for lunch. Well, Mother? Mom, come on now. I know it's a shock, but here she is. Here? Who is? Rachel. Well, can't you say anything? Barney. You mean you can just stand there and not do anything, Mother? Barney, I, I don't know what Well, a, to... a, a normal person would, would, would put her arms around... Barney. Please, Mother. You, you, you claim you don't see oh, Rachel? Oh, Barney, my son. Now, just a minute. Win winners. Winners, come in here. Uh, Barney, let me call. Wait, Mother. Winners. Uh, yes, sir. Winners, how many people are here in this room? How many, uh, how many people, sir? Yes, you heard me. There's you, my mother, myself, and... And? And my wife. Ah. Yes, sir. Yes, Winters. sir. Winters. That'll be all, Winters. Yes, sir. Well... That man worships you, Barney. He'd lay down his life for you. He'd swear on well, the Bible. What do you say now? Huh? I say that Winters is wrong to help you perpetuate this... This fantasy. Oh, is that what it is? Barney, please let me call... A, do a doctor, huh? Naturally. But what else? You say you don't see Rachel. Rachel huh? is... I didn't ask you that. I asked you if you see Rachel. No, Barney, I don't see Rachel. I believe you. Well, then... You don't, you don't see any woman as a part of my life, oh, mother. Oh, Barney. You know, it's a funny thing, Ma, now that I look back on it. You never really wanted me to get married. No, oh, sure, sure, you always said so. And you encouraged me to meet this one or that one or the other one. But that was just a paint on the top, Mom. Somehow or other, you'd always top me off at the last minute. Now, Barney, why would because I... Because you wanted me all for yourself. <gasps> Barney! Papa's been dead 25 years. You never went out with another guy once. Oh, why? Barney, I... Even today, hundreds of men, guys who are really up there, too, they all go for you, Mother. How come you never even look at anybody? Barney, this is not the time. You wanted me all to yourself, and you still want it that way. That's why you don't see Rachel. But she is not Rachel! He... Rachel, say hello to Mother. Hello, Mother. She's not here, huh? Who just spoke? Who's standing right next to me? Barney, what do you want me to say? It isn't as if you were a little boy, and we can play little games together. I'm not, I'm not your little boy anymore, Mother. I'm, and I'm on my own. And, and there's another woman in my life. Barney, please. I want you to face reality. Mom, she's not throwing you out. She's not taking your place. She's what... She's what another part of me needs. Now, please, Mom. Just take her in your arms, huh? And tell her she's welcome. She's your daughter. <laughs> What do you want, Carlson? This is the first time you've been to the office in weeks. Is that so? I've had to make a lot of judgments. Well, that's what you get paid for. But if I'm wrong, we, we, we can go broke. Oh, come on. Now, lay everything on the table and I'll straighten it out. Well, the Midwest merger. Well, I, the Midwest merger? Well, I'll tell you what I've decided. I've been juggling all the facts. And now that I think about it... Yes? Now that I, now that I think about it... Uh, just a minute. Now, the option expires this afternoon. We really have to move quickly. Yes, just, just a minute, please. Darling. Hello. I miss you, Barney. Yes, I miss you, too. I need you to keep me here. Don't stay away from me, Barney. No, I won't. I need all of your faith, all of your strength. All of your will. Darling, you've got it. I need you to hold me, Barney. Hold me. Yes, yes, yes. Hurry back to me, darling. Hurry. Before I slip away again. No, no, no. Don't do that. I'll be right there. Hurry, Barney. Hurry. I'll see you, Carlson. Where are you going? I have an important date. Mr. Kruger, we are going broke. Can't you understand? I need half a million dollars to cover an option this afternoon. We don't have... Well, don't bother me with details. And unless you raise another 500000 by Wednesday morning... All right, we'll... all right, I'll raise it. But I Is don't there anything see where else? you can raise... Just leave it to me. Oh. Please. I'm going home, and I don't want anybody to disturb me. Barney. Hmm. Do 
you ever get tired of me? Oh. After the life you led before? Oh, what kind of life did I lead before? Well, you went everywhere. Well, we go everywhere, the two of us. Even if we never leave the house, we sit here together and... Oh, uh, Barney, I hope I'm enough for you. No, 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 no. We don't need that kind of talk. Because I'll have to be enough for you. I'll need you with me all the time. <laughs> Tell my son I wish to see him, Winters. I am sorry, ma'am, but he refuses to see anyone. Now, don't you take that tone with me. I'm his mother. I, I said I was sorry, ma'am. Uh, I'll have to ask you to leave. You will have to throw me out. Winters, what's... Oh. That'll be all, Winters. Yes, Barney, I must talk to you. What's there to talk about? Mother? Barney, this newspaper. Read it. I don't care about anything. Just read it. Incredible collapse of the Kruger Enterprises. The disappearance of Barney Kruger from the command post is the possible cause You of see, that. you're broke. You don't have money to throw around anymore. You know, if you had that ring right now... Now, Mother, I don't want to hear anymore. If you had that ring, you could hold off some creditors, buy some time... Will you let me alone? The world won't let you alone. Now, you won't be able to keep this house... Mother, I don't want to you hear anymore. Don't you say that you don't care. This is a conceit of yours. But it takes money to maintain now, Mother, it. Mother, I think you've said enough. Now, do you want to say hello to Rachel before you leave? Barney, there is no Rachel. You and I saw her placed in her grave. Rachel is dead. No! Rachel's right oh, here. Oh, Barney. Please, let it be over. Whatever it is or was that raged through you like a fever, let it be over. Come back into the world. Come back where you belong. Well, I belong with Rachel. Goodbye, Mother. Oh, you're... You're like your father. He was a man who was intoxicated by liquor and it destroyed him. And you're... You're intoxicated by Rachel. Mother. By a dead Rachel. And she will destroy you, too. I won't hear any more. Barney, hold me. I can't be broke. I can't be. Hold me, Barney. You're not crazy. I must be going crazy. Hold me, Barney. Kiss me. What? Hold you? Hold me. But Rachel... But what, Barney? Hold me. I need all of you to hold me. Put your arms around me. But, but Rachel, you're... you're, you're uh... I'm what, Barney? You're dead. What did you say? You're, you're, you're dead. Oh, yes. Now I'm dead. But if you're dead, why, why do I see you so clearly? Because all of your strength hasn't left me yet. It's going, and soon I won't. Rachel. Rachel, are you here? No, Barney, you couldn't keep me here. You weren't strong enough. You don't want me badly enough. Ra Rachel, you're becoming dim, Rachel. I'm no longer your wife. Here, your ring. No. Take your ring. No, 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 no. I don't want that. I don't want it. You didn't believe the miracle. Rachel, don't go. I, I Don't go. I believe, Rachel. I do believe. Goodbye, Barney. Goodbye. R Rachel? R Rachel? Barney. Your mother, she was here. She was here. She's been here Barney, in this room Barney, all the time. Barney, sit down. Huh? Now, have Winters get you something. No, she was here, mother. You know. Barney. You know she was here. It's time that we face certain facts. Now, you know that Rachel has... Barney, look, look, what, what's that lying on the floor? Well, it... Mother, Mother, it's the rain. And there it was, gleaming on the floor. A huge diamond ring, the gift of Barney to Rachel, the ring 
that was buried with her when she died. And you can believe that she returned to the grave and left the ring to release him from their marriage vow. You can believe that. But if you are one of those practical two plus two must equal four people, we have another alternative. I'll be back shortly. Did Rachel come back from the dead and leave the ring? An explanation that might satisfy some of the more literal-minded among us is that realizing how strapped he was becoming financially, Barney may have paid a visit to the grave and removed it himself. After all, it was his ring. It goes to prove that we have a denouement to satisfy every taste. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Joan Loring, Ann Petoniak, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS News is next on KIXI AM and FM in Seattle. The time, 11 p.m. CBS News, 13 people have been indicted in an alleged $130 million oil stock fraud. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles says among those indicted was Robert Trippett, president and board chairman of the Homestake Production Company. The Attorney's Office says over a nine-year period, there was a domino effect in which prominent businessmen and people in show business were drawn into the scheme. Homestake Production was billed as an oil exploration and drilling firm, but the government charges no drilling or exploration took place. Among those supposedly swindled were such celebrities as Jack Benny, Walter Matthau, Andy Williams, and Phyllis Diller. Also listed as investors in the company were Walter Riston, chairman of the First National City Bank of New York, and Russell McFall, chairman and president of Western Union. The Securities and Exchange Commission has charged a California-based silver and coin dealer with selling nearly $1 billion in non-existent silver in what appears to be the biggest fraud of its kind in U.S. history. The SEC named the Pacific Coast Coin Exchange, also known as Monex International Limited. More news in a moment. Some cattle growers on Thursday drove a herd of range cattle to the doorstep of Agriculture Secretary Earl Butts in Washington. The cattlemen said they wanted to challenge Butts to raise the cattle to market and ensure a profit. The men say that's impossible for them to do under present economic conditions, especially high feed prices. There are predictions that cattle prices will be on the upswing before long. Ike Pappas reports from Sioux City, Iowa. Agriculture experts say farmers may be enduring depressed cattle prices now, but it's all part of the natural price cycle in the beef industry. They point to two years ago when cattle prices were high in favor of the farmer. Agriculture Secretary Butts says the cycle will start up again and farmers will get higher prices for their live cattle, but that won't be for a year or so. Meanwhile, Butts says the government can do little to help increase the price. Farmers apparently are seeking their own solutions. They are at the moment selling off large numbers of cows and calves for slaughter and feeding 25% fewer cattle in an effort to cut down the expected record supply of beef, hoping to get a higher price sooner than Butts predicts. Industry leaders say beef prices, now down from near-record highs earlier this year, should start up again by mid-1975. 
The Agriculture Department confirms beef prices will move higher next year, but it is not predicting how high. Mike Pappas, CBS News, Sioux City, Iowa. In Boston, the NAACP has gone to court requesting National Guardsmen and more state police be sent to South Boston schools where there was more violence Wednesday in the high school. Boston NAACP President Thomas Atkins told what the action is intended to accomplish. Because black and white students have inside the schools had weapons, and because white students and occasionally black students have engaged in sloganeering and mouthing of racial epithets, we will be asking the court to order the school department to promulgate regulations banning racial epithets, sloganeering, or the weapons being brought into the school. A hearing on the NAAC motion will take place in Boston Friday morning. In Atlanta Thursday night, Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter announced he'll be a candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1976. Now this. There will be a partial eclipse of the sun Friday morning visible in the United States. The eclipse will be most extensive in the east and least extensive on the west coast. It will occur at 9.25 in the morning eastern time, but weather forecasters say an expected cloud cover may obscure the phenomenon. This is Doug Poling, CBS News. This is your friendly music station, KIXI, dial 91 AM, Seattle. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. O oh, memory, thou dear deceiver, thou precious liar, without thee, how could one ever bear the past? Poetry aside, isn't it memory that gets us off the hook? After all, we don't lie. It's our memory that takes certain liberties with the truth. Who among us is brave enough to want to remember the past exactly the way it happened? Our mystery drama, Killer's Appointment, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Marion Seldes. It is said, gives a woman full stature. And if that's true, some women must be ten feet tall. They are the women for whom love is all. Love is enough. Love is both the meaning and the purpose of existence. How marvelous to be able to love like that. How wonderful and how terrible. Twenty years ago, 19-year-old Lydia Prentice was sitting in her mother's kitchen. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Lydia, you have been late for work. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. It isn't as if Herb is making enough to support and the two God of you. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Uh, there's no point in talking to you. I'm sorry, Mama. What were you saying? Honestly, Lydia, you can be so provoking sometimes. Now, a body is trying to talk sense to you, and you sit there mumbling that silly poetry. It isn't silly poetry, Mama. It's a prayer, and I say it every morning. A prayer? Yes, Mama. I say it because that's just the way I feel about Herbert. As if the poet who wrote it was looking into my own heart and my soul. Oh, my little girl that never grew up. I am grown up, Mama. I'm 19, and I'm going to be married tomorrow. But you live in a, a fantasy world. <laughs> Honestly, Mama, I don't know what you're talking about. Of course you don't. <laughs> but I know. I know in my heart that 
I haven't prepared you for marriage. You haven't been like a lot of mothers in this town. You did tell me the facts of life. Oh, those aren't the facts of life, honey. That only has to do with nature and such, but there are real facts of life. Like what? Oh, like... Like money. Oh, I don't care about money, and neither does Herbert. Oh, well, that's only true at 19. You'll be 30, 40, 50, and maybe then you won't care about anything else. Oh, darling, life is more than poetry, more than beautiful flowers. Life is pain and disappointment. The world is a cruel place. It's not my world. My world will be Herbert and me. And our children, and our folks, and our friends. Oh, Mama, it will be glorious. You'll see. Oh, I... I hope so. Herb and I are satisfied with just each other. And books, and music. Are you sure Herbert will be satisfied with that? Mama, Herbert chose me. He could have had Carol and Jordan. Now, darling, you don't know that for a fact. Oh, the whole town knows it. She had a cap set for him. Not just her cap... That mansion on the hill, that sports car. All right, all right. Maybe you're right. I am right. That's why I say my prayer to love every morning. And that's why I'm so thankful. I know it doesn't happen to everyone. Not every girl gets a man like her. I guess not. Oh, now, who do you suppose this can be? Hello? Is that you, Jenny? Yes. I didn't recognize your voice. This is Tom Garrity. Oh, good morning, Tom. Is that the sheriff? Is, uh, is uh, Lydia still there? What's he calling us for? Uh, do you want to talk to her? Yeah. Uh, no. No. Uh, uh, Jenny. What does he want? Uh, what is it, Tom? I guess it's better if you tell her. Tell her what? Herb. Herb Larson. Yes? Well, we're holding him here. Uh, where? In the jail. What for? Robbery. Assault. Oh, you, you... You can't be serious. Mama, what is it? I'm afraid it's very serious. He stole $50,000. Almost killed old Jerry Koopman. Oh, but, but... Herb could never do a thing like that. What? What could Herb never do? Well, seeing as how he and Lydia were scheduled to get married tomorrow, I... Uh, I think she ought to know about it. Don't you? Um, yes. Goodbye, Jenny. You, uh, you better tell her. Yes, I'll, I'll tell her. Tell me what, Mama? Tell me what? No, Sheriff. No. Sorry, Lydia. Who else but Herb would have known there was that much money in the safe last night? Please, Sheriff. Herb's the only one who knew the combination of the safe. Herb didn't do it. I know he didn't. Herb spends a lot of time there nights going over the books. So he knew that at 10 o'clock regular, Jerry Koopman, the night watchman, has himself a sandwich in the utility room. But you can't prove that. So Herb was able to sneak up behind him, hit Jerry on the head, and make it look like a professional job. Sheriff, it's just a mistake. I know, Herb. It's a mistake. It's a mistake, all right. Evidently, Herb didn't know that the money had all been registered. Every one of them bills is recorded. That money is going to be too hot to spend. Oh, Sheriff, Herb is innocent. I tell you, Herb is innocent. Well, I didn't expect you to say anything else. But just between you and me and off the record, you've got to get him to confess. Confess to a crime he didn't commit? If he confesses and tells us where he hid the money, we could maybe be talking in terms of three to five, five to seven. Three to five, five to seven what? Years, years in jail. Seven years in jail? What are you getting so excited about? I don't want to hear another word. Do I have the right to see him? Why, Herb? Why? Oh, my poor darling. What are they trying to do? What? It doesn't matter. It's what it will do to you. Well, we'll fight it. It isn't any use. Everyone is convinced I'm guilty. Well, I don't care about everyone. I believe in truth and I believe in justice. Oh, Lydia. It happened to us now, the, the day before we'll we... We'll be married. I promise you. It's no use, Lydia. You'll not go to jail. I don't care how many voices are raised against you. One voice will be raised for you. And that's the only voice that counts. The voice of God. Oh, Lydia, don't. Don't what? Don't believe it? Well, I do believe it. God 
isn't just something to talk about. He is here. He is with us all the time. Let's pray to him. He'll not let an innocent man go to jail. Lydia. He will not let an innocent man be branded a common criminal. Listen. Just don't say anything for a minute and just listen. I... I'm not an innocent man. <sighs> Last night I... I stayed late at the plant. I know, darling. You've... Please don't say anything. Please. It was ten o'clock. I closed the ledger. I walked out of my office past the utility room. The door was open. He, he was sitting at the table, old Jerry, his back toward me, eating a sandwich. <laughs> that Polish sausage, that kielbasa, smelled so good. I... I, uh... Herb. I said to him, how, uh, how about giving me a hunk of that? But he kept on eating. He didn't even turn around to see. And I remembered how deaf he was. It was walking stick, you know, that heavy one. It was lying on the floor be behind his chair. I pick picked it up and I'm, I, I brought it down on his head. And he just slipped out of his chair on the floor, you see. And then I walked down to the hall into Mr. Jordan's office and I... I opened the safe. You didn't. You didn't. And I took out the $50,000. dollars say anymore. I have to save the rest. I... I hid the money in... You know the old elm tree near the lane to the lake where... <laughs> where, where we carved our initials? Why? Why? I don't know. Well, there must be a reason. I don't know. So... Something made me do it. Some, something deep down inside me. Something I never dreamed existed. No, Herb. What you're telling me now, it can't be true. You don't want it to be true, Lydia. I don't want it to be true either, but I did it. Without thinking, I knew I was going to do it. And I didn't try to stop myself. It, it was as if I was standing outside my own body watching a, a stranger commit that... Crime, and I didn't try to stop him either. Herb, you're not well. This monstrous accusation has made you ill. Why? Why don't I stop lying to you and lying to myself? I wanted to do it for a long time. Don't say that. Maybe I'm... Maybe I'm just sick of just being a, a bookkeeper, a nobody. You're not a nobody. Something I... I wanted money. I wanted it so bad... I I was willing to risk anything. Everything. And I did. Oh, Herb. It was a it was a fit of madness, I guess. Now it's gone. I I, I see now what I've just thrown away. I've destroyed my whole life. For what? Something I don't want. I I don't want that money. I I want us to be married. I I want to have a job, a home. Children, that, that's all I want. What did I do? Herb, listen to what? me. Listen. You'll have those things. You and I. We'll have them together. Oh, please, Lydia. You're the most wonderful woman in the whole world, but it's over. I, I'm guilty. No, you're not. If you think about it carefully, you're not guilty. I'm the one that almost killed Jerry Cooper. No, you're not the one. I opened the safe. I stole the money. No, you didn't. Someone else did. Some, someone, someone else. Who? Who? Me. Lydia, our shy, ethereal Lydia, our young, idealistic Lydia. She hit old Jerry Coopin over the head. She stole the money from the safe. How? It's true that still waters run deep. However, this seems to be a stream that has no bottom. But it does have a second act. And I'll bring it here in just a few moments.
Things are not always what they seem. Dross may be passed off as purest gold. Indeed, it frequently is. The sweet may be only a thin patina that is laid over the bitter. Indeed, sometimes, misfortune even turns out to be a blessing in disguise. How do you figure Lydia Prentice? You? <laughs> How can you say you robbed the safe? Because I did it. Oh, Lydia, please don't. Don't you fail me. You're all I have left. Don't, don't let this destroy you. You must listen. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not when you say you bludgeoned old Jerry and you robbed the safe because... Because... Because why? Because, I'm not crazy. I did it. Herb, I'll confess. I'll go to jail. What have I done to you? You must not be convicted. There's no way you can prevent that. I'm showing you a way. I don't understand. I will confess. But you didn't Herb, do it. I did it. You're crazy. Look, can we consider the facts? You're convicted. You go to jail. Three years, five years, whatever. You're branded... You're a criminal, and it follows you for the rest of your life. Lydia, you mustn't interrupt me. And you have a skill. It concerns figures. The handling of money. It's what you do best. It's the career you want. Lydia, what are you saying? Just a few more words, and I'm finished. You come out of jail, and they'll say that you've paid your debt to society. But we know that isn't true. Who will ever give you a job handling money again? No one. Please don't say any more. You'll still be in your 20s. And your life, your active, productive business life will be over. But this way... Which way? The sensible way... I go to jail. It doesn't matter to me. All I want to do is be your wife. I, I can't let you take the blame for what I did. I want to. I'm your Lydia. Your Lydia. You and I are in love. We're like one. And if you did this thing, then I did it too. I won't even talk about it. You say you don't know what came over you. Why you did it. Herb, you did it for me. You wanted to make our life together easier. Now, which one of us should take the blame? Which one can afford it? I can. A few years in jail won't ruin my life. Lydia... Oh, Herb, don't be foolish. You're... You're serious. You... You mean it. But, Lydia... Oh, let me do it. I... I thought I knew about love. But I stand here looking at your face. The light shining in your eyes. Two years, three years. They'll go by before we know it. And we'll be together again. You'll still have a good job, an opportunity for a career. And everyone will soon forget about me. No, I... I... I, I can't. I can't let you do it. Well, that means you don't love me. How can you say that? Love is more than giving. It's also taking. And if you don't take this from me, it means you just don't love me enough. Lydia, don't I say don't... any more, please. We have to do it this way. There's no choice. What kind of a fool did you take me for? I'm guilty, Sheriff. What are you trying to do? Oh, poor Herb. He wanted to take the blame, but I just can't let him. In the first place, only Herb knew the money was in the safe. I knew. He told me. Only Herb would know the combination. I knew. Herb told now, me. Why would he tell you a thing like that? He's in love with me. I could make him tell me anything. Oh, it took a while to worm all the information out of him. But I learned everything I had to about old Jerry and his late night lunch hour. And sure enough, Jerry was busy eating and I hit him over the head. You hit him over the head, huh? Yes. Tell me, Lydia, what did you hit him with? His own walking stick. That heavy wooden cane that he carries. It was lying on the floor behind him and I picked it up and... Oh... Really paying attention to me now, aren't you, Sheriff? Oh, Lydia, I, I... I can't believe it. The walking stick? You found blood on it. Well, how would I know that that walking stick was there if, if I hadn't used it? Uh, Lydia, I know you since you was a little baby. I... I just won't believe you would commit... And if I wasn't the one, Sheriff, how would I know where the money is? Oh. 
Oh, Lydia, I, I shouldn't have let you d do it. It had to be this way, Herb. Look, I'll, I'll go to the judge. I'll, I'll confess everything. Shh, shh, don't talk so loud. But, Lydia... Don't weaken now. Three years without They'll you. They'll go by. There'll be no living for me. Until we're together again. Write to me, Herb. Keep writing to me. I promise every day. And, and I'll see you again next week. Is it an hours are over? So soon. So soon. Oh, Herb, darling. All right, keep apart. You know you ain't supposed to touch. <gasps> Say goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Lydia. Goodbye. Goodbye, Herb. Now, through there, mister. Change your pass to the guard at the door. Yes, ma'am. Goodbye, Herb. Goodbye. Okay, sister. You could have let us kiss goodbye. You know the rules. I know all the other guards will break some. Oh, look, I'm doing you a favor. Why don't you forget him? He's a punk. You you may be a prison guard and I be less than dirt under your feet, but don't you dare say... Oh, you. shut up, will you? You took the rap for him, didn't you? I hear what's going on. You couldn't prove it. Why would I want to? But he's a punk. For letting you do it. We love each other. Ah, oh, ditch that guy. He's bad news. Do it before he gives you the gate. What do you want? You didn't give me my mail today. How could I give you your mail when you didn't get me? That's impossible. I get a letter from... From him every day. Yeah? Ah, well, maybe he's got writer's cramp. Now what do you want? You know what day this is? I got a calendar. It's Sunday. You know what time it is? It's half past one. Well, it's visiting hours. I know it's visiting hours. Well, aren't you going to take me down to... What for? You don't have a visitor. Well, of course I have a visitor. My, my fiancé. He comes to see me every Sunday. Yeah. Well, maybe he found himself a girlfriend. Oh, don't say that. Why not? You're no use to him. Please. Please. Oh, something... Something may be... Something's wrong. You can say that again. I mean, maybe... Yes, that's it. Maybe he's sick. Oh, poor Herb. There'd be no one to look after him. Ain't that a shame. Please. Please don't make fun of me. I don't know what I'm going to do. Hey. Hey, you okay? Let me alone. Please. You got a visitor. What? I said you got a visitor. Oh, oh, you see, I told you he didn't forget me. Oh, he loves me. He's here. Listen to me. He loves me. Why didn't you tell me he was here? I don't even need makeup on. I have some lipstick. Where's oh, for crying out loud. I didn't say he was here. It's your old lady. I didn't know what to do. Someone had to tell you. Yes, Mama. I, I know he promised to wait for you, but well, you, you really couldn't expect him to. No. Uh, darling, please, he... Well, he, he's been going with her for almost a year. Ever since you... Ever since... Has he? She's rich. Her father owns the plant. It's it's a golden opportunity. It would seem to be. But what did you expect? You you did something crazy. I see that now. It was crazy. How could you do it? I'm sorry, Mama. I, oh, well, do, do, do you need anything? No, Mama. Well, I, I, I'll try to get up here again. Real soon. Thank you, Mama. Through that door, hand your pass to the guard, please. Good, good, goodbye, Lydia. I'm sorry. I'm going to kill him. Yeah, I guess you would if you could get to him tonight. But you're lucky. You still got two years to go. You'll, you'll cool off. I'm going to kill him. It ain't worth it. You knock him off, it's a minimum of at least 10, 15 more years here. It ain't worth it. It is to me. I'm going to kill him. Uh, what's the matter? I... I... 
I don't feel well. Yeah, but where? It's my head, and I want to see a doctor. Oh, okay, okay. Out of bed. Look, I'll, I'll take you to the dispensary. No, I, wait. I can't seem to walk. Could you hold out your hand for me? To... Oh, all right. Hey! Hello, Herbert. Lydia. Uh, you surprised to see me? Well, yeah. You're supposed to be in, in uh, jail. Yes. Well, that was my mistake. You are supposed to be in jail. What are you talking about? Oh, I understand. Now, we're at that point. What am I talking about? You've rewritten some history, haven't you? But yeah, fate does crazy things. We can't predict our actions. Yes, we can. I can predict mine. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill you. What? But you that gun. This gun, a very cheap, badly made. Lydia, you, you can't kill me. You, you love me. I did love you, Herb. How I loved you. No one will ever love anyone the way I loved you. And perhaps no one should. Love can be too strong, too terrible, too all-consuming. I... I can't help it, Lydia. I just fell out of love with you, that's all. That's all? I'm telling you the truth. Bye, Herbert. Hold on, Herbert. Hold on! Oh. Oh. Let go of that gun, Lydia. Let no, go. I'm going to kill him. Lydia, let go of that gun. I missed him. My first shot missed him. I'm going to kill him. Oh, no, Lydia, no. Now, you're going to stay in the cell and behave, or do I have to put the handcuffs on you? Why didn't you let me kill him, Sheriff? Why? Just be thankful I stopped you. The thing they called me from the penitentiary. They figured you'd be headed this way. I'm going to kill him, Sheriff. Lydia, you talk like that and you'll never get out of jail. I'm sorry I hurt you. Oh, listen... You ain't nearly as sorry as you're gonna be. Well, I suppose you do have the right to make it tough on me. Oh, not as tough as you're about to make it on yourself. Oh, let me see. Your original sentence was three out of six. Now, that goes up to the full six now. You got seven for assault. Another seven for escape, so... Uh, tonight's little caper just lost you the best years of your life. You could have been out when you were 22. Instead, you stay here till you're 39. At least. It doesn't matter. Whenever I get out, I'm going to kill him. Sure. I don't care how long it takes. But I'm going to kill him. I promise you. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> Promises, promises. But if you analyze what we've had so far, you'll see that this is a story that's based on broken promises. Meanwhile, here Lydia is back in jail for what appears to be a very long time. Well, in a very short time, I promise to be back here with the third act. And that's a promise you know I'll keep. Between 19 and 39, perhaps the most crucial 20-year period in anyone's life, the transition from youth to maturity, two fantastic decades of infinite possibilities. Well, not for everyone, certainly not for Lydia Prentice. Lydia Prentice is spending those 20 years in prison. Lydia Prentice with the raven black hair. There are little strands of gray here and there by now. And uh, there's a line or two, oh, still very faint, near the eyes, the mouth. Twenty years. A lifetime. And yet, she has kept busy. In a way, she has compiled a scrapbook, painstakingly, 
over the years. Mail call. Here's that hometown paper of yours. Thank you, Agnes. <laughs> Got another picture of him in it. He don't change a bit, does he? Yeah, I see. He's been named president of the plant. Herbert Larson, new president and chief executive officer of Jordan Industries. Good. Good? Why is it good? Shouldn't you be rooting for him to fall on his face? No, I want him to succeed. Uh, well, I gave up trying to figure you out a long time ago. No picture this time, just a story. Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Lawson returned from Round the World Tour. <laughs> a shame the boat didn't sink. I hope he had a wonderful time. I hope he's happy. Happy beyond his wildest dreams. <laughs> you know, you're kind of peculiar. That takes all kinds. Why do you want him to be happy? Why? Isn't it obvious? Not to me. Well, look at him. His career is flourishing. There's even talk of him running for the Senate. He's madly in love with his wife, a beautiful, wealthy woman. Charming children. He still has his looks, his youth, everything to live for. And I am going to take it away from him. Yeah. How? I am going to kill him. Oh, yes. His cup will be running over. He'll have everything. And then he'll have nothing. Now, Lydia, listen. It's a bad thought. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. What do you think keeps me alive? Oh, come in, Lydia. Sit down. Thank you, Warden. Oh, come on, old pals like us. You can still call me Agnes. <laughs> it's been a lot of water under the bridge since you was a new fish in this joint and I was a wet behind the ears guard. Exactly 20 years ago. Tomorrow. Yeah. I'm gonna miss you, Lydia. Let's face it. What you get in the jail is mostly riffraff. But <laughs> I don't know. You, you're a lady. Will you try to hide it? You're one, too. Ah. Well, now what are you gonna do? You know what I'm going to do. Kill him. Oh, talk sense. This is sense for me. But it's been 20 years. What do you think has sustained me all this time? What's kept me sane? They'll only send you back here. I know. You'll throw your whole life away. Oh, I threw my life away a long time ago. Now, listen. You kept your looks. More. When you came here, well, you're only a pretty girl. Now, you're a, you're a beautiful woman. It's not too late for you. I'm not interested. Oh, come on, be sensible. My brother, he, he's in real tight with the governor. That, that's how I got here behind this desk. Well, I spoke to him about you. Now, things can be arranged. A job, a, a good job could be found, say, uh, somewhere downstate. With your looks, you could still meet guys. Interesting, important guys. This don't have to be the end of your life. Make it the beginning. I gave him all these things. This ease, this wealth, this pleasure. And I am going to take them away at the very height of his enjoyment. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll keep your old cell reserved for you. Mr. Herbert Larson, please. I beg your pardon? Oh, are you his secretary? Well, I think you should tell me, because we had an appointment. Yes, my name is Cynthia Powers. I I'm with Fresh Faces magazine. I've come all the way from Los Angeles to interview Mr. Larson. He's where... But you can tell me we're old friends, Mr. Larson and I. Where? Oh, I see Sterling's. Well, I know where that is. Thank you. What'll it be? Ginger ale. You sure? Don't you serve ginger ale? Well, the reason I asked, the gentleman other end of the bar wanted to know if uh, he could buy you a drink. Thank the gentleman. Tell him no. Yeah, say, you, uh, you look familiar. Do I? Yeah. I don't know why. I just can't place you. Well, this world is full of people who look like other people. Look, uh, 
Why don't you let the gentleman buy you a drink? Because as I look at the gentleman from here, there's nothing about him that arouses my interest. Well, he's harmless and... Uh, and... Yes? Well, it's a, it's a real sad story there. Oh, please. Go no further. I've heard too many sad stories in my life. Well, uh, the, the gentleman, how, how, how old would you say he is? I'm not sure I care. Well, guess. Sixty. <laughs> You're way off. Seventy. Oh, well, look at him. Close. His hair's almost white. He's kind of fat. But he ain't nowhere near that old. Man's hardly a day over forty. Well, that's too bad. I mean, what does it cost you? He won't try to pick you up or get fresh or anything. Just give him a nod and smile. <laughs> You're looking at the richest man in town. <laughs> what kind of a town is this? Rich town. Lots of dough here. And he's got most of it. Well, his wife has anyway. They own the mill, half the real estate, three quarters of the banks. You name it, they got it. Of course, she always had it. He, he fell into it. Who? Who is he? Name's Herb Larson. A guy with everything going for him. And he... Well, he just... Uh, he's going to drink himself to death. It's hard to believe. Well, he's got a good constitution. Lay him take at least 20 years. 20 years? Oh, who knows? He may die sooner than that. Yeah, that's true. You never can tell. He might even die tonight. Are... Uh, are, are you going to kill him, Lydia? How do you know my name? I thought you looked familiar. I'm Joe Garrity. <laughs> Sheriff Tom Garrity's boy? Yeah, I was a year behind you in high school. Yeah. Um, how's your father? Oh, he's okay. He uh, stopped you from killing Herb that time you broke out of jail. That, uh, that was many years ago. Are you going to call your father now? No. Why not? It's your duty as a citizen. Yeah, I guess so. But you see, Herb gets loaded here regularly. It's uh, it's like his real home. And he talks to me. And he told me the real story. What real story? Who really robbed that safe. So, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, if you want to kill him, you have the right a fine way for a sheriff's son to talk. Fact is, when it comes right down to it, I, uh, I, I don't think you'll do it. You believe that? I'll bet on it. Or you'll lose. I'm going to open my purse. Take a look. Yeah, I see it. I still say you won't do it. Watch me. Mr. Larson? Mr. Herbert Larson? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's my name. I have something for you. For me? Would you like to see what it is? I'd be delighted. I'm so glad you decided to have a drink with me. You're a remarkably handsome woman. Thank you. You... You remind me of someone. I seem to have that gift. You seem... Familiar. She. She'd look like you. Something like you today. Who would? Girl. Girl I loved very deeply. Would her name be Lydia? Yes, that was her name. Lydia. Lydia Prentice? How would you know? I'm Lydia. You're Lydia? Yes. Lydia, you've come back. Yes, Herb, I've come back. I'll, 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 I'll divorce her. I, I never wanted her money. None of it was any good. She she never loved me. She got tired of me. She keeps me around for show. There are other men. Oh, what a shame. My kids, they have no use for me. Oh, that's too bad. Make them business look of the papers, print articles about what a great guy I am. Everybody knows it's because we own the papers. <laughs> I'm a joke. Joe Gardy, bartender, ask him, he'll tell you. But all these years, I... I had a dream. 
a dream you'd come back, I could start all over again. That was your dream? Almost 20 years. I dreamed you'd come back, we'd start all over. <laughs> and it happened, you've come back. Yes, I've come back to kill you. Lydia. I've come back here to kill you. That's been my dream. For 20 years, I've thought of it every moment. Thank you, Lydia, for setting me free. You're doing for me what I don't have the courage to do for myself. I tried it so many times, but I'm a coward. A gun terrifies me, pain frightens me. Can't force myself to take the pill. Shoot me, Lydia. Please. Quickly. Pull the trigger. Hello, Lydia. Hello, Sheriff. I heard you was out of jail. Knowing you, I figured... You figured right. I'm going to have to try to stop you. I could kill him before you moved a step. Before you reach for your gun. Kill me, Lydia, please. You'd like that, wouldn't you? This little thirty-six caliber bullet would be so quick, and you'd be out of your misery. You were always the strong one. <laughs> you were the one who knew what had to be done. Kill me. If you love me, kill me. No, Herb, I don't love you. And I'm afraid if you want to die, you'll have to make your own arrangements. But I don't want to live. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to. <gasps> oh. <gasps> What's the matter with me? I feel... Lydia? Lydia, are you all right? Yes, I... <laughs> I have this feeling. This light, crazy feeling. I've come awake from a nightmare. <laughs> I'm 19 again. And my whole life is in front of me. My whole life is out there. Waiting for me. The dream. The long cherished dream. And yet, it can come true in such strange and inexplicable ways. Sometimes, the best way to kill someone is to keep him alive. Sometimes, life is actually death. Well, on a more definitive basis, sometimes I leave you, as I do now for a few moments, but I always return. Mysterious memory. What did happen in the past? What is the past? Ten minutes ago? Yesterday? Last week? Last year? The further back we go, the more blurred and hazy. And he is brave indeed who truthfully tries to penetrate the mist. Who was guilty? Who was innocent? Who were the heroes and who were the villains? Or were things never really clear-cut? One thing is clear. We are here for your pleasure. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Michael Wager, Bryna Rayburn, and Bill Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in.
in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense. Justice, the noblest creation and the highest ideal of man. The foundation of all religion and the cornerstone of every law. Justice, the birthright of every human being on the face of the earth. Justice, we're brought up to believe in it, to expect it. But what about those people who suddenly discover that for them, there isn't any justice. Our mystery drama, Only the Dead, Remember, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts and Mandel Kramer. time, ever since he came home from one of our wars, Eddie Benson has been looking for someone. Those vital years of his life that might have been invested in a career, devoted to a family, have instead been devoured by an all-consuming search as Eddie Benson roamed the length and breadth of America. Supporting himself by his nimble and sensitive fingers, playing the piano, in grimy saloons, in sophisticated night spots, but always looking, always listening, ever alert for a clue that could lead to his quarry. Well, now, tonight, suddenly the manhunt will come to an end in a cocktail lounge in a northwestern city just a few minutes before midnight. Odd, how a search so intense could be climaxed by a discovery so casual. How so serious and deadly a crusade can be capped with a laugh. Uh, <laughs> that laugh. Uh, <laughs> Eddie Benson hasn't heard that laugh in years. That laugh. He would recognize it anywhere. It could only belong to one person. <laughs> and now, Eddie's fingers slide softly and swiftly over the keyboard and find a melody, a pretty little melody that has a special meaning for certain people, especially for that comfortable-looking man at the corner table, the man with that laugh. <laughs> So I said to her, my dear, if I were to get married again, it would be the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir, Mr. Jackson, that's a good one, all right. Oh, what's the matter, Mr. Jackson? Uh, the matter? Are you okay? You, you've got a funny look on your face all of a sudden. Hey, Millie. You didn't get sick or something. Who's that? Who, who, who's that playing the piano tonight? Oh, there's some guy filling in for Woody. You know him? Uh, no. For a minute, though, I, uh, well, I thought he may have looked familiar. That's just my imagination. Uh, Millie? What is it, Mr. Jackson? Ask him, uh, uh ask him if he'll, uh... You got a request, Mr. Jackson? Yeah, I have. Ask him to quit playing that song. You don't like it? It's kind of a catchy tune. Just give him this. Tell him to play something else. Eddie. You got a request. Uh, request in reverse. A uh, customer says to take this ten bucks and quit playing what you're playing now. What's this character's name? Uh, Jackson. R.J. Jackson. I see. R.J. Jackson. Does he, uh, live around here? No, up on the hill. All kinds of money. Figures. Huh? Uh, it's funny, Millie. How it ends. Where it ends. There were times I thought it would never end. All these years. It kind of took over, you know. It became a way of life. Look, I, I wish I knew what you were talking about. No, you don't, Millie. 
I think I'll split. You mean walk out? You can't just walk out on How'd home. you like to make ten bucks? Ah, well, all depends. You keep the ten spot, and as soon as I'm out of here, you go up to him, good old R.J. Jackson, see, and you say to him, Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming home to roost. <laughs> You're kidding. Say it. You're ten bucks ahead. Yeah, but you can't just quit in the middle of playing. Remember the chickens, Millie. See you around. Yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. The more I get to know musicians. Oh. Now, how'd that go? Mother and I see chickens. Yeah. Mr. Jackson. The, uh, Mr. Jackson, the uh, piano player, he wanted me to tell you something. Yeah? <laughs> I bet it's thanks. That's the easiest ten bucks he ever made. Well, what he wanted to tell you was... Yep. Well... <laughs> Well, he said, uh, let me see, uh, Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming home to roost. <laughs> what's that? I'm sure that's what he said. Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming. No. no. <laughs> Mr. Jackson. <coughs> hey, hey, somebody, give me a hand quick, he's fainted. <laughs> Tom Wilson, you know what time it is? It happens... I got a message for you, Tom. Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming home to roost. What? What did you say? Who is this? Hello? 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 Is Bill Trainer at home? No, but I expect him. Who's calling? Is this his wife? Yes, I'm Liz Trainer. Will you take a message? Well, of course. Tell him. Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming home to roost. Yes. That's all. Oh, you're joking. Hello? Hello? Oh, oh well. Hi, darling. Oh, Bill. You know, you just missed a phone call. Oh, never mind that. What'd the doctor say? Oh, things are just fine. He'll be born on schedule. <laughs> you mean you won't take it, girl? <laughs> Johnny, I'll take whatever we can get. I can't believe it. I mean, after all this time, everything but everything is going our way. Uh, you know, Tom worked out the contract. Oh, Bill. Oh, I'm so happy. Uh, we're going to be rich, honey. We're going to own a business. And we're going to be parents. Uh, <laughs> what were you saying about a phone call? Oh, well, a uh, man just called. Very mysterious. Hmm? He said to tell you that, uh, let me see, uh, Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming home to roost. He said what? Well, that's what he said. And he hung up. Can it mean anything? Oh, no. No, no, no not, nothing at all. Just, just, just forget it. What about dinner? Bill, dinner? Did, did the man say anything else? Bill, you, you're so pale. Honey, believe me, this is really nothing that should concern you. The key is the name Hennessy. Uh, w w where should we go to dinner? Darling, you're trying to distract me. Hennessy, we, we don't know any Hennessy. Oh, look, honey, I've, I've just been going at a very fast pace. and uh, Hennessy's chickens. Hennessy's chickens. That combination is familiar. Darling, I'm really very hungry. I've got it. Oh, I've got it. Your old army outfit is holding a reunion. What do you know about my old army outfit? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all, except... Except you and Tom Wilson were in it together. You, you were in Korea. You were prisoners and... You refuse to talk about it, even to me. Why do you say we're having a reunion? Hennessy. What? Last year when we moved into this house, I, I was putting a lot of your old stuff away. There was an army picture of you and Tom Wilson. Well, you must have been all of eighteen, and two other young soldiers. In the middle, an older man, a, a sergeant, and underneath it, you had written. Mother Hennessy's chickens. It just clicked in my mind. That, that, that sergeant, uh, that older man. He was all of 26. Well, his name was Hennessy, wasn't it? Yes. And, and, and he looked after all of you like a, like a mother hen. Yes. And, and now you're having a reunion. Oh, Bill. 
What a wonderful person that Sergeant Hennessy. How I want to meet him. No, you can't. Why? He's dead. Oh. Well, was he killed in the war? In the prison camp. Bill. That music, that, that piano. Hmm? Why don't you hear it? It's coming from the living room. Someone's playing the piano. I didn't hear anyone ring the bell. Oh, let's go see. No. But someone's in the apartment. Liz, stay here. Bill. I want you to stay in the bedroom. Yes, but why? Liz, in all the years we've been married, I never asked you to do anything just because I said so. But I'm asking you now, please. Um, all right, Bill. Just for a while. Hello, Eddie. The front door is open. I just walked in. Well, you're welcome, Eddie. Been a long time. A lifetime. Nice layout. Yeah. I've done well. I'm sure you deserve it. I went to school on the GI Bill, became an engineer. I always said you had the stuff, Billy. I'm going to own a good-sized electronics company. That's nice. I wrote buddy Tom, Tom Wilson. Remember him? <laughs> Who could ever forget Tom? Well, he's drawing up the contract. He became a lawyer. What about yourself, Eddie? Me? Yeah, a fellow with your talent, the way you could write songs. Like this one, for Hennessy. We all figured we'd hear you doing Broadway musicals, coming up with top hits. Well, I've been too busy. Doing what? Looking for somebody. Looking for an old friend of ours. Bill, I had a phone call. The craziest phone call. Hello, you... Tommy. Eddie. Hey, Eddie Benson. It could only have been you. Where you been hiding? Tom? Billy? I got the greatest news in the world. I found him. Hmm? I finally found him. You finally found who? The uh, needle in the haystack. One grain of sand on the beach. It was such a long time. It was such a long search. Eddie... Who did you find? Who do you think? Myers. Myers? R.J. Myers? He doesn't call himself Myers anymore, but it's... still R.J. Robert Joseph. Or, as Hennessy said, our own little Bobby Joe. Well, that's incredible. Except he's not so little anymore. He's a very portly gentleman these days. You say you found him? I found him. What did you say to him, Eddie? Nothing. Well, how could you just say nothing? Tom, you, Billy, and I, we've got nothing to say to Bobby Joe. I just made sure where we could find him, and I came here to pick up you two guys. Eddie... I, I have a 45. What do you guys want to use? Eddie, what are you saying? I'm saying if we leave now, we can fly to where he is in less than three hours and kill him before midnight. Kill. Into the pleasant, well-ordered, comfortable world of Bill Trainer and Tom Wilson, there suddenly intrudes a strange, terrifying an ugly word. It's not a word of this world. It's a word that belongs to another world. A world of pain and horror. A world that they thought was dead and gone. We'll continue in that world when I return shortly with Act Two. When they were 19 years old, Eddie Benson, Bill Trainer, and Tom Wilson suffered and starved and froze in a prison camp in North Korea. Now it's a lifetime later, and to Tom and Bill, Korea is barely a dream. But Eddie Benson is still stuck deep in the nightmare, still determined to carry out a deadly promise they made to each other long ago. I thought you two guys would be glad to see me. Now. Now we can keep our promise. What promise? Tom, you're kidding, aren't you? Bill, you remember the promise the three of us made? 
Well, do you? Yes. It was more than a promise. Eddie. It was an oath. Look, Eddie. No, you look, Tom. You look back. An amount of dirt in that prison camp. In Korea. You look back and see three guys. We, three guys, were kneeling next to that mound of dirt. Because it's Hennessy's grave. Look back and hear us. Hear us swear never to rest. Never to stop. Never to know a moment's peace until we kill Robert Joseph Myers. Eddie, how could we just kill him? How simple. Blow his brains out. You, you live in another world whether you realize it or not. Now you just don't go around killing people. That there are people who have to be killed, Tom. You're not in combat. The war's over. Not yet. Eddie, you're home. There's the law. Now, what do you tell the police? The truth. What's the truth? You know the truth as well as I do, Tom. Myers turned rat in Korea. He gave away our escape plan and he got Hennessy killed for it. But can you be sure it was Myers? We know it was Myers. We knew, didn't we? Bill. I guess we did. All right, tell me this. If we were so sure, why didn't we denounce him six months later after we were freed? Why? You know why, Tom. You were the law student. You said don't denounce him. I said? You said. We had no hard evidence. A smart defense lawyer could get him acquitted at a court-martial. That's what you said. All I said was I wished we had more evidence. You... You said we would have to get Myers by ourselves. That's what you said. We would find him, kill him, and announce it to the whole world. And that's what we swore we would do. Do you remember, Bill? I remember. Tom... All right, Eddie, all right. But that was a long time ago. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. No, but it means it happened in another time, in another place, under different rules. In other words, you're not willing to do it. I can't do it. I'm an attorney, a member of the bar. I simply cannot be an accessory to a felony. Okay. Bill, what's your excuse? I'm not aware that I need an excuse. I just... I spent my life looking for Bobby Joe so that justice could be done. Eddie, we can only have justice through the law. Okay. Tell me then. Will the law give us justice? We have no evidence. Okay. No justice from the law then. Tell me. In that case, where and to whom can we go for justice? Well... Does your silence mean there isn't going to be any justice? Eddie. Eddie what? Hennessy saved the lives of each of us more times than we can count. If it weren't for him, none of us would be around today. He was betrayed. He was murdered because of... Robert Joseph Myers. Now, is that going to be the end of it? Eddie, there are certain realities... I know you... what you think, Tom. Bill. I want to hear you say something. I wish I knew what to say. You've got nothing to lose, Eddie. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it comes down to, doesn't it? I I'm just crazy Eddie, the piano player. You guys. Pillars of the community. Rich, respectable. Gutless. Well, I'll do it alone. Eddie, there must be another way out of this. Tell, tell me about it. Look, I don't want him to go unpunished either. But Eddie... Eddie. Eddie, what's wrong? Eddie? Uh, I don't know. Hey, Eddie. Get, get me a drink of water. Tom, hold on. He's going to pass out. Let him sleep. What's the matter with him, Doctor? <clears throat> well, I'd say this man's been living on his nerves for a long, long time. Well, what can we do for him? Let him sleep. For a week, if you can. And uh, whatever you do, see that nothing excites him. I'm afraid that's going to be difficult. Why? Oh, it's a long story. He needs rest. Needs calm. Call me tomorrow. Yes, yes, Doctor. Bill. Try to get some sleep, Eddie. I feel so tired. I... I'll just rest a while, okay? Sure. I never felt so tired, except... When we were in... 
Korea, I remember? Yeah. Remember how Hennessy would keep us awake while we were on guard? Sure. <laughs> you, you were his favorite? Oh, he didn't play favorites. He, he liked you more than the rest of us because you were the best soldier. Eddie, try to get some sleep. I don't care about Tom, but you... Especially you. You have to help me kill Myers. Eddie, you need your sleep. Yeah. I'll sleep a little, and then when I feel stronger, we'll go get him. You have to help me, Bill. After all, if it weren't for you, if it weren't for you... If it weren't for me, what, Eddie? Eddie? Sergeant, Sergeant Hennessy, get me out of here. Hennessy, Hennessy, help me. Please, don't, don't leave me alone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was having a nightmare. Oh, darling, you, mm. look, you just can't keep torturing yourself. Oh, Liz, Liz, what am I going to do? It'll be all right. No, Liz, whatever I do, it won't be all right. It won't. Oh, surely you just can't. Just can't what? Oh, I better not say any more. Why did Eddie have to show up now? <laughs> Darling, what are you going to do? I don't know. But I just can't go and kill Myers. It would be throwing away my whole life. Yours as well. Liz, please help me. I... I can't help you. No one can help you. <laughs> It's all set. We have the closing tomorrow. You'll own a factory, Bill, my friend. Yeah. Is uh, Eddie better? Yeah, yeah. He um, He's sitting up now. He's getting an appetite. In a couple of days, the doctor says he can be out of bed. You know what we have to do, don't you? We have to get word to Myers somehow. I don't like this any more than you do, but we have to warn him to keep out of sight for a while. I suppose. Has he told you where Myers is living? No. He won't even tell me what name Myers is using. Why? I don't think he trusts Tom. He thinks we betrayed him and Hennessy. Bill. Look, Tom, what's the use? In a sense, we have betrayed Hennessy. I know. We've even betrayed ourselves. It's all... It's all part of what you have to do to live. Now, we must find out where Myers is. Eddie won't tell me. He might tell me. I'll get it out of him somehow. We'll save him yet, in spite of himself. Oh, oh, I'm freezing. It's so cold. So cold. Bill, oh. don't you having a bad dream? What? Wake up. Can Wake we build up. a fire? Why won't they let us build a fire? Bill! A fire. Bill, please. Why can't, why can't they let us have a fire? Bill, Eddie. Yes, Eddie. We gotta break out of here tomorrow night. Hennessy said to tell you. We won't have a chance. We better not. We'll die if we stay here, Tom. He's right, Tom. You guys know where we have to meet? Yeah, Tom and I know. Did you tell Myers? No. Why not? Myers isn't going. Why not? Shut up, Bill. You can't tell who's around. Hennessy says Myers can't cut it. But he's one of us. We can't leave him here. Hennessy says we can't take a chance on him. No. No, what? Without Hennessy and us around to protect him, he'll die here. I'm gonna talk to Hennessy. I'll convince him. I'll convince him. I'll convince Hennessy that we have got to take Myers. I'll convince him. Bill, Bill, wake huh? up. Darling, you're dreaming again. What? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. Bill, oh. I, I, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Oh. Only sometimes I... I don't know which is the dream. This or Korea. Hi, darling. Oh, hello, Bill. Uh, Tom's here. Oh? Yeah, he's inside talking to Eddie. Yeah, I have got something to say to Eddie, too. Look, I almost forgot you saw the doctor today. Is there anything... Oh, everything's just fine. Oh, Liz, this should be the happiest part of my life. I, I know, Bill. I'll be right out. Well, how is everybody? I want to thank you for everything, Bill. Oh, it's nothing. I'm leaving tonight. Leaving? Where to? 
There's a promise I have to keep. See if you can talk him out of it, Bill. He won't listen to me. He won't tell me anything either. I won't try to talk you out of anything, Eddie. I want to go with you. Bill! What for? To help me or to stop me? I don't know. I just feel that I have to face Myers with you. And then... Well, right now, I don't know. Fellas, if this is the way the conversation is going, I have to leave. I can't be part of what happens. Well, Eddie, where are we going? I'll tell you when we get there. What's the matter? Don't you trust me? Are you going to try to save him? I don't know what I'm going to do. We're in this because you tried to save him the last time, you remember? Yes, I remember. When are we leaving? Tonight. All right, I'll go pack. You don't need much. Just a toothbrush, a razor, and a revolver. The decisions have been made. Or have they? Tom stays, Bill goes. But what is it that Bill will do when he faces Myers? Right now, his emotions are those of a 19-year-old. But how long can those emotions sustain a man who is close to 40? We'll know when I return shortly with Act 3. <laughs> Many of us spend our lives searching for the truth. But what is the truth? Direct from CBS News, this Radio Net Alert Bulletin. This is Richard Threlkeld in San Francisco. A federal warrant was issued tonight for Patricia Hurst, kidnapped daughter of publisher Randolph Hurst, as a material witness in today's $10,000 robbery of a San Francisco bank. Ms. Hurst, who announced in a communique last week that she has renounced her family to join her erstwhile captors, the Symbionese Liberation Army, was clearly visible in a security photo taken during the robbery, holding a carbon in the bank teller area. Authorities said they wanted Ms. Hurst, who has taken the revolutionary named Tanya, not for her arrest, but only as a witness, on the assumption she may have been forced to participate in the robbery, in which two bystanders were critically wounded. Three other persons, all women, all known or suspected SLA members, were charged with the robberies. Authorities said they still do not have hard evidence that Patricia Hearst took willing part in the robbery. But as FBI agent in charge Charles Bates put it tonight, I am now convinced Patricia Hearst is alive and still with the SLA, unquote. This is Richard Trokel in San Francisco. This Net Alert Bulletin has come to you from CBS News. We now resume the regular program schedule on this CBS Radio Net Alert station. Many of us spend our lives searching for the truth. But what is the truth? When are we closest to the basic essence of our existence? Is it when we have the experience and wisdom of age, or the fire and idealism of youth? We keep asking, what is the truth? The answer is, each man must find his own truth. Liz! Liz! Eddie's gone. Yes, I know. You know? Well, I, I... I went to his room to see if he was up to having dinner, and he... He wasn't there. But I was supposed to go with him. I know that, too. How did you know? I didn't tell you. Oh, darling, you didn't have to tell well, me. Well, then how? I have faith in you, Bill. I have faith that... That in the end, you... You will do what's right. Looks as if I'm not going to do anything with Eddie gone. Oh. Do you really want to find him? But how? How could I even begin to look? Uh, I uh, know where he went. You know? How do you know? Well, well while he was sick, I, I sent his clothes to the cleaners, and in his pocket there was an airline return ticket. A ticket to where? Now, look, Bill, I, I won't tell you unless you take me with you. Honey, you can't go in your condition. Bill, but we have to do this together. But it might be dangerous. You're wasting our time, Bill. We should be getting the next plane for Central City. Oh, boy, I didn't realize how hungry I was. Well, we, we missed dinner last night. Now, tell me something. How do we find Eddie in a city this size? Oh, where's the waitress? Oh, miss. 
Oh, uh, could you bring us the morning paper, please? How's the paper going to help us? Well, the paper would carry ads for the night spots where, where he might have worked. Hey, it's right. If he found Myers, it would probably be in a bar or a club. Yes. Oh, th thank you, miss. Huh. All right, darling, you go through the ads, so I'll just sit and finish this coffee. Mm -hmm. Then I'll start looking for Eddie. Well, I intend to go with you. Oh, no. No, you don't. It's miserable out. It's snowy. Now, you stay in the hotel. I can find him. Bill. Oh, Bill, we won't. We won't find Eddie. What do you mean? Look at what it says. Hmm? Here in the paper. Let's see. Yeah. Eddie is... is dead. What? Musician found shot to death. Police puzzled by mysterious murder. Body discovered in hotel room. No apparent motive. Eddie dead? How yeah. can he be? Only yesterday. Well, do the police have anything to go on? No, it says here no leads, no clues. Liz, it had to happen last night. Someone was waiting for him. It has to be Myers. Well, look, we better tell the police. But Eddie said that's not the name Myers is using. We don't know who he is. Liz, Bill. Tom. Tom, what are you doing here? I just got in. I checked the hotels and ran you down. Then you know. Yeah, I saw it in the paper. That's why I flew out here. But Tom. What? Uh, how, how, how could you... Liz, what is it? Uh, oh, nothing. Poor Eddie. You know what this means? We're both in trouble now, you and I. Why? Well, it's obvious Myers knew Eddie was after him, so he killed him. Tom, we have no choice. We have got to find Myers. But while we don't know who he is, he knows who we are. In this big city, who is Myers? He could kill us from ambush and get away with it. Oh, Bill. Of course... There's one thing we could do. Yes. Call it off. How? Take the next plane out of here. That would be our way of telling Myers it's all over. Is that what you want to do? I'm not saying it's what I want to do. I'm listing our options. I think we have to find Myers, Tom. This time we can turn him over to justice. Oh, it's funny the way it worked out. Um, Eddie had to die so that justice could settle accounts with Myers. We have to find him first. All right, we'll try all the music places. Liz, you stay here and stick close to the phones. If either of us gets a lead, we'll be in touch. Uh, that tune. Would you ask the piano player where he learned it? <laughs> he learned it from me. I hum it all the time. You now he says to me, Hey, Millie, I like that. Now he plays it all the time. I knew the man who wrote it. Eddie Benson. Oh, you knew Eddie? Sure, we were good friends. That's oh, a shame what happened to him. He was, uh... I don't know, somebody once told me a word. Uh, mercurial. Yeah, yeah, he was a mercurial character. That he was. <laughs> a guy like him. Oh, he got a lot of people sore at him. Well, at least he left a pretty tune to remember him by. I, I just can't get it out of my head. Everybody loves it. Well, uh, almost everybody. I know one character who didn't. That's so? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it was Eddie's last night on the job. He, he was playing the tune. And... and and this guy, who comes in here all the time, this guy wanted to give him ten bucks just to quit playing it. You're kidding. No, no, it's a fact. Do you know the guy? Oh, sure. He's a regular. Oh, he hasn't been in lately. Yeah, one thing I got to say about old R.J. Jackson. He's, he's got a tin ear. R.J. Jackson. Tell me more about him.
Liz, I found him. How? I'll tell you later. His name is R.J. Jackson. He has a place out in the country up in the mountains. I'm going there now. Oh, Bill. As soon as Tom checks in with you, tell him to take Route 603 to Mountain Lane. Turn right and go up the hill as far as he can. That's the place. But, Bill, there's so much snow. They keep the roads clear up there. Bill, Bill, I must tell you. I know what bothers me about Liz, Tom. I want to get started. Look, how did Tom know to come to Central City? We didn't tell him where we were going. He said he read about Eddie in the morning papers. Yes, but Tom was already in Central City early this morning. How did he get Darling, here? Darling, you're talking about Tom. Now, I'm sure he... Look, honey, I have got to be on my way. Hi, Tom. Glad you made it. Yeah, I guess this is as far as the car can take us. It's that house on the top of the hill. Yeah. I think we should have sent the police. How? Once again, we don't have the evidence. And what are we going up there for? To kill him ourselves? No. I think we can get a confession out of him. Oh, sure. Now, look, he's human. He's got a guilty conscience. He'll break down. He has to. Now, come on. Boy. Looks like Korea, doesn't it? Yeah. Miles and miles of nothing. You could just sink into the snow. It could just be the end of everything. That's far enough. What? Stay where you are. Look in the doorway. It's Myers. He's got a rifle. You're trespassing. Now get out of here, or I'll shoot. You wouldn't shoot us, Myers. My name isn't Myers. Now get out of here. We have to talk with you, R.J. We're coming up. I'm warning you. Come on, R.J. You can't get away with it. Look out! Take the ground. Stay low, Tom. There's a line of trees leading up to the house. We'll work our way in. Ill, this guy can kill both of us. I don't think he wants to. Are you crazy? This is the man who just killed Eddie last night. Right now, he's scared. Come on. Head for those trees. Keep away! Keep away! We'll try for that stone fence. Tom! Why? Put your gun away. I'm not going to let him pick me off. He'll show himself in the doorway when he wants to shoot again. Don't. He's only trying to scare us off. I see him. Don't, Tom. Don't. I got him. I got him. Look. He's on the ground. Hurry up. Come on. R.J. Don't kill me. Don't shoot again. Get me a doctor. You'll get a doctor. But first, we'll get a confession. Now, you sold us out in the prison camp. Confess. No. No, I didn't tell. Let him alone. He'll confess later. Let's bring him inside. No, he'll confess now. And when Eddie Benson found you, you shot him. No, I didn't. And who did? I'm hurt bad. Get me to a doctor. Bill, you were always a good guy. Help me. R.J., it was a long time ago. The world's forgotten. I don't even think you could be brought to trial for it. It's just among the three of us. Now, I want you to confess. I didn't do it. Honest. I didn't do it. You did, because you didn't show up. You stayed behind. You told the guard. No. What did they give you? Did you have to kill Eddie, too? I didn't kill anybody. Yes, you did. We can get the waitress to testify. She'll tell how you saw Eddie in the lounge, how you passed out. Well, sure, I was scared. Because you guys always thought it was me. But it could have been anybody. You, Tom. What? Or you, Bill. Or even Eddie himself. Let's drag him down to my car and bring him in. Tom. Now, please. Haven't I suffered enough? No, it's not enough. Tom, how did you know about the waitress? Huh? How did you know about the waitress? What? You, you told me. No, I didn't tell you anything about the waitress. I just left a message for you to meet me here. Well, I... I... Well, you must have said something about it to Liz. But I didn't. Well, then, how would I know? How? Because Eddie told you. Eddie? Why would Eddie you tell me? You said you could get it out of him. Did you tell him that I would never help him, but that you would? Is that how you got him to trust you? Oh, come on. Why would I want to kill Eddie? Because of that talk we had in my house. Maybe unconsciously, both Eddie and I started to think... Why were we always convinced that R.J. was the informer? Because... Because you were the first one to accuse him. And who said not to denounce him to the army? You did, Tom. And who said let's hunt him down ourselves? You did. Why? 
Because you knew it would be impossible. You knew we would settle down in a civilian life and forget it. Bill, you've got it wrong. But you didn't figure on Eddie. You didn't figure one of us would spend his whole Bill, life... Bill, you know me. Everywhere you turn, it's you, Tom. You with all the shrewd answers. Why did you have to kill Eddie? Because... Because he was starting to talk just like you are. And then... And then he figured it out. And he wanted to kill me. So... So I had to kill him. It was self-defense. Oh. I had to kill him. It was like it used to be. Back in combat. Kill or be killed. You were the informer. No, no. I informed. But I wasn't the informer. I... I just didn't do what Hennessy ordered. I didn't cover my tracks. That's why they found us. What did they pay you? Nothing. I, I, I wanted us to get caught. You wanted it? Why? Well, Hennessy was wrong. The only time in his life he was wrong. We could never have made it, Bill. All of us would have died in the snow. I was trying to save our lives. Uh. I tried to explain it to Hennessy. I tried, but he wouldn't listen. He would only say in that, that way of his... Trust me, kid. It'll be okay. And I... I keep trying to explain to him. Believe me, I try. Every night. Every night for the last 20 years, I try to make him see it, but... I can't find him. He's out there in the snow. And I can't find him. All right, Tom, we better go back to town. No, no, wait here. I'll find him. He, he can't have gone far. I'll find him. I'll explain why I did it. He'll forgive me. He'll understand Stop him, Bill. Stop him. He'll, He'll get lost oh, out there. Man. He'll freeze to death. I can't leave you, RJ. <coughs> I have to get you to a doctor. We'll come back for Tom. Later. They found Tom Wilson later, much later, about the time of the spring thaw. The snow, the ice, had preserved the final expression on his face. It was one of peace and calm, as if he had actually found Hennessy, and Hennessy had forgiven him. Well, Hennessy would. He was that kind of man. dreams. The man does. It's what we call the generation gap. And this is not the distance between parents and children. It is the unbridgeable abyss between what a man is today and what he wanted to be yesterday. But that's because you can only be young once. Something you can do more than once is listen. You can listen again and again to our mystery theater tales. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Mandel Kramer, George Petrie, Bryna Rayburn, and Lon Clark. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. in San Francisco are seeking kidnap Patricia Hurst as a material witness in a bank robbery there yesterday. 
This is Ann Crosman reporting on the CBS Radio Network. Three other women, known to be associated with the Symbionese Liberation Army, have been charged in the robbery. The SLA has claimed responsibility for the Hearst kidnapping. All four women were photographed during the holdup, along with one male suspect. But both the FBI and the U.S. Attorney in the district say that Miss Hurst may have been forced to take part since the photos show one suspect training an automatic weapon in the direction of Miss Hurst. San Francisco Mayor Joseph Aliotto describes the SLA as a band of killers and third-rate intellectuals with delusions of their own importance. And he put his position on the line. We are now free to call these folks for what they are. And the first thing that we have to establish is put the mark of the outlaw on these folks who deserve it. They are a great social revolutionary. They aren't social revolutionaries. They are killers. They are murderers. They are kidnappers. They are extortionists. Mayor Alioto was speaking to the Comstock Club in Sacramento. More in a minute. Former Attorney General John Mitchell faces more questioning today from the prosecution in his New York trial. Mitchell and former Commerce Secretary Maurice Stans are charged with obstructing an investigation by the Securities and Exchange Commission of Robert Vesco in exchange for Vesco's secret contribution to President Nixon's re-election campaign. Chris Kelly reports on yesterday's testimony. In a firm voice, the former Attorney General declared he is absolutely not guilty of any of the charges against him. Testifying again in his own defense, Mitchell insisted there was nothing improper in accepting the campaign contribution of financier Robert Vesco. He said that after he and Maurice Stans discussed its propriety, they concluded it would be all right to accept the money. Mitchell did not change his story under a lengthy cross-examination by the prosecution. He said the whole matter of Vesco's contribution would have been discarded if he thought the financier was trying to buy a fix. As Mitchell put it, if Vesco thought he was going to get a favor, he would be looking for more than just a meeting with the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Mitchell denied intervening on Vesco's behalf, claiming documents suggesting he did so were merely attempts by a Vesco associate to convince the financier that he, Mitchell, was doing something for him. Chris Kelly, CBS News, New York. The Supreme Court has been told that some communities in the country are using the High Court's new rules against pornography to suppre suppress legitimate artistic expression. CBS News legal correspondent Fred Graham reports from Washington. At issue was the movie Carnal Knowledge, which won an Academy Award nomination for one of its stars, Anne Margaret, but brought an obscenity conviction to a theater owner who showed it in Albany, Georgia. Today, New York defense lawyer Louis Neiser told the justices this was cultural illiteracy, and he warned that unless it's overturned, filmmakers may become timid and unimaginative. Neiser asked the high court to re-examine the landmark obscenity decision it handed down just last spring when the court said each community can enforce its own standard of candor in obscenity cases. Neiser said communities should not be permitted to suppress films unless they are hardcore pornography without any artistic merit. Jack Valenny, president of the Motion Picture Association of America, said the film industry couldn't comply by simply cutting its film differently for different communities. The Supreme Court is expected to hand down its decision in June. Fred Graham, CBS News, Washington. Back in a minute. Vice President Ford said on Monday night that he thinks members of Congress, candidates for Congress, and top government officials should expect to have their income tax returns audited. The Vice President says these people believe the President and Vice President should be prepared to undergo audits and they should expect the same treatment. Ford was speaking at a news conference in Palm Springs, California, where he and his wife are vacationing this week. In Key Biscayne, the White House said that, that Mr. Nixon is heartened and moved by more than $40,000 he has received from Americans who want to help him pay back his back taxes. But the White House says the President will return the money to the senders and, in the case of anonymous donations, give them to the Red Cross to help victims of the recent tornado disasters. Mississippi Governor Bill Waller is asking Mr. Nixon to declare nearly half his state's counties as disaster areas following four days of rain and flooding. Damage is estimated at $50 million. Seven people are known dead. Thousands are homeless. Civil Defense and Red Cross workers are caring for the evacuees. 
One of the hardest hit cities is Hattiesburg, as David Dick reports. The floodwaters of the Leaf and Bowie rivers lap around the eaves of the houses in East Hattiesburg. Hundreds of residents driven from their homes stand on scattered bits of high ground and they survey the heavy loss. Other homeowners wade aimlessly through the brown water, a woman with a frightened dog in her arms. A man piloting a boat alone, he waves as he passes down the street dotted with automobile roofs that poke above the water level. A man sloshing through the water saying he won't move away because it's home. And two men in a house refusing to come out at all, standing waist deep in water, they vow to stay no matter what. They took turns sleeping last night on a pool table in one of their rooms. David Dick, CBS News, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Back in a minute. A team of doctors in Johannesburg have injected an expectant mother with an experimental hormone they believe could double the IQ of her baby. The hormone is known to increase the efficiency of the placenta in the last four weeks of pregnancy, the same time when the brain cells of the fetus develop. A report from the African country of Niger says that the Army Chief of Staff says that he deposed the President to relieve what he calls the catastrophic situation in the poor country. This is Ann Crosman, CBS News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Marshall. There are parts of the countryside which wake each day to a morning mist which has settled thickly during the dew-falling night. Through it, the trees have a waiting look. Hills seem to be further off than they are. Cattle look motionless as they graze. White farm horses move and turn in slow and stately unison. Everything is waiting for the sun. mystery drama, Out of the Mist, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Russell Horton. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Slowly the morning mist starts to thin out, begins to rise from the ground. Each horse and cow stands in clear outline, and the pasture where they browse shows itself for what it is. Country people call this process burning off. It means the sun has gone to work. The story we bring you now is called Out of the Mist. I'm crazy about my motorcycle. It's a road bike, fast and light. Great off-the-line acceleration. I love it. The uh, other thing I love is the country. I never even saw the country till I was 19. And if it hadn't been for my bike, I might have lived my whole life without even knowing it was there. My name is uh, Harry Steers. I graduated high school and went right to work in the garment district with the idea of working up the salesman. I might have made it if I hadn't bought my bike. I started riding out of the city on my day off. I saw trees, all kinds. I saw animals. Big ones, little ones. I saw fields of corn and clover and daisies. Most important of all, I met the old man. He was standing in front of an old white house trimming a hedge. He looked to be about a hundred years old. <laughs> but I found out later he was only 90. Hi there. Uh, good morning. That's a nice looking hedge. What do you call it? Yeah, it's private. You're not from around here, are you? Uh, no, I'm from the Bronx. And I have privet in the Bronx, too. Are you interested in privet? Not especially. I'm interested in everything about the country, everything that grows out of the ground. You know, I never knew that carrots lived under the earth. 
Anything grew on bushes? <laughs> Never thought about it at all. The carrots were just something in the supermarket. If it wasn't for this baby here, I might never have found out. I oh, you mean a motorcycle? Yeah. Well, uh, nice talking to you. Yes, sir. It was very nice talking to you. Hey, uh, listen, do you know uh, there's a flower? Uh, I, I guess it's a flower. I, I see it along the side of the road a lot lately. A, a fantastic blue color. Oh, that's chicory. Chicory? <laughs> no, no, that's not chicory. It's not? No, chicory's what my grandmother used to put in coffee. Well, she was using the root of the domesticated variety. which you see along the road is the wild chicory. It blooms in late summer. Well, I'd like to take some back to the Bronx. Well, I'm afraid you couldn't do that. Wildflowers don't like to be transplanted. They like to wander, follow their impulses. They don't wish to be told what to do, where to go, where to live. They want to be free to roam, take up residence in a spot of their own choosing. How about that? And they will brook no interference. Gee. Well, you have to admire their spirit. I do. I, I admire it. Well, uh, you want to be on your way to the Bronx. I guess so. But uh, if you're ever up this way again, stop by, eh? Well, I'll do that, though. I'll, I'll certainly do that. Uh, goodbye. And don't forget. That's what changed my life. Put its mark on me forever. A little talk with an old man about privet and chicory and carrots and an invitation to come back. I could hardly wait. If I'd known what would come of it. But I didn't know. And I was having the time of my life. I bought a paperback and I started to learn about wildflowers. Purple loose stripes, sink foil, bee balm, butter and eggs, vervain. I went crazy. I couldn't wait to see all those wild things growing out of the ground. On my very next day off, me and my bike stopped off at the old man's house. Hi there. I'm back. Remember me? Yeah, of course. The young man who's interested in chicory. Yeah, and that's not all. I bought a book. You see? I carry it around with me all the time. Oh, I have several books on wildflowers. Would you care to have a look? Hey, would I? Uh, uh, now? Uh, come inside and I'll get my housekeeper to make us coffee. Or uh, would you prefer a drink of some sort? Oh, anything at all. Uh, Listen, uh, Mr. Uh, um... uh, Bell, Calvin Bell. Uh, what do you know about hollyhocks? A little, little. It's very difficult to raise some seed, although I have succeeded from time to time. Most people buy the seedlings. Uh, here we are. Uh, Miss Peters. Mrs. Peters. Uh, yes, Mr. Bell. We have a guest. Well, now, that's nice. Uh, this is Harry Steers from the Bronx. He drove up here on his motorcycle. Is that so? We'd be obliged to you for some coffee, Miss Peters. I'll see to it. Very pleasant meeting you, Mr. Steers. Well, same here, Mrs. Peters. Uh, sir, uh, there's something in the book. It's called Bee Balm. I see it along the road some. Great shade of red. Some people have tried to domesticate it and called it bergamot. But I don't hold with that. I don't care for the whole idea of taking wild things and taming them. I like to leave things alone. Let them wander the earth as they please. Same thing with animals. I can't tolerate the thought of putting animals in a zoo for people to stare at and to laugh at and sometimes tease and feed unnatural things to which can make them sick. Sometimes 
seems though man has a morbid desire to get his hands on everything that grows and do something with it. Twist it, turn it, take it apart. Make it into something it isn't, something different, more to his personal liking. Mr. Mr. <laughs> Bell, you, you shouldn't get yourself all worked up. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. No, 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 I shouldn't. You're quite right. After all, I'm 90 years old, you know. Oh, you, uh... You could have fooled me. Uh, uh, look here, if you're so interested in wild things, if you really like the country... Well, I am. I, I, I do a lot. Well, why don't you move up here? Forget about that Bronx place. Move in here with me. I got a big house. There's plenty of room. Well, what would I do? I, could I work around the place, maybe? Hey, listen. I'm about 20 miles from Seneca. That's where the university is. I'll enroll you there, and you can study to become a botanist. What do you think of that? Well, if it'd cost money, you... Well, I couldn't sell my bike. No, it... no, there's no need, no need. Keep it. Do you know, Mr. Steers, that there are wildflowers which are endangered? Trailing Arbutus, Bitter Bloom, all the trilliums. Well, you mean endangered like, like wild animals? Precisely. Endangered species. The bluebell, the nodding wake robin, the cardinal flower, the butterfly weed. City people come for a drive in the country and they think it's great sport to pick the pretty flowers. Of course, the little things die within the hour, but... What do the predators care? Harry, there are laws, laws on the books against picking endangered wildflowers. Well, with your bike, you could police these people, these hunters. Arrest them? Yeah, track them down, report them. Or just tell them to stop and tell them why. Sometimes they'll cooperate if they understand... Oh, I guess I could do that. Yeah, sure you could. Protect my wild beauties. Yes. I'm too old. I can't go out on the roads and the highways. But you can. What do you say, Harry? Go on, indulge an old man. Uh, will you, Harry? You're very hard to say no to, Mr. Bell. Here's your coffee, Mr. Bell. Say yes, Harry. Oh, there's cream and sugar if you want them. Yeah, wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm going to fetch some superlative brandy. It's been in the cellar for 20 years. And today is the day to open it. What's Mr. Bell so wrought up about? Oh, uh... Just an idea he's got. Something to do with his precious wildflowers? Yeah, that was part of it. <laughs> Wanted you to help him save the poor, helpless things, hmm? Sort of. Um, Mrs. Peters, he wants to put me through the university. Well, if you go to the university, you'll see a painting of Mr. Bell hanging in the front hall. A fine-looking man in his 20s. Tall, handsome, strong-looking. He came into a pile of money when he was young, and first thing he did was give half of it to the university. To the botany department, I'll bet. Hmm, yep. That's why they hung his picture in the main hall. But now, well, he's an old man, and he has notions. His mind wanders a lot. Remembering things, I suppose. Well, he seems very okay to me. Yes, well, I just thought you should be told. I did it. It was a chance I couldn't pass up. I moved in with Calvin Bell. And come fall, I signed up at the university majoring in botany. Every morning of my life, I walked to the main hall and saluted the painting of Calvin Bell as a young man. Mrs. Peters was right. He'd been a great-looking guy in his day. Better than six feet tall, with bright brown eyes and wavy hair. 
and he was a nice old coot now. Even if his eyes were dimmed, he walked with a stoop, and most of his wavy brown hair had fallen out. We got along fine. Actually, everything was just about perfect. Till I met that girl. Well, even that was good at the beginning. The trouble came later. The wild flowers are disappearing. The animals are becoming superfluous. There are those who think that the entire countryside will one day be smothered by lofty apartment buildings, huge shopping centers, and enormous parking lots. The entire earth will be man-made, and God's work will be only incidental. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. What difference will it make to our grandchildren if they never see a wild primrose or a Johnny Jump Up or Chinese candles? Will they know or care that these were flowers that grew freely with no help from man at all? Will it matter if they never have a chance to see an eland, or a kudu, or a dictic? Probably it will have no significance whatsoever, because they cannot know what they have missed, what civilization has stolen from them. This is how I met the girl. It was eight o'clock in the morning, and the mist hadn't even begun to lift. It was a wonder I saw her at all. She wasn't riding a thumb. She was no hitchhiker. She was just standing there on the far side of the rise that goes over the old abandoned single-track railroad. I was already late for my first class at the university. I, I can't imagine what made me pull up. You, uh, you oughtn't to be standing out in the middle of the road like that. Why not? Well, you could get run over. Oh, I don't think so. Boy, oh, I could have run you down with my bike just now. See, there's a rise here, a, a little hill where the road goes over the old railway. I always give it the gun not to lose speed and then sort of flip over on the other side. Evil Knievel stuff, you know? <laughs> uh, that was uh, supposed to be a joke. Oh. Well, I, I don't know why they don't level off this stretch of road. The, the railroad stopped running years ago. I, I don't even know where it went to. To Miller's Ridge. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't know that. Yes, it does. Well, it would if it was running. Yes. Uh, you know what? I, I've uh, never been to Miller's Ridge. Uh, I, I've heard of it, but I, I've never been there. Oh, it's, it's just a post office, really, and a few houses. I used to live in one of those houses. Yeah? Before I went away to school. Uh, uh, well, I, I uh, better be getting to class. I got an exam coming up. Uh, nice talking to you. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Thank you. And uh, remember what I told you about not standing in the mist like that. Wait till it burns off if you want a summer ride. You wouldn't want to get run down by a bike, would you? A bike? A, a bike. A, a motorcycle. This baby here. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, better get on the stick. This exam is very important to me. I'm uh, studying to be a botanist. That's nice. That's very nice. Concentrating on wildflowers. Yeah, I'm from the Bronx, New York. I'm hung up on wildflowers. How about that? <laughs> I think it's nice. Oh, you see that? You see that? Mm -hmm. That is Queen Anne's lace. No, it's not. It certainly is. I it's yarrow. No, that's Queen Anne's lace. Look at it. You know, you're right. It's yarrow. It's hard to tell unless you're close up. They do look alike. But Queen Anne's lace is, is pretty and delicate. Yarrow is, well... Like, uh, more coarse. More coarse, yes. You... You look like Queen Anne's lace. Me? Yeah. Pretty and delicate. You'd better get on to your class at the university. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'd better... Uh, see you again, I hope. Good 
you're not going to believe this, but I was in love. I was in love. I was a whole different person entirely from the one I'd been. I was nice. I was good. I felt like I wanted to be kind to everybody all over the world. I'm telling you, I sailed right through that exam. The questions were so easy, I had to laugh. The professor looked surprised when I was the first one to hand in my book. But I tossed it on his desk, flashed him a smile, and swaggered out. All I wanted was to get back to the girl in the mist. Only, there wasn't any mist now. It had all burned off by noon, the way it always does. But there she was. A little way down the slope. That led to the old railroad track. Hi there. Hello, Mr. Spears. I came back. Yes, you did, didn't you? I hoped you would. Well, what have you been doing all this time? Oh, just wandering around. Looking for wildflowers? Some of the time. Anybody try to pick you up or anything? No. You want to be careful of that kind of thing, you know? Why? Why? Well, you, the way things are, don't you read the papers about what happens? Uh, I don't read the papers. Mm, all kinds of things happen. But then, uh, you weren't looking to be picked up, were you? I don't think so. What, um, what were you looking to do? I wanted to get to Miller's Ridge. Were you going to walk? I guess so. You want to see your family, is that it? Uh, or are you married? I'm not married. Not yet. Oh, that's good. It's your family you want to see, right? I just, I just want to see the house. Because I used to live there. Well, you're sentimental about it, right? Oh, yes. Very sentimental. Yeah, I can empathize with that. I really can. I was born in a terrible house. A really awful, dinky, unattractive. But I've always thought that when I make some money, I'm going to buy that house. Gruesome as it was, I'll never really forget it. Well, this house isn't gruesome. It's pretty. Well, um... What do you say? You you want me to take you there? Would you? Oh, I'd do a lot more than that for you. So, um, hop on. Right here. Now, if you kind of hitch up your skirt... Oh. You really ought to be wearing jeans, but... Uh... Oh. oh, my goodness. What, that scare you? That, huh? That's how you jump a bike. Uh, come on. Put your arms around my waist. Should I? Well, you know, if you don't want to fall off, you should. That's it. We go into the wild blue whatever. She didn't grab hold of me like some girls would that have never ridden tandem on a bike before. I could hardly feel her arms around me. I had to look down and see her hands clasped together and her thumbs tucked inside my belt. Every so often I'd turn around and see this sweet face behind me. The sweetest face I'd ever seen in my whole life. Innocent and lovable. Like a wildflower. Where's this house you want to see? You keep going until you see a big oak tree. A really enormous one. Oh, there it is. See it? Oh, yeah. It must be 900 years old. You go left just beyond it. There's a dirt road. Dirt road? I didn't know they had those anymore. Right here. Turn left. Hey, gotcha. Hold on. You keep going a little ways. The house will be on the right. It's a very small house, but I'll know it as soon as I see it. Oh, there. There it is. Little white one? Yes, that's it. Cute. That's cute. Ah, there's your house. Well, um, what now? You've been so nice. I hate to ask you, but would you do one more thing for me? Well, I guess I'd do anything for you. Would you ask the people in there if they'd let me come in? Just to, just to look around, sort of. Well, why don't you ask them? I'm afraid to. 
They don't know me. Well, they don't know me either. I, I don't know them. Well, you come right down to it. I don't really know you. I, I don't even know your name. It's Anne. Anne Campbell. That's a pretty name. Anne Campbell. I'm glad you like it. Do you? Oh, and, and that's a pretty house. And I, I, I like all that um, fancy stuff. Makes it look like a valentine. Oh, all that fancy stuff is carved out of wood. Live and learn, right? <laughs> Carpenter's Gothic. That's what they call this kind of house. Well, looks like lace, you know? They used to call it the lace house when I lived here. Anne Campbell of the Lace House. Queen Anne's Lace House. <laughs> You're teasing me. No, no. No, I'm not. You look like a queen to me. A little young queen. Well, are you going to ask the people if I can come in? Yeah, I, I guess so. It's important to me. Well, uh, then I'll do it. Now, uh, you stay right there. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Uh, anybody home? I don't know if there's anybody home. Oh, please try. I is anybody home here? What do you want? Oh, uh, excuse me, ma'am. Um, Who are you? Uh, well, uh, my name's Harry Steers. I, I, I live with Mr. Calvin Bell, the old gentleman that... Now, has... what are you doing here? Uh, 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 it's not for me. I, I got somebody with me. She used to live here. Oh, well, and, plenty uh, of people used to live here. Plenty. Yeah, and she'd like but to... But not uh, for long. To, ...to come in. Yeah. They all move out. If, if you don't mind. And uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, move out. <laughs> She slammed the door in my face. I felt terrible. Anne must have heard the whole thing. I wanted to put my arms around her and hold her and tell her not to mind. We'd come back some other time. But just as I was figuring out what to say and how to say it, I looked at the spot where I'd left her, and she wasn't there. She'd gone. I looked all up and down the dirt road. I asked everybody I could find. Had they seen a young girl? Nobody had. Finally, it was getting dark, and I got on my bike and went home. I went right up to Mr. Bell's room. I knew he'd be lying down. He always did before dinner. I didn't even knock on his door. I went right in. Mr. Bell? Uh, 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 Harry! Excuse me, but I, 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 I gotta tell you what happened today. You passed the examination. Oh, that, yeah, sure. But, uh, uh, Mr. Bell, I fell in love with a girl. Now, uh, uh, don't, don't laugh. It's a fact. Oh, I wouldn't laugh. I picked her up on my bike. She, she wanted to go to Miller's Ridge. Miller's Ridge? Yeah, to visit a house there. She used to live in it. <laughs> It's the prettiest house you ever saw. Uh, they used to call it the Lace House, she said. The Lace House. Yeah. Now, the girl, her name is Anne. Anne? I call her Queen Anne of the Lace House because she reminds me of Queen Anne's Lace, so soft and dainty, and... And, um, and I love her, Mr. Bell. I want to marry her. And I'm going to... It, Mr. Bell? Dinner's about ready, Mr. Bell. Uh, I, I think he fell asleep, Mrs. Peters. I've got the table all set. Oh, my. Oh, my. He, he isn't sleeping, Mr. Steers. He's dead. Times have changed. Not many people stop to pick up strangers on the road anymore. And I've noticed that people seldom strike up conversations with strangers these days, pass the time of day, or exchange pleasantries. For that matter, you hardly ever see people smile at each other anymore, unless they know each other pretty well. Yes, times have changed. And it's sad. I'll be back with Act Three shortly. No 
denying it. Fear has come to pervade our lives. And with fear comes suspicion. With suspicion comes hostility. And when hostility takes over, violence is sure to follow. Until peace and trust are things of the past. Lost to us. As though they had never existed. As though we no longer know what they mean. What they ever were. That really shook me up. Calvin Bell dying like that right when I was telling him about Anne and me being in love with her and wanting to marry her. After we buried him, a lawyer came to the house and read his will. He'd left his house and a bunch of money to Mrs. Peters and something I certainly never expected, quite a few thousand dollars to me. Mrs. Peters said she'd sell the house eventually, but till she did, I could certainly go on living there. And so I did. And I kept on going to the university to learn about wildflowers. And every morning on the way, I looked for Anne. And every afternoon on the way back, sometimes I think I saw her coming toward me out of the mist. Other times I'd look down at that old single track railway and think I saw her standing on the roadbed or sitting on the slope to one side or the other. But I never really saw her. Not even on my way home when there was no mist and I could see everything quite clearly. One day, I took it into my head to go to the lace house at Miller's Ridge. There was a sign in front of the house and it said, For sale. Agent Nicholas Vaughn. I went to see Mr. Vaughn. Yes, sir? Are uh, you Mr. Vaughn? Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Well, I want to see about buying a house in Miller's Ridge. Oh? Any particular house you have in mind? A little white house, uh, Carpenter's Gothic style. Someone told me it used to be called the Lace House. Yeah, I believe it was once called the Lace House. Charming place. Needs a few things done to it, but it certainly... Well, anything it needs, I'll have it done. I... I want it. Well, aren't you curious about the price? Well, I've got a little money. Uh, Calvin Bell left me some money. I'm... Oh, I'm Harry Steers. Oh, yes. Well, the house has been empty for some time now. I want it. It's had quite a few owners. I'd have to inquire about the asking price. I want that house. Uh... Mr. Steers, naturally, I'd be pleased to make the sale. Do you mind telling me why you're so set on buying this particular house? I want it. Well, frankly, Mr. Steers, that house has been, well, sort of a jinx. Everyone's enchanted with the house when they first see it, but once they've moved in, they take a dislike to it. They tell strange tales about strange goings-on. Like what? Oh, sobbing in the night. Restless footsteps on the stairs. Oh, I know, those are the standard complaints when a house has the reputation of being haunted, but everyone who's lived there has said the same thing. I just thought you should know. I want it. Did I know what I was doing? No. I just went ahead and did it. I moved into the house and waited for something to happen. It's true, I did hear very strange noises sometimes. Like slow, heavy footsteps. And a kind of crying sometimes. Low, strangled sobs is what they sounded like. No. 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 But none of these things bothered me. They were a kind of company for me. Because I was lonely. Lonely and waiting. Then, one morning, I was riding my bike to school. And all of a sudden, out of the mist... It's you. It, it is you, isn't it? Hello, Harry. Well, 
It's, it's been almost a year. Almost. But you look just the same. So do you. You know, I, I've been looking for you every morning, every afternoon, too. Well, sometimes I thought I saw you, but I never did, really. I saw you. You did? Why didn't you ever stop me? I don't know. I... I just can't believe, finally, after all this time. I, look, uh, you still want to go to Miller's Ridge? Oh, yes. To the lace house? Yes, yes, I do, I do. Okay, I'll take you. Hop on. Will I be able to go inside? You bet you will. Are you sure? I'm positive. You... You know why? No, tell me. Because it's my house now. Really? You mean it? <laughs> I bought it. Why did you do that? I don't know. I, I thought maybe I'd find you there, I guess. It, nah, nah, that's not it. I, I, I thought I'd find you somewhere, like like here, standing in the mist, and I, I'd take you to the house, and, <laughs> and I'd take you inside and tell you how much I love you, and then uh, we'd get married there. <laughs> you all set? Yes. Off we go into the wherever. Have you got any idea how I felt when I pulled up in front of the lace house, helped her off the bike, and led her up to the front door, took out the key, unlocked and opened it, eyes opened about a mile wide when we stepped into the front hall, and then she started running all over the place, touching everything. You'd think I'd let her into paradise. After a while, I left the house and went over to see Mrs. Peters. I don't know if Anne even knew I was gone. Why, Mr. Steers, and how are you? You're looking splendid, I must say. Well, that's what I am, Mrs. Peters, just splendid. Oh, pardon the mess around here. I, I sold the house, you know. Oh, no, I, I didn't know. Oh, yes. Mr. Vaughn got me a real nice price for it. Oh, but my heavens, cleaning out all that stuff that's accumulated, you've no idea. All that clutter. Well, it wasn't like Mr. Bell to throw anything away. Oh, true, a word was never spoke. Well, now, and you... How are you getting along in your your little lace house? Well, uh, that's what I came over to talk to you about, Mrs. Peters. Oh, now. You're not happy there. What is it? The ghost's been bothering you? Well, not a bit. I always thought that was a lot of talk. M Mrs. Peters, when I bought the lace house, I didn't really know exactly why I was doing it. Mm, got it cheap, that's what I figured. I... I bought it for a, um, for a girl. A girl? Yeah. <laughs> Why, Mr. Steers, I didn't even know you had a girl. Well, I didn't. I, I, I mean, I, I just met her on my way to the university, and then one more time on my way back. That was almost a year ago. She wanted to visit the lace house. She used to live there, so I took her. <laughs> but the woman who lived in it wouldn't let us in. Screamed at us, as a matter of fact. And, and when I went back to speak to Anne, you sort of comfort her, she was gone. But Mrs. Peters, by that time, I was in love with her. I, I mean, in love, really in love. Well, for mercy's sake, tell me about it, my gracious. Oh, she's, she's just... Wonderful, Mrs. Peters, like like um, like a wildflower. Young girl, huh? Yeah, 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 she's young. Family? Oh, I don't know, she didn't say. Uh, never been married before. Oh, no, I, I don't think so. Well, long as she loves you. Well, she didn't exactly say that either. Well, now, don't you think that... Uh, Mrs. Peters, I love her enough for both of us. And and when I talk about the wedding and everything... Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's what I want to talk to you about. The wedding. Oh, oh, I love a wedding. Now, will you come to it? Oh, you just try and keep me away. And if you'd sort of help uh, plan it, you know, mm -hmm. I think Anne would appreciate oh, it. that's her name, huh? Anne. Anne, Anne, Anne Campbell, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, look, we thought, uh, well, I thought we should sort of rehearse it. I mean, isn't that usually what people do? Mm -hmm, I believe so, yeah. We could do that this afternoon, if that's all right with you. Mm -hmm. This is the anniversary of the day I met her for the first time. 
a year ago, September 15th. Yeah. And today, the same day, one year later, I meet her again. <laughs> it just seems, well, appropriate. So is, is it okay with you? Oh, well, I guess so. Yes, it's all right. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Peters. I hope you're doing the right thing. I, I really hope you are. Now, I think the minister should stand here in front of that fireplace. Now, let me pretend I'm the minister for now. Harry, Harry, now you stand on my left. Now, I think that's correct. Right, okay. And, uh, Anne, Anne, w would you like to make an entrance down the stairs? What do you think? Whatever you say. It's such an informal wedding. Uh, maybe if you just come in from the dining room. Now, how would that be? All right. And uh, you walk up to the fireplace and stand just, uh, just to my right. That'll be the minister's right. Y you want to try that, dear? All right. Now, the door from the dining room will be open just as it is now. All right, dear. Now, you come in now. All right. That's it, dear. Now, stand right about there, and then the minister starts to say those beautiful words about being gathered here in the sight of God and so on to unite this man and this woman in holy matrimony. No. 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 I looked up, and so did Mrs. Peters. But Anne was already looking at where the voice was coming from. She was looking at... Yes. At a man. Young. Tall. Handsome. With wavy brown hair. It was Calvin Bell. I knew him from the painting. Calvin Bell, when he was a young man. And he walked over to my little Queen Anne, and she put her hand in his, and they disappeared together. No explaining these things, Harry. Well, you saw them too, didn't you, Mrs. Peters? Oh, yes. Nobody would believe me if I told them, so I'm not going to try. It'll be between you and me, Harry. Yeah, that's the best way, I think. I, uh, I brought you something I found in the attic. It's a newspaper clipping. I'm going to read it to you, and you can make up your own mind. It says, the morning train to Miller's Ridge was derailed yesterday due to mechanical failure. Many of the passengers were injured, but none fatally, with the exception of Miss Anne Campbell, who was returning to Miller's Ridge in order to marry Mr. Calvin Bell. The date on the newspaper, Harry, is September 15. 1912. I put the house up for sale. I'm back in the Bronx now teaching botany in one of the high schools. I haven't had even one offer for the lace house. People think it's haunted. And I guess they're right. I shall make no statement about haunted houses, either for or against. Though there are those who claim they have lived with ghosts and even taken their pictures. But if the lace house is haunted by the ghosts of Anne Campbell and Calvin Bell, why, then it must be a very happy place indeed. I'll be back shortly. I have never once heard of a ghost harming anyone. Never. Which is more than I can say for so-called real people. One of these days, someone is going to buy the lace house. And if he is of a calm and equable temperament, he may find it a most pleasant place to live. 
And he'll never lack for company, either. Our cast included Russell Horton, Jada Rowland, Carol Titel, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Marshall. Welcome to the halls of mystery, the corridors of terror where the impossible becomes the probable and the unexpected becomes the accepted. Because in this exciting theater of the mind, the things you don't see but imagine are far more terrifying than anything we might show you. Oh, you'll hear strange things and these will conjure pictures that only you can produce. For starters, let's listen in on a phone conversation between electronics engineer Roy Watson and his boss, Andy Carter. Hello, Roy. I know it's 10 o'clock at night, but I've got something strange over here at the lab. Can you come right over? Well, sure, Andy. Well, what's up? It's something on the L-43 tape recorder. The one I brought home the other night? Yeah, and while you were using it, it picked up those sounds you've been telling me about. Well, the mice? I don't know what you've got in those walls of yours, but they're sure not mice. I want you to get over here and listen to them. Our mystery drama, Sagamore Cottage, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Bob Caliban and Carmen Matthews. Large houses have large shadows and large secrets. Far out on Long Island, New York, sits a large house with very large shadows. The Sagamore Estate, once the showplace of the island. The estate still stands, but the happy days have died with the generations. To make ends meet in maintaining the estate, Miss Eleanor Sagamore, the last remaining family member, rents out a small cottage, the caretaker's cottage in better days. And it's to this cottage and this foreboding estate that young Roy and Peggy Watson are now traveling. Two destinies are fast approaching each other, and what will happen, only time can tell. Well, we ought to be within sight of it soon. The real estate agent said it was only ten miles. Roy, did you think he acted funny? About our renting the cottage? Yes. Well, frankly, I did. He insisted there were better and more attractive places, but not for the price. We don't have to take it. Oh, there, up ahead. That must be it. Oh, it has to be it. From the description we got, we'll be there in a minute. I... I don't see any cottage yet. It must be behind the house. Yeah, it probably is. The gatehouses were near the front of the estates. The caretakers live back in the gardens. Hmm, it's been some time since anyone cared for these grounds. Well, I imagine the old girl has little enough to live on without expensive gardeners. Oh, the house doesn't look too bad. But I'm sure it's nothing like it was. Huh? Let's go. She must have seen us arriving. It's so still. 
How does she stand it all alone? That's her problem. Come on. You didn't have to ring. I saw you. Uh, Miss Sagamore, we're the people about renting the cottage. I know it. Who else would be coming up to Sagamore? Well, uh, can we see it? You'll have to see Miss Sagamore first. She must decide if you're right for it. Well, then you're not... To... I'm Margareta. Uh, show them in, Margareta. Don't stand there crabbing. You heard her. Come in. I'm Miss Sagamore. How do you do? That will be all, Margareta. Yes, Miss Sagamore. Oh, shall we retire to the library? Actually, I could answer the door faster than Margareta, but she's been here so long I couldn't hurt her feelings. <laughs> I have to allow her the chores. I understand. It's nice of you. We arrived at Sagamore the very same day. She came to work as a housemaid the day I was born. But you're interested in the cottage, not in us? Well, uh, we would like to see it. Please sit down. What brings you to the island, Mr. Watson, is it? Yes. I'm uh, starting a new job out here with Crown Electronics. Oh, that ghastly building two miles down. I've heard they do evil things in there. No, no, it's, a, it's an electronics research firm. Ray guns and weapons. Uh, not quite. Uh, we're experimenting with a new transistor. I've been hired to head a team. It's my specialty. I know nothing about it except it's evil. But I won't hold it against you. I like you both. You know, Mrs. Watson, you strongly resemble Marie Antoinette. Has anyone ever told you that? Oh, we know. A striking resemblance. Turn your head a little to the side. Oh, well... Yes, I... even the profile. Uh, uh, perhaps we could see the cottage? Oh, of course. I get carried away sometimes. <laughs> That's all right. I knew I married a queen. It's quite remarkable. Quite. What do you think? It's absolutely charming. Oh, suits me fine. <laughs> then you'll take it. I'm so glad. The rent's only 200 a month. That's the best part about it. <laughs> we hope to have our own place by next summer, but living here will be a delight. It has a lot of character. Well, then let's go back to the main house, and I'll give you a receipt for the first month's rent. I don't ask for a lease or anything like that. You, you look like reliable people. Thank you. And desirable people. Very desirable. Even the china's expensive, Roy. Limoges yet. In a rental cottage. First class all the way. <laughs> Look, uh, you get settled in. I'm uh, going to run over to the labs and let Andy know I've arrived. Okay. The place is so clean, there's not much to do. I'll see you later, my queen. Roy, uh, she gave me the creeps when she told me I looked like Marie Antoinette. Why? I thought it was a compliment. Well, probably was, but the way she looked at me... Scrutinized is the word. I felt so uncomfortable. Forget it. She probably won't mention it again. Roy, I didn't expect you till Monday. When would you get in town? Yesterday. We wanted to get settled first, so we drove in and got us a place to stay. Great. But you don't have to be on the job till Monday. Oh, I thought I'd take a couple of days to look around. Get familiar with the plan ahead of time. I like that kind of attitude. I think we're going to work well together. Well, that's why I took the job. Come on this way. I'll show you your office. Uh, where are you staying? You find an apartment in town? Oh, better than that. We took the cottage on the Sagamore estate, two miles down the road. Oh, the Sagamore place with that wacky old dame? Oh, she seemed okay to us. Peg loves the place. Uh, you wish you weren't renting there. Why? Because Miss Sagamore's different? The last two tenants in that cottage, first an elderly man and then after him a young widow, disappeared. Disappeared? They apparently left and never came back. Nobody bothered about the old man, but when the young widow disappeared, her folks came looking for her. They were frantic. And she was never found? I don't know. Never heard any more about it. That was three or four months ago. They passed her picture out all over the place, hoping someone had seen her. But surely they... Didn't think Miss Sagamore... Oh, no. She seemed as surprised as anyone else that they'd left. In fact, I, I still have one of the pictures here. Kept it just in case there was a way to help those people. Oh. 
Attractive, isn't she? Yeah, just 26. Sort of looks like Marilyn Monroe in a way. A little darker, though. I still wish you'd move out of there. <laughs> you find me two bedrooms, carpeting, fireplace, and utilities for 200 a month, and I will. Well, you win. But watch your step. I don't know what it is about that place, but I don't want to lose a good assistant. <laughs> May I come up? Oh, oh, Miss Sagamore, of course. Well, I just stopped by to see if everything's all right. Just perfect. It's beautiful. Yes, it is a charming cottage. And it's so nice to have someone in it again. It's been vacant for several months. Oh, I can't imagine why. It's so lovely. <laughs> oh, people around here have strange ideas. Oh, I, I did want to mention, Mrs. Watson, not to let Margareta bother you. Sometimes she says and does things that... Oh, well, she's she's getting on in years. I understand. Oh, and by the way, should you hear music from the main house tonight, it's just a little party I'm having. I do hope you won't feel offended that I haven't invited you. It's just some very close friends. Oh, of course I won't. We've only just met. I, I wouldn't expect... I do love my little parties. I'll have you and Mr. Watson over soon. Oh, that's very kind, but I expect he'll be working late a lot with the new job and all. Oh, of course. Well... There's lots of time. I must get back. I don't like to leave Margareta alone too long. Thanks for coming by. Oh, Mr. Watson's coming up the drive. Oh, he's home sooner than I expected. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you both, my dear. My Mary Antoinette. I hope you'll stay a long, long time. Certainly. Till we get a place of our own. Hi, honey. Hi, Roy. Well, I'll leave you two to each other. Good day, Mrs. Watson. Oh, Hi, Miss Sagamore. Good day, Mr. Watson. You're back early. Oh, not really. Andy and I went over the plant, and I'll go back early tomorrow. Yeah. What did Miss Sagamore want? Oh, just to see if everything was all right. Oh. What's the matter? Nothing. Why? You look... Well, a, a cloud passed over your face. Oh, just <laughs> thinking about the new job, I guess. Uh, come on. Let's go out for dinner. You should eat your potatoes. I'm not hungry. You know, I never eat very much before a party. I don't know why you insist on filling my plate with a lot of food I won't eat. Mm. It's not the party. It's them, isn't it? Yes. Do you think it's wise so soon? I don't care. I must. Mm. Well, do you want me to begin? You can start the preparations. But I want to think a little more about him. Oh, I'm bushed. I'm not even going to watch the news. That well, sounds as though things are in full swing at the main house. You said she was having a party, huh? Mm-hmm. Some close friends. She apologized for not inviting us. That's funny. I didn't see any cars parked out there. I'll get the light. I wonder why she has a party on the second floor. Looks like there's dancing going on behind the curtains. With a house that size, she's probably got ten living rooms. Unzip, please, huh? I want to get an early start at the plant tomorrow. I still wonder why there weren't any cars out front. What? If Miss Sagamore's having a party, well, wouldn't there be cars? Well, you'd think so, but oh, who knows. Maybe they all came in one car, parked in the garage. <laughs> I'm too tired to care. Maybe I'll take the train into New York City next week. I'm dying to see Fifth Avenue. Oh, you'll love it. You ready for the light out? I was ready an hour ago. Listen. You're lucky I'm not afraid of mice. Sounds like we have a visitor. See it? It's behind her. In the wall. Oh, I guess the fields are full of them. Oh, if he's not bothering you, he won't bother me. They're kind of cute anyway. Uh, okay. Night, honey. Night. <sighs> Persistent little character. Mm. It seems that Sagamore Cottage has more than Peggy and Roy Watson for tenants. But then, as Peggy said, field mice are kind of cute. They're really not undesirable, and they generally mind their own business. 
So Roy and Peggy really have nothing to worry about with a field mouse in the walls. That is, if it is only a field mouse. We'll return to Sagamore Cottage shortly with Act Two. Skittering in the walls of your bedroom is not exactly conducive to sleep. And for Peggy and Roy Watson, it was a restless night. The rustling in the bedroom wall stopped after a while, but the next day at Roy's office... Morning, Roy. Hey, why the long face? Oh, not much sleep last night. Oh? Mice kept us awake half the night. Mice! <laughs> in the walls, rustling and squeaking. Yeah, I told you you shouldn't have rented that place. And Peg's going in to get some traps when she goes shopping. A cat's better, if they're field mice. And they probably are. They can grab that bait without setting off the trap. They don't weigh half an ounce, you know. But a cat, now he'll take care of them. Yeah, maybe you got a point. I'll talk to Peg about it tonight. Feel like starting on that transistor scheme today? Sure. Fine. I'll have Jim McDonald set you up. And say, you might check with him about a cat. His house usually has a litter or two. His wife has a soft heart for strays. <laughs> okay, I'll get me a cat. Oh, isn't he sweet? Hey, Jim said he's almost a year. Just right for mousing. <laughs> well, the traps didn't catch anything in two days. Well, maybe just having the cat around will scare the mice off. Oh, you're beautiful. I'm going to call you Tiger because you're such a ferocious looking fellow. I love you already. There, down you go. And scare some mice. You want some help with dinner? Nope. Everything's ready. Mix us a cocktail. Oh, what's the matter, Tiger? Oh, he's backing away from something, but why? Oh, great. Our first cat, and he's afraid of mice. Oh, come here, Tiger. What's the matter? Oh, he seems to be calming down a little. Something frightened him. Well, he's supposed to do the frightening. <laughs> the sounds haven't been too bad for the past couple of nights, though. You, you seen anything of Miss Sagamore? Oh, she dropped by this afternoon with some flowers. Pathetic little violet. She said she grew herself. I, I think they're growing wild all around the property. She talks too much, but she's really very pleasant. That housekeeper gives me the willies, though. I don't know how she stands her. <laughs> for your tea, Miss Sagamore. Oh, I don't want it, Margaretta. That doesn't matter. It's time. Oh, if things are to work, they must be done exactly. It's always been that way, you know it. But I still can't see what my tea time has to do with it. It has always worked. Don't question it. The violets are in the house. Yes. She didn't seem surprised or anything. No reason to be surprised over a few violets. Is it ready yet? Almost. I can hardly wait. You know, they all take time. And some are slower than others. Uh, drink your tea. And I want you to stay in bed tomorrow. But I was going... You'll stay in bed tomorrow. <sighs> yes, Margareta. I'll stay in bed. Strange. I was sure I closed the house door behind me when I left. Oh, hello, Tiger. Hey, you didn't open the door, did you? Well, it's a good thing I came back for the tape measure. I'll be sure to lock it this time. Oh, oh, oh Margareta. Oh, Mrs. Watson. Well, what are you doing here? Well, I, I just came to see if everything was all right, if you needed anything. I am the housekeeper. I keep my own house, thank you. I don't mean to be rude, but I, I don't want you or Miss Sagamore coming in here when we're not home. Oh, I, I'm sorry if I've upset you, Mrs. Watson. Good morning. Goodbye. If there is a way I can be of service, please call. That chance. <laughs> don't like that woman. The sooner things start working, the better. It can't be too soon to suit me. I wish she hadn't surprised me in the cottage. It's just liable to make her too suspicious. Are 
I suppose I was rude, but I didn't like her snooping. And I'm sure that's what it was, snooping. You want me to speak to Miss Sagamore? Oh, no, I, I don't think we'll have any more trouble with Margareta. I let her know how I felt. What's the matter, dear? Do you notice a funny odor? No, not really. Sort of like uh, seaweed. Well, a little, now that you've got me thinking about it. But this is Long Island. Nothing but salt air and seaweed. Yeah, I suppose. I just hadn't noticed it before. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. <gasps> Good grief, my ring. <laughs> I've heard of throwing your weight around, but not your rings. That, oh, that's never happened before. My engagement and my wedding ring, both. They just slipped off when I reached for the glass. Here they are. Oh, but they're usually too snug. Roy, look how, how they slide on my finger. I don't understand it all of a sudden. Beats me. Well, I, I don't see how they could get larger just like that. You'll have to have a jeweler put those doohickeys on them to make them smaller. Well, I'd better keep them off for now. I'll lose them if I try to wear them like this. I have some work to do tonight. I thought it'd be easier to do it here. Uh-oh. There they go again. Oh, I've given up on Tiger. We're just going to have to live with those noises. Here. Look at this. Looks like a watch. No, a tape recorder. You're kidding. That small? Oh, this is nothing to what we expect to do. Someday a recorder smaller than a diamond in that ring of yours. This one actually works. Microphone, tape, speaker. All in this little case. No bigger than a pocket watch. Fascinating. But you have to work. I better get dinner. I'll have my second drink in the kitchen. Oh. Well, honey, take it easy. I'm all right. My right shoe just slipped off when I stood up. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Watson. I hope you don't mind a visit. Oh, no, of course not. I want to apologize for Margareta being here yesterday. As I told you, she's getting on in years, and sometimes, well, <laughs> she's set in her ways. Always has to have someone or something to care for. Well, I'm sorry if I was rude to her, but I, I didn't like her being in the house that way. How are you feeling? Feeling? <gasps> Fine. Why? You're looking a little thinner. You notice? Well, I'm afraid so, but, uh... Oh, then it's probably just the change, the adjustment to a new life. I, um... Uh, I have found that my clothes, uh... My, my rings are looser. Well, that's not so bad. Overweight can be a problem. But I, I was never... Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm, uh, I'm having another party next Saturday night. The last one didn't disturb you, did it? Oh, no. Good. One of these days, you and Mr. Watson must come to the ballroom. You particularly. I know you'll find it enchanting someday. You'll see. Yes, th that's very nice of you. <laughs> well, I must go. Margareta gets nervous when I'm out of her sight for too long. Good day, Mrs. Watson. Well, let's face it, Peg. We've both got to see a doctor. This weight loss isn't natural. I know. I'm feeling weaker, too. My suits are all a size too big. We've been losing weight. Now, Andy wants us to see the company doctor. He says she's great, and we don't know any other. She? Yeah, a lady doctor. She has a private practice in town, but she treats all the company employees. Well, all right. Well, maybe we'd better. Maybe it's a virus or something. I mean, for both of us to be this way... Every test is negative, Mr. Watson. No anemia, no tumors, no blood infection, no problem in the digestive tract. Nothing that would produce such a weight loss in you and Mrs. Watson. Well, it's encouraging, Doctor, to know we're healthy, but we are getting thinner. Yes, well, the only thing I can suggest is going into the hospital for extended observation. Oh, no. I can't do that. Well, Andy will give you the time off if I feel it's necessary. I don't see what more you can do. You've made all the tests, and there's nothing wrong. Oh, there is something wrong, but we have to search further than the lab tests and x-rays. There seems to be no pathological cause for your condition. Well, I don't want to go into the hospital now. We'll wait a while. If we keep losing, well, then we may think differently, but it's probably just fatigue. Roy starting a new job and, and the change for me. Mm-hmm. That's possible, but look, if the condition persists, 
I urge you to do it my way. Oh, I get it. Hello? Hello, Roy. I know it's 10 o'clock at night, but I've got something strange over here at the lab. Can you come over? Oh, sure. What's up? It's on that tape in the L-43 tape recorder. Well, the one I brought home the other night? Yeah. I don't know what you've got in those walls of yours, but they sure aren't mice. I want you to get over here and listen to them. Hi, Peg. I hope you don't mind my tagging along, Andy. I'm curious, too. Not at all. Let's go in the lab. What's the sound, Andy? I was testing the L-43 and discovered you must have had it going while you had it home. Yeah, I was showing it to Peg. Well, whether you knew it or not, you were taping the sounds in your walls. They came in very distinctly. But when I played it back at half speed, it it seemed to talk. What? Well, here, listen. Now, this is the sound at normal speed. Now, at half. human voice. I don't know if it's human, but it is a voice saying something. We can't slow the L-43 anymore, but if we re-record and slow the master tape further, we might understand it. But what can it be? There, there's no one behind the wall, unless they're ghosts. Or coincidence. It, variable speeds on tape recorders can produce curious sounds. I'd like to do some more taping in the cottage, Roy, with more refined equipment. Well, I have no objections. Well, how about tomorrow night? The sounds get going at nighttime, don't they? Usually. I'll bring over the M2400 model. It's the most sensitive recorder we've got. Okay. Well, there's uh, no harm in experimenting. If you two insist, then come for dinner, Andy. You can have your fun over brandy. I hope Andy likes Sauerbraten. I guess I should have asked. I think he'll eat anything as long as it's home-cooked and not his usual bachelor fare. Well, there you are, Tiger. Your dinner's in the corner. Oh, his highness finally showed up, huh? Well, he's not wet. He must have been in the bedroom. Look. Wait, he's got something in his mouth. Oh, I'll bet he finally caught one of the... Oh, what would he catch? Well, let's see. What you got, Tiger? Hmm? Come on, drop it. No. What, what is it? Well, Tiger, that's no way to act. It's nothing but a hunk of straw. Oh, well, there's your seaweed smell. Well, let's see. It's a little straw dog. Oh. I wonder where he found it. Well, he seems to like it. It's his toy. Look at him play with it. <laughs> well, I, I've got to look at the potatoes. Oh, there, there's Andy. I'll get it. Hi, Roy. Not too early, I hope. No, never. Come on in. Yeah, where can I put this tape machine? Uh, over here on the table. We'll, uh, set it up after dinner. Oh, things have been quiet tonight. Hi, Andy. The cook will be with you for cocktails in a minute. Take your time. Charming little place here, all right. Uh, what's going on up at the main house? Oh, another of, uh, Miss Sagamore's parties, probably. Hmm, I thought I heard music up there. Fix the drinks, Roy. I'll be right in. Yeah, Andy? Mmm, scotch is fine. Something wrong? Just an odor. I smelled somewhere before. Oh, yeah. That's Peg's sauerbraten. No, no, it's not that. <laughs> what is it, Andy? Well, you must have noticed it. Well, that damp seaweed smell. Yeah, yeah, we have it all the time. Well, we've gotten used to it. You can't live near the beach without sea smell. Andy, what's the matter, for heaven's sake? That's not seaweed. It, it's straw. An unmistakable odor. And there's only one thing that smells like that. Just exactly like that. What? The straw in a voodoo doll. Things at Sagamore Cottage seem stranger all the time. Noises in the walls. The Watson's weight problem. And now, voodoo? In the 1970s on Long Island? Well, they tell me it's not limited to Haiti. But is it really a voodoo doll or just something the cat dragged in? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three.
Good rentals are hard to come by these days. To get a delightful cottage on Long Island with wall-to-wall carpeting, fireplace, utilities, two bedrooms furnished, and all for $200 a month? Well, you've got to expect some drawbacks, like noises in the walls and perhaps voodoo dolls the cat brings in. Are you serious, Andy? I had some experience with them when I was on college field training in the West Indies. And there's no smell quite like the straw of a voodoo doll. It, it's quite unmistakable. But voodoo here? Oh, good Lord. That thing Tiger brought in. It was a hunk of straw. It's shaped like a little doll. What? Well, the, the cat had a straw thing in here earlier. We didn't think anything about it. Where is it? Well, Tiger was playing with it like a toy. It, it must be around here someplace. Well, forget dinner for the moment, please. I must see that thing. Well, I'll see if Tiger's in the bedroom. Uh, he brought it into the kitchen first. Let, let, let's try there, Andy. Uh, you may think I'm making too much of this. Well, I, but... I don't know what to think, but you don't expect me to believe Miss Sagamore and that weirdo maid of hers are bewitching us. Look, I smell something I don't like. You describe a straw doll the cat found. Now, that's a hex. No matter who's pulling it off. Somehow, I just can't take this seriously. Well, Tiger's in the bedroom sleeping, but I can't find that thing. I, I don't know what he did with it. You say it's not doing you any harm, Roy. What about your weight loss? What? Just a... Uh... Tension and fatigue. Dr. Mason didn't think so. She wanted more tests. You're suggesting our weight loss is due to a hex? I suggest you both get out of this cottage as fast as you can. Now, forget the recording we were going to do. Forget looking for the straw thing. Pack up and get out tonight. Roy, I'm frightened. And you better be. I told you about the others, Roy. What others? I never told her. An older man who lived here before, and then a young girl after him. Both disappeared, never a trace. Roy, is that true? All I know is what Andy tells me. It's true. How or where they disappear to, no one knows. But there's something unholy here. And I want you two out of it. Roy, that that odor we we thought was seaweed, we first noticed it the day after I surprised Margaretta in the cottage. What, do, do you think... She was planting the doll here? Mm, it could be. It's been hidden in here all the time, until Tiger found it. Okay, okay, let's not lose our scientific heads. I wouldn't wait, Roy. Just leave. You're paid in advance. Take my apartment. I'll bunk in with Jim McDonald. Okay, Andy. Uh, we'll get out, but one more night's not going to make any difference. Okay, that's up to you. But you'll leave in the morning? I'll tell Miss Sagamore. First thing. What a heavenly morning. It makes last night seem like a nightmare. Yeah, I'll go up and tell Miss Sagamore we're leaving. I'll come. You don't have to. You're not leaving me alone. Well, it's too bad we couldn't get any more tapings last night. Not a sound in the walls. Frankly, I don't care. I'm sorry to leave this charming cottage. We won't find another one as pretty, but I hope we don't find another one as sinister. Oh, come on, Peg. I don't think there's anything sinister here. I really don't understand Andy for a scientist like him to go ape over what he thinks might be voodoo. That is what frightens me. Andy's a reasonable, logical man, and he's concerned. He's no superstitious kook. Well, we'll have done with it. Goodbye, Miss Sagamore. I looked all over for that straw thing this morning. I, I, I couldn't find it. Oh, Tiger probably took it out in the rain and it's gone. I can't believe neither of them aren't home. I'll try the door. It's not locked. Miss Sagamore? Hello? Still is a tomb. Miss Sagamore? Should we go in? Oh, no, no reason to. I'll, I'll leave a note in the cottage. Well, they're evidently not here. But I would love to see upstairs before we go. Now who's snooping? You're right. Take a peek, huh? Yeah, okay. Maybe they're upstairs and didn't hear us. Yeah, I still think we should leave a note. Miss Sagamore! This place is like a museum. Oh, I can't imagine living here. How does she stand it? Ah, I guess in its day it was fantastic. Now it's just old and dingy. Let's go upstairs. I've just got to see that ballroom. <laughs> Roy! What a room. Oh, well, there must be hundreds of them. Is this where she holds her parties? I, I don't see how she'd dare with all this china. Hundreds and hundreds of figurines. But 
We saw people dancing. There's shadows on the curtains. Well, maybe this isn't the same room. It has to be. Oh, look. On the table by the window. The clowns? Pierrot and Pierrette from the old Italian Commedia dell'arte. The figures are so lifelike. So small. Oh, I wouldn't touch it if I were you. Oh, it's a music box. They dance. Those must have been the shadows we saw against the curtains. These are Miss Sagamore's party guests? Oh, she's an old woman lost in her memories and souvenirs. I, uh... I, I think we ought to get going. These things are all so beautiful. Oh, this table seems to be all fairy tale characters. And over there, a complete English drawing room. Well, look, even Bo Peep's sheep look real. Except for the size. Oh, I'm going to take a chance and hold Bo Peep. Oh, it's just perfect. But no name. Usually the designer's mark is on the bottom. But such perfect features. <laughs> she sort of looks like Marilyn Monroe, only darker. What? What's the matter? You've gone white as a sheet. Let me see that. Well, be careful with it. It can't be. Oh, Roy, what is it, for heaven's sake? When Andy told me about the girl who had the cottage before us, the, the one who disappeared, he showed me a picture her parents had sent around. C come on. We've got to get out of here fast. And I mean fast. <laughs> hurry. Just hurry. Don't pack. Just get the stuff out of the car as fast as you can. I'm hurrying. Oh, get out of the way, Tiger. Oh, my. What is it? In the drawer. Another doll. Don't touch it. It wouldn't matter. The spell is cast. Oh. How did you get in here? There is no escape. Boy, what's happening? There is no escape. I'm dreaming. I, I'm in the middle of a nightmare. It's too much listening to Andy. It is nightmarish. I tried so hard to warn you. Who... Who are you? George Dobert's the name. I've been hiding from them for more than a year. You mean... You... Are... I was one of the former tenants, yes. I don't believe any of this. Very well. Look out there, then. There, through the opening in the baseboard. Good Lord. That's the bedroom. A hundred times as big. Now you believe me. I tried to warn you. I tried to warn that young girl a few months ago. But neither of you could understand my squeaks. That was you we heard in the walls? Yes. Peggy. Where is Peggy? Margaretta got her before the cat did. That's all they wanted. I don't think they're interested in you. Yet. I've got to find her. Help her. Oh, that's impossible. Don't dare venture out. I'm not staying here if Peggy's in danger. Roy! Peggy! It's Andy. Andy, help us! Roy! Where are you two? Andy! In here! Behind the baseboard! You've got to help us! You've got to find Peggy! Find Peggy! It's no use, you know. All he can hear are your little squeaks. Little mouse squeaks. Just like you heard from me. I'm going out there. No, no. If you value your life. You... My life? Don't be funny. I've got to get to Peggy somehow. I'm not staying here if Peggy's in danger. Don't 
You can't help her. I'll show you how to live in here, how to get food, how to avoid them. Not a chance. I'm going after Peg. Stop, Mr. Watson. Don't go out there. I'm going to find my wife. I don't care about anything else. Come back, please. I tried to warn you. Yes? Miss Sagamore. Oh, you're from the weapons factory. I remember you. Oh, forget about our past differences. I want to know what happened to the Watsons. What happened? What do you... Don't mi- play games, Miss Sagamore. I was there in the cottage last night. I know about the voodoo doll. And now they're gone. Gone? I warned them to get out, but all their things are still in the cottage. They didn't leave of their own accord. Well, I'm sure I don't know. I, I don't keep track of my tenants coming and going. <laughs> okay, Miss Sagamore. Have it your way. But you haven't heard the end of this. They were friends of mine. And I'm following this one up. You should have let me handle him. <sighs> Perhaps I will. He was always a bother. And now it appears he's becoming troublesome. Besides, I do need a taller Louis the Fourteenth for my Marie. <laughs> Is she ready? Mm. Here. <gasps> Margareta, she's perfect. One of your best to date. Mm. I'm pleased with it myself. The glaze is particularly good, I think. Her, Margareta. Her. Not it. (laughs) My Marie Antoinette. My beautiful Marie Antoinette. Ah, your court is waiting, my dear. Over here, by the window. And soon, we'll have a nice, tall, handsome Louis the Fourteenth for you. Well, at least this Marie Antoinette won't lose her head. Unless, of course, she happens to fall to the floor. Which seems unlikely under Miss Sagamore's watchful eye and loving care. Her figurine collection is her life. I suppose for Peggy Watson, it was her fate. She ended as she did for two reasons, really. The first, she was the spitting image of Marie Antoinette. The second, she made the mistake of renting Sagamore Cottage. I'll be back shortly. our tale. Except for one thing that bothers me a little. Tiger. Now that Roy and Peggy won't be around to care for him, he's going to find it tough going. I do hope someone remembers to feed him, poor kitten. He hasn't had a thing since Roy. Our cast included Bob Caliban, Carmen Matthews, Janet Waldo, Bryna Rayburn, and Robert Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. This time, a mystery... A puzzle, if you will, which I challenge you to solve. As with all mysteries worthy of the name, 
Each clue will be honestly and plainly presented to you. And yet, unless I miss my guess, the answer to the puzzle will elude you till the very end. We'll play a game of wits, you and I, just for the fun of it, and see who wins. Unhappily, one of the characters you'll meet lost. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Sting of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars William Prince. My first move is to describe the huge barn-like living room of the country home of Trevor Costain. Explorer, adventurer, author. And the living room reflects the trophies of his travels. On the north wall, headdresses of native tribal chiefs from all over the world. The south wall is covered with awards, trophies. The west wall is hung with native spears, shields, primitive weapons. And on the east wall, above the huge fireplace, hangs a clock. A most bizarre clock. The face is made of a Tugari war shield. Headhunters, you know, the Tugari. The hands of the clock are made of, uh, well, human thigh bones. And the hours, from one to twelve, are marked by shrunken human heads. Well, don't look so horrified. I told you the Tugari were headhunters. And when I told you that, I gave you your first important clue. See what you can do with it. Liz, give me another drink. Trevor, the doctor... I know, I know, but if I'm going to die, I'm going to die happy. Dad, the disease, you know what alcohol does to you because of it? I'm in enough pain, Furry. Stop calling me Dad. He is your son-in-law, Father. Don't remind me, Jackie. Liz, that drink, please. Some son-in-law, some husband, an alcoholic who's put you through purgatory since the day you married him. That's ended now. I haven't had a drink since I joined AA five weeks ago. I wish I could believe that. You can. Oh, Fari, here's your drink, Trevor. Thanks. Oh, Father, you're not going to smoke, too. Did I say I was going to smoke? Well, every time you pick up one of your pipes... Oh, don't I'm... worry, Jackie. Whatever disease hit me in Borneo years ago... Just a whiff of tobacco sickens me. Give my right arm to be able to smoke these pipes again, but all I can do is polish them, clean them, puff on them, never light them. It's a terrible way to live. I'll be glad when I'm dead. Oh, don't say that, Trevor. You sound as if you'll be sorry when I'm gone, Liz. I will be. Why lie to me, Liz? Our marriage has been... Anything but a happy one. We put each other through the ringer the way our long-haired son-in-law put Jackie through one. Different kind of ringer, that's all. Oh, that's over now. Everything's over. For me. <clears throat> oh, Father, please don't get up if you want anything. Got to get up and ease the pain. Just want to get those pipe cleaners on the mantle and... <clears throat> oh, blast. You dropped your drink. All over me, I'm afraid. Sorry, Spasm of pain. I'll make you another. Uh, I'll have to change these pants. Father, sit down. I'll get the pipe cleaners. <sighs> oh, I can't do a thing for myself anymore. Not a thing. <sighs> Jackie, what about the divorce? Well, I've given for it. Here, here are the pipe cleaners. Mm -hmm. I've given for it another chance. Wasted time. You know that. It's probably hopeless, but in common decency, I can't let him down. He depends on me, Father. A weakling. He's a weakling. Well, some men are. Not Rod Champion. He was a man for you. I told you that. Your drink. Thanks. Rod will be here tomorrow, Jackie. Going to spend a few days helping me straighten out my affairs. Why don't you and he try to get together... See if you can still hit it off. Father. He's the... What the devil? 
what? The clock. That headhunter clock over the fireplace. Look at it. That's strange. One of those awful shrunken heads is missing. The one that marked the hour of seven. Oh, Father, what happened to I it? I don't know. I just noticed it was missing this minute. Look around. See if it's on the floor. Oh, if it is, I'd just as soon... Look not... around, I said. I can't. All right, dear. All right. Jackie, you look and see if... <gasps> Oh, that was Fari. Something's happened. Good heavens, what could... I don't know. I do... look, look at this. Look at this. Look. The head off the clock. Oh. oh. What are you doing with it? It was on the pillow of my bed. Your pillow? It was just lying there, smack in the middle of the pillow. Fari, this some kind of gag? Did you take it off the clock? Oh, why would I do a thing like that? I don't know. But then I don't know why you've done a lot of things you've done. Dad, I tell you, I... All right, all right. We'll put it back on the clock. The hour of seven. Yeah. Sure. Somebody's playing games. Somebody with a sick sense of humor. And I... Oh. Oh! Sorry, what? Uh, Father! Catch him, he's... Uh, oh, 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 sorry! Get away, Jackie. L let me see. Is he... Is he... Dead? Yes. Drum clock in the hall. It's seven o'clock. The shrunken head. The hour of seven. Fari found it in his room. On his pillow. And now he's dead. What does it mean? What? Yes? Well, this is Trevor Castain. Uh, I see. Oh, uh, yes. Well, I want to be informed the minute you find out. Fine. Goodbye. Who is that? At the coroner's office. I've been bugging them all through the night to tell me what killed that husband of yours. And? We just wanted to let me know they're starting the autopsy now. Oh. Jackie... Yes, Father. We've never pulled any punches with each other, you and me, so don't let's pull any now. You really sorry for he's dead? What a thing to ask. What's the answer? I... I don't know. <laughs> Marriage to Fari was purgatory, as you said last night, but he... He was starting a new life, joining AA, and... Oh, it isn't fair somehow. Not to him, maybe. But it's very fair to you. What do you mean? You can do what you should have done in the first place. You can marry Roger. Oh, Father. You're taking an awful lot for granted. You love him, don't you? Yes, I... I guess I do, but... No buts about it. When Roger gets here... Hey. Sounds like he's here. Come on. Let's meet him at the door. Are you strong enough to walk? Sure, sure. Having a good day. Come on. Can't wait to see him. Best safari manager I ever had. <laughs> Never took any guff from me either. <laughs> Didn't have to. He's a fine man, Jackie. Fine man. <clears throat> hey, Trevor. Jackie. Good to see you. Rod, you old son of a gun. I can't tell you how good it is to see Who's this? Trevor? Jackie? Meet Virginia. My wife. <laughs> You've no idea. No idea at all what killed for it? Well, they're doing the autopsy now, Raj. Uh, coroner, uh, Dr. Dodd is a friend of mine. You'll let me know what they come up with as soon as they know. Help yourself to a drink, Raj. Oh, thanks. You? No, no, almost lunchtime. I have to limit myself. Can't even smoke. And with three months or less to live. Hell of a way to go out. Oh, hand me those pipe cleaners, will you? Yeah, here you are. <laughs> At least you get some satisfaction from fooling around with these old pipes of yours. Yes. Kind of makes that smoking a little easier. You know, Raj, 
You shocked me when you arrived with a wife. How come? I had plans for you and Jackie. I was in love with Jackie, yes, but when she married Forey, well, that was that. Ginny's a, a wonderful girl, and she'll be a wonderful wife. Oh, I'm sure. Speaking of Jackie and Virginia, they ought to be back from their walk soon. It's almost... Now, what in blazes? What is it? The clock. Look at the clock. A head's missing. From 12. Now, what does this mean? Well, probably nothing at all. It probably just fell off. It didn't just fall off. And don't bother looking for it on the floor. Someone took that head off the clock, Raj. And unless I miss my guess, it means someone else is going to die. Oh, I can't believe that there's any significance. Oh, Father. Roger. Is something wrong? Jackie, your mother's still asleep in her room, worn out after last night. Better get her down here. Well, why? What, what's happened? A head is missing from the clock again, this time from the hour of twelve. Oh, no. Oh. If it means another death... Well, never mind. Wake your mother up and tell her to come down here. We're... Liz, stay here. All of you, I'll handle this. Father, when did you discover this head missing? Just now. Seconds before you and Virginia came back from your walk. But Father, you don't think it means... You, it can't mean another... I'm afraid it could. Uh, easy, easy, Elizabeth. Oh. Trev, oh. she woke up a minute ago to find this oh. beside her on the pillow. The shrunken head. Oh, Mother. Oh, am I going to die? Is that what it means? That I, I, I'm going to die the way Paul did? Oh, of course not. Twelve o'clock. My head is missing from 12 o'clock. I'm going to die at 12. I know I'm going to die at 12. The question is, 12 noon or 12 midnight? Oh, I didn't think of that. Well, you'd better. Oh, how can you be so callous at that head? That shrunken head. You put it on my pillow. What? It would be just like you to do something crazy like this. Because you're... You're sick, Trevor. Mother, sick. Mother, he is please. sick. I don't know how he killed Fari. Before our eyes, yours and mine, killed him. But he did. And he's going to do it again. This time to me. Well, take, it, take it easy, Elizabeth. You, uh... When... When is he going to do it? That's the only question now. The only question that interests me. When, Trevor? Twelve noon? Twelve midnight? I don't mind dying. But I can't bear not knowing when. Tell me, Trevor. <laughs> a dramatic scene and an intriguing one don't you think if I were you I wouldn't at this moment be asking was Forey murdered and will Elizabeth meet the same fate but if Forey was and she does how I'll return in a minute for Act Two. At this moment, you have all the clues you need. In fact, all the clues you're going to get, because that's all there are to answer the riddle of how Forey Prescott died. And, oh, let's face it, it is murder. And who killed him? If it comes to that, who will murder Elizabeth and how? For surely she too is going to die. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Oh, catch her. She's falling. I've got her. Elizabeth? Oh, oh I, I, I... I'm all right. Oh, Mother, thank heaven you're alive. 
So you see, oh. my dear Elizabeth, I didn't murder you after all. Oh. <laughs> Only because you mean to prolong the agony, Trevor. Now I must wait till midnight. Why? What do you mean, why? You can simply leave. Get out of here. Now. Yes, Mother, you can do that. I'll drive you to town. You could stay at the motel. Or if you want, I'll take you to New York. You could... No. But, Elizabeth, if you're afraid of being murdered at midnight... Then let it be at midnight. And get it over with. This... This, it's, it's crazy. You know, all this talk about murder. You, all of you, you're assuming Forry was murdered when you don't even know what he died of. For all you know, he could simply have dropped dead. A heart attack. Cerebral hemorrhage. Why have you assumed, the three of you, you, Jackie, you, Trev, you, Elizabeth, why have you assumed from the start that Forry was murdered? But if he wasn't, Raj, what's the meaning behind the shrunken head? We discovered the head was missing from the hour of seven on that... That awful clock above the fireplace. And then Forry found it on the pillow of his bed. And Forry died at exactly seven o'clock. This time a head is missing from twelve. And it's on the pillow of my bed. Where I found it when I woke up from my neck. Hello? Oh, hello, Ed. Dr. Dodd, the coroner. I see. Mm-hmm. Well, how long will that take? Will you let me know? Thanks, Ed. Thanks very much. What, what did Dr. Dodd say, Father? Forey was murdered. <gasps> no! The autopsy revealed poison in the body tissues. What <gasps> kind of poison? Well, they uh, don't know yet. Ed's sending a tissue sample to the New York police lab to find out. No doubt uh, about it now, though. Forey was murdered. As you will murder me. At midnight. Darling, let's sit down a few minutes before we go back. Oh, Raj, I just had to get away from that awful atmosphere in that house. Oh, look, sweetheart, I'll be more than happy to take you back to New York. And then come back by yourself? Oh, no. Oh, I'd be safe enough, I think. From whom? What? I'm not thinking of the murderer, sweetheart. I, I'm thinking of the danger you'd be in. And, and I'd be in from the very attractive and decidedly sexy Jacqueline. Mm, I owe it to Trevor to help him all I can with his records, papers, Lord knows what. Help him get them in order before he dies. Raj, what do you make of all this? I, who do you think murdered Trevor's son-in-law? I don't know. Could be Trevor. He hated Fari, but then it... It could be Jackie. She hated him, too. What about Mrs. Costain? Elizabeth? Hmm. I know what you mean. And that shrunken head on her pillow, she could have put it there. Yeah. A red herring, a blind. Hmm. Something to throw the police off the scent when they get here. The police will come again, you think? Well, sure. I'd say all they're waiting for is a toxicology report on whatever poison killed Fari, and that can come any minute, any hour. It's, it's almost five. I guess we, we've been gone at least a couple of hours. I guess we'd better think of getting back. <laughs> Jenny, you sure I am? You don't want me to take you back to New York? Uh-uh. You're a brave little girl who deserves a kiss. I'm a scared little girl. But, but don't let that stop you. Don't tell me what to do, Jackie. If I want to change my will, I'll change it. In fact, my attorneys are changing it right now. Well, damn it, don't look at me as if I'd done some terrible thing to you. Or maybe you misunderstood me. No, I, I didn't misunderstand. You're cutting Mother off and leaving your fortune to me. Why? Plain enough. I want to be sure you're financially safe and secure. Oh, no, Father. There's more behind it than that. You know as well as I do, Mother would take good care of me. Share what she has with me. <laughs> you don't know her like I know her. Oh, I know her better than you. I've spent my life with her. You've spent yours elsewhere. I'm an explorer, or I was. Oh, you could have spent more time with her. I don't tolerate fools easily. Well, we've got off the subject. What's your real reason for changing the will? All right. 
Let me tell you. You're still hoping I'll marry Roger Campion. You're hoping that if I'm an heiress, the money will help induce him to divorce Virginia and marry me. You said it, not me. Well, you think it. You must. I can't think of any other reason for changing your will. Oh, Father, Roger and I are through with each other. If only you hadn't married Fari. Damn. Well, if you'd put a break on your temper, you wouldn't break so many of those pipe stems. One of my best pipes, too. Well, I have to send it for repair. I wish I could repair the mess you've made of your life as easily. All right, I made a mess of my life, but that's over now. Fari's dead, and that's over. And I mean to keep you from making another. Now, you listen to me. Roger's the man for you. He always has been. And why you didn't marry him oh, years ago... You know ago. why? I wanted a husband I could live with, be with. Not a wanderer like you. I saw what happened to Mother because of you. The emptiness, loneliness, and I made up my mind it would never happen to me. <laughs> Farley was no bargain, as it turned out, but he stayed at home. So does Roger now. He runs his safaris from an office in New York. <laughs> that... That disease you picked up in Borneo, it's just making you see things in a warped way, a distorted way. You're not yourself. You think it's crazy of me to change my will? It's crazy of me to hope that you'll persuade Roger to get a divorce and marry you. That what I want so much, the two people I love most in this world, should make it together. But I haven't got a prayer, it'll happen. Well, it won't. I'm sorry. But it won't. It will. I want... You can't always have what you want. You're wrong. I always have. And always will. Till the day I die. Midnight. It's nearly midnight. Jackie, where's your mother? I told you. She's locked herself in her room. And I told you I want her here in this living room at midnight. Go get her. She won't unlock the door. She feels safer, locked in her room. If you won't go and get her, I will. Weak as I am, I'll go up there and break the door down. I want her here. Give it another try, Jackie. All right. And tell her I'll come up and break the door down. And you go get that piece of fluff you married. I want her here, too. That? little piece of fluff I married is probably fast asleep. And Trev, I'm not waking her. You will do as I He's say. He's had a rough time since we got here this morning. If I'd known what we were heading into, I wouldn't have come, let alone bring Ginny. She went to bed after dinner, and that's where she's going to stay. All right. Now, that's the one thing I always liked about you, Raj. You never failed to stand up to me. You take a lot of standing up, too. Not anymore. Hand me that rack of pipes, will you? The, the one with the church wardens. Church wardens? Oh, the ones with the long stamp. Yes. They're beautiful, Trev. They really are. Any practical reason for the extra long stem? Well, sure, they cool and filter the smoke. The longer the stem, the better... The Oh, you finally decided to join us. You decided, Trevor. Why are you so determined to have me here, in this room at midnight? Elizabeth, why were you so determined to stay in yours? To put it plainly, so you couldn't kill me. You've eaten no dinner? You've had nothing to drink all to cut day? cut down the chances of your poisoning me the way you poisoned Fari. I locked myself in my room to cut the chances down even further. But, well, here I am. You wanted me here, in this room, so you could murder me. And I'm sure that when the drunk clock strikes at midnight, you will. Oh, I don't know, but you will. This never occurred to you, I suppose, that I want you here so I can protect you. 
protect me. <laughs> Is that so hard to believe? Oh, very hard. In fact, impossible. Well, less than a minute now to midnight. Roger. Yes, Elizabeth? Goodbye. I, I want you to know that, like Trevor, I too have always been very fond of you. Respected you. Hoped you and Jackie would marry. But I also want you to know that you, you couldn't have done better when you married Virginia. She's a fine girl, Roger. Just the kind of wife you need. Goodbye, Roger. Elizabeth, you're sounding as if you were going to your execution. In a way, that's what would be. Nonsense. You're not going to die. You're standing here in this room as healthy a woman as I've ever seen. You and we... We've let Fari's death overshadow everything, warp our thinking, make us expect death. But look around you, Elizabeth. Where could you possibly find a more... a more home-like scene... A scene that ought to reflect contentment rather than anything else. Content? I mean, look around. The fire blazing in the fireplace. Trev polishing his pipe. The friendly warmth of an old house where... Midnight. Jackie. Mother. Let me hold you. Mother, you're not going to die. You can I am, I know it. I... Elizabeth, this is nonsense. It's ridiculous. Trevor, I'm waiting. What do you mean, waiting? Poor you to kill me. Murder me. If I murder you, Elizabeth, it'll be the neatest trick of the week. I couldn't agree with you more. Oh, mother. Oh, mother. I, I tried to catch her, but... No, no. Jackie, stand back. Let me... She's dead. But how? How? One moment she was alive and the next... Dead. Roger, what killed her? What killed Fari? What? What? How? Do you know? Have you figured it all out? As I told you, you have all the clues I have, and I've figured it out. Well, uh, I think I have. I'll be back shortly for Act Three. Now Elizabeth Costain is dead. Mysteriously struck down, instantly killed as her son-in-law Forrest Prescott was, only the day before. Now, the following morning in the guest room, occupied by Roger and Virginia Campion... No, no, Virginia, I've made up my mind. We're leaving. Not if you plan to take me to New York and then return here. I won't be coming back. I never expected anything like this when I agreed to help Trevor straighten out his affairs. Oh, but Roger, you're such old friends. I'm not so sure of that, Jenny. To be Trevor Costain's friend, you have to be friends on his terms. Oh, he likes me, sure. He values my friendship up to a point. But that's because I always did the job he wanted done, and I never crossed him. He must have been a hard man to live with. He hasn't changed any, even with a... Well, even with his death only a few weeks, months away. He's still demanding and getting what he wants. He's still riding roughshod over everyone in his path. I have got a strong suspicion that that's why Fari and Elizabeth were murdered. They got in Trevor's way. Then you really think... That... I'm almost sure of it. Now, there are only four of us left in this house now. There's you and me and Jackie and Trevor. Now, you and I certainly aren't murderers, and Jackie wouldn't kill a gnat if she could avoid it. No, no. It's got to be Trevor. What I can't figure out is how he killed them. What's that? Oh, I, I thought all the police had left. Oh, it's the last car heading out of the driveway now. Come on, Ginny, let's get these bags packed. I want to be heading out of that driveway, too. And just as soon as possible. Father. Father, will you please stop polishing that? Damn pipe and listen to me. Well, what do you want, Jackie? <clears throat> the 
police have just left. I... I wondered if you'd like a cup of coffee. Give me a drink. No, you're not supposed to drink. I know what I'm not supposed to do. All right. Whatever you say. And hand me those pipe cleaners. Here you are. Here's your drink. Thanks. It's good. Good. I'll miss this fine old Scots when I'm gone. <laughs> One consolation, though. Roger always enjoyed it, too. And it'll all be his when I've kicked the bucket. You... <laughs> you willed it to him? Your supply of scotch? No, no, of course not. I meant all of this will be his. I don't, I, I don't understand. You said you willed everything to me. Well, I did. Maybe I shouldn't have said this will all be Roger's. I should have said yours and Roger's. Naturally, after you're married... Married? Father, I told... I told you yesterday I'm not marrying Roger. For one thing, I don't love him anymore, and he doesn't love me. And for another, he's happily married to Virginia. For as long as she lives. As long as she lives? As long as... Oh, come in, Raj. Come in, Trav. Jackie. Did you and Jenny get any sleep? Not much. Dozed an hour or so. How about some coffee? It's a good idea. And what would you like for breakfast? Just uh, coffee. You'll be okay. And what about Jenny? Coffee will be enough for her, too. We, uh, we want to get an early start back to New York. Back to New York? We haven't even started on my paper, my record. I know, old Trev, but, uh... But if what? Trev, uh, if I'd known what I was walking into when I came here, and, uh, known what I was walking Ginny into, I'd never have come. Oh, yes, you would. You never disobeyed me. Stood up to me, yes. But when the chips were down, you did what you were told. I was your second in command then, and that was years ago. Oh, not so many. Uh, Two, three. But busy, busy years, Trev. I've got my own business now, my own life to live, and to be plain, I don't take orders from anybody anymore. Why, you ungrateful... Now, just a minute, Trev. I was more than willing to come here and spend as much time as it took to straighten out your affairs. I felt I owed you that. The least you owed me, the least. Maybe. But what I don't owe you is putting my life, or Ginny's, on the line for you. You mean, Fari's death. Mother's. Yeah, and who's and... next? I've got a feeling that no one is safe in this house. A feeling? Or a suspicion? Same thing, Trev. Not exactly. Feeling there may be another death is one thing. Suspecting who might be behind the deaths is another you suspect me, don't you? Yes, Trev, I do. Well, I guess the time has come to tell you that your suspicion is correct. One hundred percent correct. You. You did kill me. Oh, you suspected me too, but did you? But it's impossible. You hardly have strength enough left to stand on your feet. To walk a few steps. Wrong. Uh oh, I'm weak, all right, but not as weak as I pretended. See? Then you... You were able to take the shrunken heads from that clock. And put one on Forey's pillow. And the other on Elizabeth's. But even so, I still don't see how... You, how you killed them exactly on the hour. Forey at seven... Mother at midnight. How did you manage that, Trev? My little secret. Some sort of slow-acting poison? A, a poison that you were able to time to the minute? No, but oh, a small matter. All that matters to me now is that you and Roger marry. You're out of your head. Father, father. You're sick. Right now you're overly tired. You're exhausted. You're a, a little mi mixed up. Crazy. You... Say it. You said it yesterday. Say it again. Crazy. But sane or crazy, the two of you will do as I wish. 
Obey. My final order. No way, Trevor. I love Virginia. I'm married to Virginia. I'll stay married to Virginia. You can't very well stay married to a corpse, Raj. Now, what do you mean by that? Why, no more than what is stated in the marriage vows. Uh, Till death do us part. And death is going to do just that in a few short minutes. When I kill Virginia, as I kill Forey and Elizabeth. Trev, you've gone crazy. Ginny and I are getting out of here and fast. Don't move. What? I said don't move. Try, and I'll kill you where you stand. And be warned, Raj, I can do it. Jackie? Yes? Get Virginia. Bring her here. Father, I... Do as I order you. But I... Do you want him to die now, before your eyes? Jackie, no. I'd better do what he wants, or he will kill you, Raj. Get her in here, Jackie. No need. I'm here. Ginny. I heard every word he said. He will kill you, Raj, unless you let him kill me. Let me kill you? He can't prevent me. What I mean is it's my death you want, not his. I don't know how you do it, but go ahead and do it. Kill me. Ginny, you're out of your mind. I love you, Raj. Too much to see you die. Answer that, Jackie. Hello? Yes, Dr. Dodd. It's for you, Father. You talk to him. I uh, can't at the moment. Oh, if Father can't come to the phone, Dr. Dodd, could you give me... Oh, I see. Yes. Yes, I'll tell him. Well? The poison that killed Forey. And Mother, too. I guess. The New York police identified it. Carrari. Carrari? So, that's how you did it. Huh? What is Carrari? It's a poison used by New Guinea headhunters to kill their victims. Kill them instantly. How? With darts, thorns, dipped in the stuff, shot through blowguns. Yes, but how could Father... Oh, good Lord. Oh, Lord. The pipes. The pipes. You've sat there polishing and cleaning. Blowing through the stems to clear them, you said. But blowing a poison dart through them when you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> the stem of a pipe makes an... Excellent blowgun. Especially the very long stem of a church warden like this one. And the thorn inside this stem, a thorn dipped in curare, kills instantly. Virginia? Yes, sir. Doesn't hurt, Virginia. Uh, All you feel is a little sting uh, when the thorn pricks the skin. Second later, you'll be dead. Roger. I warned you. Drop it, Trev. Drop that pipe stem or blow gun or whatever you call it. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. You standing there holding that mess I wore spear over your head, ready to throw it. You look a little silly, Raj. You're not exactly the mess I wore your type. I know how to throw one of these things, and you know I do. You've seen me do it. In Africa, yes. Those Maasai spears fascinated you. Oh, you practiced every day. Got quite good, too. But not good enough to put that spear through me before I blow this dart into your wife. Not you. I'm not going to throw it into you. I'm going to throw it into her. Me? Kill Jackie? You leave me no choice, Trev. You love your daughter. You love her more than anything, anyone on this earth. Kill Jenny and I'll kill her. You haven't the guts. Yeah, try me. Jackie, take that pipe stem away from him. Give it to me, Father. <sighs> take it. Oh. I know when I'm licked. What are you doing? I'm calling the police. All things considered, Trev, the quicker you're taken into custody, the better. If you want to move really fast, call the morgue. 
A morgue. I gave Jackie the pipe stem. But I kept the thorn. Father, no! Oh, father! Father! Police headquarters, this is Roger Campion. I'm calling from the home of Trevor Costain. You better send someone out here. What? No, it's not another murder. Suicide. You'll admit I did play fair with you. From the very beginning of this mystery, you had all the clues, all of them, including the shrunken heads, the New Guinea headhunters, who you might have known use curare, and a clue that gave everything away. Trevor Costain's absorbing interest in his pipes. When E.G. Marshall plays fair, he plays fair. I'll be back shortly. Hope you enjoyed our mystery. I certainly enjoyed playing a little game with you. Because that's what all mysteries are, you know. A game of wits. Oh, sure. I have the advantage. I know the answer before I start. But in fairness to you, whenever I bring you a mystery, I'll make sure you have all the clues from the start. After that, it's up to you. Entirely. Our cast included William Prince, Tony Roberts, Marion Seldes, and Martha Greenhouse. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. How does a Mediterranean cruise in the sun sound to you? All expenses paid. Not very sinister. Rather pleasant, eh? That's what you think. For when this cruise is only half finished, I think you'll be ready to abandon ship and take the next plane home. We're on a cruise with Elvira Graham, one of the world's leading fashion designers. Her escort, Tony Butler, and her daughter, Marjorie. At the moment, our ship is docked in the Libyan coastal town of Derna. Elvira and Tony have gone sightseeing, trying to find a certain shop they heard about from the ship's captain. This is so deserted. There can't be any stores down here. Oh, it's not a very long alley. Let's look. Oh, there's a candle shop. Would that be it? Well, there doesn't seem to be anything else. Elvira, I don't like this. Let's get out of here. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's just too strange. We've gone almost the whole length of the alley, and there's nothing but that candle shop, and that's closed. Oh, Tony, wait. Look, look up ahead. The alley doesn't end. It makes a turn. Let's go back. Captain Miller said the store didn't really exist, and I believe him. We can at least look. Come on. Tony, look! There it is! Our mystery drama, The Devil's Boutique, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Joan Loring and Robert L. Green.
Elvira Graham found the Devil's Boutique. And that was her greatest mistake. She found it on a sunny afternoon in Derna on that Mediterranean cruise. And uh, what happened after that? Well, Tony Butler will have to tell us. A year has passed since that fateful afternoon. And at the moment, we're in the office of Lieutenant Morgan, 31st Precinct. Come in, Mr. Butler. Uh, sit down. Thanks. Sergeant McKay says you can identify the body, the uh, lady of the earrings. Yes. Oh, good. Uh, we'll go right down to the morgue and... Uh, I don't have to see her, Lieutenant. I know who it is. Well, a uh, viewing is absolutely necessary, but uh, we can do it later. Uh, who is she? Elvira Graham. Was she a friend of yours, a relative? A friend. Elvira Graham... Uh, we put her age at about uh, 50. If you'd seen her in life, you'd have thought she was 30. But you were close. She was 52. I'd appreciate your giving us a statement, Mr. Butler. Uh, tell us all you can about her. Cause of death was drowning, no marks on the body. Uh, we have it down as suicide, but uh, we still can't rule out murder. I'll make a statement. But would you do me a favor? Keep it out of the press. Well, it's already news, Mr. Butler. I know that. It was the item in the paper that brought me in here. Ordinarily, with an unidentified body floating in the river isn't that much news, but uh, a nude woman in earrings and fantastic lipstick... That's why I know without the shadow of a doubt it's Elvira Graham. And that's why I wish you could keep what I'm about to tell you out of the papers. Well, I'll uh, do what I can, Mr. Butler, but... Uh, <laughs> well, they don't have to know every detail. We'll have to release her identity, though. Yes, I see that. A lot of people are wondering what happened to Elvira Graham. And now they'll know. But the woman suffered enough. Yeah, she won't suffer anymore. No, I guess not. She was admired, hated, adored, despised, envied. You uh, say you're a friend. She has no relatives? Only a daughter. I'm here in her stead. The daughter's name? Marjorie. Marjorie Graham. Well, just relax and tell us all you can about Elvira Graham. I'll ask questions later. Elvira Graham was a fashion designer. At her peak, the best. And she had a knack of making sure that no one, but no one, ever looked better than Elvira Graham. It was almost a year ago, in June. She just had a showing of her fall line, and she, Marjorie and I, were starting off on a cruise to relax. I was her escort at the moment. Roger! Bye! Bye! Tell Amy I'll bring her a souvenir from Italy. I said tell Amy I'll bring her... Can't hear you, Elvira, dear. Just wave. Oh. Bye! Bye! Marjorie, give me a streamer, quick. You've thrown them all, Mother. Oh. Oh, it doesn't matter. Come along. Let's go back and finish up that champagne. I think you've had enough, Mother. How many times do I have to tell you, Marjorie? I'll be the judge of that. Oh, I'm exhausted. Pour me one more, Tony. Thank heaven Marjorie's gone to her own cabin. She is so tiresome sometimes. Do you think I've had too much champagne, darling? Be honest. Well, you do want to look your best at the captain's table tonight. <laughs> sweet, sweet, Tony. You have such a knack. For what, I'm not sure yet, but a knack. You're absolutely right. You drink this. I'm going to take a nap. I think I'll go up on deck for a while. Tony. Hmm? Do you think that dress Charlotte Remsen was wearing made her look slimmer? Maybe a little taller? Definitely. You designed it that way. Yes. Made her look almost too attractive, I think. Well, I'm not going to think about work anymore. We're here to relax. Kiss me, Tony. And let Elvira get her beauty rest. I thought you were in your cabin. Oh, it's too exciting to stay down there. What's Mother doing? Napping. Of course, I needn't have asked. Marge, 
Why do you stay so close to Elvira? Don't you want a life of your own? I could ask the same of you, couldn't I? Touche. Are you in love with my mother, Tony? Love? No. And you know, she's not in love with me. We are companions. I'm convenient. And vice versa. The great Elvira Graham. She picks her men the way she picks her wardrobe. But it's fun while it lasts. Escort to the great Elvira Graham. And all that press doesn't hurt my acting career. Well, at least you're honest, Tony. Probably the first who was. Thank you. But you didn't answer my question. And I've answered yours. Why do I stay so close? I admire her, too. But I love her. So many people are jealous of her, and I feel maybe... I'm the one little sincere spot in her life. I don't always agree with her. And she wants you with her. I know that. I wondered about that. Why the glamorous Elvira Graham wants her 20-year-old daughter tagging along? Ever stop to think she loves you? Yes, I think she does. And let's face it. You add to her image. Who would believe that anyone as young as Elvira could have a 20-year-old daughter? I've heard that before. Mother's always been vain. But lately, Tony, it's becoming more of an obsession. She's the acknowledged queen of fashion. What would you expect? She's putting it before everything else. She sold her soul to vanity. Such profundity from one so young. Don't laugh at me, Tony. I'm worried. I'm not laughing at you, Marge. But there's nothing we can do about Elvira's personality. We just live with it. Or... Or what? Or leave it. And for the moment, it suits me to live with it. Come on. Why don't you take a nap, too? You want to look your best? We're at the captain's table tonight. How could I forget it? Mother? Come in, dear. I just wondered if you were ready to go up for dinner. Tony and I have had a cocktail already. Yes, just about. But I see you're not, Marjorie. I, I am. That, that's why I came by. But, Marjorie, you're not going to wear that scarf with that dress. Well, yes, I am. Oh, no, 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 dear. The dress of chiffon, it looks fine, but you don't cover décolleté as low as that with a scarf. It's ridiculous. Besides, it's the wrong color. It should contrast, if anything. But I thought it was perfect. Perfect? Marjorie, I cannot understand how the daughter of Elvira Graham can be so insensitive to style. Doesn't anything rub off? Mother, this... We're is... dining at the captain's table. It may not mean anything to you, but it does to me. I disagree with you about the scarf, but I'll give in to your superior judgment. No, darling, you'll find it's always right. Now, hurry and replace that dreadful scarf with a string of plain, simple pearls and change your lipstick too bright. I'll meet you in the dining room. You do understand. I just want you to look your best. Well, you must always look your best, my dear. But never better than mother. <laughs> I've never tasted such wine, Captain. A very special vintage, saved for very special guests. Oh, you flatter me, sir. Uh, have some more, Marjorie. Oh, no, thank you. I, I'm fine. Do, Marjorie. It's bound to improve your disposition. Uh, just a little there. Uh, Mr. Butler? Thanks. Uh, this isn't your first cruise, Mrs. Graham. <laughs> the first with such a charming captain. <laughs> <laughs> now, who's flattering? No, I was quite honored to be asked to your table, Captain. Oh, my pleasure, Mrs. Graham. I've been admiring those pearls, Miss Graham. Are they natural? Yes, and, and matched. Thank you for noticing, Captain. Stunning. Really? I always thought Marjorie's neck was too thick for pearls. Mother... A light scarf might have been more suitable, perhaps. I bow to your expertise, Mrs. Graham, but I do like the pearls. Thank you, Captain. As a matter of fact, I know a place you'd both be interested in. Have you ever heard of the Devil's Boutique? Devil's Boutique? No. 
sounds fascinating. It's a little shop in Derna, on the Libyan coast. I've heard some of my passengers talk about it. If it's unusual, it's for Elvira. Apparently, it is unusual, all right. Actually, they tell me the shop itself has no name, and it's very difficult to find, even with directions. How curious. What do you mean? Well, I've had passengers tell me about the unusual things they've bought in this shop. Clothes, accessories, scented candles, everything. Oh, that sounds charming. But I've had others who claim they've never even been able to find it. <laughs> That's apparently why it's called the Devil's Boutique. Elvira will find it. <laughs> when will we be in Derna? In about nine days. Oh, well, there's lots of crews to enjoy before then. Yes, our first stop is Cadiz. Then we swing into the Mediterranean. Oh, well, here's to the Mediterranean. And the Devil's Boutique. The next few days were filled with sun, shuffleboard, and swimming. Elvira made sure everyone knew Elvira Graham was aboard. She'd spend a half hour deciding on just the right outfit for the time of day she'd make her appearance. Even the shade of her lipstick changed. One color for morning, another for cocktails. We stopped for a day at Cadiz and then slipped into the Mediterranean. There it is, on the horizon. Derna. We'll dock in about two hours. How long will we be there, Captain? We'll leave with tonight's tide, about seven o'clock. Good. We'll have all afternoon for sightseeing. Uh, you'll excuse me, I have to get to the bridge. Certainly. I have such a strange excitement about this city, Tony. There's something about the name, Derna. And the challenge of finding that fascinating shop. And this was supposed to be a non-work vacation? <laughs> There's no such thing for me, and you know it. If I don't keep ahead of the pack, well, besides it's fun, we'll sightsee in Derna, and I won't leave until I find that devil's boutique. I can tell you one thing. You wouldn't catch me going near a place with a name like that. And I certainly wouldn't go out of my way to find it. But then, for a woman as vain and determined as Elvira Graham, it might be just the place. Vanity, like love, is blind. And Elvira has no inkling of the strange fate that awaits her in the Devil's Boutique. Most women are particular about their appearance, which everyone should be. But with some, it becomes an obsession. Elvira Graham was pushed by an ego that demanded to be first, pulled by a vanity that demanded most of her attention. And both were responsible for her downfall. Marjorie, why aren't you dressed? We're going ashore. I'm not going, Mother. I feel like staying on the ship. Well, do as you like. Tony and I are going into town and find that shop the captain told us about. You go ahead. I'll be all right. I just don't feel like going. This is exciting. I've never seen a place like this. I wish we knew where we were going. The captain said follow the main street to the water well and then take the first alley on the right. If it's that simple, how come some people couldn't find it? They didn't want to find it badly enough. Come along, Tony. Why don't we just stroll and enjoy the sights on the way? Time for that later. Here's the alley. First right after the well. You're going down there? Of course. This is so deserted. There can't be any stores down here. Oh, it's not a very long alley. Let's look. There's a candle shop. Would that be it? Well, it doesn't seem to be anything else. Elvira, I don't like this. Let's get out of here. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's just too strange. There's nothing but that candle shop, and that's closed. Oh, well, maybe we could knock and ask. Somebody might be in the back. I, I think we'd better get out of here. Oh, I hate to just... Wait, Tony, look. Up ahead. The alley doesn't end. It makes a turn. Let's go back. Oh, we can at least look. This is crazy. 
There wouldn't be a store hidden back there. Captain Miller said it was hard to find, and it's probably worth it. I can't imagine why. <gasps> Tony, look. There it is. There it was, just ahead of us. The windows of a quaint boutique, dimly lighted. And in the window, belts, dresses, slacks, scarves, accessories, beads. Elvira literally jumped with joy. Tony, we found it. And it's open. Come on. Oh, look at the things in this window. Tony, that belt. It is different. It's fabulous. I could design a whole suit around that. Let's go in. The captain was right. There's no name on it. There weren't on any of the shops in the main street either. Here it doesn't seem to matter. <sighs> fabulous. Just fabulous. Doesn't seem to be anyone around. I just want to browse anyway. Look at this jacket. There's not a seam in it. How do you suppose... Madame likes the jacket? Oh, yes. It is stunning. One of my favorite creations. You're certainly original. I've never seen styles even resembling these before. And though I'm not copied, everything here is quite original. Mrs. Graham is a designer herself. She knows how to judge quality. Ah, yes, it Vera Graham. I am honored. You know me. Anyone remotely concerned with fashion knows Elvira Graham. Oh. Is that not so? Well, yes, but I never thought here... You I'm... didn't think that in such a humbled out-of-the-way shop, one would have heard of you? <laughs> well, frankly, no. I keep up with things, huh? And you are... My name is Arch. You don't mind if I... Look around. <laughs> that is what my shop is here for, Mrs. Graham. Uh, if I can be of service, just call me. I will be in the back. Mm. Oh, I stumbled onto a gold mine. What do you mean? Why, these styles. The man is a genius. But how many people know about him? No one who matters. So? None of this stuff has hit the market yet, and I'm going to introduce it. You can't take it all back with you, dear. Ah, yes, I can. In my sketchbook. Tony, darling, you're looking at Elvira Graham's newest collection. You're going to pass the stuff off as your own? Of course. Who's going to know the difference? Ah, you have found something to oh, your liking. <laughs> everything. It's impossible to choose. I'd like to bring my daughter back to see your place. Uh, I would be honored. Oh, we're sailing on the Lady Madison. I'm going back to the ship and get her. You'll be open all afternoon? Uh, certainly. Come, Tony. I can't wait to see Marjorie's reaction to this place. Why all the fuss about Marjorie? I want Marjorie to come back with us so the two of you can distract him while I copy. You think he's not going to notice you in your sketchbook? Not if you and Marjorie help. She'll know how to keep him busy. Mother, this is unbelievable. I told you it was sensational. I just wish there were other customers around. Now, you you know what to do, Marjorie. Yes. I don't really approve. But I'll do it. What'll I do? You stay with me, Tony. You can cover me. Ah, ah, uh, Mrs. Graham, you did return. Yes. Uh, this is my daughter, Marjorie. I am charmed, Miss Graham. How do you do? This is Mr. Art, the fabulous designer. Marjorie's interested in a pantsuit. Uh, she wants to try on a few things. Tony and I'll just browse. As you wish. This way, Miss Graham. I have a few styles here I think might interest you. Oh, just stand close, Tony. We'll pretend we're looking closely at these things and I'll, I'll get my sketches. Well, Marjorie... Did you find something you liked? I'm taking this blouse. I decided against a suit. Oh, it's very attractive. Well, we must be on our way. We're sailing this evening. Mrs. Graham? Oh? Uh? Did you get all the sketches you need? I... Well, I... 
I, I did jot down an idea or two. I hope you don't mind. I mean, imitation is the highest form of flattery or whatever. Is that exactly ethical? Oh, Mother. Oh, well, perhaps not, Mr. Arch. I shall tear them up if you feel that way. No, 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 no. I didn't say I mind it. Oh, perhaps we should leave. Tony, Marjorie... One moment, Mrs. Graham. Yes? Please, no hard feelings. I should not have mentioned the subject. After all, I am flattered by your very presence. The great Edvira Graham in my humble shop, huh? <laughs> Would you accept the token of admiration? I... Uh, well, I don't quite understand. Have you ever seen anything as exquisite <gasps> as this? Mother, how beautiful. Wow. Oh, they... They are expensive earrings, but surely you're not suggesting you that I... You would honor me by accepting them. This is most extraordinary and generous, Mr. Arch, but I, I don't see how I could possibly... Uh, you do me a disservice, Mrs. Graham. I, I insist. Go ahead, Elvira. It's an unusual gesture. Well, <sighs> thank you. I wrap them for you. I'll be right back. You ought to accept a kindness with a little more grace, Elvira. But he took me so by surprise. I mean, right on the heels of accusing me of spying. He didn't exactly accuse, Mother. Well, I don't embarrass easily, but that was one of the times. Shh, here he comes. Well, here you are, Mrs. Graham. There is no one on whom they will look better. <laughs> Good day, Mrs. Graham, and bon voyage. <laughs> It was late afternoon when we got back to the ship. Marjorie went to her stateroom to dress for dinner. And Elvira stored her sketches in a secret compartment of her trunk. I'm not taking any chances with those, Tony. They are priceless. Speaking of priceless, let's see the earrings. Oh, yes. Here they are, in my purse. I've, I'm so taken up with the sketches, I'd almost forgotten them. I still don't understand his generosity. Oh, but they are beautiful. Well, what's this? Anything wrong? We're packed with the earrings. It's a lipstick. So? Well, nothing, really. He just didn't mention it. Let's see the earrings. They are extraordinary, aren't they? They seem even more brilliant than they did in the shop. Why don't you wear them at dinner tonight? I intend to. Curious about the lipstick, though. I wonder why he didn't mention it. Almost ready, Elvira. It's eight o'clock. We'll be out in a minute. Is Marjorie there yet? She just arrived. I won't be long. She wants us to get the full effect all at once. The earrings. She's wearing them at dinner tonight. And the lipstick. The lipstick? The shopkeeper at that boutique slipped in a lipstick with the earrings. It seems to match the color of the stones. Well... Elvira. Oh, Mother. They're breathtaking. They are striking, Elvira. The lipstick is perfect, isn't it? It lights up your whole face. It's almost uncanny. I've, I've never seen you quite so radiant, darling. Watch out, you two. You'll turn my head. That has been done by experts. Oh, you're dreadful, Tony. Come on. Let's go to dinner. <laughs> You're turning heads, darling. Everyone's looking at you. Oh, I hadn't noticed. Oh, Mrs. <laughs> Graham. Good evening. Miss Graham, Mr. Butler, how did you enjoy dinner? Captain Miller, I owe you a million thanks. I found that boutique. And you liked it? It is fabulous. It's going to do great things for me. Do you like my earrings, Captain? Magnificent. I got them at the boutique. Most unusual. The man at the shop gave them to Mother. They're most becoming, Mrs. Graham. Uh, shall we sit down? The steward's ready with a consomme. Oh, yes, dinner, of course. Oh, Tony, it's been the gayest night since we left New York. I think I danced with every man in the room. Almost. Almost? Everyone but me. Oh, but... Well, you hate dancing. You could have sat one out. Uh, be a dear and unzip me. 
I want to get comfortable and have a last champagne. Here, alone with you. <laughs> Tony, darling. Damn. Help me with this earring, Tony. I can't get it off. Let's see. Just clips on. It ought to open up. Hmm. It... It won't open. Well, try the other one. I... I can't budge this one either. Well, this is ridiculous. It's just a little spring. Pull harder. Ow! Sorry, darling. Well... Never mind. I, I'll get them off in the morning. I'm too tired to care. I'm going to bed. Don't wake me tomorrow, Tony. I feel as though I could sleep for a week. Good morning, darling. It's morning already. Oh, I must look a sight. Hand me that cold cream, dear. Here you are. Oh. I must have been tired last night to leave this lipstick on. You were quite the belle of the ball, you know. <laughs> you don't mind. The price I pay for escorting the Elvira Graham. Oh. What's the matter? Tony, my lips, the lipstick isn't coming off. What? I can't seem to remove this lipstick. I mean, cold cream always takes it right off. Rub harder. It just doesn't seem to work. The earrings. Now the lipstick. The earrings. Last night. We couldn't get the earrings off. Oh, I remember now. They're still on. Yes, I... I... Can't open the clasp. I didn't have any luck with them last night, either. Try again, Tony. Try. Okay. It's it's crazy. It's just a little spring, but... Uh, I... I can't open it. Oh, you've got to, Tony. I've got to get these off. <laughs> I told you I wouldn't go near a place with a name like the Devil's Boutique. You never know what you're in for. The earrings and lipstick the little shopkeeper gave Elvira were beautiful, all right. And she was immediately attached to them, wouldn't you say? We'll see what happens next when I return shortly with Act Three. Let's return now to the stateroom where Elvira Graham can't seem to remove her lipstick or her earrings. Two items she was given by the proprietor of that quaint little shop in Derna. You know, the one with that odd name. I've got to get them off, Tony. I can't, can't be seen in the morning wearing these or this lipstick either. It's just not done. Relax, Elvira. We'll get them oh. off. Just sit still while I... Oh, there's no use trying that again. Maybe you could get some kind of tool, something to pry them loose. Where? Well, ask the captain. Oh, no, wait, don't. Um, he'd think it's odd. Uh... No different from what I'm thinking. Oh. Mother, Tony, going up for breakfast? Uh, Mother, you're still wearing the earrings. Yes. Well, do you think they're quite the thing for morning? Well, of course not. But I'm having a little trouble getting them off. Want me to try? Well, you might as well. Tony and I haven't had any luck. Tony, maybe we ought to try and get a tool. Don't ask the captain. Try the purser or someone. Oh, I've never seen a class. Oh, so tight. That's not the half of it. What do you mean? I can't get the lipstick off either. We tried everything. Cold cream and even alcohol on the lipstick. Wire cutters we got from the engine room on the earrings. But nothing would take away the color from Elvira's lips or those dazzling earrings from her ears. The metal clasps seemed impervious to the shears. Evening finally came, and Elvira decided she could put in an appearance for dinner. The lipstick and the earrings were appropriate after six. Relax, darling. You're still the center of all eyes. Oh, oh Mrs. Graham. You're wearing those becoming earrings from the shop in Derna. Uh -huh. They're quite extraordinary. They are indeed. We're having a piano recital tonight after dinner. I hope you're all planning to join us. We wouldn't miss it. In the lounge at nine. We never made the recital. On the way from the dining room, something happened that set Elvira off. Mother, what is it? Stupid little tramp. Calm down, Elvira. Didn't either of you hear that woman as we were leaving dinner? No. You didn't. You didn't hear her say how gauche those earrings again. To you? No, to her whole table. I wish I'd slapped her face. 
Well, I can't leave the stateroom again, not until I find some way of getting these hateful things off. Maybe the man in the shop who gave them to you can help. Go all the way back to Derna. There's got to be an easier way. Well, you haven't come up with it. Maybe Marjorie has an idea. I'm going back to Derna. We'll fly from the next port at which we stop. Elvira, be reasonable. We well, can't... reasonable? There's no reason to this whole mad thing. Marjorie, you go on with the cruise. Tony and I will go back to Derna and then meet you in New York. Oh, no, I'm staying with you. Oh, do as you like. I'm too upset to argue. Tony, see the purser or the captain or someone and see what arrangements we can make. There. There's the will. And I remember that carpet shop across the square. The alley should be just ahead. I hope he can help after what it took to get back here. Oh. We've been on everything but a camel. That's the alley we went down, isn't it? Oh, yes. Come on. This is it. Uh... There's that candle shop. Still closed. Doesn't look as though it's ever been opened. Tony? Yes, I see. That's strange. The alley ends in a wall. But it, it turned off to the left the last time we were here. That's where the shop was. An absolutely dead end. How could they have put up a wall? We were here only three days ago. This isn't a new wall, Elvira. Look at it. What? It's hundreds of years old. But this is the alley we came down and it branched off and we found the shop. I wasn't dreaming you were both with me. Tony, this is frightening. Well, there's another way in, another alley. I've got to find that shop. I've got to find it. Come on, Marjorie, be quick. Which way did she go? I don't know. Oh, she's disappeared in the crowd. Stay close to me. The street's so crowded, we can't go fast enough. Oh, Tony, what are we going to do? We pushed through the crowded streets, and finally, after more than half an hour, we found Elvira. Mother! Marjorie! Tony, oh, thank heavens I didn't know where to look for you. Elvira, get a hold of yourself. I've asked everyone I could find who spoke any English at all. No one, absolutely no one, ever heard of the shop. <laughs> thing left to do was to go back to New York. We returned home and Elvira went into hiding. Of course, everyone assumed we were still on the cruise, so no one called. But Elvira was getting more desperate. A plastic surgeon's my only hope. A friend of mine had some work done about a year ago. I could find out the name of his man. Oh, do it, Tony. Do it today. Now, oh, Mrs. Graham, Mr. Butler, come in. Thank you, Doctor. You're a friend of Charlie Porter's. Yes, we've done some shows together. Well, now, uh, how can I help you, Mrs. Graham? This lipstick I'm wearing. Yes? I can't get it off. Nothing works, so don't ask me how many things I've tried. I, I wouldn't be here if anything had helped. Oh, well, let me see. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I'm just going to scrape your lower lip a little. It, it won't hurt. <clears throat> yes, the color's embedded in the lip tissue. Seems to be a dye. Is there anything you can do? Well, I could try a bleach. It would be uncomfortable for a week or so, but probably effective. Do it. I'll do anything to get out of this clown makeup, but that's only part of my problem. There's more. Uh, take my bandana, Tony. Those earrings, Doctor. They won't come off either. They're clasped completely around my earlobe. How long have you had this uh, uh, condition? It's been almost a month. I got the earrings and lipstick in a little shop in Libya, and frankly, they are bewitched. I know that now. Uh, hold still a moment. Yes, the lobes are beginning to swell. We'll have to work on this. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Graham. I'm, I'm at a loss to know what to do with these. Oh, Have you tried... Uh, a machine shop, an auto garage, everything but an acetylene torch. I must admit I've never seen anything like it. No one has. Well, Doctor. Well, I, I shall give you the bleach for your lips, apply it twice a day, and then I'll see you again in a week. Well, and the earrings? You have to give them some very serious thought, Mrs. Graham. There seems to be nothing I can do short of removing your earlobes. Mother, 
Mother, please answer me. Leave me alone, Marjorie. What's the matter, Marjorie? Oh, Tony, thank God you're here. Mother won't come out of her room. She locked herself in hours ago. There's no harm in that. She's going through hell. But I want to help her. You can't help her. All we can do is to be here if she wants us. If she wants to be alone, let her. That bleach isn't helping her lips. It just makes it harder for her to talk. They're as bright as ever. This morning she came out for breakfast. Tony, I nearly fainted. I know. She's not a pretty sight. Her face is so white and lined. Those colors just scream at you. I thought I heard you, Tony. Where have you been? Down at the docks. The ship came in this morning. I went to claim our trunks. Oh, of course, the luggage we left on board when we flew back. I never... I've never given it a thought. Was everything there? Everything. And everyone. Everyone? A welcome home party. Oh, no. About 20. Oh. They assumed we were still on the cruise. Oh, Lord, Tony. What did you tell them? That you and Marjorie stayed on in Nice. Oh, that's good. Good thinking, Tony. No one will be calling up here. Go oh, here are the trunks. Just put them anywhere for now. There's the one I'm interested in. Here you are. And this is for you. Oh, yes, I'd almost forgotten. What are you doing, Mother? My sketches. I may be in hibernation, but Elvira Graham isn't through yet. I'll fix that demon. Oh, yes, here they are. <gasps> what is it, Elvira? Oh. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Mother? What the... No wonder. <gasps> Tony, they're blank. Absolutely blank. Elvira, please. Mother. You saw them. Blank. Every last page blank. He's cursed me. Elvira, come sit down. Why? What did I do to be cursed like this? Elvira, time can... No, no, no. Don't feed me any more of your stupid encouragement. What's the matter with you? Look at me. Clown. Freak. Tony, I can't stand this. I, I've got to leave. Stay, dear little daughter. Elvira. Dear, pretty light of my life. Your beauty won't change your freshness. But just look at your glamorous mother. Look, damn you. I've been damned. For what? Why? Is the answer to that in heaven? In hell? Ah, yes, hell. Where that demon came from. That demon who gave me this beauty. The devil himself in his quaint little boutique. The devil's boutique be damned. The devil himself be damned along with me. What did I do? Did I worship beauty too much? Elvira never spoke another word after that. She returned to her room, stayed there, night and day, and three days later she was gone. Gone? She'd vanished. You tried to find her? Oh, yes. We hired a private detective. We didn't want it in the papers or in the police files. After about six months, we gave up. Where do you suppose she's been all this time? Wandering, hiding. I don't know. Well, uh, will you look at her body now? If you insist. I must. Well, that was quite a story, Mr. Butler. You a writer? You don't believe it? I don't know whether I do or not. It's too fantastic to be true. Then again, it's too fantastic to be made up. Well, here we are. Ah, oh, there she... Oh, no. What the devil? The earrings are gone. And the lipstick. Now, do you believe me? Dear Elvira, you were beautiful, determined, and the world's best designer. <laughs> you were on your way to becoming the greatest. But be reasonable, Elvira, and look at it this way. 
there was not room for the two of us. There's nothing wrong in being beautiful to other people. It's when we start becoming beautiful to ourselves that we're in for trouble. Elvira's life wasn't a total loss. Considering her personality, she ended up in pretty good company. I'll be back shortly. I hope you won't think unkindly about the fashion world because of our play. Those worthy institutions strive to keep us looking our best and do a wonderful job of it. Where would we be without them? In jail for indecent exposure, no doubt. But I would like to leave you with a friendly suggestion. The next time you buy a lipstick, jewelry, a garment, be sure there's a label on it. Be safe. Know your designer. Our cast included Joan Loring, Robert L. Green, Jada Rowland, Bob Caliban, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Difference. Bright and beautiful music. KIXI, Seattle. CBS News. A new deal has been worked out to free about 50 hostages being held in Malaysia. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. An airliner is due to leave Tokyo any time now. There is one late report which says it has left about 12 minutes ago. It's supposed to be carrying five Japanese terrorists who had been held in jail. Their freedom has been demanded by some of their comrades who stormed a building in Kuala Lumpur Monday. They took about 50 hostages, including Robert Stebbins, the American consul. Throughout the day, officials back in Japan talked about what to do. The demand was for seven guerrillas to be flown to Malaysia, but two of them refused to go. A stalemate went on for several hours, then the gunmen in Malaysia said they would accept just the five Red Army members. They threatened to kill their hostages and blow up the building if the demand was not met. President Ford arrived back in Washington late Monday night. He said he was very encouraged and optimistic over the results of his trip to Europe. In ten days, the president was in five countries. The mission included that summit in Finland and the signing of new accords on European security. Some thoughts on the trip from CBS White House correspondent Robert Pierpoint. For Gerald Ford, this trip really was necessary. Whatever was actually accomplished at Helsinki, this president was required to go by the logic of history. Along with the presidency, he inherited the trip from Richard Nixon. Long before Gerald Ford had ever given a thought to the Helsinki Agreement, or even to taking over the White House, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger had decided that Helsinki was another step in a twisting road toward peace. Rightly or wrongly, they had decided that the Four Power Agreement on Berlin of 1971 a decision by nations of East and West to discuss a mutual reduction of armed forces in Europe, the attempt to negotiate limitations on the uses of nuclear weapons, all the steps included in that vague French word detente were related in what Kissinger called linkage. When Gerald Ford assumed the presidency, Kissinger convinced him that to break this chain of small links toward a large goal would be tragic, would tilt the world toward despair, frustration, even war. So President Ford felt he could not say no. Robert Pierpoint, CBS News, with the President. 
Israel has announced a commando raid into Lebanon. Authorities in Tel Aviv say a number of terrorists were killed or injured and arms emplacements blown up when Israeli troops raided an Arab guerrilla camp near Tyre in southern Lebanon. The announcement came about 24 hours after guerrillas tried to stage a raid into northern Israel. One guerrilla and one Israeli were killed in that exchange. Tuesday is election day for Democrats in Mississippi. There are six candidates in a primary for the governorship. Considered the front runner is Lieutenant Governor William Winter. Senator Birch Bayh of Indiana appears to be looking toward the Democratic presidential nomination. Bayh says a committee is being set up on his behalf to determine whether he should become a candidate. In 1972, Bayh dropped out of the race when it was revealed that his wife had cancer. She underwent surgery and recovered. The Federal Energy Administration reported Monday that price hikes during July pushed up the cost of a gallon of gasoline to a national average of 58.7 cents a gallon. That's 3.1 cents higher than in June. Now this. Want to play McDonald's French fry word game? Huh? Don't be shy. Give it a try. Think of a word. Put in a fry. What do you call a French fry with handlebars? A <laughs> fricicle. <laughs> don't be afraid to get you fry. Uh, if at first you don't succeed, fry fry again. Fry in the sky. Ah. Okay, okay. What's big and has four legs and a huge French fry at the end of its nose? A fry nicer. Let's simplify things. When a French fry nut is really hungry, what does he do? Get a large order of McDonald's world famous fries. You know what they're famous for? What is the best French fries in town? Get the large order of McDonald's fries. Hot, crisp, golden, and delicious. They're fritastic. You're wise up quality fries and you deserve a break today. In New York, a Jewish organization says it's decided to press for the excommunication of Secretary of State Kissinger from Judaism. The Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Activist Organizations describes Kissinger as the greatest threat to millions of Jews since the days of World War II. Officials did not specify their differences with Kissinger, but it's thought the activists are angry at Kissinger's effort to get Israel to give up territory it holds in the Middle East. Doug Poling, CBS News. G. Marshall. Do you believe in monsters? They exist, you know. The Irish giant in the Museum of Trinity College, Dublin. Dwarfs, which are stronger and live longer and usually have strong passions and acute intellect. The fabulous monsters of Guiana near Lake Parima, sketched in 1663 by Joost Segman in his collection of voyages. Those are just a few examples which will lend credence to the story we're about to hear. I saw it, Billy Lee. I, I, I saw it. I saw the thing. Now take it easy. It was horrible. Our mystery drama, The Horror of Dead Lake was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars William Prince and Gordon Gould. Since the earliest times, monstrosities have attracted attention and have engendered the cloying fear we experience in the presence of the unnatural. The Loch Ness Monster, for example. Is it fact or fiction? The search for it still goes on. Cyclops? The monster with one eye? Oh, there undoubtedly was such a creature because there still are. Really. At a point where the nose sticks out from the forehead, there's a single orbital cavity with an eye in it. Well, 
In this tale, we encounter another deviate from nature when we discover the hideous thing that inhabits the dead lake. Claude? Yes? Was it all right? Not too grim? No, it was all right. I know how much you loved your father. Well, he lived a long life and he didn't suffer. The lawyer went over things and assigned them to me. The savings, the old house, that kind of thing. It was sad, come to think of it. But it's over now. You know, Polly, there's something I never told you because I'd forgotten about it. And so had my dad, for that matter. Oh? A castle in Spain? A map where the treasure is buried? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not so far off at that. My dad left me 50 acres of land near a small town in Florida, Orisville. 50 acres? Mm -hmm. And with land down there selling for a fortune? Well, not this land. Well, there's something funny about it. A long time ago, back in the early part of the 18th century, a certain Silas Baxter, an ancestor of mine, was, I kid you not, a pirate. Claude. He must have run a pretty good ship, because when he left the sea, he bought those 50 acres and built himself a castle. He called it the Captain's Doubloon. A castle? Oh, not a great big one, but big enough. The history of the Captain's Doubloon has been handed down from one Baxter to another, and was among my father's papers. I see. When I've been left is the captain's doubloon in a state of ruin, the acreage, and something named Dead Lake. Why? Because nothing lives in it. That's creepy. Mm. My father never had any interest in the property. I don't know if he ever saw it. But we do own a ruined castle and 50 acres of land. With a dead lake where nothing lives. That's right. Claude, we ought to sell it. I think so, too. You know, it's funny nobody has ever wanted to buy it. Well, maybe they did. But my father never said anything about it to me. Dead Lake. Claude. Yeah? Let's go see it. You mean it? Sure. Florida's no big trip from Philadelphia. Can you get time off from your job? I think so. I could take off Friday, and we could have most of Friday and the weekend. I can't promise anything, Polly. The captain's doubloon is a ruin, and maybe the acreage is worthless. But what about Dead Lake? I'd like to know why it's dead. Wouldn't you? Yes. Tell you what I'll do. I'll telephone the lawyer who settled my father's estate. Maybe he can give me the name of someone to see when we reach Orisville. I don't think Orisville's much more than a widening in the road. I'm so excited. <laughs> a deserted old castle. A dead lake. Makes chills run up and down my back. <laughs> well, Professor Micah, and uh, how are you, sir? Quite well, I thank you. Here is my food list. Uh, can you also obtain the chemicals I've written down here? Uh, oh, oh, yes, sir. No, no problem. I'll have one of the boys drive over to Palatka. No, I, I've got to pay him, of course. I understand. I will give you these. I have before. Yes, sir, you sure have. Doubloons. My goodness, what pretty coins. Solid gold. You mind if I ask you something, Professor? I mean, Johnny Reed was in here yesterday, and he's scared white. A heifer of his wandered down to the shore of Dead Lake, and Johnny said some kind of thing. Grabbed it and dragged it under the water. Johnny said it bellowed something terrible. Did you hear it? You know anything about it? It is wise to stay away from the lake. I do not go near it. I remain in the castle and do my work. Uh, well, maybe not for long, Professor. You've been squatting there so long, I guess you feel you own the place. But the real owner's coming to Orisville Friday afternoon to tomorrow. Ah. A fellow named Baxter. Same as Captain Silas Baxter, who stole all them doubloons from the Spanish. Like these you just gave me. I have found a few. Mm -hmm. Well, where will you go if Baxter tells you to get out? I would have no choice. 
I would leave. He will discover that the property is worthless. Uh, when he goes home, I will return. Uh, maybe. You got this idea of developing the land and selling it for home sites. You have tried to do that before, Mr. Billy Lee. <laughs> I sure did. Those persons I drove over to look at the land never did find their child. Quicksand? N not according to the sheriff and his men. They scoured and dredged the lake. All they found was some of the child's clothes. Yes, regrettable. The lake is dangerous. Why? There are unknown things in nature. It is better to let them remain unknown. Now, I will return tonight for my supplies. Oh, hello there, Professor. Good morning. Uh, I'll tell you, Billy Lee, he gives me the creeps. Uh, he may be gone soon, Johnny. Yeah? Uh, how come? New owner's arriving tomorrow. Named Baxter. I can't say I'll be sorry to see Professor Micah go. He's in league with the devil. You remember that parrot? Oh, I sure do. Grew to have a wingspan of ten feet. <clears throat> Vicious thing. I remember we all went out and gunned it down. A horrible thing. Where did it come from? His experiments? That was just an ordinary little old parrot, no bigger than a crow. You saw what it became. Micah did that. He's always experimenting with something. Mm -hmm. Look here. Hmm. More doubloons. Wonder how many he's got. Mm -hmm. Just a few, he says. Old Silas Baxter's supposed to have had thousands of them. But even if that old room's full of them, I wouldn't go near it with an army. Mm -hmm. You gotten over your scare? No, and I never will. That was the awfulest thing I ever saw, that poor heifer being pulled under the water by some thing. Now, what did it look like? What I saw of it was a kind of red color, round and fat, and it had uh, horns kind of sticking out in front like uh, like feelers. Shh, there ain't no such thing, Johnny. Back up on that, Billy Lee. I saw the thing. Uh, you say the new owner's showing up tomorrow? That's right. Him and his wife. Staying in my, my rooms upstairs. You taking them over to their property? Well, I expect so. Now, let me tell you. Stay away from the lake and keep them away from it, too. The room's lovely, Mr. Harrison. Oh, oh Billy Lee. Oh, I'm pleased you like it, Mrs. Baxter. It's fine. I like your store, too. Oh, it really ain't much. Uh, just a general store. Got just about everything in it that folks around here need. Well, it's very nice. Not bad for a one-horse town. Horseville isn't much, but those of us who've been here all our lives, we like it. If you want excitement, you, it's Palatka close by, and St. Augustine's only 40 miles away. Nice country. We landed at St. Augustine and drove down. I enjoyed it. There's lots of pine, isn't there? Oh, sure is. Paper pulp. It's a big business down there. And cattle... He's a rancher now. Hi, Johnny. Oh. Meet Mr. and Mrs. Baxter. Hello. Johnny Reed. How do you Johnny do? Mr. Reed, how are you? Baxters. You uh, really interested in the captain's doubloon, Mr. Baxter? Well, I don't know. It's my property. I might want to sell it off or interest some developer. I should think it would be worth quite a fair amount of money. You look skeptical, Mr. Harrison. Why are you shaking your head? No, no, don't go scaring him, Johnny. That's just what I'm going to do. It's not fair to keep him ignorant. Is it... Is it Dead Lake? No. How did you guess that, ma'am? Well, the name. There's something spooky about a lake that's dead. It's dead, all right. Except for one thing. There's something in it. Something I saw with my own eyes. And it's really something terrible. Oh, come on, Mr. Reed. I don't blame you, Mr. Baxter, for looking at me as if I'm escaped from the mental home... But a few evenings ago, one of my herd, a nice little heifer, went to the edge of the water of Dead Lake, and some awful thing grabbed it and dragged it under. A thing? What's a thing? Nobody knows, Mr. Baxter, but Johnny saw something. And strange things have happened down there before. Mm. Oh, and another thing, Mr. Baxter. For over 30 years, 
A squatter's been living in the ruins of the castle. A man named Micah. He was a professor. I'll tell you about him when we drive out. Spoke to him yesterday morning and said he'd probably have to clear out. He agreed, but uh, you'll meet him. A professor? And he's a squatter? What does he do? You'll excuse me for saying it, Miss Baxter, but I think he consorts with the devil. Oh, that's a little hard to believe in this day, Mr. Harrison. Uh, he's some kind of scientist, always sending for chemicals to Palatka to St. Augustine. He's a... Uh... Now, what did he call himself? An em embry... embry... something or other. Embryologist? What's that, Claude? It's a branch of science concerned with the formation and development of the embryo. Teratology is the study of deviations from the normal. By golly, that explains the parrot with the ten-foot wing spread. What? It's the truth. I can swear to that, Mr. Baxter. Half the village went gunning for it. We shot it down. Oh, it's not possible. Yeah, neither is that thing that lives in Dead Lake. What do we know about what exists at the bottom of the oceans? What prehistoric creatures live there concealed from our sight and knowledge? Monsters? Probably. There still are phenomena which we have not fathomed. What is that thing at the bottom of Dead Lake? We will encounter it when I return with Act Two. The subject is monsters. We seldom think about them. If we ever do... But there are monsters all the same. They are, in fact, studied in zoology under a special branch named tetralogy, concerned with deviations from the normal in the embryo. When deviations occur, the result can be a monster. Primitive man believed that a monster was the result of a woman's pact with Satan. Nonsense, of course. But the fact of the monster remains... What beautiful little birds you are. Uh, which one of you will it be today? I have grown attached to all of you, but it must eat. An immutable law of nature. One feeds upon another, and that is how I learn. And that is what I live for, to learn. The great plant must live, and it is a carnivore. Ruin is right. The captain's doubloon isn't a castle. It's a heap of rubble. One turret sort of standing. The rest caved in. The professor's at home. See smoke rising from the chimney. Strange smell. It's acrid. It's the chemicals. He's always experimenting with something. Have you been here before, Billy Lee? Oh, oh not to go inside. I've been around the grounds, but... <laughs> Like the rest of us in Orisville, I don't feel comfortable here. Well, we've seen it, Polly. Maybe we should forget it and go home. <laughs> That's what the dog thinks, don't you, Binks? But we've come all the way from Philadelphia, Claude. We ought to meet this professor and see what it's like inside. And ask him about those doubloons he brings to Billy Lee for food. What do you say, Billy Lee? Well, I guess I don't have to say anything. There's the professor now. Afternoon, professor. Good afternoon. Is this is Mr. Baxter? That's right. This is Baxter. My dog, Binks. How do you do? Yes, a dog. I'm the legal owner of all this property, Professor Micah. I do not question it, Mr. Baxter. And I am an interloper. If you want to put it that way, yes. So, when it's convenient to you... Of course. I will gather my few possessions and leave. You've been here 30 years. Oh, longer than that. It is an isolated place. I uh, do my work here, my uh, experiments. Like that, uh, that monster parrot? I uh, told him about that, Professor. 
You remember how some of us in the village had to gun it down? Yes, I have not forgotten. A pity. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, killing sheep and almost dragging off a child. I mean, uh, the destruction of a master's scientific achievement, a, a phenomenon, proof that experiments in tetralogy can produce new breeds of animals that could change the face of the earth. I wonder if we might see the inside of the castle. You are the owner. Well, I don't want to inconvenience you. It is no inconvenience, but... I caution you, do not wander away alone. I have experiments in many stages of development. Some of them are dangerous. A Venus flytrap is one of them. No, oh, I know about them. They eat flies. Interesting little plants. Carnivorous. Uh, follow me. It would be wise... Not to bring the dog. I'll take him back to the car, Polly. No, 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 let me. No, no, no. Come on, Binks. Hey, you folks, get your fill of the castle. No, I'll be outside. Come on. Come on, Binks. <gasps> oh, my goodness. What's that thing, Claude? It looks like a huge sunflower plant. And look at those pouches at the end of its leaves. They're bigger than a pelican's pouch. Much bigger. And much more dangerous. It is a Venus flytrap. It can't be. They're small. But by controlling its growth from a seedling, I have created a new species. It is very powerful. Look, Polly. It's leaning toward me. <gasps> and it's opening up. Claude. Do not approach it, Mr. Baxter. If it should seize your arm. Oh, that's horrible. Claude, stay back. Well, that's the first thing that will go. I'll take an axe to it. Let's get out of here, Claude. You you live here, Professor? Yes, in the ruined tower. Uh, this is my plant room. Is there a basement? Yes, but except for me, uh, the dungeon is unsafe. You've got more things like this down there? My experiments are varied. Professor, please clear out as soon as you can and destroy these experiments of yours. But Claude, that's Binks. He sounds like he's being killed. Mrs. Baxter, all right? Yes. Yes, Billy Lee. Thank you. Glad you're still open. What happened? I can see by your face. Their dog. What? It wasn't anyone's fault, Billy Lee. Binks slipped his collar. No. And... Uh... And ran loose? Yeah, down to Dead Lake. I ran after him, but not in time. I saw it myself this time, Johnny. It rose up out of the water, a, a, a round, huge, slimy thing, and, and, and dragged the dog into the lake. What is it? What is the thing? I, I, I never saw anything like it in my life. I, I don't know what it is, but... It's probably one of Micah's experiments. We went there this afternoon. My wife and I went into Micah's room in the castle. And Johnny, it made my hair stand on end. Binks, that's our dog, whined and wouldn't go with us. Billy Lee said he'd wait outside with the dog. I, I was taking him back to the car. He fought the leash so hard he, he slipped his collar and he flew toward Dead Lake. Ran after him, but... By the time I got within 50 yards of the shore, something had caught the dog and was dragging him under. If I was you, Claude, I'd cut my losses and forget the place. No, sir. I'm going to get rid of Micah and find out just what makes Dead Lake dead. There's something in it. You caught a glimpse of it. So did Billy Lee. A big, fat, slimy thing with horns. Now, what is it? I know a man who might know. A friend who's a zoologist at the University of Pennsylvania. I've telephoned him for help. He'll be here late tomorrow. Then we're going out and solve this filthy, hideous mystery. Now that you've met Dr. Petty, let's hear what he has to say. You're on, Joe. I see everyone's well armed. Well, there's something in Dead Lake, Dr. Petty. And if we catch sight of it, we're going to blow it to bits. Binks was my dog. I'm going along. I'm not afraid, and I can handle a gun. Well, all right. My plan, for what it's worth, Joe, 
is for all of us to go out there now. It's uh, five o'clock. We ought to get there in half an hour. Then you and I will go inside and find out if Professor Micah has cleared out. Mm -hmm. If he hasn't, I'll throw him out. Then we'll destroy that awful plant. Once Micah's gone, all of us will explore that dungeon. Maybe that's where he's got the thing. You got any idea of what it might be? Uh, you described it as about six feet long, fat and slimy, with horns. And colored, a reddish kind of color. You know what it makes me think of? A giant snail. But they don't eat flesh, Johnny. Could it be a giant slug? I don't think so. I don't like to speculate, Claude, but since you telephoned me yesterday, I've been doing some research, although I don't believe all this. It's true, Dr. Betty. As a scientist, it's hard for me to believe, but I accept what you've told me. Why, Joe? What do you think it could be? A member of the Harutani, which is a branch of the Kitopod worms. What? It's a worm? No, Johnny, but it could be a monster leech. One of those things that attaches itself to the skin. Yes, yes. And, in uh, Egypt and in the Near East, there's an aquatic leech that lives in streams and ponds and does extensive damage to horses and other baggage animals. Leeches? You make my skin crawl, Joe. Well, they've been used extensively in medicine. In 1832, France alone imported over 50 million of them for bloodletting. And you think that's what the thing is that's in Dead Lake? It's hard to say, Billy Lee, but you've described a leech... The red-colored body, its bloated appearance, and slimy look. Of course, the fall of a leech five or six feet long boggles my mind. I simply can't imagine it. But if that's what the thing is, it could kill anything. And once those enormous suckers have attached themselves to any blood animal, the animal would be dead in minutes. Well, let's get started. Yeah, we'll, we'll take my pickup truck. We've got an arsenal. And dynamite. Dynamite? Sure. If we don't see the leech, maybe we can find where it lives. And that's when I blow up his cave. People around here have a score to settle with that monster. I told you to get out, Professor Micah. So you did. And I will leave now. I have not had time to... Out. You have a rifle and a shotgun. Why? We think there's a monster leech in Dead Lake, and we intend to destroy it. Fantastic. I want you out of here. I have packed what I can carry. The rest I leave to you in the name of science. Get out, Professor. That marvelous Venus flytrap. I never saw anything like it, Claude. Look at those traps undulating and stretching toward us. He said it's powerful. That's the first thing we take care of. You have the shotgun, Joe. Look at us. Inching toward us. I'll release the birds. They're what he fed to the plant. Look at them go. Joe, call the others. We'll try the dungeon. Well, come with me. We don't want to be separated. You've got a point. What a devil's hole this is, Joe. Let's get the others. Glad I brought the axe. Did you see that thing try to wind itself around me? Some kind of vine? Strongest wire. It's just awful down here. What's that over there, Claude? Shine your light. Uh, a huge door. Hinged with a drop lock. Do you think... Don't open it, Claude. Shh, shh, listen. Mister, what's that? Sounds like something breathing underwater. Oh. Wet bubbly kind of breathing. There's one way to stop that. No, Claude, don't shoot. I've got a better idea. There is something behind that door. If it's the thing, the giant leech, you won't kill it with one shot. Oh, what's your idea, Dr. Petty? Well, that door must open into a tunnel. And the tunnel probably leads to the lake. Now, if we can trace the tunnel from above, on the ground, and see where it leads to, Johnny here can dynamite the entrance and block the thing in. That's when we'll have it trapped, and that's when we'll kill it. Good idea. Everyone stick together, and we'll go back upstairs and out. Oh, I never want to see this place again. You'll be all right, Polly, when we get out into the air. Come on. Walk between Joe and me. Is it 
impossible? In nature, most things are. And nature, with a prod from an experimental scientist, has created a monster. A giant, predatory, hideous, monster leech. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Have you ever had a leech attach itself to your skin? It happens not infrequently in many freshwater lakes. They are small and they can be flipped off with the finger. But the experience makes one shudder. Imagine the horror, then, of speculating that what Professor Micah has bred, the thing that has made the dead lake dead, is a gargantuan leech. I'll get the dynamite. Hand me the rifle, Billy Lee. Sure. I'll grab the shotgun. Hold it. Here's the other one for you, Dr. Petty. Right. Joe, let me carry it for Johnny. I'd appreciate it if you'd stay with Polly. I'm all right, Claude. I was just being in that filthy basement. No way, Polly. You're going to stay by the truck and Joe. Claude! No, absolutely not. I mean it, Polly. I think he's right, Mrs. Baxter. I tell you what. Why don't you swing the truck around and turn on the lights and shine them on the north side of the castle? The locked basement doors on that side. Give us some light down to the shore, too. All right, Polly. Come on, hop in. Claude. No, please don't argue. You stay with Joe. Ready, Johnny? I'll lead the way. Keep your guns up, but be ready for anything. Joe, I feel sick. If the thing is what you think it is. Yeah, yeah me too. Let me get the truck turned around. Black as a tunnel. I'll switch on the lights. I see them, Claude and the others. The car lights do run down to Dead Lake. Isn't that an awful name for it? It's dead, all right, if there's a giant leech in it. <gasps> Joe, look. What? It's the professor. Now, what the He's devil... He's returning to the castle, not through the front, but through the north side of it. I wonder what he's up to. He's disappeared now. Must be another entrance to the place. If Johnny does blow up the tunnel and the professor's in that basement... Claude ordered him out. I know that. All, all the same, he is a human being. And I he... don't think he's a human being at all. Shine your big torch over the lake, Johnny. Sure cuts through the blackness all the way to the other side. Johnny, look. Hmm. Something's moving just under the surface of the water. It's moving to the other side. Follow it with the torch. Look at it. Just a little of its back is out of the water like a whale. Keep following it. I can hit it from here. No, Claude, no. Let it go. When it returns from the other side of the lake. Oh, no. That's a small deer over there. See? The thing is coming out of the water. Go fire a shot, Claude. It scared the deer. Look at that thing. It's half out of the water. The deer got away. Johnny, follow where the thing swims. It's coming toward this side of the lake, a few hundred feet north of us. Come on. No, 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 hold it. If it does have a cave or a tunnel to a cave, we don't want to scare it off. Just watch it. It didn't surface. And it's disappeared. Now, let's move. All set, Johnny? Yeah. Here goes. Claude, run that torch along from where Johnny blew the entrance. Back toward the castle. That's it. Look. Yeah. The force of the explosion in the tunnel lifted the ground above the tunnel. And now we can see its path. It does go to the castle. It goes to that barred door in the basement. We've got the thing trapped. Maybe it's dead. That was a terrific blast. But we got to make sure, Claude. There's only one way to do that. We have to open that big bar door. Now what, Joe? I don't know. That was a big charge of dynamite. They must have found the tunnel. What about the thing... Dead, probably. Just the force of the detonation could kill it, but I don't know. Look, they're coming back. Maybe they'll tell us what happened. Yeah, that got their attention. 
Is it dead? Claude? Is it dead? I don't know. We hope the explosion caved in on the thing and killed it. But we don't know. And there's only one way to find out. We have to go back into the castle. Oh, no. We have to, Polly. Uh, you, you saw it? Enough of it, Joe. It's a leech, all right. A monster leech. How big, Claude? At least six feet long. Round as a hippo and reddish in color. When it came out of the water, it writhed like a snake. And it, it's, it's blood-sucking cups, or whatever you want to call them, were bigger than half dollars. Mm. It's the most revolting creature I've ever seen. How in heaven's name did it ever come about? Experimental breeding and crossbreeding. Professor Micah developed gigantism in some strain of leech until he achieved one with monster size. But why would he want to do something like that? All scientists, Billy Lee, are fascinated by the subject of life. How it can be controlled and developed. He's in there, Claude. In the castle. Micah? That's right. The headlights from the truck picked him out just as he disappeared through some of those big stones on the north side. Well, then... We may have killed him. The blast. If that blast blew open that hinged door. Come on. Let's see where he went in. We'll follow him. Leave the dynamite detonating box here, Johnny. Grab the shotgun. You told him to get out, Claude. Why would he want to come back? Joe, I'm afraid. You stay here with me. There's nothing we can do to help. But if something... If something should happen to Claude... And it was my idea to come down here. He didn't want to. And now if something should happen... Could be it. See where I'm shining the torch? Yeah, it could be. Just about wide enough for a man to squeeze through. All right. Follow me. Hold it, Claude. You bring up the rear. Now, wait a minute. I'm not going to have you risk your lives any more than you already have. Billy and me have the shotguns. Much more effective close range. You bring up the rear with your rifle. Right, Billy Lee? Right. I don't know what to expect, but whatever we find, it's bound to be close range. Now, let's go, Johnny. This place is a house of horrors. Ought to be burned to the ground. It will be, once we know that the monster leech is dead. Ah! It's Micah from that big room in the dungeon. Oh, have your gun cocked, Johnny, and go slow. Look. Oh, good Lord. The leech. It's, it's all over him. Move back, Johnny. Micah's dead. The leech is all over him. Shoot, Johnny! Blood. All over. Is it... Is it dead? Don't go near it, Claude. Some of the suckers are still working away. We have to get Mike out from under. He's dead, Claude. Let's get out of here. We can come back when it's daylight. Get Mike and hack that thing to pieces. It. Just have to, Polly. We're not leaving this truck. But those gunshots, what if they run into? I can't guess. You can, but you won't. What if that blast of dynamite blew out that hinge door? If the thing wasn't killed in the tunnel. Hold it. They're coming out of the front of the castle. You see the flashlights? They're safe. Oh, Joe, they're safe. <laughs> Are you all right, Polly? Still feel a little faint. When you saw Claude safe returning to the truck, you passed out. I remember. Joe was right. Professor Micah had developed a giant leech. It lived in a tunnel which ran from the shore of Dead Lake up to a cave near the castle. When Johnny set off that blast of dynamite, the tremendous repercussion broke the hinges of the door into the cave, and the leech got out. Micah was there in the room. He was probably stunned by the blast. And that's when the leech grabbed him. There was nothing we could do to save him. It must have been awful. It was a nightmare, Polly. We're returning there in the morning. So am I. Polly. No, Claude. I got us into this and I'm going to see what's in that room. Lee. 
listen to the birds. Life is kind of a return to the captain's doubloon. I don't feel much like going down into that basement again. And I'm not sure it's safe for Miss Baxter. Don't you worry about me, Johnny. Now that I know the monster leech is dead, I'm not afraid. All right. But let's go in through the front. Have we got everything? Lights, ropes. And my shotgun. Just in case. And camera. Watch your footing, Polly. And when we go down into the dungeon, stay between us. Uh, let me lead, Claude. I've uh, got the gun. There it is. Oh, Claude. Poor old Micah's under that thing. Oh, aim that big light right, right at it, Johnny. It's incredible. It's six feet long and four feet thick. Micah let out one scream and then he was dead. Partly fright, maybe. Keep the light trained on him, Johnny. We'll try to pull him free. Let me take a few pictures first. No one's going to believe this horror. Claude, what about Professor Micah? What happens to him now? We give him a decent burial. And Joe wants to find out, if he can, why Micah did all this. Billy and I searched the castle. In the one tower, still partly standing, Micah had a room and his books and a small laboratory. Yeah, there were a lot of papers and chemicals. But the real discovery was this diary. It goes back 40 years, back to 1931, in fact. Now, under an October date, listen to what Micah wrote. Today, I was discharged as an assistant professor of zoology because I was consulted by a friend whose son was certain to die from acute nephritis. I urged the man's doctor to attempt a transplant. The doctor was repelled by my suggestion. I explained that in zoology, I had conducted many experiments in which I have saved small animals with various organ defects. My suggestion was rejected, and so was I. I have left. I intend to continue my experiments somehow, somewhere, well, south probably, where at least I will have the climate in my favor. And one day, I am convinced the name of Micah will be honored for his proof that life can be prolonged and improved. There it is. And a lot more. Poor man. He wasn't really mad. He, he just felt rejected. And because of his bitterness, his experiments became grotesque. <sighs> Through that huge parrot, for example, he intended to prove to skeptics that man's magic, science, could reshape mankind and his environment. He was an intellect... And far ahead of the time in which he lived. And the giant leech? Like the parrot, another proof of what Micah maintained. Control of life. And both got out of hand. I'm going to publish Micah's papers, Claude. And I'm going to burn the captain's doubloon to the ground. Make that land habitable again. And stock Dead Lake with fish. That horror is gone. Nature... With a little help from me, we'll restore it. Nightmares are made of such stuff as a dream about a monster leech because the word makes the skin crawl. And when in sleep, a fiend or incubus oppresses you, wake up, it will go away. But was it real? Or just a nightmare. I'll be back in a moment. It is foolish, I think, to dismiss anything. Was it conceivable years back to imagine men walking on the moon? Is the notion of a huge killer shark unimaginable? We know a great deal about Earth, something about the universe, but isn't anything, or almost anything, conceivable? 
Monsters are, and our story's giant leech was one of them. Our cast included William Prince, Gordon Gould, Anne Shepard, George Petrie, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Is there anything more insidiously disturbing, awake or asleep, than the slow drip, drip, drip of a faucet with a worn washer? A tap, not quite turned off. An unknown leak somewhere in the plumbing. Particularly in the far reaches of the night. It can murder sleep better than Macbeth. mystery drama, The Lady of the Mist, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Rosemary Murphy. Drayton Manor is not nearly as old as the House of Drayton itself. By that I mean that the structure is probably not much over 200 years old. But the Drayton family is listed in Burke's peerage as far back as the War of the Roses. And the present house is certainly built on the foundations of the ancient castle which guarded the head of the lake and the river that feeds into it. But this is 1975, and once again, a remodeling is in order. Well, I located the trouble right here, Lady Drayton. Miss Drayton, Mr. Giles. The title, such as it is, evolves only on the men in direct line. My brother Charles, for example. Or if I had a son. You, a son? We shall hope it isn't likely since I'm not married. So, that great booming drip of water I hear in my bedroom is just caused by this leaky old faucet. All it is, Mom, but it bounces off the drain and makes it all echoey-like and strange from below. Can't we do something to stop it? My brother and his new bride have to sleep right under this. I tried a new washer, Mum, but the old stem is so warm... Can you stop the noise is the important thing. Oh, Lord, yes. All it takes is to be careful. Like when you turn off this here cold tap, you just gives it an extra little nudge, like, and she's tight as a drum. Well, thank heavens. That drip, drip, drip was like the Chinese water torture. Enough to drive a person stark staring mad. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> nothing new in these parts, though, or in this family. Hey, your ladyship. Miss Giles. Miss. Sir Charles is the lord of the manor, but in this day and age, who pays attention to such things anymore? Oh, around here we cling to the old ways and the old superstitions. Sort of rubs off on you without your knowing it, you might say. Just looking out that window there at the waterfall, twilight coming on as it is, if I didn't know better, I could swear I could see the lady of the mist peering through there like it was a veil or a curtain. Now, come along, Giles. I don't know what's come over you. Oh, just remembering and hoping she's resting easy now. 
who? Her. What puts the water madness on you like she did to poor Sir Charles' first wife? Oh, Charles, nobody knows if the woman really ever existed. It's all just folk legend. Oh, she existed all right. You'll never convince me or any of the plain folk here about she didn't. Lonely she is, calling people across the veil to the other side to keep her company. And the animals. The what? Oh, they've took the water madness again ever since the news of the wedding. Peter Dombey, he found two of his sheep wandered. And they came up drowned in the lake. And I lost me old cow. I'll take odds that's where she's off to. Oh, she'll, she'll turn up one of these days. If your lady of the mist is lonely for company, why pick on animals? I'm sure she'd rather have someone to talk to. But even if she doesn't, why does she return them? Dead, she does. It's the soul she wants us all, you see. Shades and specters, just like herself. And it isn't only animals. What about the bludgeon boy five years ago, eh? And comes to that. What about her poor first ladyship ten years ago? Why, Giles, you know that was an accident. Suicide, some still whisper. What nonsense. You saw her slip yourself and me try to save her. Ah, so I did, so I did. But lately I've taken to wondering if maybe the lady didn't call her. Especially with Sir Charles marrying again. I haven't any more time listening to country gossip. Come along, Giles. We've loads to do to prepare for them coming. I don't know how I'll ever manage it. At least that drip has been fixed. Pick up your tools and let's get along. Yes, sir. And I don't want to hear one word of this from now on. Do you hear? I want this Lady of the Mist put to rest. Oh, yes, sir. If only she'll stay there. I should have been more vexed with Giles if I hadn't been so put out with Charles. Of course, I was a perfect fool to have financed his little jaunt to Europe, and more than that, to let him go alone. I knew, of course, there would be women. There always are in Charles's life. But that he would get married again. Well, it was just like the first. I hope you'll take to Meg, Vanessa, darling. Oh, I know I will. I mean, how couldn't I, since she's your sister? Well, she's quite a bit older than I, you know, and Margaret, uh, Meg is sort of county, if that means anything. You mean Gross Point, Michigan, Philadelphia, Main Line, that sort of thing? <laughs> Do I? <laughs> yes, well, I can live with that. It's how I was brought up. Oh, I can't imagine it. You, Tweedy, stuffy and old-fashioned. Oh, no, not me. I'm kind of a heller, matter of fact. You? Oh, I warned you before we got married that I'm not quite the real me. I mean, I... I'm just still so shook up after Mom and Dad totaled themselves in that car wreck. Oh, darling. You know, until I met you, I thought I'd never be myself again. But thanks to you, I'm on the way. You know, I... I feel a little guilty about it. But Charles... I've never been so happy in my whole life. Well, just give me the chance and I'll make you that always. You know, I was just thinking... What? The manor is pretty far out and sort of isolated. Oh, but while I'm getting my head put together again, it's just what I need. To be alone. With you. Well, we shan't be exactly alone. I mean, there's always Meg. Oh, darling, I don't mind at all about sharing the house with her. You're the one I'm going to be selfish enough not to want to share with anyone. Oh, come on, Charles. I'm dying to get there. Meg, this is Vanessa. How do you do? I'm so glad to meet you. I... Okay, may I call you Meg? And, and please call me Van. Yes, of course. Uh, Van. <laughs> well, I must say, I've never seen you so bowled over, Meg. Of course, Vanessa is radiantly beautiful, but... It isn't uh... that. Of course she is, but you didn't warn me that she'd be so incredibly like... I'm sorry. Perhaps I put my foot in it. No, that's all right, Meg. I know Charles was married before. He told me all about it. He did? Well, of course I did. Thing to do, after all... Van and I have no secrets. 
Brenda never was strong, and the pneumonia was just too much for her. Do I really look so much like her, Meg? My dear, time dims memories. There is a resemblance, but just for a moment. And one can see that there's nothing weak about you. Pity I was silly enough to bring the whole subject up. Now, come along in and let's see about getting you settled. But I was lying, of course. The resemblance to me was startling. So startling that for a moment it had taken my breath away. And I had found my heart pounding in my head as if saying, She's come back. Not again. Oh, no, not again. Couldn't be again. But the pleasant, familiar process of dinner and after-dinner coffee buried such thoughts below the veneer of normal hospitality. It wasn't until Charles went out to put the car away and close up the garage that they started to sneak back insidiously. More coffee, Matt? Oh, I, 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 I didn't mean to sound as if I were taking over. I just... Oh, my dear, it's your house now. Oh, our house, I hope. You can't know what it is to... to have a family again, feel cared for, and not alone. You took your mother and father's death very hard, I suspect. I... I... I flipped. It was so sudden. Well, I mean, everyone knows that in the normal course of events, you're going to lose your father and your mother, but... but you think... Well, I guess in hindsight, I thought there'd be some advanced warning. It wouldn't just happen like one minute they were there and the next minute they were gone, gone forever. We have to take these things in our stride. Yes, but do you know what happened on my 18th birthday? No, I, no, I didn't. They were hurrying to get back in time to spend it with me. <laughs> my birthday surprise. And instead, the surprise I got was six months in a psychiatric clinic and another year on the couch. Good heaven. Oh, oh don't look so shocked. I it's all behind me now. <laughs> I'm an old lady of 20 now with her head just about screwed back on straight. And Charles. Well, Charles is the one who'll complete my cure. Now that I've got him, I don't need anything else. I just hope I can be woman enough to make him feel the same about me. Well, you girls get acquainted while the old man's back was turned. I hope so. <laughs> I'm sure I learned a great deal. Now, I think I should leave you two alone. Oh, you don't have to move, Meg. I was going to suggest to Van that we go on up to our room. It's been a long day. All right, Van? Oh, yes, dear. Let's go up to our room. Our room. Two words like a scalpel which opened up the wound and let me look at it openly for the first time since the news of the marriage. Our room. Why, that was my room, which I had to vacate to accommodate this, this intruder. Worse than that, an intruder returned almost as a ghost to haunt me. Brenda, as she was ten years ago. I crossed to the window and looked out. The park was bathed in bright moonlight. At the end of it, the beams glistened and bounced off the silver lake and the mist of the waterfall that fell from the cliff into it. I couldn't hear Charles and Van, of course, but later I was to know a part of their conversation which charted my course. Charles, come here to the window. Huh? What are you looking at, darling? How peaceful and lovely it all is. And that curtain of stars falling down to the lake. Every drop of water in the moonlight looks like a star. Uh, yes. Ye yes, my dear. Now, now, come away. Let's, let's get to bed. Just one moment. Let me soak it all in. Look, Charles. Isn't it strange? What? The waterfall. If you look at it long enough, you could swear that that column of mist Looks like the figure of a white lady looking out from her window into the night. Like me. For heaven's sake, come away from the window, Brenda. And... Brenda? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I meant Vanessa. Oh, forgive me, my darling. That's Meg's fault talking about her tonight. I won't ever make such a slip again, I promise you. Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> Do you really get that feeling that it isn't going to be all right at all? 
ancient legends that people refuse to let die. A first wife who seems to be afflicted with the same problem. And a sister who seems to feel that her way of life has been threatened. Not a very auspicious homecoming for a new and young wife whose only search is for peace and love. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Well, perhaps too much of my life is concerned with brooding night fancies which vanish with the light of dawn. Certainly breakfast the following morning has been a pleasant and cheerful meal with the bright sun streaming in the windows and drenching the green grass of the park and the dancing blue of the lake with sparkling warmth. Now as Van, Meg, and Charles rise from the table... I'm glad you slept well, Van. I certainly did, Meg, like a top. Well, what's on the program for you two today? Well, I thought maybe Van might like to have a look at some of the scenery around the manor. First of all, I want to start by walking down to the lake and looking at that mysterious lady I saw last night. What mysterious lady? Oh, it's just that old optical illusion that... Oh, good morning, Giles. You were looking for me? Uh, I beg your pardon, sir, but Molly said you'd be finished breakfast and it'd be all right for me to come in. Of course it is, child. And you haven't met Sir Charles's new wife, have you? Van, dear, this is Mr. Giles Folkham, who lives down the road and who's not only an invaluable part of the family, so to speak, but also a fount of local knowledge. How do you do, Mr. Giles? Oh, Lord bless me, lady. <laughs> not Mr. Giles, it is. Plain and simple. Oh, I... Giles is our jack of all trades and master of most of them. Um, Giles, did you want something? Oh, well, yes, sir. I wanted to know if you'd be wanting the horses ready this morning. Ah. Well, what do you say, Van? We can ride, use the carriage, or putter about in the car. Well, we've got to go down to the lake first. I want to look for the lady. Oh, begging your pardon, Mum, but if I was you, I'd stay away from the lake, uh, at least for a while, what does that mean, Giles? Oh, well, you know what I was telling you, Miss Drayton, and you said that oh, I... Oh, you mean all that nonsense about the water madness turning up again. <laughs> Did you find your cow? Now, wait a minute. What's all this about water madness? Well, uh, you know, sir. It seems everyone knows but me. Can't I be let in? Oh, it's just some silly local superstition. Why don't you get along and have a nice ride? Yes, why not? What shall it be, Van? Auto, carriage, or some good stout horse flesh? I'm a nice docile little mare, if you fancy the last, and I did see some riding clothes of yours, didn't I? Oh, yes, I love to ride. But no docile little mares, please. I'd like something with a little get-up-and-go. <laughs> <laughs> well, excuse me, Meg. I'll go up and change. You coming, Charles? Oh, I'm half-dressed for riding already. You could bring down my jacket, if you will, or I'll be up in a moment. Just want to check out the tack with Giles. Right, dear. Uh, you go ahead, Giles. Ride with you. As you say, sir. Meg, what's all this about Giles' cow? Oh, you know, the usual. It's been a dry summer, and while you were off in Europe, a few cattle turned up drowned. Giles lost a cow? No. At the moment, it's just missing. But, of course, he's convinced the Lady of the Mist is up to her old tricks. Now, look here, Meg. I don't want any of this nonsense brought up in front of Van. I'm sorry, but she has to know sooner or later. Oh? You don't like Vanessa? I didn't say that. Then what are you saying? Great heavens. Are you too blind to see for yourself? The resemblance... You've married the same woman you did 12 years ago, except for the accent. It's like bringing a ghost back to haunt us all. I think we'll stop this right here, Meg. I'm quite madly in love with Van. It's a whole different thing than that childish schoolboy marriage of years ago. But if you don't like it, you can get out. You don't have to live here. May I remind you that the manor may be yours by entail. But it's my money that keeps it running ever since you gambled your own away. Now let me tell you something in return. As it happens, Vanessa was left a very rich girl. And not only has she given everything to me in her will, but she's already given me power to handle her money. So I don't need you anymore, Meg. The apron strings have come untied. Charles, I don't want to quarrel. I don't know how this started. Nor do I. I just want you to know how things stand. Like it here and you're welcome to stay. If you don't like it, you can lump it. 
first I was shocked beyond belief. Charles hadn't defied me since he was a little child and I was left to bring him up. Then suddenly I was monstrously furious. The years were rolled back and it was Brenda all over again. An interloper had chased me from my room and from my rightful position. Title or not, I was the Lady of Drayton Manor. It was mine. And nobody was going to take it away from me. It didn't take me long to recover. It was just something to handle, as I always managed to handle things. The only question was how. That would have to be resolved. In the meanwhile, as time passed, things progressed exactly as I might have foretold. Charles! Oh, what is it, Van? You're not going off and leaving me like this? Well, good Lord, it's only for the day. I can't let old Gookie down. The pheasant are running and we always shoot over our land together. But why can't I go with you? Oh, don't be silly, Van, my dear. Hunting is men's business. No place for a woman. I'll be back by twilight. And leave me alone again all day? Not alone. You'll have Meg around for company. It isn't working that way, Charles. I'm afraid... I don't think Meg likes me. Oh, what nonsense. Meg's a bit stiff and formal, that's all. You'll break her down. Now, don't hold me up, darling. Can't keep Gookie waiting. <laughs> Like Brenda, the woman, <laughs> I should say the girl, just didn't fit in with our sort at all. Uh, uh, that's the last of the draperies, your ladyship. Where shall I have them took? What on earth's going on oh, here? Oh, just a moment, Meg. Right up to my bedroom suite, Giles. Oh, yes, your ladyship. I asked you a question, oh, I'm Van. sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to be rude. I'm going to do over our bedroom, for a start, anyway. Do over the bedroom? But it's, it's full of family heirlooms. Uh, excuse me. You can start taking them up, Giles. Uh, yes, your lady. <laughs> See, that's just the trouble, Meg. What? Well, they are heirlooms, and... <laughs> I'm sorry, but they <laughs> loom over me. <laughs> I'm trying to shake off all the cobwebs I've been fighting against. I, do, I don't want a past. I want the future for myself and for Charles. Oh, I know that that heavy old furniture and those musty old drapes are tradition, but they... they depress me, and I want it to be light and airy. So please try to understand. Oh, I understand, my dear. Of course I understand. <laughs> This was just the beginning. First the drapes, then the furniture, then me. Relics of the past to be thrown aside. Well, I had no intention of being cast aside. But I had to bide my time. So I concealed my feelings and I waited. You know, Van, darling, I've been thinking and I... I do owe you an apology. You do? Why? Oh, about the hunting thing and other stuff. I've I've been neglecting you, I suddenly realized, and I, I never meant to. Oh, darling. I do miss you, but I, I can't take up all your time. It's only that, well, while we're on a, a sort of honeymoon... Yes, I, I know, I know. I tell you what, why don't we run up to London for a little trip? Oh, I'd love it. And while we're there, we'll go on a real shopping spree. Yes, anything you say. You know what I want to do? What? The whole house. Refurnish it. Let some light and fresh air in. Would you mind? Oh, n not I, but... Yeah. Uh... Meg, I'm afraid she won't be very happy about it. Oh, she'll come around, and if she doesn't, we'll pack her off on a jaunt to the continent or around the world or something. <laughs> Matter of fact, if we have to, we'll just move her out altogether. <laughs> it's just you and I from now on that come first. Shame to say that I was eavesdropping every bit of that conversation from behind the hedge in the rose garden. But how dare they change Drayton Hall, cast me out? Oh no, never! You'll go first, Lady Misfit. I can't understand how Charles can stand to have you go round to remind him of. But then it isn't quite the same. But how can I move unless I have her to myself? And then suddenly. By the most tremendous stroke of luck, it was all arranged. Can 
Hello. Yes, this is he. What? Good Lord. Oh, Mrs. Chatham, I am sorry. I'm devastated. What can I do? Oh, yes, 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 of course. No, 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 no. I wouldn't have it any other way. One of the best friends I ever... Look, I'll drive up right away and stay through the funeral. Yes, only too glad to be of help. What is it, darling? Something happened to Reggie? He's dead. Heart attack. Just like that. Oh. His mother is in an absolute state. Can't take hold. Look, I'll, um, I'll throw some clothes in a bag and go there right away. I'll go with you. What? Oh, no, dear. Wouldn't work. Under, under the circumstances, much better I go alone. You will excuse me, won't you? And now I had her to myself. As soon as she was safely in her bed that first night, I started the water dripping. Not for long, just long enough to find out if it would waken her, and she'd hear it. I don't want to be alone again. Oh, Charles. Charles, I love you so. All right with you here, but when you're away, I... What's that? What's that sound? You're sure you didn't hear it, Meg? Not a sound, darling. It's a loose faucet or something, maybe in the plumbing. It's a, it's a strange sound, and don't it just... Don't you keeps... worry. We'll have Giles get rid of it. Matter of fact, why don't we stroll down to the lake right now? Well, what's he doing down there? He's installing a little present from me to you. Present? Yes, a light, so you can illuminate your favorite waterfall and the local legend. The Lady of the Mist! Oh, I've forgotten about her. Yes, let's get out into the air and listen to some pleasant-sounding water. And maybe you could tell me the legend about her? Delighted to, dear. And Giles can add his own embroideries. <laughs> he makes it quite an adventure, like listening to a ghost story on a windy night when one was a child. I had to move fast. I had much time. And I could see my way to... Removing Vanessa from my life and hers. Charming English gentlewoman Meg Drake, isn't she? And it's becoming quite clear in her genteel way, mad. Mad as a hatter. But does she really think in a few days she can drive Vanessa mad... Or what is the way that is quite clear to her? I'll return shortly with Act Three. So here we go with Meg leading Vanessa down the garden walk. In more ways than one. And now, the closer we come to the waterfall, which looks so charming at a distance, and whose gentle sound is muted and not heard at the manor, a different picture of it emerges. The terrain is lovely, the soft screen of water that falls a truly beautiful curtain of mist, and the lake stretching beyond, smooth as glass. But right beneath the rock, where the water falls is a pool that spins in a quite terrifying counterclockwise whirl, creating a deep bowl with a hole at the bottom that seems to suck everything away into infinity. I like it better from a distance. It's a little shivery close up, especially that evil-looking swirl of water in the pool. It's like, like some huge drain. What is it? Oh, that'd be the entrance to the cave, or the other world, like where she lives. He means the Lady of the Mist. Oh, well, what was? What is her story, anyway? Oh, she was some poor lady in the Middle Ages. The Lady of the Old Castle, which used to stand where the manor house is now. Built on some of the old foundations, is the manor. It's possible. At all events, men being what they are, my lady's husband lost interest in her for some other woman, or more than one, and... One night she came out, just as dusk was falling, and threw herself into the pool. 
committed suicide. Oh, anything falls in that pool gets sucked down out of sight. Shaft there seems to have no bottom. She doesn't want their bodies, you see, only their souls. But what for? To keep her company on the other side, wherever she lives between heaven and hell. They say she puts the water madness on them. And when that happens, no matter how strong a fence you build, you can't keep the animals in. No holding them when they hear the sound of water in their heads that draws them here. The sound of water in their heads. Oh, I'm kind of sorry now I got this close to it at all. Had to happen sooner or later. Best to have things out in the open. Oh, by the way, Giles, her ladyship thought she heard some sort of water noise in the house last night. Any idea what it could be? Why, no, ma'am. You know, we checked everything out before Sir Charles and her ladyship came back. Oh, unless... Have another look and see, will you? Yes. Uh, uh, did you hear it too, ma'am? No, uh, not a sound. Why, what's the matter, Giles? Oh, uh, why not then, ma'am? Uh, I was just remembering what you told me about the first lady. That'll be quite enough. On you go back to the house, Giles. Her ladyship and I will follow. Oh, yes, ma'am. Shall we get away from here? It's damp and dreary. Yes, let's. It's out of the sun. I can feel a chill in my bones. Meg, what was it that Giles started to say about the first lady, Drayton? The first? I mean, Brenda. You cut him off, didn't you? Did I? I? I don't know that I meant to. Why would I? You're hiding something from me, Meg. Oh, dear. I'm I'm not a very good dissembler, but I'd... I'd rather you ask Charles about Charles it. isn't here. Anyway, he said she died of pneumonia, didn't she? Well, Van, dearest, it was just a little... Oh, you might say white lie. He, he just wanted to save your feelings. Save my feelings? About what? <gasps> oh, she was found in the lake. Well, oh. yes, she she fell off the rock. <gasps> oh dear, I didn't want you to know. Charles will be very annoyed with me. I... It was an accident. <sighs> well, now it's out. I suppose you might as well know all the way. It was suicide. Both Giles and I saw her, but we're too late to stop her. Oh, how awful! But why? Why? I, I think we've talked enough if about it. If you don't it. tell me, I'll, I'll get it from Giles. It's a silly theory. He thinks his Lady of the Mist resents anyone who tries to take her place as the Lady of the Manor. Why? Did every one of them drown? I have no idea. You see, the Manor was empty for years until Charles and I reopened it. Everything's changed now. You certainly haven't a thing in the world to worry about. Everything was ticking along like clockwork. Or better still, like a jigsaw puzzle. The pattern was being built to create the picture I needed. I did some things that night. Took the telephone receiver on the maid's floor hall off the hook so Charles couldn't get through if he tried to call. When I turned the tap on, I left it running most of the night. Good morning, Vanessa. What's the matter? Didn't you sleep well? Oh, Meg, I had the most awful night. Whatever is the matter? Here, let me get you some tea. I've been up all night. You couldn't sleep? Why? Well, first of all, I was expecting Charles to call me. And I waited and I waited. I just don't understand why he didn't call. Well, maybe he will today. Is that what kept you up all night? No, oh. Charles didn't find out what was wrong, did he? What that leak was? No, my dear. He couldn't find a thing. Don't tell me you heard it again. It started about one o'clock, and it lasted most of the night. You didn't hear it? No, I didn't hear a thing, and I'm a very light sleep. Is it still going on now? No. It stopped about an hour ago, just as mysteriously as it began. Oh, and there's another thing, Meg. Yes, dear. It it was kind of you about the light. Light? On the waterfall, but... I think maybe if you wouldn't mind, I'd rather... Oh, Van, dear, what is it? You must tell me. Well, it... 
was so restless with that, that Chinese water torture going on. And I could see the light was on. And I I went to the window and... And what? Well, I know it's just auto-suggestion or whatever you call it, but I could swear I saw a woman in white behind the spray, and I... I even thought I heard her voice. <laughs> What's the matter with me? Oh, Meg. I feel I'm coming all unglued just the way I did after Mom and Pop. <laughs> now that settles it. I think we ought to have Dr. Vickers over to look at you. No. No, please, I don't want... To. I don't need a strange doctor. I'll be all right. All I need is some sleep. Oh, it was all working deliciously. The timing was going to be perfect, and this time I was going to be quite safe. It had been very risky with Brenda. I made the tea, dosing it carefully, carried it up to the hall table, nipped up to the next floor and started the tap again, and put the phone back on the hook. Not asleep. Here's the nice cup of tea I promised you. Asleep? With that awful, unending, relentless noise. What noise, dear? You mean you can't hear it? You don't mean the water sound. It's driving me mad. Can't we stop it? But darling, there's nothing to stop. Whatever it is, it's all in your... Well, I shouldn't put it that way. You must have an inner ear infection or something. Now, really, this time I insist. I am going to call Dr. Vickers. Yes. Maybe a better. At least, maybe he can give me a sedative. Yes. Now, in the meantime, you must drink your tea. Don't you hear it? Darling, why wouldn't I tell you if I did? <laughs> Why wouldn't I tell her indeed? Oh, everything was going just splendidly. She drank her tea obediently, not realizing she was getting another nice jolt to keep her on the ragged edge. Then I called the doctor. On the way down to let him in, I turned off the tap, of course. Very sensitive, very highly strung young lady. She doesn't take any kind of medicine, does she? Oh, no, Dr. Vickers. Not now, anyway. Uh, what do you mean, not now, Miss Drayton? I told you about her parents, how protected she'd been, and that she'd been under psychiatric care for several years. Oh, yes, possibly, possibly. There is a slight dilation of the pupils, uh, but then she's under such a strain that I'm I... I'm a very unstable girl. You... Oh... Do you think this girl might be a, a suicidal? It's what terrifies me. Ah, 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 ah. Well, I, I've given her a sedative and she should rest now. I'll look in again after supper. She should be watched very closely, very closely. I, I don't think she should be left alone for a moment. Uh, just in case. I could promise him that all right, silly old daughter. This time, I knew I had him locked up as my witness, if I needed him. Now, all I had to do was wait for dusk and hope the last act would play itself as perfectly. Vanessa, what are you doing up? I, I wanted to call Charles, but something seems to be wrong with the phone. It's always acting up in the country. But maybe he's been trying to get in touch with me. Oh, can't we go to the village and phone? But Charles took the car. Isn't there a carriage? Or could we go by horse? I wouldn't think of it. It's much too far in your condition. But Giles has a phone. I could go over there. Oh, no. And... I don't want to be left alone in the house. Well, if you feel up to it, dear, it isn't far. You would come along and make the call yourself. Oh, yes. Oh, please. Please take me. I'm... Sorry, I'm so slow, Meg. I I just feel so dizzy and weak. It's so dark. Don't worry, my little one. You'll soon be at rest. What are you stopping for? Come along. All right, Meg. But it isn't 
Isn't that the waterfall? Of course. We have to go over the path across to the top to no, get to Giles. I don't want to go. Wait, I, I don't want to go that way. It's the only way for you to go. The only way you have to go. Meg, you're hurting me. Don't, don't worry. You soon won't ever hurt again. Just like Brenda, only this time easier. What are you doing? Sending you to join your Lady of the Mist. No. Won't it be sad when you turn up days later drunk? You must be mad. You're mad. No, you are the mad one. Going to be a suicide just like Dr. Vickers was afraid you might. No. Meg, Meg, in heaven's name, are you out of your mind? Charles, uh, how could... Let me go. No. Van, what's going on? <laughs> Darling. When did you get back here? I've been trying to reach you since yesterday. I was frantic when I couldn't get through and you didn't call me, so I drove back. When I found the house empty, I went running over to Giles, half crazy, wondering what had taken place. When I, and then I just saw you. But why didn't you phone at Giles? Darling, Giles doesn't have a phone. Oh, God. She lied about that, too. Everything, everything must have been a lie. No, no, calm down. What? What was a lie? What? Who? What are you talking about? Meg! She was trying to kill me. Oh. Throw me over into the lake. Just as she must have done with your first wife. Meg? But where is she? It's too late. When you called out, you distracted her. I was trying to break free, but she lost her balance and she... Maybe we can help. No, no, no. If she went over, no one can help her. And from what you're telling me, nobody should. Ah, poor Meg. She must have been mad as a March hare. Oh, Van, darling. I suppose after this... You won't want anything to do with the Draytons. Oh, darling, I am a Drayton. I just want you to promise me one thing. What? Don't ever... Please, don't just ever leave me again. Meg's body never did turn up. Perhaps just as well. And Charles never did leave Vanessa alone from then on. Well, let's be sensible. After the crisis was over, no two sensible people take a statement like that, literally. What both of them did leave alone was Drayton Manor. Forever. Under the same circumstances, what two sensible people wouldn't? I'll be back shortly. By bit, agonizingly, Van and Charles eventually pieced the story together as we know it. A sad story. Few people would go so far as Margaret Drayton just to preserve the status quo, the way things are. But that is life's great illusion. Because the status quo doesn't exist, life is the process of constant change. The business of learning how to make the most out of life is to learn that to begin with. Our cast included Rosemary Murphy, William Redfield, Marion Seldes, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
is a certain kind of real estate which is special and unique. It can be at once the best or the worst place of all to be. If you want to hide from the world, shut away everyone else, and have perfect solitude, it's the place for you. But if you love your fellow man and value human contact, as most of us do, this paradise can be the very worst kind of hell. The piece of real estate is an island. And this is the story of a very special island. Our mystery drama, The Mysterious Island, was based on the classic by Jules Verne and written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Earl Hammond and Leon Janney. In March of 1865, the Union Army of General Grant had the town of Richmond, Virginia sewed up in siege. And a curious situation developed. Within the town were many northern prisoners, Union officers and others whose burning desire was to escape and rejoin the north. But while allowed certain liberties, the town was so strictly guarded that escape seemed impossible. However, just as their prisoners could not escape, the southern secessionists themselves were also trapped. That is how Forster's balloon came to be manufactured and inflated in the great square of Richmond waiting on North Wind, which arrived on March 18th with a vengeance. What brings you out in such weather, Captain Harding? What else, Mr. Spillett? Escape? Whenever the weather is bad is the time. The worse it gets, the better our chances. Have you a new plan? I've been approached by someone with a new idea. Who? His name is Pencroft, a sea captain and a navigator. Well, <laughs> we can hardly hope to escape by sea, so we have little need of a navigator. Don't be too sure. Suppose we were to escape by air. By air? How? We're looking at the means right now. Foster's balloon. Are you mad? We're not aeronauts. I am an engineer. Pencroft is a sea captain. We have some qualifications. Yes, and what about me? You, Mr. Spillett, will have a front page story for the New York Herald. And what a newspaper story for a war correspondent to write. As if I'm alive to put pen to paper. No, no, it's impossible. The craft is too well guarded. And besides, Jonathan Forster is scheduled to leave today. With five heavily armed men. The gondola is packed with $2,000 in gold, ammunition, and stores. But if Bencroft is right, he will delay his takeoff. Why? He reads this wind as the leading edge of a hurricane. Forster won't risk it. And you propose we should? It's a chance that may never come again. How many are we? Myself, yourself, Pencroft, and his son. How old? A boy, but full grown. We can't very well leave Pencroft behind. It was his idea, and he won't go without his son. Very well. When? Tonight, after dark, at 10 o'clock. Keep your fingers crossed that the wind does not die down before then. And so began an incredible adventure. As a writer, it naturally fell to me to keep the record of it. And weird and unbelievable as it may seem, I have tried to keep it faithfully. The hurricane that Pencroft had forecast became a reality. And when the soldiers guarding the balloon had run for cover, that was when we made our break. Captain Hardy, do you think we dare try to take off at least? It's our only chance. What do you say, Pencroft? Even me was ready to set out alone. Though well, I know nothing of sailing a lighter than aircraft. With you along, Captain, hey, your knowledge of balloons, we're doubly ready. Well, Gideon, you know you're with us. Well, if you think I'm going to miss out on the best story of the war, you're crazy. I am with you. All right, now listen. Luckily, the wind's blown out the gas lamps, so we've got the dark as well as the mist to shield us. But we'll take no chances, since none of us are armed. We'll split up now and each sneak up to the balloon from a different side. We meet there in five minutes. Hurry, Gideon, we're ready to cast off. Where's the boy? He was supposed to come from the east. I'll have to go look for him. Give him a chance. In the meantime, all of you, help me get rid of the ballast bags. Oh, uh, I won't go without my boy. Here he comes now. Sorry, I didn't mean to keep you waiting. What happened to you? It was Top. He must have broken his chain. Who's Top? My dog. I told him he couldn't come, but... Uh, uh, what, are, what are they going to do to you? He's roused the guard. Pencroft, grab the boy. I've got to go to him. I've Looks got like to go to him. Looks like he's coming to us. Cast 
cast off the cable on your side, Gideon, while I get mine. The dog jumped aboard. Oh, Top wants to go with him. Bring him in. Get him overboard. It's too late. We're five feet off the ground already. Thank heaven we're rising fast enough to get away from their bullets. We've made it. We've escaped. We're on our way home. Little did any of us know how long it would be before we saw that again, if ever. No words could describe the terror of the next five days. The full rage of the hurricane swept us through the air, tossing and turning the gondola basket like, like a pendulum till all of us were airsick. By night, the captain could not dare risk a descent, and by day, a curtain of swirling fog shrouded the earth. For five days, we rode the whirlwind, surviving it Lord only knows how, till at last, that morning, for the first time, the mist parted below us, and we saw the sea. It's sea beneath us. Yes, and we're falling fast. What's that sound? There's a rent in the balloon. The gas is leaking out. What can we do, Captain? Get everything overboard. Lighten her as much as we can. <laughs> oh, what about this gold? Over with it. It's over $2,000. Good. It might buy us our lives. Over. Come on. <laughs> the food, Captain. Everything, even the guns. It isn't doing any good. We're still falling. Land, Captain. Land. Top sword first. Land. Where? Where? Neb, you're right, boy. Off to starboard there. We'll never fetch it. We're almost in the sea now. Oh, we've got to lighten her more. There's nothing left to get rid of. Yes, there is. We'll cut away the gondola itself. Quick, all of you, climb up on the net around the balloon and cling to it. The wind's carrying us toward the island. But, but Tom, he can't up get up you there. go with the others, boy. I'll hand top up to you. Here. I got him. I've got him. Okay. Hurry, Captain. Hurry. We're almost on the wave top. Just one more cable. And oh, 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 what happened? We took a wave broadside. Look, it bounced the balloon up into the air. We're going to make it to land. We're going to... No, no, Top, Top! What is it, Nab? The captain, Dad. The captain, he's gone. And Top went in after him. It was true. A wave struck the balloon and carried away Captain Harding and the dog. And the loss of their weight had been just enough to let the collapsing balloon rise and the wind to carry it towards the land. Now, just before we came to the shore, the balloon, half inflated, fell again to the sea. And with the wind driving it and us clinging to the mesh, we were rushed to the shore, battered by the surf, fighting our way to shore, exhausted and half dead. Oh, easy, easy there, easy. Well, you'll find him. Oh, never, never in a sea like that. Any, any sign of him, Gideon? Uh, I didn't, I didn't have much hope. And I was too exhausted to go far. Uh, what happened to the balloon? As soon as, as soon as we cut ourselves free, the wind took it. It's gone too. Oh, it, it's top, it's top. Here, boy, here, boy, come on, boy. Oh, top, you're alive, you made it. God looks in good condition. Strange, something stranger. His coat's near as dry as a bone. How could that be if he come out of the sea? Well, he didn't. He came along the beach and... Hush, boy, hush. Well, then that means the captain may have made it ashore, too. I, I don't see a sign of him. If only Top could tell us. Oh, but he is, Mr. Gideon. He is. Look. He's got my sleeve and he's trying to pull me back the way he came. He's trying to take us to the captain. We followed the excited dog. He was leading us into the tropical jungle. Now, after fighting our way for nearly a mile, we came out in a clearing off which opened a cave. And in it, we found... It's the captain! Uh, down, Top, down. Well, I only hope he's still alive. Uh, captain, Captain, can you hear me? Neb, here, take my hat. Get some water from that stream. Yes, Father. How, how, how is he? Well, he's, he's unconscious. Oh, that's a bad gash in his head. But otherwise, he seems unhurt. How in the name of all that's holy could he have got out of that sea, cross all them rocks, and dragged himself here? Yes, seems impossible. But we haven't time to worry about any mysteries now. We have to try to bring him to. 
As I worked over the captain, my mind was busy with many questions. Where were we? Was it an island or a continent? Did it have inhabitants or not? And how could a man with so, so serious a concussion exhausted from a long swim have possibly dragged himself across those jagged rocks without injury and found his way a mile deep into this tropical jungle to the safe haven of this cave? I can't answer your question, Gideon. When I hit the water, I was knocked half dizzy. I swam as long as I could, but the waves were terrific. And the last thing I remember was thinking I'd had it and blacking out. You don't remember anything about getting to the beach or, or finding your way here? Oh, not a blessed thing. And Top? Oh, I, I remember his swimming beside me when I blacked out. Yes, but he could hardly have dragged you ashore. <laughs> hardly. Well, you'd better rest. Gideon, where are we? Well, that's what I've been hoping to ask you. I've been thinking about that since I regained consciousness. Now, traveling southeast from a starting point in Richmond at an average of 90 miles an hour ahead of the wind, my guess would be some 7,000 miles away and somewhere in the Pacific. 7,000 miles? Well, the distance is less important, perhaps, than the direction. The question is where we are here. Is it the South American continent, the Asian, the Australian, or is it an island? I can answer that. We seem to be marooned on a desert island. A desert island? Uh, how, how's the captain? Well, much better as you'll see, Neb. What luck? All kinds of luck. Unbelievable. Washed up on the shore, lashed to two barrels which kept it afloat, a, a, a great sea chest full of all sorts of tools and weapons and clothes. Maybe more important, two wooden crates. One full of tinned goods, the other ship staples. Coffee, flour, dried beef and the like. It's incredible. Washed ashore from some shipwreck? Well, maybe, only... Well, you tell them, Father. All I could say is them rope lashings hadn't been in the seawater long. Someone or something, we think, left those stores for us. And I know for sure I couldn't have saved myself. I had to have help. Divine or... No, no, just a minute. If anyone's saying that some supernatural influence hovers around the island... All I'm saying is what I see and what I know... mysterious island with its unknown benefactor who seems to protect our castaways. Is he real or imagined? And can he still protect them from all the dangers yet to come? If he exists, will they ever meet him face to face? I shall return shortly with Act Two. conceive of traveling 7,000 miles in an unguided balloon, of being swept from one hemisphere to the other? And yet, if you'll take out a map of the world and lay an ordinary ruler from Richmond, Virginia to the southwest, the direction that a northeast wind would blow you, you'll see you could end up somewhere south of the Hawaiian Islands in the midst of a sea that in 1865 was still largely uncharted. If indeed some other presence invaded our island, during the next month we had no further evidence of it. We were all too busy with our various tasks, and Captain Harding with regaining his strength to think much further about it. One morning, Neb and Pencroft set out to hunt, and I set about constructing some more earthenware pots on a wheel which the captain had designed. Good morning, Gideon. <sighs> morning, Captain. It's a beautiful day. Seems so to me. Thanks to you, Gideon. Ah, nonsense. I've done little. Without your leadership and knowledge, we'd all have been in a bad way. Now, this potter's wheel, for example. Without it, no dishes. The magnifying glass you made for me a watch crystal. Without it, no fire. Oh, hundreds of other things. Well, I'd be a poor engineer if I had no knowledge of simple mechanics. Are the others gone? Uh, yes, yes, good half hour since. Then I'd be an even poorer leader if I didn't face hard facts. 
What do you mean? We must find a better place to stay. But, Captain, we have shelter, water. Oh, I know the insects are bad at Gideon. night. Gideon, so far we've been concerned with survival. We've managed that. Now we have to consider escape. Escape? To where? Another island, then another. Till at last, the mainland or civilization. But how? We must build a boat. And to do that, we must be near the sea where it can be launched. Tomorrow, I start looking for our new home. Three weeks later, Captain Harding had found what we came to call Granite House, which became our permanent home. I will never forget the day he first led us to it. A great granite cliff suddenly reared straight up from the beach, a sheer wall facing the sea. To the side of it, we climbed a tortuous path, past a waterfall, till we came to a small plateau with a small lake cupped in it. Around the lake, we followed him to an opening in the granite wall, and then through a continuously downward path till... Seems like we're on our way back down to the beach again, except inside. Exactly, Mr. Pencroft. Well, we must have come a couple of hundred feet through this narrow cave, Captain. Not much further. This is a fascinating formation. At one time, I believe the lake above and the sea itself were one, filling these caverns. It won't come back and drown us now, will it? No, no chance. You'll see why in a moment. Ah. Now. Welcome to your new home. Why, it's huge. And all those windows opening onto the sea. That's why the sea no longer boils up into the lake. It broke through the granite eventually. Oh, it must be 60 feet down to the beach. A little less. But if we lived here, we'd have to have all that climb up and then hundreds of feet back down again. Not at all, Mr. Pencroft. We would build a stout door to protect our rear. Rope ladders from our windows to come and go, which could be drawn up if need be. Use the waterfall for power to help our machines and build our boat ready to be launched in the river mouth down below. Well, I I understand, Captain Harding, but do we need all that protection? Who knows? Are we not all sure there is some other presence on our island? We moved in, and we made it home, and we started to build our boat, the Bonaventure. Looking back over my diaries, it is hard to believe the time that passed almost unnoticed, but even harder to believe the amount of work that was done. On one of his exploring expeditions, Captain Harding had discovered the tattered remains of the balloon trapped in the treetops. These had been brought back to make sails. And at last, the great day of launching had happened, and we sailed within the lagoon, finding the Bonaventure handled very well. It was just at dusk, as we were returning to our mooring, that a strange thing happened. Help, Neb, come about. What is it, Pencroft? Don't if I know. There was an eddy there, like there might be a rock. But I... Uh, watch out to come about. Clear the boom. Tremor, Neb. Aye, aye, sir. No, no, hold a minute. Let her fall away. Now what, Ben? Right there, Captain, where I saw the water break like an eddy. See it? There, uh... A bottle floating. We came about, circling again. And sure enough, there was a bottle bobbing in the water. Penn sent Neb over the side for it. And in a few minutes, we hauled him in. Wet, but triumphant. What have you got, lad? It's just like, just like Father said. A bottle. Give it here. Here you are, sir. Let's see if we can get this cork out. There's a message inside, or at least a paper. Can you get it, Captain? What does it say? Just these words. Help. Please. Castaway. Tabor Island. 153 degrees west longitude. 37 degrees 11 minutes south latitude. Why? Well, that's not over 70 miles. Just over the horizon. We could make it in this craft easily as sailing downwind. But not all of us. It's near dusk. Head for the mooring. We'll set all our courses for tomorrow. I won't go into the discussion that night at any length. It's enough to say that since the boat could not handle more than three people, only two of us could go. At first, the captain and Pencroft seemed the logical pair, but Pencroft proved to be stubborn. He didn't want to be parted from Neb, 
and I had to agree that he was right. Everything we attempted was full of danger, and our boat was at best very frail. Obviously, it could be best handled by a seaman and his son. So, uneasily, we bid them goodbye the next morning. During the day, we kept busy, but with nightfall, the captain and I returned to worry and the helplessness of waiting. I don't like the weather. Yeah, it looks as if there's a squall on the way, but it, it should blow over long before they get back. Should I have let them go is the real question. <laughs> Another human being in trouble? What choice was there? If he's still there. Paper looked quite fresh. I don't think that bottle could have been long in the sea. Thinking back, that's what worries me. Well, nothing we can do but wait. With the fury of a demon, a tropical storm broke, and huge waves lashed at the shore below us. It was the night of the third day, and we had expected the Bonaventure back this night. Could she live in such a storm? Where have you been, Captain? I climbed down the rope ladder. The tides washed all the way to the cliff. I can't get to the bonfires to light them. Well, perhaps they haven't started back yet. I told them to spend no more than one day, and if they found no one to return. Maybe, maybe they saw the storm making up and delayed. Perhaps. Or perhaps the note in the bottle was some kind of a trick. The island may be inhabited. They may have been taken prisoner by some hostile tribe. Oh, I should never have let them. Oh, no, you, you can't blame yourself. But I do. Particularly for not being able to get to the signal fires. In the dark, for a wind like this, they miss the island. They may be lost forever. They may... Look! Look, Gideon! The bonfires! They're lit! They're burning! Impossible! How could any man in this tide reach the point except by sea? And no mortal could live in such a sea. Look out beyond the bonfires. Can you see it winking on the sea? The riding light of the Bonaventure. And the fires will lead it straight to home. It was the bonfires that saved Pencroft and Ned. And who or what hand had lit them was a question lost the following morning in the excitement of their news. For they had found a castaway on Tabor Island. A new member had joined our society. He was tall, a mass of hair and beard, half clad in animal skins and filthy, more beast than man, and his arms were tightly bound behind his back. When we first reached the island, we thought there was no one there, uh, although we did find a, an old broken-down shack, but that looked as though nobody lived there anymore either. Then we found him running on all fours like an animal. When we tried to come nearer, he attacked us. And I don't think we could have handled him if I hadn't had a pistol to bring him to his senses. Oh, he gave me a whopper of a black eye and we had to tie him up. He didn't want to come with us at first and, well, he won't talk. You, you can't get a word out of him. Then you don't know his name or who he is or what he was doing there? Uh, that's enough. I'm, I'm British. What's your name? Uh, that's as may be. You ashamed of it? Who are you, Governor? Captain Cyrus Harding. Oh, a military man, I... Union Army. Never heard of it. You American? I am. What are you doing on this here island? We're castaways, just like you. Captain Pencroft, sea captain, that is. His son, Neb. And Mr. Gideon Spillett of the New York Herald. Now, you tell me. What were you doing on that island? Oh, now, that's a long story. Captain Harding! Captain Harding, sir. Yes, Neb. What is it? I think you, I think you better bring your spyglass, sir. It looks like there's a there's a ship on the horizon. A what? Here, here's the glass, Captain. Where's my? Oh, oh thank you, Pencroft. Where away, boy? Uh, east by northeast, sir. About sixty points. By Tophet, you're right, Neb. There is a sail. Can you make her, Captain? She's too low on the horizon yet, but the ship it is. We are saved! We are saved! Well, I wouldn't be too sure on that yet, sir. Not if I was you. In the midst of their excitement, all four of them turned to the stranger among them. Their wild burst of hope and enthusiasm dampened chilled as though they'd been doused in ice water by the ominous tone of his voice. What does he mean? What enemy could the approaching ship turn out to be? 
I'll return shortly with Act 3. Well, now, let's see. We left our four castaways gazing in surprise and dismay at the marooned man they had rescued from Tabor Island. But uh, he wasn't looking at them. With his arms still bound behind him, he had moved to one of the great windows in the rock of Granite House and was squinting out to sea with a seaman's eye, his gaze fixed in the direction of the faraway sail, just clearing the horizon. What do you mean you wouldn't be too sure of that ship till she comes a lot closer? It'll be an hour or two before she comes near enough to see what she is. It doesn't matter what she is. She's a ship, and it means a chance to get back off this island and home. Pencroft is right, Captain. I'll go light the bonfires. Plenty of time for that, my boy. She might share off if she sees no sign of life here. Uh, not much chance of that, I should think. She... She could mean rescue for you four. And she could be bringing you what I'm afraid she brings me. She could be flying the black flag. The black flag? A jolly roger. A pirate ship. All right, everyone, let's calm down. Pencroft, take my glass and keep a close lookout on that sail. As for you... I think you'd better tell us this story of yours and make it fast. Uh, aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Tis ten long years since I talked to any man. The words come slow and my throat is stiff, but I'll try. As you, as you may have guessed, my trade was the sea. But in 1855, I'd been on the beach in Australia... And in desperation to keep body and soul together, mixed up in various trades, <laughs> none of them quite legal, I paled about with another no good who in his cups more than once claimed to be the legal heir of Lord Glenarvan. You mean the millionaire, the shipping magnate? Yes, the same. I never paid him much heed. And one night in a barroom fight, he was knifed. And killed by another Joey of mine. Joey? An Australian word for friend, Neb. Go on. Uh, about a year later, this big steam yacht put into Melbourne. And it's his lordship looking for his son. Well, between us, Bob Joyce and myself, we saw a real opportunity to make our pile and end up rich. Uh, the plan was simple. Lord Glenarvan's ship needed to take on some crew. I was to say I knew where young Glenarvan might be found. And then, ship aboard with some men we had on our side, and enough of Bob Joyce's gold to buy enough others in the crew. For what purpose? The boy was dead? Where could you leave them? Just far enough to see to take over the ship. Now, don't forget, a steam sail ship in those days in Australian waters. We'd have a freebooter which could own the seas. What's a freebooter? A pirate ship. And uh, I take it something went wrong with your plan. Uh, that's right. One of the crew I tried to buy went to the mate and threw him before Captain Gray. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. This sailor, fully proved guilty of the crime of fomenting mutiny, shall forthwith be hanged from the yard arm as an example. Moment, Captain Gray. May I speak to the condemned? Of course, your lordship. I can do little to save you, but... First, my son is dead. Uh, you can take the word of a dying man. Who killed him? Uh, that's not for me to say. Give me the name of the man so I can hunt him down and perhaps I can save your life. Well, why should I protect him now, whatever? The knife was in the back. His name is Bob Joyce. Very good. Bob Joyce. If I find this man, would you be witness against him? Well, that's a hard promise to make. Since within 15 minutes, I'll be dancing on the end of a yard arm. I could intercede. And have we set free? No one can promise that. On his ship by maritime law, the captain is in total command. Yet, I am sure my request could uh, save your life. You do that, my lord. And whenever you need me, just call on me. Oh, his 
his lordship was as good as his word, as far as it went. Oh, I was saved from the gallows. But by the captain's orders, marooned on Tabor Island for the rest of my life. His lordship has never returned to call on you, as you suggested? Uh, no, sir. Why do you suppose that is? Well, until two years ago or thereabout, I had supposed because Bob Joyce was dead. And then... And then? Uh, a ship came to call at my island. I was delirious with joy. But some sixth sense warned me. I let the boat land, remaining hidden in a secret place. Saw the men who felt I had betrayed him, Bob Joyce, and heard him. He vowed he would search every island in this area until he found me either dead or exterminated. Well, why was he so violent against you? Because he felt I betrayed him, condemned him to a life of piracy and fleeing the hangman. Well, that's why you're afraid of this ship we see bearing down on us. That it may be his ship. Uh, yes, Captain. Because of it is, I'll give you my word for what it's worth. That he will destroy me and all the rest of us without a single regret. I don't think there was one of us who wasn't deeply affected by the story Ayrton told, or not convinced of his honest repentance after the punishment he had suffered. But we had little time to dwell on that. For under a steady wind, the ship was upon us sooner than we expected. Less than a mile offshore, she came about, and after breaking out the Jolly Roger... Hold your fire. But she fired on us. The advantage of cannon, she's beyond our range. Uh, you're right, Captain. Don't answer her fire. It's what she's looking for. You mean to see if the island is inhabited? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Then if we don't answer, she won't anchor and beat off again? No, 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 no. We won't be that lucky. Uh, put some boats ashore. Some boats? Aye, lad. There's 40 to 50 men aboard her. Far more than we can handle. Except one way. Which way is that? You'd have to trust me. To do what? I see a spit of land going out there. It can't be more than half a mile to the ship from there. It's coming on to nightfall. Free my arms. Take me out there and I'll guarantee to swim to the ship and set off the powder magazine and blow them all to hell where they belong. And if I fail, what have you lost? Under cover of darkness, Nev and I sneaked down with him to the point, leaving the captain and Pencroft to hold the fort. Nev and I were armed with guns to protect him if he had to make a run for it. At exactly midnight, he slipped into the water for the long swim, and Nev and I settled down to wait and pray for his safe return. In less than an hour, all hell broke loose across the water in the dark. He was discovered. Now well, that much is obvious. How can we help him to escape? Mostly by keeping quiet and praying. The trouble is we never should have risked this. Well, well, why? Because obviously now they know there's someone on the island. And it won't take long to discover how few of us there are. Well, well, why should they bother us? I mean, maybe they'll just sail away. No, 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 I wouldn't count on it. They'll have to come to shore for water and... could see the ship exploding literally into fragments, which burst into the air in a spray, and for a long time, like a flaming rocket, hovered, till at last all the fragments came down to the sea and hissed out. Once again, it was black. We waited tensely, and at last we heard the splashing of a swimmer coming near. Guns at ready, we greeted... Mr. Ayrton! I... My lad, oh, give me a land. Here. Oh, a long swim. And a worthy one. You got to their powder magazine. Uh, no, not I. They found me before I, I could get there. The pirates? Oh, oh yes, it, it was them, all right. We, we all had a fortunate escape. Oh, thanks to you. No, no, thanks to me, lad. But their powder magazine blew up. Not through my efforts. W well, whose? Maybe. <laughs> the good God. But some other hand in mine. He's, he's passed out, Mr. Gideon. Yes. Exhaustion, I hope. Here, I'll take care of him. How is he? Not hurt. Just sheer exhaustion. Neb tell you about the... Yes, and as you can see, now it's getting light. There's no trace of the ship, and... Well, what is it? Look. 
Maybe that's our answer. To what? To the blowing up of the ship. The chest with the supplies. The bottle with the message. Everything that's been happening to us since we landed on this mysterious island. I looked. And rising from the sea was a sight I had never seen. A man, or was it a man, clothed in rubber with a great iron bubble on his head and two heavy tanks strapped to his back. Could it be human? Or was it something straight from the bowels of hell? Yes, gentlemen. I blew up your pirate ship. I am the answer to many strange things that have happened to you since you reached this island. Yes, I am. If you will. Your benefactor. Now you must help me. But who are you, sir? My name... Captain Harding, it is and will never be other than Captain Nemo. Nemo? The famous, the famous Captain Nemo of the Nautilus? You end of 20,000 leagues under the sea, the same. But, but I thought, well, well, most people believe that you and your fabulous undersea craft were destroyed. A belief since I shunned the company of men. I was happy for the world to accept. For all these years, I have combed the underworld of the sea alone, in peace. And your crew? One by one, Captain Harding, the sea, the rigors of our life, have taken their toll. At last, three years ago, I was left alone. And the Nautilus, that fabulous undersea craft? I piloted it to its grave under this granite cave you live in. The well. You used to come up it and you were diving apparatus and occupy this chamber for your own. Right. When you came to the island, I wanted to help. I did it the best I could. The chest of supplies and tools. The bonfires that were lighted to bring us home. My rescue from the sea and tops. The bottle with the message that Ayrton was marooned on Tabor's Island. But why? Why didn't you reveal yourself? My history is my flight from my fellow man. And now you choose to reveal yourself? Why? Because I am dying. I have made my last effort in your behalf by blowing up the pirate ship. Now I ask a return from you. What? Buried in a subterranean chamber below this granite house of yours lies the Nautilus. I am going to it to die. I ask you to make it my coffin. What is it you're asking? Restore my diving equipment to me. Let me descend through the well to my rest. Besides the explosive I used to destroy the pirate ship, I brought a chest. My gift to the living. Now let me go. Gift to the living? You may go, but where do we go from here? I can tell you where you must go. Must go? At least away from this island. The forces that trap the Nautilus are again burbling. There is an eruption coming which, in my belief, will bury this island in the sea. Mark my words. As soon as I descend to my burial chamber, you must set sail. In the Bonaventure? Well, it has barely room for three. Nevertheless, Mr. Spillett, you must load it to the gunnels. But any reasonable sea would swamp us. You must trust my belief that there will be no unreasonable sea. But where would we head for? Northeast by east, tracing the path you came. Only this time you travel the surface of the earth. Follow the trades, and you will reach the Hawaiian Islands. That, that's a wild venture. Not if you take my charts and the chest I leave you. Find your way home. And you? The sands of my life have run out. Once I am back where I have lived in isolation for years, I will be content with what is to come. But you... Leave fast. We left the island as we came, leaving every possession with weight behind. Oh, we sailed bravely away on the Bonaventure, wallowing in the sea. We had been forced there by the prophecy of Captain Nemo when the center of the island started to spout fire and later brimstone, and the whole earth had rolled in a terrifying warning that the island was about to blow up. We 
watched by the king. And within all of us, a painful dread. The secret of Mysterious Island. What is it? That life is made to be lived, no matter how we find it, or how it may present itself to us. And that beyond us, there is a special being. Yes, if you want to believe in that. And if you do, you can believe that he can make anything possible. Or much more important, that through him, you can make anything possible. If you just try hard enough. I'll be back shortly. A unique and fascinating man, Jules Verne. Over a century ago, he was opening vistas far beyond the vision of the ordinary man, charting unknown seas and revealing what lay beneath them, ranging across unclimbed mountains, through virgin forests, reaching even deep into the heart of the earth to bring his readers the world of imagination. Where would the rest of us be if the dreamers and the visionaries didn't possess the keys to keep opening new doors to new tomorrows? Thank God for Jules Verne. Our cast included Earl Hammond, Leon Janney, Jackson Beck, and Roger Barron. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. This tale isn't for the easily scared or the faint of heart. It's a full-blooded ghost story and introduces once again that intrepid voyager into the unknown seas of the supernatural and the occult who always manages to return with a pragmatic explanation of what seems to be the inexplicable. Our mystery drama, The Shining Man, was based on the short story by E. and H. Heron and written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin, and stars Bob Caliban and Morgan Fairchild. I don't know about you, but to me, it seems a pity that haunted houses have gone out of style. Perhaps it has to do with the uncompromising utilitarianism of modern houses. After all, what self-respecting ghost would feel at home without a turret room, a sliding panel or two, and a host of shadowed, twisted corners? So to enjoy our story, let's retrace our steps back to the turn of the century, when walls were wainscoted, ceilings were high and ornate, and the clanking of chains and groans from the grave were enhanced instead of smothered by insulation and acoustic tile. I hope he's on this train, Uncle Flax. He was due last night, and he wasn't on the morning train. Well, whatever held him up, it must have been a very important something indeed to keep my nephew Donald away from your side for so long. Oh, it doesn't matter anymore. There he is. Don? Oh, darling, Gigi. It's been a thousand years. A million without you. Was the trip worth leaving me abandoned here in London? Oh, just will you hear. Hello, Uncle. Hello, Don. Did you take the position? I did. 
you are now looking at the brand new headmaster of the Girvan Academy for Boys. Not only that, but I found us a house. Oh, I knew the trip would be worthwhile. I just knew it. Congratulations, my boy. Oh, uh, I, I must talk to you about the house, too, Uncle Flax. Oh, there's time enough for that at home tonight. Now, uh, if it's a matter of finances... No, 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 <laughs> nothing to do with that. It's... Well, I'll explain later. Well, whatever it is, you know you can count on me. My name is Don Campbell. I'm of Scottish and English descent. But I was educated in Canada and America, where I met and married my wife. Gigi was an orphan, like me. And in 1900, being at that time unemployed, we were overjoyed to accept an invitation from my only relative, Mr. Flaxman Lowe, to visit him in London. While there, I suspect through my uncle's pulling a few strings, I had been offered an interview for a job as headmaster of Girvan Academy in Scotland. The job sounds marvelous, Don. But I know you. Why do you keep avoiding talking about the house? But that's marvelous, too. Do we need a house? Surely it couldn't have been too difficult to rent something furnished. But the house is furnished, too. And Gigi, I mean, it was too good a thing to pass up. The bargain of all time. Well, what sort of bargain? What what sort of house? Well, it, it's kind of hard to describe. I mean, it's it's really stunning. High on a ridge. And the view is stupendous. Connor Old House, it's called. When you look at it from outside, you'll fall in love with it just as I did. <laughs> and the inside? Oh, uh... Well, it's it's been empty for quite a few years. And, well, there's work to be done there. And... I've already arranged with the agent to hire a man to clean it up. And the price includes the furniture. Don, are you trying to tell me you've bought this house without my ever even seeing it? Well, not exactly bought. Just a down payment. Oh, but darling, I tell you, it was such an incredible bargain. Why is this house such an incredible bargain? Well, I suppose because it's supposed to be haunted. Oh, that's great. Well, Gigi... I couldn't pass up an absolute steal like this. I can't describe to you how lovely Connor Old House is. Clothed in ivy, on the highest hill within its horizon, with the green grass tumbling down to the cliffs and the dunes and the endless sea beyond. And the ghosts you spoke of? Oh, local superstition. And if they bother us by groaning and clanking about, well, there's always Uncle Flax. As a parapsychologist, they're his life work. And he can blow them away just like the mists. Are you so sure? Brandy, Uncle Flax? Yes, thank you. You're not joining me? No, thanks. I, uh... Well, I only got you away from Gigi so I'd have a chance to talk to you about the house. All right. What's troubling you? The house is supposed to be haunted. By whom? What they call the Shining Man. The Shining Man? Uh-huh. Hmm. What does that mean? Oh, a lot of talk. Gibberish, but I honestly don't know. I, oh, I think a trick of the moon on the windows reflecting. I, something like that. Mm, I see. Who was the uh, former owner? Uh, Sir James Mackay who had retired from abroad, Central Africa, I think. He lived there with his daughter and a gigantic black who apparently was devoted to him for saving his life in Africa. Why did they leave? Well, they didn't. The daughter, it seemed, had contracted some virulent disease from her African sojourn, and she died while her father was on some business in London. Mm. And the father? The shock of finding his daughter dead on his return was too great for him, and... He settled into a sort of melancholy and eventually died. It's not a very pretty history. What happened to the slave? Slave? Yes, the black man. I didn't say he was a slave. Oh, yes, that's right, you didn't. Uh, what uh, happened to him, anyway? Oh, I don't know. Uh, well, let me see. In, in the local gossip, there was something about Sir James accusing him of being responsible for the girl's death, but... Well, it never came to anything because the black had disappeared, and not long after, Sir James was found on the living room couch, dead of apoplexy, his face covered with horrible, livid patches. 
And this is the home to which you expect to take that pretty young American wife of yours? <laughs> oh, don't be ridiculous, Uncle Flaxman. The tragedies of others have nothing to do with us. A house is not a person. It can't affect us. <laughs> well, and even if there are any malign influence hovering around, well, I have the best protection in the world, don't I? Oh, yes? What is that? You. Aren't you the foremost ghost detective in the world? If we run into trouble, can't I coax you to tilt a couple of tables or at least exorcise any demons if they're wandering about? My dear boy, you know I am always at your service, but uh, I wouldn't joke about the unknown, Don. Why this house instead of any other? Because it's the only one I can afford. And I've already made a down payment. So, there we were. Gigi and I, with all our worldly belongings, off for Scotland as soon as we could pack. Of course, I should have stopped to write first and waited for a reply, but that isn't my way. I had made a decision. Why waste time? Especially since London was expensive and almost all my money had gone for the payment on the house. And it would be a month before I could expect my salary at the academy to begin. We had to take the train north to air and then debark and retrace our steps south some 30 miles to Gervan, the nearest town to what I now thought of our home. It was a good 25 miles by road, and it was after dark on a blustery, drizzly evening when we arrived at Lanark Inn, where I had stayed before. Happily, the landlord remembered me and had accommodations. Hey, hello there, Mr. Campbell. It's good to see you again. Will you be staying? Oh, just for a night or so, Mr. McTavish, with my wife. Well, bid you good welcome, too, Mrs. Campbell. Oh, but you're a bonny lass, and I can't blame Mr. Campbell for making you his own. <laughs> but, but you look a wee bit chill. Now, come on, Ben, and you'll warm yourself by the fire, the two of you. Mr. McTavish was as good as his word. Not only did he have a fire, but he had some warming beer. And with it, some heavenly steak and kidney pie. So, what brings you back to Girvan, Mr. Campbell? Well, I'm back to stay, Mr. McTavish. All right. And uh, where would that be? At our new home. I'm going to buy Connor Oldhouse. Uh, you yeah. are? Oh, my husband can't wait to take possession. If it had been daylight, it'd have moved right in. I'd move in right now if I were sure it had been aired and cleaned thoroughly. Mr. Niven, the agent, wouldn't still be around town, would he? Oh, no, he's away home long before twilight. He, uh, he lives quite far down the road. Oh, well, I'd rather see the house by daylight first anyway. We can move in tomorrow. No, I wouldn't haste too much till, uh... Well, uh, till you've had a word with Tommy Niven. Well, of course, we have to see him first. I'll be up at the crack of dawn waiting in his office till he comes in. Well, I don't think in the morning he'll be by. He'll be over to Contrer, I would think, to, uh, uh, to the funeral. What funeral? Uh, well, you see, it was this lad he engaged from the village here to, to clean up Connor Oldhouse. Yes, I commissioned him to do that. What about him? Well, it's not all that easy to get folks hereabouts to to go near Connor Oldhouse, even in the daylight. After all that's happened there. You mean Sir James and his daughter and their unfortunate deaths? Aye, and then over all that, there's the... Uh, the Shining Man? Aye, him. Oh, and in front of the lady, I didn't want to... Oh, that's quite all right, Mr. McTavish. Don has told me all about the history of the house. It's sort of exciting, but... Well, I don't really believe in ghosts. I'm not scared. That's my wife. Hey, I don't know but what I'd be a wee bit canny if I were in your shoes. It wasn't he only the doctor and his daughter. But there was what happened to the tinker as well. And poor slow jock. Oh, no, now, wait a minute. Who's the tinker? And, and who's poor slow jock? Well, here, 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 one at a time. The tinker was a nobody, a tramp, or a, or a, or a bum, I think you'd be calling him in the States. And a couple of years back, he moved himself in. It looked to be as if he lived in the kitchen, quite comfortable and happy for a few days. But then, he moved into the library, and... And? And they found him on the library couch. Sir James's couch, that was. 
stark, raving mad and at death's door, and his face all over with great black marks like he'd been in a peat bog. <laughs> we just had a dirty face. We probably got caught in the rain and went into Connor Old House for shelter and died quietly of pneumonia. Raving? With the DTs, just like poor Jock. What happened to him? Oh, only the good Lord could maybe answer that. But he was just like the tinker, lying on the couch. Only he was dead. Oh, and an expression on his face only old Clutie himself could have written there. Old Clutie? The devil. Well, don't tell me Jock's face was blackened too. Aye, uh, mm, just like the others. Oh, here. Now, I hope I'm not upsetting you. Oh, no, no. Nothing of the sort. Just the, the right thing to make us sleep like tops. Uh, well, the toddy should take care of that. But, uh, I just thought you ought to be warned. Come to bed, Don. Why are you watching out the window? Oh, uh, nothing. It's started to rain. Typical Scottish drizzle. I think there's going to be a storm. No, I don't... What is it? Don, what did you see? Uh, I, I didn't see anything. Go back to bed, Gigi. Don, you're looking towards our house, aren't you? Connor House, I mean. Yeah, yes, I... Well, I mean, that's the general direction, but it's... I see it. I see what you saw. What? A light. Glimmering like a... Like a huge June bug, only it's... It's shaped like a man. Oh, dear Lord, it is haunted, just as the innkeeper said. Look, Don, look, it's the shining man. Now, wouldn't you say that's a fair beginning for a story of a haunted house? What is it that Gigi has seen or thinks she saw? Some trick of refraction of the light from the inn windows against the misting drizzle of the rain? Or a real light carried by a real person who has no business in Connor Old House? I shall return shortly with Act Two. From ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night, good Lord deliver us. An old Scottish saying, and one that shivered through Gigi's mind that night, trickling in icy waves down her spine, till at last dawn coaxed her to sleep. But with the coming of morning, all the night fears seemed ridiculous, particularly in the face of Thomas Niven's cheerful scorn. The real estate agent was a giant of a man, an old Scotland rugby player who boomed and beamed and bubbled with good cheer. Oh, pack of Tommy rot, the whole thing. Old wives' tales and gossips gabbling, eh? <laughs> that tramp was sheer coincidence, and Sir James and his daughter, well, that was tragedy, if you will, but nothing supernatural about it. Oh, what about this boy, Jock, Mr. Niven? Oh, yes, well, Jock... Now, there I do blame myself, Mr. Campbell. I, I should have realized that the boy wasn't up to the job. Never send a boy on a man's errand. Uh. Was he really so young? Uh, not in years, Mrs. Campbell. A man grown, in body, that is. But he was a touch, uh, well, you know, not not quite right in the head. Mark you, that would never have interfered with the clean-up job. It was just the sort of thing for him under ordinary circumstances. And he and his mother could always use the money. You say ordinary circumstances... I thought you were telling us that there's nothing extraordinary about... About Connor Oldhouse? No, 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 I don't believe there is. Well, then what caused the poor fellow's death? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Campbell. It couldn't have been the shining man, could it? Oh, good heavens. They've gotten to you with that old gibberish, have they? Well, whatever you've heard, <laughs> forget it. There is no such thing. I'm afraid there is. What? I saw it. We both saw it. Last night. Where? Well, he seemed to be in Connor Old House. Oh, and you were looking from the village? From our window at the inn, yes. And this would be after dark? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, I've seen that myself. Whenever it's misting very heavily. <laughs> that was no ghost you saw, Mr. and Mrs. Campbell. That was Ignis Fatuus, Friars Lanthorn, if you wish. What? W what we call Will-o'-the-Wisp, honey. 
Caused by swamp gas, I think. Yes, just the way of it. Sulfuretted hydrogen, actually, rising from rotting vegetation and such, and spontaneously ignited in spite of the damp, so that it glows in the dark. Well, you think that's what the boy saw, and that it frightened him to death? Oh, yes, very like... What did the doctors say caused his death? A uh, sheer physical fright, acting on an already faulty brain. Oh, I say hello, that's overdue. He's been on the way for a couple of days. I'm afraid we're in for a bit of bad weather. Shouldn't bother you too much, though, since I'm sorry to say the house isn't ready to receive you as yet. I haven't been able to find anyone else to get over there. Uh, Mr. Niven, before we take any further action, perhaps I should let my wife see the property. Well, now, look, you're not thinking of backing out on me, man. Great heavens, you have the bargain of a century in that house. What I'm beginning to wonder is... Why? Oh, I can tell you that. Idle tongue, sheer and simple. How I picked it up myself. You mean the house is yours? Well, you didn't tell me that, Don. I didn't know, dear. I thought Mr. Niven was only acting as an agent for the original owner. Oh, well, you see, actually, I bought it from Sir James' estate for my grandmother and put it in her name before she died. Uh, never had a chance to move in. So it has stood empty the last few years. I, uh... I will say, however, that if you're considering backing out on the sale, in my opinion, you'd be a fool, young man. Well, it isn't the house, Mr. Niven. It's... well, it's its reputation. Well, then, Mrs. Campbell, I tell you what I'll do. I do feel a little put out that I didn't have it ready for you, as I promised you and your husband. So, as soon as the rain lets up, since I can't find anyone else, I'll go out and clean the house myself. Well, I shouldn't think a man would want... Oh, my dear girl, I'm a sailor, and you've only to look at my boat to see what a first-class housekeeper I am. I promise you she'll be shining like a new pin. Not only that, but I'll want to set your mind at rest. I'll spend the night there, too. And show you there isn't a single solitary thing to fear in Connor Old House. I will admit that I had misgivings. I'd even partially allayed them by sending a wire that morning before we had gone to Mr. Niven's office, asking my Uncle Flaxman to come up to Girvan, post haste, by the next train. But Mr. Niven was so obviously physically powerful that I pushed them aside. If I had known the terror that awaited him and us, I would never... But well, that is only hindsight. In no time, it was the afternoon of the next day, and Uncle Flax had arrived, and we were briefing him on all that happened in the tap room. Oh, dear, 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 dear. Just listen to that rain. It's a pity. I'm really very anxious to have a look at this strange house of yours. You don't think it really can be haunted, do you? I mean, you can prove it isn't, can't you? Well, I don't know, Gigi. It may very well be. But I, I thought you were a, a ghost detective. I mean, an investigator who proved that they were fakes. All your famous cases Oh, were... uh, not all, my dear. Most, perhaps, but certainly not all. Are you trying to tell me that... that there really are such things as ghosts? I think there is such a thing as the human soul, dear girl. A spirit that has its own life independent of the body... I've seen too much evidence of it in my investigations not to believe in it. But it does not necessarily follow that there is some lost soul haunting Connor Old House. Oh, I don't know. Now you're really beginning to scare me. I'm really afraid, terribly afraid, that there's some awful, malign, dreadful thing that lurks there by night that doesn't want anyone disturbing it, that kills to keep it for its own. Well, if there is, my dear, then we must exorcise it. But first, we must find out what it is. In spite of the weather, we would have tried to go over to Connor Old House that afternoon, but the driver refused to take his horse out again in that torrential rain. And by the time the rain had slacked off, it was too late, for the long Scottish twilight was beginning to fall. Gigi was lying down before supper when I came downstairs to find my uncle gazing out the window... Through the peculiar half-light. Uh, Donald, come here. B yes, Uncle. Over toward the house, you see that? That light patch in the darkness? Where? Framed by the house as though it uh, came from one of the windows. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I see it. The darker it gets, the more that light glows. And seems to be taking on shape. Is that uh, what you saw last night? Yes, I... I, I think so, but... Could that be a candle or... 
lamplight from the house? No, no, the color is wrong. It's not soft and yellow, and uh, there's no flicker. Just the steady blue efflorescence. You think it might be Will of the Wisp? No, it's too steady. Hello. There goes some lamplight. Moving from room to room, it seems. And the other glow is gone. It doesn't like the real light, it would seem. Hmm. What do you think, Uncle? Without any facts to go on, very little. I only wonder. But I do know three things. What, sir? First, that it is too dark for us to venture out there tonight. Second, that when we do, we will not take Gigi with us. And third, we had better leave tomorrow at crack of dawn. With the first rays of light, and with Gigi still fast asleep, we were off by carriage for the long drive to the ridge. When we pulled up in the cobblestone yard in front of Connor Old House, it was as silent as a tomb. Only the gulls screaming out to sea. Could your Mr. Niven have left already? Do you suppose he missed him? Well, I don't see how. He came out here by carriage, so... Well, he'd have had to use the road. We'd have passed him. Came from the stables. He must still be there. That horse sounds frightened. Uh, Come along, Don. You've been in the house before. Now, you take it. I'll take the stables. He left me. I hurried up the stairs of the porte cochere, and after testing the handle, swung open the heavy hall door. The gloom of the wet dawning and the heavy smell of stagnant air filled the great hall as I looked around its dreary emptiness. The silence inside the house was oppressive. I called Mr. Niven's name, but the noise only echoed through the house, jarring on the stillness. I walked, almost timidly to the middle of the hall, my footsteps silent on the carpet of accumulated layer upon layer of dust. Wherever Nivet had been cleaning, he certainly hadn't started here. I felt a wave of panic spiral up from my stomach, and I called his name again. Mr. Niven? Mr. Niven? Don? I... It's all right. It's all right. It's only me. No sign of him here. No. You didn't find anything at the stable? No, just a poor horse bathed in a lather of sweat, shying at the blink of an eye. Something's happened to scare him, but not in the stable. Or here, it seems. I don't see how Niven can be in this house. Oh, why? Well, you can see the dust everywhere. And my footsteps, no sign of any others. He's here in this house. How do you know? I can sense it, and the vibrations are bad. Uh, come, which way are the living quarters? Uh, this way. Including the library? Right through this door. It seems to be stuck. Oh, there. Good Lord. Oh, that smell. The smell of death. Let me pass. No, Uncle. No, uh, don't. don't. Come, come, help me. I found your Mr. Niven, I think. Oh. oh. Is this he? Yes. Is he dead? No, I don't think so, but we've got to get him out of here and home before he is. What happened to him? I don't know, but whatever it was, he was trying to run from it when he fell against the inside of the door. Come, my boy, if we're to save his life, we must get him out of here. <laughs> I hope you're not listening to this alone. Not that I want to scare you. Yet. After all, we still have no idea what else was inside that room that drove a strong, healthy athlete in the prime of life to the edge of death, do we? For that matter, we don't even know if it is still here. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borrow groves, and the mom rats outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jujubird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. 
I mention this quote from Lewis Carroll not because it means anything, which it doesn't, but because it suggests evil incarnate and crawling things calculated to send a shudder to the roots. The indescribable, fetid odor from that haunted room was so stifling and smothering that it almost overpowered my Uncle Flax and me as we struggled to carry the big, heavy, inert body of Niven from the room. We half dragged him through the door to the relief of fresh air and the carriage outside. How is he, Uncle? In a rather bad way. He needs medical attention as soon as possible. Hey, giddy up! Giddy up! Hold on! You think he was scared to death? Like the poor guy he sent up to clean the house before? Not to death, since he's still alive, but something has given him a shock, all right. A profound shock. Something? You you mean the place is haunted? I didn't say then. But you meant it. Perhaps, in a sense. What do you mean, a, a sense? When we opened the door and that awful stench poured out, you, you said it was the smell of death. It's a figure of speech. I'm afraid only time will tell. Now, hurry now. Get back to the inn. Oh, Mr. McTavish, what's going on? Where is my husband? Oh, he's scrubbing from top to toe with lye soap, as Mr. Lowe himself did first. And my uncle? Well, after he carried all the clothes out and started them burning, he went back to the bedside of Mr. Niven. Burn the clothes? Well, what was the matter with the clothes? Oh, I don't know. Contaminated somehow from that evil house of warlocks and ghoulies. Don, darling, are you all right? Well, I feel a little as if I'd been skinned alive. Otherwise, yes, yeah, What fine. do you mean, skinned alive? Well, the scrubbing and that strong laundry soap. Is that all? Oh, can I touch you now? Oh, darling... I want you to hold me and never let me go. Oh. Now tell me what happened. What about our house? Our house? Oh, I wish the damn thing had burned to the ground before I ever saw it. That's what I wish had happened. Mr. Niven, you think you can tell me the rest of what happened now that you're feeling a little better? Oh, well... I could try, but I, I didn't know. Where was, was I? Who, who did you say you were? My name is Flaxman Lowe. Now, you started cleaning the back of the house, the kitchen, the dining room, the pantry, the living room, so on. Hmm? Yes, yes, it was daytime, but I, I got there later than... Then I'd hoped. I understand. So suddenly, night was upon you, and you lit a lamp, eh? Yes. So after you lit the lamp, you went into the library, right? Yes. I went in. Oh, oh that, that awful smell hit me and, and turned me sick to the pit of my stomach. I, I must have passed out. How do you suppose you got to the door where we found you? I woke up again, and the lamp had gone out, but there was this... Ghastly light. I, oh, no, I, I don't want to remember that damned house. Why didn't I burn it the day I bought it? And when he came to, Mr. Niven told me the lamp had gone out, but suddenly he was aware that the darkness was clearing. A feeble light was filtering down through it from above. He looked up at the ceiling and saw there an irregular patch of pale, phosphorescent luminescence which grew gradually brighter and brighter. The shining man. When he had the impression that through the radiance above, someone was looking down on him. And through the thickening atmosphere of drowsy horror, choking and revolted by the growing odor, he looked up again. To see what? To see the brightness dim and dark smears show through it, all running together into something that swelled out and downward like a fat, green, white, evil face from which great drops of black, dripping fluid fell like rain. Oh, good Lord. And suddenly, fear and loathing broke his chains enough for him to run to the door where he plunged forward into a dark, red vacancy to remember no more. 
So the place is haunted. By whom and why? Yes, Uncle, why? And who is the Shining Man? Why does his ghost haunt Connor Old House? I can only answer two of those questions. Which? I mean, I can guess the answers. Who it is and that he is no ghost. As to proving it and the why, that will have to wait until tomorrow. So, here we are again, back at the library. Yeah, at least it smells a little better today. Uh, nevertheless, put your handkerchief over your mouth and nose, as I'm doing, before we enter it. Now, come over to the couch. Why the handkerchiefs? Oh, it's simply that I believe the dust in this room to be poisonous. Niven inhaled too much of it, hence his condition. It is literally piled up around the couch here. Uncle, look. Above, on the ceiling, a long, discolored stain. You see that? Yes. So I should have expected I, uh... I think that explains everything. A blood stain on the ceiling explains everything? Well, what do you mean? Oh, wait a minute. Look. What? You see those tracks? A cat has been walking over this sofa. Can you explain that? And what do you mean about the blood stain? My dear boy, the stain on the ceiling has nothing to do with blood. It is simply a patch of mold and fungus. As for what you call cat's footsteps... Look at them more carefully and uh, you will see they look more like raindrops. Raindrops? In a perfectly watertight room where the dust is so dry the slightest movement makes it rise like smoke? Ah, the dust. When we came to fetch Niven, I noticed how green and fine it was and how enormous an accumulation of it there was in this room. Why? Because this dust is like the powder in a puffball formed of minute spores. And that's why it's poisonous? Well, I have no doubt that from this dust, as we shall call it, within a few days, a specimen of fungus could be cultivated, which would prove to be African in origin. But if the dust is so dangerous, aren't we running the risk well, of... Well, not if we don't inhale too much. And last night, incidentally, I saw that Niven's coat was covered with it, and that above the collar and along the upper part of the sleeve, as though they had dropped from above was a spatter of gummy marks which corresponded to these so-called raindrops. What else would you call them? Oh, drops from the stain on the ceiling caused by the unnamed fungus I mentioned, which decays as it matures, liquefying into a dark mucilage which drops down, diffusing a repulsive smell, which disappears as it dries and leaves only the dust of the spores and... Uh, those raindrops are most certainly what killed the boy, the tinker, and Sir James and his daughter. How? Oh. Well, I would guess that the fungus is singularly malignant, acting through the skin to the brain, then interpenetrating all the tissues of the body with terrible rapidity and causing a violent and horrible death. Which Mr. Niven escaped because the drops touched only his clothing and not his skin. Exactly. Ah, oh, I see. But well, what about the light? The, the ghost must have caused all this. Why don't we go upstairs and perhaps we can find out. Look, Uncle. Look. The light. Yes, son, I see it. When, now it's gone. It, it, it just quivered for a moment as uh, though... Where it, would you say it came from? Um, from that... Dark end of the hall. Between those two doors? Yes, that's where I saw it. But where could it have gone to? What actually come from? Which uh, room? Hm. You take the left, I'll take the right. We searched both of the rooms with a fine tooth comb, but there was no sign of anything. Then Uncle Flaxman had a brilliant idea. We paced off the width of each room inside. Then the total yardage outside in the hall. Between the rooms was a common wall which must, by our measurements, be some three feet wide, but no door in either to a closet. In the hall, we looked at the seemingly solid wall between the doors. Then Uncle Flaxman said, Close your room door while I close mine, Don. Right, Uncle. 
now that it shadowed again in here. Back up toward the stairwell. Ah, you see that? A glimmer of light as though it were behind the solid wall. Which means the wall can't be solid. Come here. Hello. Well, there must be some sort of secret room or closet there. Let me see. Uncle. What is it? There's some sort of a catch here to the upper panel. Probably a means of opening it to ventilate the space between the walls. Try it, my boy. Try it. I have it. Oh, oh that smell again. Ah. And look. Good Lord. What is it? I fancy it is the body of the missing black man who was supposed to have worshipped his master and his mistress. Black? But he's white. What's that shining white stuff all over him? A fungus. The fungus. The shining man, whose phosphorescent glow on damp evenings sometimes shone through the little window at the end of the closet and scared everyone in the countryside half to death. Not a ghost, but just a poor man who met a terrible death in a coffin of his own making. How horrible. Oh, Don, how horrible. Who was he, anyway? Sir James Mackay's faithful servant. Ah, but remember, I said slave, and I think not so faithful. What do you mean, Uncle? I have always intended to devote myself to the study of Obia. Obia? What, what is that? Voodoo. A fetish-worshipping religion of sorcery and conjuration. In the dead man's hands were the remains of two crude figures, a man and a woman, coated with a fungus. You mean he was responsible for the deaths of Sir James and his daughter? Or for wishing his gods to take vengeance on them for the virtual slavery in which he had been held all his life. Poetic irony, isn't it, that the monster he called into being in the end was the means of his own destruction? Oh, that house. I could never live in it now. Well, don't worry, darling. We never will. What should be done about it, Uncle? It should be burnt to ashes, just as we did our clothes. It's the only way the spirit of evil will ever be exorcised from Connor Old House. <laughs> That same night, Connor Old House went up in a pillar of smoke, its funeral pyre lighting the Scottish night. Interesting that earlier that same evening, Mr. Niven, now recovered, had left the inn for his home. Don Campbell had ridden alone to the post office for a letter which didn't arrive, and Mr. Lowe had gone for a long ramble to blow the cobwebs away, as he said. But who or what? cause the fire, no one will ever know. I'll be back shortly. Mr. Flaxman Lowe has proved and demonstrated that the shining man in Connor Old House was not supernatural, that he wasn't a ghost. When is a ghost not a ghost? All I know is that fungus-swathed corpse, desiccated and decayed, but still propped upright in its narrow tomb, will haunt me the rest of my life. Our cast included Bob Caliban, Morgan Fairchild, Ralph Bell, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by General Electric Citizen Band Radios and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In his Psalm of Life, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow says... Trust no future, howe'er pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present. The trouble is that the past so often refuses to stay in its place. And the dead invade the living present, or at least the memory of them does, to shadow both it and the future. As you will find out if you listen to this particular tale. mystery drama, This Deadly Fraternity, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jack Grimes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Not so very long ago, a bank was a temple, a hallowed place of mystery. Its high priests were the executive officers in three-button vested suits cut from conservative surge. The gleaming marble floors echoed one's footsteps, which rang hollowly over the hushed whisper of the business of transacting money. Most banks are very different today. In the hustle of advertising, the giveaways, the constant battle to win depositors. But not all. Some remain just as forbidding. As, for example, the First Continental Bank of Cleveland, whose president is a formidable M.J. Trimble. Yes, Miss Proud. Who? Harold Clark? Oh, Clark. Clark, yes. Yes, send him in. Here we see now where was I? Come in, come in. You, uh, wish to see me, Mr. Trimble? Oh, uh, yes, come in. Close the door. Uh, yes, sir. Now well, then, uh, how's everything going along at mortgages and loans, Clark? Uh, well, all right, I uh, I think. Uh, have I, I done something wrong? I don't know, Clark, have you? Well, no, sir, well, I mean... Why bring up such nonsense? I just asked a friendly question. It so happens that for a certain reason I find I have an interest in you. Uh, how long have you been with us now? Uh, well, just a little under a year. Uh, came over to us from Metro Bank, I believe. Ah, uh, that's right, sir. Uh-huh. After seven years, uh, <laughs> certainly took time for you to see the error of your ways. I mean, after all, we Holcraft men should stick together. Yeah, sir? Uh, your college, Clark, your college. Didn't you graduate from Holcraft? Well, yeah, yes, Mr. Trimble, I did. Well, there you are. So did I. Uh, I know that, sir. You're one of our most distinguished alumni. Oh, well. <laughs> you get as old as I am, they have to say something nice about you. What was your fraternity? Yeah, why, well, uh... I sort of dropped out, sir. Oh, I'm disappointed to hear that, Clark. Best days of a man's life. What was your affiliation? I tell off again, well, then we'll have to see what we can do about reinstating you. You're going up to homecoming, of course. Are you going, Mr. Trimble? Just haven't missed one in 36 years. Come to think of it, I don't remember ever seeing you at any of them. Well, I'll tell you the truth, sir. I've never been to one. Oh, it's a shame. Now, you come up this year. We'll see what we can do about making you a Tau Alpha Gamma again. Uh, y y yes, sir. So, how nice to have had this talk. That's all, Mr. Trimble? Yes, yes. I just wanted to get acquainted with a fellow collegiate. Sorry it took so long. You get back once a year to see the old alma mater. Keep up the good work here, and we'll be glad to have you aboard. <laughs> I 
you what's got you in such a lather, Harry. Helen, I just got through telling you. So your boss suggests you should go off on a little jaunt to your college homecoming. What's so terrible? He didn't suggest. It's, it's an order. All right. If it'll keep the old boy happy, it's no skin off your back, is it? You might even have a good time. I won't have a good time. All right, then. Don't go. If I want to keep my job, I've got to go. That's the message I got today, loud and clear. Nonsense. Oh, it's true. But sometimes I wonder about you, Harry. Huh? Honey, what is it makes you so uptight all the time? You're like Chicken Little, always afraid the sky is going to fall on you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Helen. I always have the feeling that something haunts you. Way down deep, like it was something you buried a long time ago, and and keep being afraid wouldn't stay that way. Oh, now you're being silly. That there's hardly a thing in my life you don't know about. That there's nothing wrong with us. I'm terrified there is. What do you mean? Is it because because we're, because I've never given you a child? Oh, come on, honey. We've had that out long ago. One of these days... Oh, come on, honey. When it's meant to, it'll happen. Now, in the meantime, who's complaining? I guess maybe I am. Oh. I find it gets sort of lonely around the house days, and now that you're going off on a weekend jaunt with a big boss and, and starting to plan nights out with the boys... Hey, hey, hold on. Wait a minute. I'm not going with MJ. I'll have to get there by myself, and... Uh, what's all this about going out nights with the boys? Well, isn't one of the ideas you're going to join up with your old fraternity again? No. But I thought that was part of M.J. Trimble's master plan for you. I don't want to have anything more to do with Tal Alpha. Why? Didn't you have a good time there? No. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's not my style. I think maybe you ought to make it your style. Look, let's... Stop talking about it. It, it, it. it just doesn't matter. I think it does. No, I'm, 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 I'm not going. Harry, now there's that old bugaboo again. Why are you so afraid of going back to a college you graduated from with honors? It, it, it isn't the college. It's... I'll get it. Mm. Hello? Hello? Uh, Mrs. Clark? Yes. MJ Trumbull here. I wonder if I can speak to your husband. How do you do, Mr. Trimble? Uh, 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 of course, uh, it'll just take a moment to get him. He's in the other room. Who is it? Why did you say I was in the other room? It's Mr. Trimble, and I wanted to give you a chance to think before you talk to him. Why? What, what does he want? I don't know, but before you answer him, think, darling. Oh, for heaven's sake, Helen, give, give me the phone. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Trimble. Clark? Boomer Joe Hanson just called me, and he won't be able to make it next week. So he'll be out of the country on State Department business. You remember the old Boomer? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't believe the I... class of 38. Mm -hmm. Old crap's first All-American. Anyway, since he had to cancel, that means there'll be an empty seat on our bank's jet. So, uh, I'll fly you up and fly you back. Can I count on you? Uh... Well, well, you, well you, you, yes, Mr. Tremble, that's that's very kind of you, sir. Ah, uh, nothing at all, my boy. Just gives you a notion what a fraternity brother can mean to you. <laughs> Especially a big one. <laughs> now, I'll have my secretary give you the flight time and any other pertinent details. Well, what happened? Well, he hung up. What do you want? He wants to fly me up to the homecoming. And you accepted... I didn't know how not to. Oh, honey, I'm glad you did. I promise you, you'll never regret it. I sure hope so. Well, almost there. Look familiar to you, Clark? I, yeah, sort of, Mr. Trimble. It's, uh, it's a little different from the air. Yeah. Well, there's the lake, off to your left. Uh-huh. And up on the bluff, beyond it, there's our alma mater. <laughs> uh, we'll be coming on in right over Devil's Leap on our landing pattern. Devil's Leap? Yeah. Uh, you ever have to scale that southeast pace there? 
Uh, no, sir, I never did. Oh, that used to be one of the big features of Hell Week. <laughs> well, they cut it out some years ago, probably before your time. Well, maybe they were right. A couple of weak sisters took some bad falls there. One of them was killed, I think. Still in all, it was a real thrill for a fella to climb that bleak old rock face. Ah, give you a sense of power and belief in yourself. Eh, I suppose they took it easier on you in your day. The hazing, I mean. Now, sir, it was pretty tough. Well, uh, you minded that? Oh, no, sir, I didn't. Not then. Oh, look, look there. Well, well what's that, sir? Don't you recognize it? Right near the bluff? Last house on the road there. That's the old tower for house. <laughs> recognize her now? Yeah. Never forget it. Found anyone you know yet, Clark? No, not yet, Mr. Trimble. Oh, well, you will. I'll have to leave you now. I've got a meeting of the Board of Governors over at the old frat house. <laughs> I'll put in a good word for you. Uh, where are you staying? Uh, Ralston House. Fine, fine. You check for a message from me before you turn in. With any luck, it'll be word that you're reinstated without prejudice to membership in Tau Alpha Gamma. Now, you look for that message. Oh, brother. Hey! Hmm? Harry! Is that you, old Harry the Horse? But Buck Stat well, for Pete's sake. <laughs> I was wondering when I'd run into somebody I knew. Oh, you're a sight for sore eyes. Hey, where have you been keeping yourself all these years? Uh, yeah, working, getting married, you know. Yeah, how about you? Uh, I was married, but it didn't take. No kids. You? Uh-uh. Yeah. Maybe it's uh, just as well. What does that mean? No, uh, forget it. This isn't the place. But uh, later, I, I got to... I, I, I'm glad I found you here. I don't know why I came. There's too many memories. Any of the others here? No, we're all that's left, Terry. What? What about Tom Pierce? Oh, he, he died a couple of years ago. Drowned. Gosh. Uh, uh, Andy Hassler? Oh, he's gone. He fell off a building. Jumped, some people said. Well, wasn't he in real estate? Yeah, yeah. He uh, died three years ago. And, uh, well, we might as well get it over with as fast as possible. Um, Pete Stein died in the hospital after an appendicitis attack last year. Oh, man. Well, that only leaves Joe Coslow. Uh, any idea what happened to him? I, um, I, uh, lost track of him after the army busted him. Busted him? Mm. Yeah, stuck the, uh, Killer in the brig. Uh, silly old nicknames. For what? Oh, for manslaughter. He uh, half killed a recruit. <laughs> his nickname wasn't so silly. And the leopard never changes his spots, I guess. Is he still in the brig? No. How do you know? Um. Well, uh, after Pete Stein, um. Got his. I um, I got an army buddy to check for me. Coslow's stretch was over September 28th, 1976. Seventeen days before Pete died. October 15th. October 15th. That's the same day that Phil Fowler. Yeah. Oh, are you, are you suggesting that? The killer had anything to do with Pete's death? Well, that's what I got to talk to you about. Because Andy and Tom died on the same day, too. I want to tell you, I'm scared stiff, Harry. I figure one of us has got to be next. What do you suppose happened to six members of the class of 34 at Holcroft College that would make them candidates for sudden death? I did promise you that the dead past was going to invade the present, and it seems as if it has, with a vengeance. Now, was that just a cliché phrase, or prophetic? I shall return shortly with Act Two. It's a bright fall afternoon. 
afternoon in late October, mild and balmy, the last rosy glow of Indian summer. But as Harry Clark strolls under the profusion of red gold leaves along a winding, deserted path on the campus, icy fingers clutch at his insides. His old classmate, Buck Stanley, is reeling out a string of coincidence and conjecture, building to a conclusion that shakes him to the core. For what Buck is saying confirms the premonition that has dogged him all the way up on this trip to the past. Knock it off, Buck. What are you trying to give me? A warning, Harry. At the very least. What? That I'm next on the hit list? It has to be you or me. Oh, come on. What kind of rip is this? Look, Harry, there were six of us in on it. Only one of us took any kind of real rap for it. The killer. He got bounced from school. It wrecked his life. And you want to tell me that he's coming back for revenge on all of us? It... Nah, it just won't wash, Buck. Why not? First off, because... Well, the way you tell it, there wasn't a shred of evidence that Pete and Andy and Tom's deaths were anything but natural. Except that each one of them died on the 15th of October, each just one year apart, and all of them after Joe Coslow was sprung out of the brig. Uh, plus one other thing. You know what the 15th of October is. Yeah, I'm not likely to forget. So? You, uh, said that Tom Pierce was drowned. How? Well, all I know is what I got from the newspaper story I looked up in the library. He drowned in his pool. Well, what about Andy? I, I didn't see anything about it. Where did he fall from? Oh, some two-bit hotel. They kind of hushed it up as much as possible. I, I uh, went to the funeral. You, you remember he married Sarah Templeton? He did? Yeah. yeah she took it pretty bad. I, I uh... I got the notion he'd been messing around with some other dame. Suicide? Yeah. I thought so then. Well, now you don't think he jumped. You think he was pushed. Yep. And you don't think Tom just drowned by accident. You think the killer helped him somehow. Yep. Well, if you don't believe it was an accident, it, it, it could have been suicide also, couldn't it? It could. And Pete, a, a ruptured appendix. You can't make murder out of that. They all died on the same date, Harry. Now, how far can you stretch coincidence? It doesn't have to be coincidence. But let's be sensible. Look, after what happened, none of us were ever quite the same. We've all carried our own guilt feelings, I guess. I know I have. About Phil Fowler. Yeah. Yeah, I'll never get that kid out of my mind. Neither could Andy and Tom, it looks like. You're telling me they took their own lives because they were remorseful or something? Uh, all your old army buddy told you was that the killer was supposed to be released on September 28th, 76. We don't know he was. For all we know, he, he could have been kept in another year or anything. You know where he was in the brig? Well, in Germany, I guess. That's where he was stationed. Ah, uh, you see? Now, isn't it crazy? He, he, he could get back to the States within 17 days and somehow manage to knock off Tom in his own pool. And why would he wait a whole year to go after Andy? And another one for Pete, if he'd been nursing a grudge all this time. <laughs> like I say, Buck, you, you, you're flipping your lid over nothing. It, it just doesn't hold water. Okay, okay, you win. Harry, I want to believe you. You, you. you could be right. You make a lot of sense. Keeping a thing like this bottled up, I... I suppose a guy does get wacky ideas. And that, uh, That killer, Coslow. Yeah, he, uh, made the same impression on me, but... We were kids then. He... He doesn't scare me anymore. enjoy a weekend on the old campus, son. Well, I don't know if I can quite tell you, Mr. Trimble, how much. <laughs> Teach you to stay away from homecomings, eh? Uh, I guess. Uh, you look a whale of a lot better than when you came up. You feel better? Yes, I do, sir. I got a lot of things straightened out in my head. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something frankly, Harry. When I put up your name for reinstatement and they opened the books for me, I was shaken. Here I was, sponsoring or trying to sponsor someone who 
walked out on us in the middle of his sophomore year. Now, don't, don't interrupt me. You know me, I, I couldn't leave it like that. So I started digging, and the whole story came out. About Phil Fowler? Yes. Unfortunate thing, terrible thing. Nobody's fault, or if anyone's the culprit was suitably punished for it, that should be the end of it. It's a matter I hope is closed for the rest of my life. I can't tell you how happy and delighted I am. About what? You. Oh, is there something new with me? You know there is. Ever since you came back from your big rah-rah weekend, you've been a different person. You're the man I married again. What happened up there, Harry? Where? At dear old Holcraft. Uh, it's... Something I do have to tell you, Helen, someday. Why not now? No, not yet. Going back, I got a couple of things in perspective, at least. I uh, should have gone back years ago, and it mightn't have haunted me so much. I don't want it to start haunting me again. Mm, why don't you tell me? Oh, okay, uh, let me turn off the radio. When I went to Hallcroft, there was a guy two classes ahead of me called Joe Coslow. He looked like uh, King Khan. I was scared of him. Well, we were all scared of him. He could have broken any of us in two. We called him Killer Coslow. Mm. Wasn't he a football player? Yeah. Hallcroft's only two-time All-American, a, a fullback. The, the guy was a... a a twisted, terrifying bully. I ought to know. He was the one who put me and all my closest friends through our hazing when we were bid to tell off a gamma. He was a fraternity brother of yours? We belonged to the same fraternity. He was no brother. He was just what he was nicknamed. A killer. You mean he hurt you? <laughs> Tom Pierce, Sandy Hassler, Pete Stein, Buck Stanley, me... And we all had scars enough to prove that, but they don't matter. They didn't last. Phil Fowler wasn't so lucky. I don't think I've ever heard you mention him. Oh, you haven't. I've been too ashamed to. Why? Because we killed Phil. All six of us killed him. Well, what would you mean? Five of us were sophomores. Killer was a senior. He organized all the hazing. He, he liked that. And he had everyone so intimidated we were scared to question him. It, it, it was the end of Hell Week and Phil Fowler was freshman pledged to us. We were the fraternity to belong to on our campus. And to get in, any kid was ready to bust his butt. So the killer was going to make sure he did. Over our objections, he decreed Phil had to go through a trial by fire. What does that mean? Well, he made Phil strip and told us all to light cigarettes. Then he told Phil we were going to grind them out on his bare skin after he was blindfolded. Oh, the rest of you went along with that? It, it was a trick, Helen, just a mental suggestion. All we'd have done was touched him with a piece of ice. I don't understand. The power of suggestion. You're conditioned the victim so that he thinks he's being burned. But just the same, none of us wanted to go through with it. And did you? No. Because Phil was so scared that while we were arguing, he ran for the door and took off into the night. Did you go after him? You're darn right. Listen, it was October 15th. We'd had a cold snap that year and it was below freezing. And Phil was in his birthday suit. You found him and, and dragged him back? We didn't find him. It was a pitch black night and there were thick woods between the fraternity house and the lake. The whole killer was fit to be tied, but we were all relieved. Till the next morning. The next morning? There's a bluff called the Devil's Leap right near the Tau Alpha house. 
It's a 200-foot drop to the lake shore. They found Phil there with a broken neck. In the dark, he must have run right off the cliff. Oh, how awful. Ah, there was an investigation. Very hush-hush, of course. And the verdict was accidental death. Only it wasn't. We killed him. But you didn't. It was all that killer Coslow's fault. Ah, that's what the Chancellor and the Deans decided. Tom and me and the others were allowed to stay on at college. Coslow was expelled. He promised us all he'd be back someday to get even with us. But he never did. No. I, I kept thinking he would, but as the years went by, I accepted it as just a threat. And that's what you told your friend Buck? Because I believed it. Then. You don't believe it now? No. I, I've carried the guilt too long. I'm terrified that somehow it's going to catch up with me. How? I, I don't know. If the 15th comes and goes, then maybe I can relax. And if it doesn't? Well, there's a 50-50 chance I won't be around to worry. Because if Joe Coslow is on the loose and out for revenge, it's only a question which one of us will be first. Buck Stanley? Or me? And though circuitous and obscure, the feet of Nemesis, how sure. Those are the lines of the Victorian poet Sir William Watson. And Nemesis is the ancient Greek goddess of retribution who takes many forms. Is the form in this case the hulking figure of the brooding, brutal killer Coslow? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Kayam wrote, "'Tis all a checkerboard of nights and days, where destiny with men for pieces plays." That seems totally contradictory to the American belief in free choice. Yet, when you come right down to day-to-day -day living, how many of us have the strength to exercise it? Instead, in common with people all over the rest of the world, we find ourselves prisoners of the past and hostages to our future, as Harry Clark finds himself now. Oh. 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 Harry. Harry? Uh. Mm, seven o'clock. Time to get up. Uh, I don't want to get up. You don't want to be late for the bank, do you? Oh, I didn't mean because of the bank. I'm afraid to get up. Why? Oh, you know what date this is? I know. Darling. Uh, what? Promise me something. What? I know the day has got to be lived through. But once we're through with this 15th of October, can we please wash it out of our lives for good? Yeah, I hope. I hope as much as you that we can. Will you be late tonight? Eh, probably. I'll be reconciling the books and we'll all be locked in the cage till they prove out. That's good. Hmm? You'll be safe. Hello? Oh, uh, uh, hello. Is, uh, this Mrs. Clark? That's right. Uh, this is, uh, Buck. Stanley, I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm an old friend of your husband's. Oh, yes, I know. We've been talking a lot about you. Uh, I, uh, don't mean to be rude, Mrs. Clark, but this isn't a social call. Is, uh, Harry there? No, I'm sorry. He's at the bank. Oh, um, well, look, could you give me the number? Mm, it wouldn't do any good. You couldn't reach him. Oh, when can I reach him? Well, I could give him a message as soon as he gets home. All right. Uh, tell him to call immediately. I'll be waiting. Uh, my number here is code 901-555-5111. 
Uh, I'm in uh, uh, Toledo. Do you, you have that? Uh, yes. Uh, any message? Tell him it is literally a matter of life and death. Tell him that he's turned up again. That we were wrong. It isn't over and done with. Not by a long shot. What do you mean? Hello? Hello? Mr. Stanley? Mr. Stanley, can you hear me? What's happened? What time did Buck call? About four o'clock. Yeah, it's almost six now. He didn't say what it was all about? Harry, I told you all he said. What did he mean by he's turned up again? Well, who else could it be but Joe Coslo? Then why didn't he just say that? Well, I suppose because... Well, he didn't think I would know what he was referring to. Yeah, maybe. Why doesn't he answer? Buck? What's this? Is this Buck Stanley's wire? Yes. Who wants to talk to him? Well, this is a friend of his from Cleveland. What's the name? Uh, Harry Clark. Who, who's this? Uh, this is Detective Sergeant Kennelly, Mr. Clark. I'm afraid you can't talk to Mr. Stanley. Why not? Because he's dead. Dead? How? Well, I can't answer that all the way. We just got here. All I know so far is he was shot with a 45 caliber revolver on the issue. You mean he... he took his own life? Well, I can't tell you that either. Uh, sir, do you have any reason to suspect he might not have, that uh, someone else was involved? Well, I hope that any suspicions I might have are wrong. Where would I find you in Toledo, Detective Kennelly? At the 17th Precinct, but... Uh, uh, I, I'd rather drive to Toledo and discuss that in person. What's happened? It's Buck Stanley. He's dead. How? That policeman on the phone said suicide. Well, so why do you have to go to Toledo? To see for myself, Helen. Darling... This whole thing has become an obsession with you. Oh, I, I, I don't blame you. It was a terrible thing, that young boy meeting his death the way he did. But it was an accident. An accident that would never have happened if he hadn't been scared out of his wits. You are just determined to punish yourself for what happened, Harry. No matter what I say. Now, it's psychotic to carry such a guilt. It's, it's an obsession. Never mind about me, Helen. Let's just stick to killer Joe Coslow. Whatever remorse he feels about that poor kid, Phil Fowler, is all swallowed up in his fixation that he took the whole blame and we railroaded him. If anyone has an obsession, it's him. And if I'm right, I have to be the next because I'm the only one left. Do you want him to kill me, too? No. All right, then somehow he's got to be stopped. That's why Toledo. To see if I can get the police to do it. Because if I can't... If you can't. Then I'll have to find him wherever he is and... kill him first. Ah, uh, you can see for yourself, Mr. Clark. It's a classical suicide picture. He was seated at the desk. The bullet was directed directly to the brain. Death was instantaneous. The gun dropped from his hand to the floor... And there are no other prints on it than those of the deceased. <laughs> I'm afraid you've had a long trip for nothing. In spite of what I told you? Yeah, we're checking all through that now. But uh, to the best of our knowledge, there was no one like the man you described in Mr. Clayton's acquaintance. And we have no reason to suspect anything except death by his own hand. You're absolutely sure of that? Mr. Clark, in my business, you learn to be absolutely sure of nothing. We live by a series of educated guesses. So you're just going to let this go with that? No, sir. I don't close any files till I'm certain. But because of you, this one's going to remain open until... Until what? Well, until we check out this Joseph Coslow of yours. Are you working on that now? Mr. Clark, I'm only one detective sergeant in the Toledo police force. I got all I can handle with my own local problem. But... For your information and my own, I am checking. But I can't do what you want me to do, get results yesterday or even today. You're just going to have to wait till tomorrow. And the best I can promise you is I'll uh, 
stay on it and keep in touch. It's awfully important to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You drew me a picture. I believe my life depends on it. Sir, if I get word, I'll be in touch. And if I don't hear from you? Yeah, then we're both out of answers. And that's what we got to live with. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Clark, I'm M.J. Trimble. Oh, yes, from, from the bank. Uh, won't you come in? Thank you, my dear. I uh, <clears throat> just wanted to have a few words with your husband. Oh, I'm so sorry. Harry isn't here. Oh, he's not? Uh, well, uh, do you expect him home soon? I'm afraid not. He had to, uh, he had to drive to Toledo. Oh, well, then you don't expect him back tonight. I don't know. Uh, I'm waiting to hear from him. Uh, wh what took him so suddenly to Toledo? Well, he got news that an old friend, a fraternity brother of his, had died. Joe Coslow? Oh, no, his name was Buck Stanley. Uh, but why would you mention Joe Coslow? Well, I had some news about him, and I thought your husband would like to hear. What? Well, let me explain a little first. When I dragooned your husband into going up with me for homecoming, I, I had no idea what sad memories our fraternity had for him. Subsequently, I found out. In proposing him to return to our membership, the story came out. That a young boy died. Yes. And who did you conclude was responsible for that, Mr. Trimble? Uh, if anyone... I'm ashamed to say the system. Well, that's a generous admission, but how does it help anyone who was the victim of the system, like my husband? Well, since I'm part of the hierarchy, what else can I do but accept that the basic guilt is mine? Well, it would be a little late to tell Harry that. He's borrowed all the guilt for himself. Well, that's ridiculous, and it's why I'm here tonight. Oh? I wanted to tell Harry that the man who created this whole issue in the first place is dead. Joe Coslow? Yes. He's been dead for the last five years. How? Well, there was a fire in the jailhouse in which he was assigned two days before his sentence was up. In 1976, he died in that fire. Are you sure? There's no doubt. His body was identified through dental work, fingerprints, bone scans. Joe Coslow is dead. I wish there was some way I could get in touch with your husband. Maybe there is. That we could call him through that sergeant of police at the precinct in Toledo. Yeah, this is Detective Sergeant Canelli. Oh, Mrs. Clark, yeah, sure. Well, no, no, your husband was here, but he left to drive home to Cleveland over an hour ago. What? No. Well, uh, we talked about the guy, Coslow, but neither of us knew he was dead. He, he wanted me to look into that, but to tell you the truth, I uh, told him I would just to keep him happy. Huh? Oh, well, because it was an open and shut case of suicide. No way it could have been murder, no matter how much your husband wanted to make it look that way. Right? What do I mean by that? Well, uh, let me just lay it on the line, Mrs. Clark. Uh, your husband has a guilty conscience for something that happened all in years ago. And he'd like to lay the blame off on somebody else. Only it don't work that way. That's something he's got to learn to face. <laughs> Helen to let her know I was on my way home. Ah, huh, it's too late now. I don't want to stop in this one. Perhaps it's just as well, Harry. Phil Fowler. What are you doing here in the car? It's still not quite midnight, Harry. This is my one day on Earth each year. So it was you. 
it never was Joe Coslo who was looking for revenge. It was you all the time. Quite right, Harry. You killed them all. Oh, no. Correction, please. They destroyed themselves, just as all of you destroyed me. What did you mean when you said it was just as well I hadn't stopped to call Helen to tell her I was coming home? Isn't that obvious? You're never going to get home. I won't let you stop me. Oh, I won't stop you. You will do that yourself. What do you mean? You've lived with it for over 15 years, Harry. Just like the others. You know there's only one way you'll ever get rid of what haunts you. How? I never managed to join your fraternity. Instead, I ask you to join mine. It's the only way you'll ever know peace. There were many tragic automobile accidents on the night of that October 15th. Highway police had issued a traffic advisory because of weather conditions. Clark's death from the skid that sent him hurtling through the guardrail and into the ravine below was only another statistic. But was it an accident? Or was he called just as all the others who bore the guilt for a boy's death so many years before? I'll be back shortly. Was our story one of deep remorse? I don't know. I leave you only with another quote from Omar Khayyam. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on. Nor all the piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all your tears wash out a word of it. Our cast included Jack Grimes, Malika Gray, Court Benson, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. It was William Congreve, the early 18th century playwright, who first penned the words, Heaven has no rage, nor hell a fury, like a woman scorned. It is a basic truth, whatever century. Certainly is true in the 19th, where this story lies. But the woman, in this case, not exactly what you might imagine, but uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin at the beginning. mystery drama, To Hang by the Neck, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Marion Seldes.
Calvert Conway spread, brand mark C Circle C, used to lie between Dallas to the north and Houston to the south, and east by west between the Louisiana border and Waco. It wasn't the largest cattle ranch in Texas, but in its own right, between those two extremes, it was an empire. The ownership of empires, or the succession to them, has caused most of the turbulence in history and has always brought tragedy and agony to the individuals involved in them, as witnessed the story of C. Circle C. Carrie, what are you doing here? I came back, Mother. I thought you needed me. Of course I need you. But what good is this? You're gone. I've had enough of dreams. Maybe this is a little more than dreaming. What? Remember Becky Pryor, who was going to be my maid of honor? Of course. I had a letter from her recently. She's coming to visit from New Orleans. But you don't want to see her. That isn't... That isn't true, precious. I, your father felt that perhaps the way I am... It wouldn't be the best idea. He's very solicitous of you, isn't he? Of course. He loves me. And me. He loved you. Oh, that's true now. Rebecca Pryor. Our best friend. I want to protect Becky. That's one of the main reasons I returned. And you must help her too, Mom. Please, protect my friend. Protect my friend. My friend. Pardon me, ma'am, uh, but you just got to be who I'm looking for. Miss Rebecca Pryor? I answer to that name, sir. What is yours? Uh, I'm Teague Whitman, ranch hand of the C Circle C. I, I was sent to meet you. Oh, how nice. I was afraid I might have beaten my telegram here. No, it come on time. Uh, the only thing was I reckon Mrs. Carstairs didn't have enough time to answer you back. Well, I'm glad because being an anniversary and all, I, I wanted to come. Anniversary? Yes, sir. Just about one year ago, I came off this same old train to be maid of honor at my friend Carrie's wedding. Only to find out the terrible news. What news is that, ma'am? Both Avisham, her husband-to-be, had run out on her and carried it. You have no need to go on, Miss Pryor. I, I know what you're talking about. The, the hanging. I still can't believe anyone, especially Carrie, could kill herself that way. But I don't want to talk about it anymore. I can uh, understand why. Uh, I got the uh, rig waiting. Uh, let me get your bags and, and take you out to the ranch. Who is it? It's me, Julie. Chad. May I come in? It's your house, Chad. Well, it's your bedroom, Julie. I uh, wouldn't have disturbed you except... Well, I, I thought I heard you talking to someone in here. Well, who could I be talking to? I don't know. Silly of me, perhaps. I thought maybe Becky Pryor had arrived earlier and we expected her. No. Rebecca isn't here yet. Well, I was out riding the fence and just came in. She might have arrived without my knowing it. There's very little you don't know that happens, Chad. Well, I'm human. Can't be everywhere at once. So am I. And I find that I'm not any place anymore. Now, Julie... Don't talk like that. I try not to, Chad. But since the accident, and most of all, Carrie, what do I have left to live for? Me? Yes, Chad, my husband. I do have you to live for. Sometimes I wish you felt that more strongly. You must believe me. You are the only thing that keeps me alive, Chad. My darling. Listen. Yeah? Someone's driving up. That must be Rebecca. Uh, she uh, planning to stay long? Well, I shouldn't guess. She just said in her letter she'd like to come and visit Carrie's grave on 
on the anniversary. Why didn't you mention the letter? It's just one of those things. I replied and invited her. Do you mind, Jack? Oh, why should I mind? You need some companionship stuck out here in the back of beyond the way we are. I reckon maybe I do, Chad. Especially since... Since my accident. Oh, that damn mare. I told Punch Williams her milk wasn't proper drawn after she lost the colt. She went plumb loco. I should have fired Punch. What kind of ranch foreman was it to let it happen? You cannot blame him. I should have been ready when the mare shied. It's just that she was always so sure-foot and gentle. I never no, dreamed don't, that... Oh, don't, uh, don't dwell on it, Julie. Well, what else can I do? My back broken, shackled to a chair the way I am, in pain most of the time. <sighs> well, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's your visitor, all right. I'll, uh, I'll go on out and make her welcome. I never should have let Rebecca come here Except somehow I must find a way back to my own child Oh, my lovely darling The flesh cut and scarred The staring eyes Your feet moving a little yet As if they had life of their own But all the rest of you was still why? Why? Life could still have been good. Nothing should have made it worth throwing away. Oh. Well, here we are, Miss Pryor. Can I hand you down? Oh, thank you. Have you been with Conway Ranch a long time? Oh, no, ma'am. Uh, just since I was mustered out a few weeks. Uh, I'm a Johnny come lately. Were you a Johnny Reb? Um, not from these parts. I, I was Union. I'll get your bag. But what brought you to Conway Ranch? Or, or maybe I should say the Carstairs. It's still the Sea Circle C. Even though Mrs. Conway married again with Mr. Carstairs... Most of the old hands still call it the Conway spread. My dear Becky, how nice to see you again. Oh, Mr. Costas, thank you. I hope it was all right to come. Well, of course. You're the nearest thing to a daughter we got left. You're always welcome here. That's nice of you. See, you can put the horse and rig away, then report to Punch Williams. I'm sure he can find you something to do. I reckon. Thanks for your escort, Mr. Whitman. My duty, ma'am, and uh, my pleasure. That's a nice young man. Teague? Hmm. I don't know. Too close mouth about himself and everything for my fancy. I think he's just kind of shy. Well, he's a good worker, I'll say that. And haven't been so easy to come by with the war. Here we are. Let me open the door for you. Well, in you go. Well, what are you waiting for? I was just thinking how different it was the last time I came into this don't, house. Don't, Becky. Please don't. I'm sorry. And uh, try not to talk too much about it to my wife. She... Oh, I understand. Oh, I just hope I didn't make a mistake. That I'm really welcome. Why, you know I couldn't be more pleased. And the only reason Julie isn't down to meet you is because... She... Well, she uh, can't walk anymore. She's confined to her bed or her chair. Oh, what happened? Well, it was seven or eight months after... After Carrie died. She uh, wanted to go riding one day. I, I still didn't like to see her off alone, so I went with her. Chad! Chad! Oh, excuse me. Yes, dear? Heaven sakes, what's taking so long? Isn't Becky here? Yeah, I just brought her in. Then you just march her right upstairs here. I want to say hello and make her welcome. Why don't you run along, Chad? Us women can find plenty to talk about ourselves. Well, I thought I ought to see Becky settle for dinner. Well, Mrs. Ames can see her things are put away. Now, right now, I'd like to talk to Becky alone. Very well, Julie. Uh, see you at dinner, Becky. Right, Mr. Carson. Quick. Go to the door. Make sure he's gone. Gone? Don't you see he doesn't want us to be alone a minute? Now, don't upset yourself. Upset myself? I'm torn apart. 
Is he gone? Yes, I think so. What is it, Mrs. Carstairs? I have no right to put you into jeopardy, but I need help. Your letter was a godsend. The only chance I had. <clears throat> Mrs. Carstairs, what is it? Shall I ring for help? Oh, what shall I do? It's just another back spasm. Heels in my drawer. And some water. Oh. Here you are. How many of these pills? Two. And water. Here. Oh. 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 Now, I, I can't tell you, but I must. I need help. Oh, and Gary, Gary can't rest in peace until the truth, the truth, is, the truth. Is anything wrong? You better come in, Mr. Uh, Costas. Uh, what's the matter, Becky? I thought I heard oh. Julie cry out. Well, come back, I think. I gave her some of these pills, two of them. Is that all right? Yes, all you can do when these attacks come. Uh, well, look at her. Look, she's... Yes, it's a uh, very strong drug. Puts a person to sleep almost immediately. Oh, Quite frankly, I don't like her to have them so near at hand. I'm always afraid if the pain is too much, she might take an overdose. She seems rational enough, but she's not. Ever since Carrie's death, her mind wanders. All the wildest flights of fancy, feelings of persecution. I, I don't know. I, I'd hope to spare you this, but... Now that you're here, I'm afraid my poor wife is stark, staring mad. Rebecca Pryor looks at the handsome man, the lines of sorrow etched deep in the gentle face, and her heart goes out to him. And then suddenly, she is remembering the haunted face of her dead friend's mother and her cry for help. Against what? Rebecca doesn't know. What she does know is that she will not be able to relax till many questions are answered. I shall return shortly with Act Two. You are Rebecca Pryor. In the year of our Lord, 1865, the war between the states is over now, but you remember vividly one year ago the excitement of traveling from New Orleans to the ranch in Texas, where you now are, in order to be maid of honor at your best friend's marriage. You were roommates and inseparable at Mrs. Covington's seminary for young ladies during the war, and it was there that your roommate, Carrie Conway, met Bo Faversham who was to have been her husband. Now, one year later, after the wedding that never happened because Bo disappeared and Carrie's awful death by hanging herself, you are back at the ranch. Dear Daddy, I'm writing you because something is strangely wrong up here at the Sea Circle Sea. And I think... It might need you to help set it straight. Do you think there's any possibility you could come here as though to fetch me home? And then, while you're here... Who is it? Chad Carstairs, Becky. Can I see you a minute? Of course, Mr. Carstairs. I'll be right there. Oh, if it's too early... Oh, I'm all up and dressed, as you can see. Come in. Thank you. How is Mrs. Carstairs this morning? Well, not much better, I'm afraid. I'm going into town to fetch a doctor. I thought uh, perhaps you might like to ride with me. Oh, that's kind of you. But maybe I can help here with your wife. Oh, I doubt it. She'll be keeping to her bed today, and the housekeeper, Mrs. Ames, will be there to keep an eye on her. No, oh, let me persuade you to come with me. We could have a nice meal at the hotel and give you some little holiday feeling on your visit. Oh, that's kind of you, but I am a bit tired after my trip up. I think I could just rest here at the ranch today. Well, if that's what you want. I tell you what, my ranch foreman hasn't quite decided what to do with that new hand who brought you from the station. 
I'll have him stand by. Don't bother. I can take care of myself. Well, if you want to rest, that's fine, but uh, Teague will be available. And you're sure I can't help Mrs. Costa? Oh, no, no. Best thing is to leave her alone. She's a whole lot more than you or any one of us can handle. From my window, I watch Mr. Costas climb into his buck wagon and give some orders to Teague Whitman, who glanced once towards the house. I drew back as he looked up. I found suddenly that I was a turmoil of mixed feelings, and the only thing I could think of to do was to finish my letter to Daddy. But as I did, I blamed myself bitterly for not going into town with Mr. Carstairs. I could have posted the letter myself. Now, who was I going to trust to get it sent out? Once I sealed the envelope, I felt the need of some air. Well, howdy, Miss Pryor. What you got there? A letter you want mailed? Yes. I reckon I should have finished it sooner in time for Mr. Carstairs to take it to town. You won't have to lose out. I'll be riding in after sundown. I'll... See, it goes out with the morning stage. Oh, I, I wouldn't want to bother you. Or trust me. Well, whatever made you say a thing like that? I don't know. Uh, maybe because I wish I was sure you did or would. <laughs> Why on earth shouldn't I? I kind of got the notion Mr. Carstairs has it in for me some way and uh, plans to let me go. Oh, I don't think so. It's just... Just what, Miss Pryor? Well, I, I think he... No, I'll tell you straight out what he said to me. He thinks you don't talk very much about yourself, and he'd like to know more about your background. And he asked you to see what you could find out? Not exactly. Anyways, I wouldn't have any part of a thing like that. It's none of my business. But maybe you could do something for me. A pleasure. Matter of fact, I was told by Mr. Carstairs to keep an eye on you. An eye on me? Well, he seemed to want to make sure you stayed away from Mrs. Carstairs. In the stable here. Why the stable? Well, I wasn't here when it happened, but uh, I suppose because this is where Miss Carey... Well, you know, uh, I should think it'd be the last place you'd want to see again. But I was going to ask you if you could saddle me up a horse or hitch one up to the trap so I could ride into town and mail my letter. Oh, well, I don't know about that, uh... There's only one horse left in here, and Punch Williams, the ranch boss, took all the hands and the remuda out this morning to graze up on the northwest fork. Uh, there's just this one mare left. Well, it's just this one girl. That'd suit me. Will she take her in? Uh, no, ma'am. The way I heard it, uh, well, this poor little black mare got stole some time back, and uh, whoever the horse thief was, he hitched her to a split rail fence somewhere and left her to starve or die of thirst. Well, she got so frantic, she broke the stringer right out of the posts. And when they found her lying exhausted in the arroyo, she plain had dragged that heavy log Lord knows how many miles till her strength gave out. Buck Henry, the oldest of the hands, told me about her. Ever since that day, you try to hitch her to anything, and she goes just plumb loco. Other times, she's as nice a little filly as you'd ever want to see. Oh, will she stand if you just let the reins trail? I reckon. Well, then I'll just change into some jeans and you could saddle her up and I'll ride her into town. I don't think Mr. Carstairs would want that. Well, I do. Uh, would you... Would you come inside the stable with me for a moment? No, I don't want to go in there. Why? Did you see her hanging? Tom. Yes. I did. Just before they cut her down. Oh, how could she have done such a thing? I was hoping you might know the real reason. What do you mean, the real reason? Well, it's mighty hard to believe a girl could hang herself just because a man ran out on her, if he did. Oh, he did, all right. Where is he now, this man? I don't know. I don't reckon he'd dare show his face anywhere in this state, or Mr. Carstairs will be out looking for him. What are you doing? <sighs> Opening the stable door. What for? Just where was she hanging? Could you point it out? From that big beam there. Oh, Lord. I don't see how she could have done it. Plain and simple, Miss Pryor. You toss a lariat over the beam, tie off the hitching rail so it hangs with a noose some eight feet off the ground, climb on a horse, get under it, put the noose over your neck, and kick the spurs home. 
and you're left hanging. But to strangle slowly to death like that, it's so horrible. Nope. Chances are on the first drop you break your neck. And you don't know anything after that. Oh. No, ma'am, the how is not the question. It's the why. Just like you said. And I get the feeling you know more than you want to say about that. Who? Who are you? Let me ask you a question first. What brought you back here? A year after it all took place. What are you looking for? What right have you to ask? Maybe none. You afraid to answer? I don't see it's any of your business. Supposing I could convince you it might be. What's that? All right, uh, someone coming. Why, it, it, it's Mr. Carstairs. Back from town so soon. I reckon he forgot something. Um, anything wrong, Mr. Carstairs? No, no, no. Just something slipped my mind. Uh, Becky, didn't you say something about a letter you wanted to get in the mail? Why, yes, I did. But I, I hope you didn't come all the way back here for that. Well, weekend coming up suddenly crossed my mind it could be important. I should take it in. Could I change my mind and come in with you? Well, that's always a lady's privilege. <laughs> Tell you the truth, it's just what I hoped you'd do. <laughs> it uh, crossed my mind after I left. This was no place to leave you alone. You uh, going to believe in this uh, soon, Becky? Why do you say that, Mr. Costa? Well, letter to your father. I thought it might be to arrange to have him meet you. This is no place for a young girl anymore, I'm afraid. I hadn't planned to leave right away. Of course, if you want me to. Oh, I'd be the last person to chase you out. <laughs> But with Julie as she is and the memories, sure don't blame you if you included in your letter the news that you're coming home. Now, there's a train day after tomorrow or the stagecoach, and we can make arrangements as soon as we get to town. Well, but now, you see, I'd hope to stay long enough to be of some help. Well, no one can help Carrie anymore. Julie is in the same way. The only difference is she's alive. What are you doing sneaking around up here, young man? I wasn't sneaking, Mrs. Ames. Then what were you doing? Well, before he left for town, Mr. Carstairs asked me to tell his wife that he'd come back to take Miss Pryor with him. Mr. Carstairs told you no such thing. There'd been no need to tell Mrs. Carstairs anything. She's sound asleep. You're lying. Yeah, you? Maybe you? we both are, Mrs. Yeah. Ames. I hear talking in there. That's her talking to herself again. Crazy. If you ask me, she ought to be put away somewhere. Like her daughter and Bo Faversham? What does that mean? I was just asking. Did you mean dead like him? Who said Bo Faversham was dead? If he isn't, where'd he disappear to? Nobody knows that, of course. After he ran out on Miss Carey, he wouldn't dare leave any traces of... What business is that of yours? Oh, uh, none. Who are you? Just a hired hand. With a large bump of curiosity. I'd like to know why. And what you're doing in the house. I'm sure the cat... Mr. Carstairs wouldn't like it. Does he have to, Mrs. Ames? Couldn't you and me share... A secret or two between us? You keep your ideas to yourself, young man. You pick the wrong woman to smart around. Now, get out of this house, and before the sun rises tomorrow, I'll see that my... that Mr. Carstairs gets you off this ranch. How, Mrs. Ames? Feet first, like Bo Faversham went? Why do you see that? Who are you? Oh, just an interested bystander. You listen to me and listen close. If you're counting on Mr. Carstairs inheriting the C-Circle C, or ever controlling it, forget it. Oh. And you might want to keep your own skirts a little clean. So I'm asking you a question. What really happened the night Miss Carey died in the stable? How did she die? And why? <laughs> why everybody knows that. They know what was supposed to have happened. What I'm looking for is the <laughs> truth. Good Lord. Who was that? No, Carrie, no. 
Don't tell me there was a child. You know there was. Why else would I haunt you? What is it you want me to do? Face the truth. Don't let me have died for nothing. Don't let him win. What can I do? I'm afraid he'll kill me just as he did you. No, no, Carrie. Leave me alone. I'm, I'm afraid. Now, don't ask me to fight him. Don't, don't, don't. What is it, Mrs. Carstairs? Oh, nothing. No, no, nothing. It's just a, a bad dream. A dream about what? Who, who's that? Who's that? Get him out. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about anything. I just want to be left alone. I'd like to have you talk to me, ma'am. I don't want to talk to anyone ever again. Ever again. Except maybe, maybe Rebecca Pariah. What is it that tortures Mrs. Carstairs? The daughter who seems to haunt her? You must believe that the Carrie who talks to her is a figment of the imagination, a reflection of a guilty conscience. But exactly why does she have a guilty conscience, if she has one? And who is Teague Whitman or Mrs. Ames? And most of all, why should a stranger like Rebecca Pryor be the one who, in her agony, Mrs. Carstairs seems to want to turn to for help? I'll return shortly with Act Three. events at the Sea Circle Sea have been moving to their own climax. They have also been moving more slowly to a decision in Becky Pryor's life. First off, she has a strange feeling about the letter to her father. Uh, this is the general store. We can mail your letter right here. Uh, why don't you give it to me, Becky, and I'll take it in. Oh, I can do it myself. Oh, it's no trouble. Won't take a minute. <laughs> Unless uh, you don't trust me to carry the mail. Why would I feel that way? But as I gave it to him and he swung from the buckboard and went into the store, I wished I hadn't. Some nagging doubt tugged at me. For a moment, I almost followed him in. But I was too late. For at the moment of decision, he was already returning. Ah, uh, that's that. Now we can go visit Doc Medford. Yeah, boy, yeah. You really think he can help us? I don't know what that means. I'm afraid to say it means anything. It was honestly just a question. Then I'm going to be just as honest in return, Becky. No. I don't think he can. I don't think anyone can. Then why do you go to him? What other choice do I have? I couldn't save my daughter. I'd like to save my wife. Why did... Carrie, do it, Mr. Costas. Hang herself. And that's really, I suppose, why I'm back here. I just can't understand. That she counted the world well lost for love? No, she was young like I am. Some other man would have come along. I tell you the truth, I, I am never going to rest till I can understand why. Well, you're very young, Becky. So many things you don't know or even imagine. If it'll help you, I'll tell you the one secret. What? Why Carrie killed herself. It wasn't just because her promised husband walked out on her. Then why? Why? She... She was carrying a child that would have no name. Both Avishams. If he wasn't a father, who else could she claim? And how could she face bringing a fatherless child into the world? I came back and I stuck my nose into it, stirred up muddy waters, couldn't leave well enough alone. What is well enough? What is it I'm looking for? And if Carrie didn't put a rope around her neck, how else did she die? And most of all, why am I so scared? Now, Becky, I, uh, I don't know what you wrote in the letter to your dad, but uh, I didn't mail it. What? Here it is, unopened. I just felt there was no point in mailing it. 
way I feel now. I don't understand. Well, I... Uh, I figured with you taking the train tomorrow morning, you might even get there before the mail's delivered. You want me to leave? Well, it would be best for everyone. I didn't see Mrs. Costas that evening. I went through all the preparations for leaving, haunted by some inner voice that I shouldn't. That something was being left undone. I didn't get a chance to talk to the doctor after he'd seen Mrs. Costas. And when Teague Whitman came to get my bag, he was escorted by that dour Mrs. Ames. So we had little to say to each other. I might have made some opportunity to try to see Mrs. Carstairs. But the truth is that after dinner with Mr. Carstairs, the wine seemed to go to my head and I barely made it up to bed before I was in a profound sleep. Deep, but uneasy. Because it seemed to me that in my sleep, I was talking to Carrie. Becky. Becky. Huh? Who? Who's that? Who's calling? It's Carrie. But you're dead. In the grave, but not at rest. I wander and cry out for Retribution. Retribution? For what? For dying too soon. And dying in shame. Don't leave me alone. You're the only friend I had. But what can I do to help? Someone will show you the way. You have guessed it, some of the truth. Someone will show you the rest. Someone. It's all going to be in your hands. Your hands. Becky, Miss Pryor, wake up. Hmm? Wake up. Wake hmm? up. What is it? Who? It's Steve. Well, it's Steve Whitman. Hmm? you got to get up. Here. Let me help you to your feet. Uh, That's it. Now, start walking. Well, what? What are... What are you doing in my room? I'm trying to revive you. You've been drugged. Drugged? With what? Keep walking. Breathe deep. With Mrs. Carstairs' medicine for her back pains. But why? Why should I be drugged? So you could be killed more easy. Killed? Who would want to... Shh, 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 shh. What? Why would anyone want to kill me? Same reason Carrie was killed. And my brother... Your brother? Yes, ma'am. Bo Faversham. You see, Faversham is my real family name. I, I don't understand. Of course I'm you don't. So, I... Becky, Becky, it, it all goes back to what is the most unattractive of human sins. Greed. <sighs> Chad Carstairs was foreman of this ranch. And he wanted to own the Sea Circle Sea so bad he'd stop at nothing. He tried to romance old man Conway's wife and wouldn't have gotten nowhere except... Well, fate gave him a lucky break. Mr. Conway died of a heart attack. So he swarmed around and finally up and married the widow. Only to get a real shock. Uh, what? What sort of a shock? Well, he found out the spread wasn't left to the widow, but to Carrie, the daughter. And he tried romancing her, but she didn't want any part of him. She had her own man. My brother, Bo, but... Chad Carstairs is a man set on getting his own way, so he didn't stop at romancing. It wasn't my brother's child she was carrying. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, so that's why Bo walked out on her. And why she... Why she... she Bo didn't walk out on her, Becky. He loved her too much. I figure Chad had some hired guns to take care of my brother and... Leave him in the desert to have his bones picked clean. <laughs> Carrie didn't hang herself. She was hung. But how? At the point of a gun. He had the rope all tied to the spike on the hitching post and made her climb on the horse, dropped the noose over her neck, and kicked the horse out from under her. I reckon, poor lady, she didn't care all that much about living anyway. But she didn't take her own life. It was took. How do you know all this? Oh, I, I don't. I, 
I'm only guessing. Well, how are you feeling now? I don't think I'll ever want to sleep again. Oh, good. Good? Yeah. Because I got to get you out of here while there's still time for you to get away. Well, I'm leaving tomorrow morning. Well, that may be too late. Too late? For what? To save your own life. Why should my life be in danger? Because this evening, while you were asleep, drugged, Doc Medwick and I witnessed this will by Mrs. Carstairs, leaving the Sea Circle Sea to you. <gasps> yeah, she'd asked you to take it home with you. Well, to your father to be recorded. But why will the wretch to me? To anyone rather than the man who murdered to make it his own. And you were her daughter's best friend. But but what difference does it make? A will could be changed at any time as long as... As long as the person who makes it is still alive. Becky, Mrs. Carstairs died less than an hour after this will was made. She's dead? A few more pills than you were fed. Mrs. Ames took care of that. She's in on it? She's Chad's real wife. What? It's true. Now, you come on with me. We're going down to the stable and get you some transport to get you out of here with a whole skin. All right. I've saddled and brighted our poor old local little mare. Only horse we have to get you into town so you can pick up the midnight stage. Aren't you going with me? No, ma'am. I'm staying to even up some old scores. You don't mean to kill Chad Costas. That's exactly what I aim to do. Oh, no, please, T. Please, there's been enough killing. What good would it do? It would save your life, for one thing. Is that so important to you? Or is it just revenge for what you think might have happened? I guess that's a question I'd better let you answer. <gasps> Maybe I can answer that for the both of you. No. Don't move, Teague. Except real slow to loosen your gun belt and let it drop while I light this lamp. Do it or I'll put a bullet in her. You can't get away with any more murders, Chad. In my territory here where I live, I can get away with anything. Now let me have the will. No. Give it to him, Teague. What does it matter? Once we do, we're both dead. If I kill you both first, I can just take it. Except that killing us both might not be as easy to explain as all the others. Carrie, my brother, your wife. I'll find a way. I'm not so sure. You're losing your touch, you know, Chad. You finally had to poison Mrs. Carstairs. Because you missed the first time. What does that mean? Oh, don't try to spook me, Chad. You took her out on this poor little mare here you knew was loco, didn't you? All right, that's enough talking, Ed. And then you stopped somewhere before she had a chance to dismount. You jerked at the reins against the bit in her mouth as if to tie her out. What are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, no! No! Hey, are you all right? I am. And, and Mr. Costell? Oh, poor little mare. She didn't mean it. But she saved our lives. What happened? She trampled him to death. Well, it's sort of poetic justice. What he spent his life doing to women. Only at the end, this particular one turned the tables. In one quick move, Teague Faversham had flipped the halter rope over the hitching rail, and immediately the mare had reacted by going berserk. Chad, caught off balance, was unable to protect himself against her flailing hooves. The special death he had planned long ago for his wife, unsuccessfully, was successful by accident and became his own. True poetic justice. That ideal justice which poets exercise by making the good happy and the evil unsuccessful. I'll return shortly. Sea Circle C has changed its brand, but the ranch is more successful than ever. It's now the T-Bar R, framed in a sort of circle that looks a lot more like a heart, and it's run by Teague and Becky Faversham. Their first child is on the way, 
but both of them feel in a sense it is their second. The first is a little black mare that Teague has spent a long time gentling and who no longer fears being hitched. Maybe she takes an example from Teague and his bride, Becky. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Bob Caliban, Ann Petoniak, Martha Greenhouse, and Bill Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We hear about... The changing times. Is it the times that change or the people within those times? We talk about a need for change and then don't recognize the change when it comes along. Around 500 BC, a Greek philosopher declared that all is flux, nothing stays still, nothing endures but change. Yet, an old French proverb tells us the more things change, the more they remain the same. Confusing, isn't it? At least we know that time never stands still. But does it? Our mystery drama, Too Early, Too Late, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Russell Horton and Marion Seldes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Jack and Ruth Peterson felt themselves lucky to inherit a ramshackle old house in Connecticut where his grandparents had once lived. The place was closed for a long time until last summer when the couple began fixing it up. They recalled past holidays there and decided it would be a great place to spend New Year's Eve. They have invited a friend from childhood to join them. Ah, good dinner, Ruth. Sorry Dave didn't get here in time to eat with us. Mm, he should have been here by now. I just didn't realize how late it is. I hope nothing's happened to him. That's the nuisance of not having a phone. First thing next spring, we oh, are going to... Oh, I'm beginning to think we shouldn't have come here in the winter time. Oh, nonsense. I'd rather be here than anywhere else in the world. Hey, anybody home? It's Dave. I'll get the door. Dave! Dave, come in. We were worried. Oh, welcome, old buddy. Where have you been? Oh, I've been lost. You're kidding. You know this area better than we do. Well, it's wilder than it used to be and so dark. You know, I'm accustomed to city lights. And now the road's slippery. I couldn't make it up your driveway. Have you had anything to eat? Not a thing. I'm starved. Oh, I hope there's a spark left in that wretched stove. Mm, and while Ruth stirs up the coals, I'm going to get you a drink. I feel better now. <laughs> Back on those icy roads, your reunion in the woods sounded like a crazy idea. I had this sudden urge to go back to the old days. I remember, Dave, when we were kids, the three of us swore we'd be friends forever. Yeah, I remember how the three of us used to leave the other kids and go off to the old graveyard. Yeah, <laughs> and just sit there quietly. I never did let on how scared I was. Of ghosts? I felt that all those dead eyes were looking at me. The old folks disapprovingly and the children... Begging me to help him. Oh, honey, I thought you liked the old graveyard. Oh, I did, in a creepy sort of way, but 
But those ancestors of ours seemed almost too real. Hey, do you suppose the inscriptions on those stones are, are still readable today? Of course. We checked up this past summer. Oh, I don't know. That place is terribly overgrown now. The bushes are just tangled everywhere. Well, I'd like to go back to that old graveyard and take a look. Hey, how about tomorrow? Mm -mm -mm. Sheer ice underfoot. Honey, let's try. It might not be so bad. You two can go. Just count me up. Uh-oh. The stone's back. I should have fixed that broken shutter. This house is like a sieve when the wind blows. It just sends chills into every corner. Is it okay if I throw another log on the fire? Yeah. Nothing like a roaring fire in the country. <laughs> I remember these sudden windstorms. Mm, I love them. Maybe that's why I went into the business. Say, that's right. You still working on those wind machines? Mm, you bet. We're making real progress. I can tell you right now, you're on the wrong track. What do you mean? I mean that old-fashioned stuff is out, completely out. Our ancestors tried it. You, uh, know something better? Yeah, darn right I do. Don't you realize we're in a nuclear age? Yes, and it's much too dangerous. No, uh, no, not the way I'm working at it. We're almost ready to conquer nature. <laughs> Who needs your nuclear power? That's what the wind can Jack, do. Jack, close the door. Oh, Lord, the lights have gone out. That does it. I've got to put a new lock on this door. I knew we shouldn't have come up here in the winter time. Well, don't you have kerosene lamps? Yeah, there are plenty of lamps in the house, but Jack couldn't find any kerosene. Everyone's bought it up for those fancy new stoves. <laughs> Is this ever a backward country? Now, just you wait. No, no, wait. Don't panic. We've got plenty of candles. And we don't need a refrigerator. I chipped some eyes off the rain spout, and the champagne's been chilling for hours. It's nearly midnight. Time to welcome the new year. Here's to us. And to a wind that blows everyone good. Well, let's conquer that wind. Here's to nuclear energy. Oh, wait a minute, you guys. While we're drinking champagne, millions of people are starving. I drink to a better chance for survival. For everyone. Yeah, that's what we all want. A happier new year. Jack? Jack, mm -hmm. wake up. Mm -hmm. Do I have to? Yes. Hold me tight. I want to be sure I'm alive. Oh, honey, you sure? I just had the most ghastly dream. I had a strange one, too. Oh, but mine was so frightening, so real. So was mine. Listen, there was this... this terrible man. I guess he was terrible. I couldn't exactly see him. But he kept telling me over and over that I had to obey his orders. That's extraordinary. Well, what did he tell you to do? He told me I must go to the graveyard. When? At noon, today. I don't believe it. You don't have to believe in dreams, do you? Now listen, there's more. The voice told you to go exactly six paces behind the furthest gravestone in the northwest corner. How did you know? Because I had exactly the same dream. But that's impossible. Is it? Uh, what was the next step? Uh, to dig a hole. To the depth of two feet? Yes, that's what he said, and then we'd... we'd... Uncover something that might change the whole course of, of the, the next, next decade. It's you and I agree on a lot of things, but we were never any good at ESP. Wait till Dave hears about this. Breakfast will be ready in a minute, I hope. Oh. Stove sure feels good. Hope you weren't cold during the night. No, no, there were plenty of blankets. For, I don't know, I'm chilled to the bone. Oh, sorry about that. Here, here's a cup of coffee. Oh, thanks. You know, um, I, uh, I had the most extraordinary dream last night. You too? Yeah. Now, wait, 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 wait till I tell you that, you know, there was this disembodied voice. A man's. Yeah, but, you know, I, I had no idea what sort of person he was. He, he, he sounded as though he knew me and, and he wanted me to do something. Oh, no. Well, what did he want you to do? He, he ordered me to go to the old graveyard. When? Uh, today, uh, at noon. And to take six paces straight back from the last gravestone in the northwest corner. How did you know that? Because I had the same dream. And so did I. That's incredible. 
Let me tell you the rest. We know. You're supposed to dig a hole. That's it. Two feet down, and you'll find... Well, the voice didn't say exactly what we'd find. Well, not what, but he indicated it was something important. Hey, hey, uh, just come on a minute. We're acting as though there really is something buried there. I don't know what to think. I know, I'm scared. How could three people have the same dream if there wasn't something to it? It's simple. Last night we all had the old graveyard on our minds. But we were talking about a time years ago when we were just kids. Those were vivid memories. And wait a minute. I did say I'd like to see the graveyard today. But I said I wouldn't go. Only I knew you'd come along. Well, I have a theory about dreams. What is it? I believe the dreams take up where an interrupted thought left off. Uh, I, I don't follow you. Last evening, we were all thinking about going to the graveyard, right? And then the storm blew up and the lights went out. Yes, that's right. We each concentrated on the same thing. And then, boom. I mean, don't you see how logical it is? Mm, that's an analysis even Freud might approve of. Elementary. So. We just go ahead with our original plans. But I think since we're going to the graveyard, we might as well take along a couple of shovels. Just in case. Are you two really going to the graveyard? We're all going, Ruth. And just for kicks, we're going right at noon. <laughs> I've forgotten how beautiful it is. We've never been here in the wintertime. It looks like an ice palace. Mm. Hey, this one's my great, great, great grandfather. <laughs> he lived to a ripe old age. Why did they carve such an awful skull thing with wings? Oh, that's the traditional angel of death. The person who lies under here was drowned in Lake Ontario. How'd you know that? It says so. Hey, listen. A church bell. But there hasn't been a church around here in a hundred years. Yes, there's a church over the hill. I know, it's two miles away. Well, it's a clear day, the atmosphere and wind are just right for sound to carry. And the dream said noontime, so if it's striking... Uh, Do you suppose... I'm getting out of no, here. No, no, just, just a minute, Ruth. I'll tell you one thing. We couldn't possibly dig a hole in the ground. Why not? Because the ground is frozen absolutely solid. Look, I'll show you. Well, uh, I'll try over here. Yeah, you see, Ruth, look, it's hard as marble. Well, I'm glad of that. Because anyway, we could get arrested for digging up a grave. Only we're supposed to dig beyond the last tombstone. That, that's out of the cemetery. Ground will be just as hard over there. Well, at least we can see if there's some sort of marker. Yeah, why not? Uh, oh, here's the last stone. Uh, okay, let's mm -hmm. measure off six paces. Uh, how long is a pace? That's a big step, like this. One... Two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I'll show you why we can't possibly dig a hole. Uh, you try over there, Jack, and uh, don't don't break the shovel. Okay, here goes. Good Lord, the ground is soft as butter. It can't be. Just one step back and look. It's hard as a rock. Uh, g come over here and dig. I'm not going to watch. I don't like the sight of old bones. Two feet down. We're almost there, Jack. Uh, I found something. Hey, hey, scrape the dirt away. Uh, be careful. Look. Well, I'll be. Look. Ruth. Look. What is it? Oh. Something shiny. I've never seen anything like it. What have they found? Something shiny, Ruth said. Can it be gold? Surely not treasure buried by Captain Kidd. Although there's at least one legend which claims that some of his loot was buried in the foothills of Connecticut. However, that's another story. Our three friends have made a surprising discovery, and the circumstances which surround their findings become more strange by the minute, as you'll learn presently in Act Two. <laughs> What is the fabric of dreams? Are they fashioned of fragments from the past, or do they portend the future? 
something remarkable has just taken place. Three people have had the same dream. Moreover, this dream has led them to an old graveyard on the first day of a new year in the 1980s. They have just dug a hole in the ground, roughly coffin-shaped. And what they uncovered has left them stunned. How can this be? Jack, don't touch it. I think it's some kind of a bomb. It can't be a bomb. It's it's encased in, in glass. No, it's not glass. I struck it hard with a spade. Plastic? No, I don't think so. Plastic doesn't gleam like that. It's... It's made of a substance I've never seen before. But what is it? I'd say it's a time capsule. Oh, Lord, a storm coming. In one minute we'll be drenched. There's not, there's not a cloud in the sky. Wind. Hang on to me, Jack. I can't stand up. Get, get down on the ground, everybody. No need to behave like huh? that. Get up. That voice. It's his. Whose voice? The man in, in our dream. Oh, don't let your imagination run away with you. I uh, knew you'd come. Greetings. Isn't it? Isn't it his voice? Where's it coming from? Over there, by that last tombstone. But that's where one of my ancestors is buried. He died in 1790. You're so right. It can't be a voice from the dead. Right again. Ah, someone is playing tricks. They planted a tape recorder. Wrong about that. Tape recorders went out of use years ago. But you came from there, from, from, from the grave of... You must be my great... Nonsense. Do I look like a man from the 18th century? No, you're dressed just like us. Of course. Then you must be a descendant of one of the people buried here. That, that would make you a distant cousin. Sorry to disappoint you. I'm no blood relative... But I do know all these people. I know them very well. Ah, let's stop this nonsense. You're a joker. You were crouching behind that stone. And it's time to tell us what this charade is all about. I don't play a charade. This has to be some sort of game. Surely you haven't forgotten your dream. Who are you? That, dear lady, is of little importance. What does matter is who you are. And what you're going to do about it. Would you stop talking in riddles and tell us what you're driving at? In due course. Right now, we must all get down to business. So far, you have obeyed instructions and uncovered what we sent you to find. Tell us what that... that thing in the ground is. You were right in calling it a time capsule. I suppose, in a way, that's what it is. But no ancestor of mine ever buried an object that looks like that. I don't think anyone thought about time capsules back in the 1780s. Exactly. So, if it's just been buried, who wants to open it? We know everything that's going on today. Who said anything about today? This capsule contains the future. Oh, then I'm going to break into it. Not so fast. Here's the spade. Let's dig it up. No need for that. Put the spade down. Okay, then help us get this thing out of the ground. It's very simple. Stand back. The capsule will come out right over there. Do you see what I have in my hand? Well, sure. It's a flashlight. What an antiquated idea. This is a beamer. A what? I focus the beam like this, and... Look. The capsule's coming out of the ground. Well, we'll track it over here where there's space for us all to gather around. Hey, it's bigger than I thought. Must be nearly four feet long. The last one we buried was much bigger. We've come a long way in the past century. Well, for Pete's sake, open it. Why don't you do it? It's very easy. Just lift off the shell. Here, Dave, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. Uh, you see? You see how light it is? It's, it's, it's like something out of science fiction. There is no fiction about these scientific instruments. Unbelievable. Computers? Scanners? What strange-looking bottles. Why, that's a miniature space module. Ah, they've put too much in here. I told them there would be only three. By three? Uh, do you mean Ruth and Dave and me? Uh, are you talking about us? Of course. Why do you think you've been summoned here? We haven't the slightest idea. You'd better find out. 
How stupid can you be? But no one has explained... I know, I know, I know. And the young lady is shivering. Well, it's the first of January. It's cold. Well, fix that. We'll start a fire. Oh, come on. This frozen wood will never burn. Who needs wood? This nuclear pellet will do. Nuclear pellet? You want to blast us all out of this world? Oh, what a lot you have to learn. One small pellet from this bottle. And this is just the spot. There. Oh. Let's get away, Jack. Uh, th 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 there'll be an explosion. There sure is. If this crazy man is really playing around with a neutron. Calm yourselves, my friend. How do we know we can trust you? You have no alternative. We're all here together for a purpose. Look, Mr. Uh, whoever you are, you'd better get to that purpose right now. We've had enough of these magic tricks. Warm yourselves by the fire while I get your material from the capsule. And I'll give the proper instructions to each of you. One at a time. Ah, fire feels good. You know, this is crazy. All of it. That man's insane. I mean, he may well be dangerous. He may be a madman, but by golly, I want to know everything he has to say. And one of the... It's coming back. It's carrying something that looks like a, a big balloon. Your name is Jack, is that right? That's right. And you're the man who's working on energy sources through wind power? Well, I don't know how you know that, but it's true. Hang on to this inflated bag. It's filled with wind power. <laughs> the bag's so light it can't be filled with anything but wind. Oh, no, you're quite wrong. It contains instruments which weigh at least 100 pounds. Well, how can that be? Pay attention. First, tell me who lies under this stone. That's the, uh, the grave of my ancestor, Samuel Peterson. Did you know he was one of the first to build a windmill in this part of the country? Oh, that's very interesting. It could have been. But it wasn't. Why? Didn't it work? He tried. But all he ever got was a trickle of water. We offered to help him... But he was too busy to listen. Well, that was two centuries ago. If I could just show you what we're doing today... You can show me nothing. Open that bag. <laughs> and all these things couldn't have come from that lightweight bag. When will you learn how easy it is to carry heavy objects when they're floated in hydrogen? No, no, that can't be. The, the slightest friction and everything would go up in flames. Uh, I'd forgotten you've not yet figured how to make hydrogen decombustible. But no matter. I'll give Jack one minute to look over the contents of the bag. And there's everything here that I've been working on. Much more. There's a computer, of course I have one of those. Uh, not like this one. All these other things. How wonderful! A, a rotor, the new vertical blades, an electronic driving shaft, all in miniature. I've never seen such perfect scale models. Those are not scale models. Of course they are. Your cumbersome equipment is out of date. That small piece of machinery in your hand can power turbines to light a city or to move a 747. I don't believe it. You will when you learn how. But it's time to open the next bag. I'll get it. He's mad, you know. That stuff is a bunch of junk. But how can I tell without testing it? Your but... name is Ruth. Yes. I, I know nothing about machinery. You but... are concerned that some people don't have enough to eat, right? You have no idea how many people are dying of starvation. Open the bag. Sure. Bottles and seed packets and chemical retorts? Enough there to feed the world many times over. You're joking. Those seeds can be treated to germinate within minutes rather than weeks. Oh, how wonderful if that would be true. And, and, and what are these... these pills? Each one contains more nutrients than a full-course meal. Then why haven't we heard about them? I try to keep up with all the literature. That's why I'm here. To help you. With a bag full of seed and pills? How do I know these things aren't poison? Is there no trust left in the world? You're a woman with a brain. Use it. A formula is there. 
find out for yourself. He's gone for the third bag. This one has to be for you. And your name is David. You consider yourself an expert on nuclear power. On certain aspects of it, yeah. Well, that's the whole point, those... those aspects. Open the bag. Uh, another bag of tricks. <laughs> you know, I'm not interested in the scale model of a reactor. Our problem is getting rid of hazardous wastes. We're on the right track. You're darn right we are. We are reprocessing uranium and plutonium, leaving no more than 10% radiation. That's too much. I suppose you know how to get rid of it. Read the instructions and you'll find the way to end all thermal pollution. Huh, that'll be the day. It will, if you want it to be. Oh, the fire is going out. It's getting so dark. I think there's going to be a snowstorm. It's only a passing cloud, but I must be on my way. I'll inflate the bag so you can carry your precious materials home. You mean we can keep these things? Only if you make proper use of them. Well, come with us, then. There are a lot of questions I want to ask. Oh, no. No, you're on your own. If you three are doing more for humanity than the people buried under these stones, then prove it. Well, what do you expect us to do? You will use the information I have given you to help solve the problems of a troubled world. <laughs> That's a big order. We don't expect it to happen overnight. So you will have one month in which to make progress. Who's calling the shots? That's out of your hands and mine. But I'll meet you here one month from today, at noon, on February 1st, to find out how you're doing. Good luck. With that last big gust of wind, the mysterious stranger vanished without a trace. Then the three bewildered people returned to the country house with what they called their bags of tricks. If you are skeptical, so were they. That strange presence had appealed to each of them individually on matters which concerned them deeply. If nothing else, they are consumed with curiosity. We hope you are too. Act three will begin presently. <laughs> friends have spent an extraordinary afternoon with a presence who did not identify himself. They have been challenged to show what progress can be made in important fields of a human endeavor. Baffled by the circumstances, they are compelled to examine the materials which have been placed in their hands. Several hours have passed, and their absorption has been complete. It all makes sense, Ruth, every page of it. The combination of ingredients used in these pellets is fantastic. Why haven't we thought about using this formula? Well, we've got to get to the lab to try this out. Now, how are we going to explain what happened today? There's no need to, Jack. Once we learn how to use these tools, the information is ours to demonstrate. Then you do believe that for some reason we've been chosen. All we can do now is believe in ourselves. I think it's time to pack up and go back to civilization. Well, I'm leaving right now. And if word gets to the suburbs that a city apartment house has blown up, you'll know something went wrong. Jack, you must come to bed. You've been working on the car every night this week with almost no sleep. It's nearly ready for testing. I am getting close, very close. How do you feel? Oh, I never felt better. Why? I just feel guilty about not cooking dinner. Well, where's time for dinner with so much to do? Yes, but we can't use up the food pills until I learn how to make more. Uh, yeah, that does it. Now, I'll just turn on the ignition. It works. By heaven, Ruth, it works. What's so unusual about starting the motor? Uh, how'd you like to drive this car without ever buying another drop of gasoline? Jack, come into my office. 
I'm glad you called me, sir. I, I have something very important to show you. Now, Jack, what's this I hear about you not attending the WPNA meeting? We're too busy, sir. And uh, who do you think you're working for? I never believed so completely in wind power as I do right now. Now, let me show you my car. What the devil do I care about your car? Please, when you see it, you'll know what I've been working on all week. Well, uh, you can drive me to the plant. Three o'clock this afternoon. Nice sounding motor, isn't it? Yeah. Sounds okay to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, take a look at the gas gauge. What? Why, you young fool, it's empty. What kind of game are you playing? Just, uh, proving a point. Yeah, let's drive into that gas station. This car does not use gas. Oh, I suppose it's running on thin air. Exactly. I'm using wind power. <laughs> You're out of your mind. Now, I'll, I'll pull up over there and open the hood so you can see for yourself. You hooked that tiny vertical bladed motor to the generator. That's right. At what speed? Well, I've only tested it up to 70 miles an hour. Yeah. How far will it go without being regenerated? Huh? I've only driven 250 miles, but it regenerates itself. Uh-huh. Gag, drive me back to the office at once. Jack. you must realize we have a tiger by the tail. Now, um... How many people know about this uh, invention of yours? Well, you're the first one I've come to. Good, good, good. So until the details can be worked out, this must be kept an absolute secret. Oh. No, no, uh, that, that's not the point. If we go into production immediately, we can lick the energy crisis. Now, first of all, Wind Power Associates must have an exclusive contract. But this is for everybody. We'll take out a patent in, in your name, of course. And, Jack, from now on, you're a vice president and stockholder in the company. Well, I don't want a patent or a title. All I want is for you to back me up with a public demonstration tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow? You're madder than I thought. Uh, for your own protection, Jack, I'm not throwing you to the wolves. Ruth Peterson, what's going on in here? Looks like a jungle. These seeds. There's just never been anything like them. Now look, it's almost ready to be harvested. That whole side is wheat. And over here it's rye. And and the tub, that's full of rice. Well, how did all that stuff get in here? The storeroom was empty just a couple of days ago. <laughs> that's why I caught you. I've been given a formula with which I treated these seeds. And you pour some water in that bowl and I'll just show you what happens. Uh, it better be good. Now... I'll sprinkle some of these seeds in the bowl. Now watch. Well, I'll be a... Well, you're opening up like those magic flower things we had as kids. You see? They just start sprouting immediately. And when they're planted, well, there are the results. We can feed the world. Ruth, come into the conference room and uh, make a report. <laughs> Mr. Bascom, you say you've come up with something that limits radiation? Well, yes, sir. I'd, uh, I'd like to show it to I'm you. I'm a very busy man. Can't you sketch in the details? Uh, no, sir. It's all set up in the testing room. I thought you'd been given instructions that no more nuclear devices would... Uh, be... Sir, sir, this, uh, this experiment is different. I, I, it's like nothing you've ever seen. Is everything sealed? Uh, yes, sir. Sealed tight. Uh, put on your face mask. Uh, the light will be bright. Here goes. <laughs> had your explosion, and according to the Geiger reading, there's a high radiation count. I installed a container which will open with the heat and pour its contents over the contaminated area. Uh, uh, watch, sir. Uh, it's, it's, it's working. By George, the counter is stopped. Yes, sir. That means all contamination has been eliminated. David, if what you've just done can be proved... We must contact the Pentagon immediately. Ruth, are you home? Yes, not for long. 
You're going to drive me to the airport. Oh, honey, I'm Bush. Nothing but disappointment all day, all week. I, I, what's this about an airport? Well, you know how well my work's been going. They've tested the formula, and they've learned how to make the food pills. Well, so why don't they ship them off to wherever they're needed most? Because if they fell into the wrong hands, they'd never get to the needy. I have the honor of launching the program. They're sending me overseas. <laughs> Oh, the Pentagon. I'll never learn my way around this place. Just a minute, sir. Uh, y yes, Sign look, here. Uh, look, ma'am, I've, I've been here five times in the last couple of days. I've Sign here. I've signed in duplicate and triplicate. I, I, I've even been fingerprinted. Look, please, could you tell me which way to room 1405? Down the hall to the left, then turn right. Mr. Baskin, we are deeply impressed by the documentation on your experiment. Uh, please, sir, would you untangle me from all this red tape so we can go to work on the disposal of hazardous wastes? All in due time. You have given us what can be a clean bomb. Uh, 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 wait a minute. I want nothing to do with bombs. But if we had a missile which was truly clean... Imagine the possibilities. My information must not be used for making weapons. I am concerned with saving lives, not destruction. Now look, I want those documents back. I should have gone straight to the Nuclear Energy Commission. We work directly with them, of course. I know they'll be interested. Okay, then give me my papers and let me go. These have now become government property. Okay, I'll go to the president. Well, I'm sure that eventually he will want to see you. I mean right now. Naturally, you'll be living in Washington. We will provide security. A man with your information must be protected at all times. <laughs> Oh, Dave, am I ever glad to see you. Oh, that goes for me too, Jack. How you doing? Miserably. Before any damage is done, I must get to the president. How's it going with you? Ah, rotten. I've drawn charts. I've filled in forms. The auto industry won't talk to me till their big convention in April. I tried going straight to the press. They think I'm a nut. Yeah, I know what you've been going through. Uh, excuse me. Hello? Hello? Who? Uh... L louder, please. Uh, this this connection is terrible. Hello? Hello? Jack? Ruth, where are you? I'm in jail. Well, you're where? They put me in prison. For what reason? For being a spy. You're kidding. Darling, I'm only allowed one phone call. Please, please, do what you can to get me out of this place. I'm in the... Ruth? Ruth? What's the matter with this line? What is it? Ruth's been thrown in jail. I, I have no idea where, and, and, and the phone's dead. Well, you know where we're supposed to be three days from now. Oh, we can't go without Ruth. Oh, we may have to. This house is colder than ever. Yeah. Mind if I throw some wood on the fire? Oh, go ahead. I guess we'll be up all night. I can't imagine getting any sleep. You, you do think... He'll be there, though, don't you? I'll well, have to be. I'll get more worried about Ruth by the minute. Well, he's the one who's responsible. He'll have to bring her back. Oh! oh. Ruth, <laughs> darling! You all right, Ruth? I'm okay. I wouldn't go through that again for anything. How'd you get away? They released me yesterday without any explanation. I was put on a plane and sent home, and I rented a car at the airport, and here I am. Oh, thank the Lord. Of course, I had to be here. Tomorrow... We have a rendezvous. I'm sorry to get up so late. Good morning. I'm not sure that it is. Maybe I'm not awake yet, but I feel very strange. I hope you didn't have bad dreams like mine all night long. Well, your dreams couldn't have been as wild as mine. I need another cup of coffee. Well, fresh air ought to fix us up. Remember, we agreed to go to the old cemetery. Looks very different this time of year. I'd forgotten the place was so deep in the woods. Greetings, all of you. You're right on time. He's here. Of course he is. He said he would be, didn't he? You, uh, you don't know what trouble you got us into. Oh, yes, I do. You threw me to the warlord. I was thrown into jail. I know, I know, I know. Don't bore me with details. 
You were given a remarkable opportunity, but not one of you got to first base. Well, it was all so frustrating. Life always is. And so are dreams. Well, how would you handle a situation where everything has to be checked and, and double-checked? I wouldn't stand for it. Well, you'd have to, unless you were a dictator. Your ancestors under this ground came here to be free. They acted for themselves, did things in their own way. And how many died young? You just read the dates on these gravestones. That's irrelevant. Irrelevant? That we've learned to prevent the diseases they died from? If you think it's progress to extend the span of human life, why are you working to wipe out your entire universe in one instant? That's not our intention. It's too early to pass judgment on what we can do in the future. Too late, I'd say. In view of the way you've already bungled things. Yeah, but now with the tools you've given us, well, we'll get things on the right track. You never had any tools. It was quite clear from the beginning that our experiment would be too much for you to handle. You brought us the capsule. I brought you a time capsule only. Often a very useful tool for stretching the mind. Well, then help us to use it. Oh, no. Now, that's up to you. Too early, too late. Anything's possible in the time machine. And right now, it's time to go back. He's gone. Yeah, I've had enough of this old graveyard. Let's get out of here. Oh, race you down the hill. Not me. I feel very tired all of a sudden. I have a, a headache. I'll see you at the car. Having car trouble? I thought I'd warm up the motor, but the darn thing won't start. Hey, you'll wreck the battery. Jack, look at the gas gauge. Well, well it's empty. I swear, we, we we filled it yesterday. Didn't we, Mom? It sounds crazy, but I don't remember. It's quite a hike to the nearest gas station. But the summer station is closed in... in February. What did you say? I said the station is closed. And... I, I, I'm all mixed up. Uh, what day is today? Uh, well, I'm I'm not working, so it must be a holiday. I feel as though I've been away for a month. Hmm. An old graveyard can be a very unsettling place. What, what what time is it? Well, on my watch, it's two minutes to one. We've been here nearly an hour. An hour? But what's the date? Well, my watch says it right here. It's January the 1st. Jan January the 1st? What happened to the whole month of January? But that's not possible. You mean that all that happened to us didn't... Was it a dream? Well, if it was, I'm glad. <laughs> so am I. Well, then don't look so gloomy, you two. Happy New Year. All things are possible. It's really just the beginning. Minutes, hours, days, a month. The major events of a lifetime can pass through the human mind within a matter of seconds. And what do we mean by progress? I'm inclined to believe the 1980s are a good deal better than many people say they are. Perhaps, to use Shakespeare's phrase, time is always out of joint. In their struggle for existence, those early American settlers were forced to move slowly. Today, the frightening part about heading into the future is not speed. It's the direction we are taking. I'll be back shortly. It's not unusual to come across a ghost in an old graveyard, but a ghost of the future? Our ghost, if that's what it was, offered some tantalizing possibilities. At least he indicated there are better things ahead. 
Author George Orwell painted a far gloomier picture. But we're so close to 1984 that some of Orwell's predictions can't possibly come true. Or can they? We are forced to revert to that well-worn cliché, only time will tell. Our cast included Russell Horton, Marion Seldes, Paul Hecht, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Raven House Paperback Mysteries. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.